Tertullian Introductory Note, AD 145-220, When Our Lord Repulsed the Woman of Canaan, Matt. 15. 22, With apparent harshness, he applied to her people the epithet dogs, with which the children of Israel had thought it piety to reproach them. When he accepted her faith and caused it to be recorded for our learning, he did something more. He reversed the curse of the Canaanite and showed that the church was designed for all people, Catholic alike for all time and for all sorts and conditions of men. Thus the North African church was loved before it was born. The Good Shepherd was gently leading those that were with young. Here was the charter of those Christians to be a church, who then were Canaanites in the land of their father Ham. It is remarkable indeed that among these pilgrims and strangers to the West the first elements of Latin Christianity come into view. Even at the close of the second century the Church in Rome is an inconsiderable, though prominent, member of the great confederation of Christian churches which has its chief seats in Alexandria and Antioch, and of which the entire literature is Greek. It is an African presbyter who takes from Latin Christendom the reproach of theological and literary barrenness and begins the great work in which, upon his foundations, Cyprian and Augustine built up, with incomparable genius, that Carthaginian school of Christian thought by which Latin theology was dominated for centuries. It is important to note, 1, that providentially not one of these illustrious doctors died in communion with the Roman see, pure though it was and venerable at that time, and, 2, that to the works of Augustine the Reformation in Germany and continental Europe was largely due, while, 3, the specialties of the Anglican Reformation were, in like proportion, due to the writings of Tertullian and Cyprian, the hinges of great and controlling destinies for Western Europe and our own America are to be found in the period we are now approaching. The merest schoolboy knows much of the history of Carthage, and how the North Africans became Roman citizens. How they became Christians is not so clear. A melancholy destiny has enveloped Carthage from the outset and its glory and greatness as a Christian see were transient indeed. It blazed out all at once in Tertullian, after about a century of missionary labors had been exerted upon its creation, and having given a Minicius Felix, an Arnabius and a Lactantius to adorn the earliest period of Western ecclesiastical learning, in addition to its nobler luminaries, it rapidly declined. At the beginning of the third century, at a council presided over by Agrippinus, Bishop of Carthage, there were present not less than seventy bishops of the province. A period of cruel persecutions followed, and the African church received a baptism of blood. Tertullian was born a heathen, and seems to have been educated at Rome, where he probably practiced as a juris consult. We may, perhaps, adopt most of the ideas of Alex, as conjecturally probable, and assign his birth to AD 145. He became a Christian about 185 and a presbyter about 190. The period of his strict orthodoxy very nearly expires with the century. He lived to an extreme old age, and some suppose even till AD 240. More probably we must adopt the date preferred by recent writers, AD 220. It seems to be the fashion to treat of Tertullian as a Montanist, and only incidentally to celebrate his services to the Catholic orthodoxy of Western Christendom. Were I his biographer I should reverse this course as a mere act of justice, to say nothing of gratitude to a man of splendid intellect, to whom the filial spirit of Cyprian accorded the loving tribute of a disciple, and whose genius stamped itself upon the very words of Latin theology, and prepared the language for the labors of a Jerome, in creating the Vulgate, and so lifting the Western churches into a position of intellectual equality with the East, the latter as well as Saint. Augustine himself were debtors to Tertullian in a degree not to be estimated by any other than the providential mind that inspired his brilliant career as a Christian. In speaking of Tatian I laid the base for what I wished to say of Tertullian. Let God only be their judge, let us gratefully recognize the debt we owe to them. Let us read them, as we read the works of King Solomon. We must, indeed, approve of the discipline of the primitive age which allowed of no compromises, the church was struggling for existence, and could not permit any man to become her master. The more brilliant the intellect, the more dangerous to the poor church were its perversions of her testimony. Before the heathen tribunals, and in the marketplaces, it would not answer to let Christianity appear double-tongued. The orthodoxy of the church, 
not less than her children, was undergoing an ordeal of fire. It seems a miracle that her testimony preserved its unity, and that heresy was branded as such by the instinct of the faithful. Poor Churchillian was cut off by his own act. The weeping church might bewail him as David mourns for Absalom, but like David, she could not give the ark of God into other hands than those of the loyal and the true. I have set the writings of Churchillian in a natural and logical order, so as to aid the student, and to relieve him from the distractions of such an arrangement as one finds in Oller's edition. Valuable as it is, the practical use of it is irritating and confusing. The reader of that edition may turn to the slightly differing schemes of Neander and K, for a theoretical order of the works, but here he will find a classification which will aid his inquiries. He will find, first, those works which connect with the apologists of the former volumes of this series, which illustrate the Church's position toward the outside world, the Jews as well as the Gentiles. Next come those works which contend with internal differences and heresies, and then, those which reflect the morals and manners of Christians. These are classed with some reference to their degrees of freedom from the Montanistic taint, and are followed, last of all, by the few tracts which belong to the melancholy period of his lapse, and are directed against the Church's orthodoxy. Let it be borne in mind, that if the sad close of Tertullian's career cannot be extenuated, the later history of Latin Christianity forbids us to condemn him in the tones which proceeded from the virgin church with authority, and which the law of her testimony and the instinct of self-preservation forced her to utter. Let us reflect that Saint, Bernard and after him the schoolmen, whom we so deservedly honor, separated themselves far more absolutely than ever Tertullian did from the orthodoxy of primitive Christendom. The schism which withdrew the West from communion with the original seats of Christendom, and from Nicene Catholicity, was formidable beyond all expression, in comparison with Tertullian's entanglements with a delusion which the See of Rome itself had momentarily patronized. Since the Council of Trent, not a theologian of the Latins has been free from organic heresies, compared with which the fanaticism of our author was a trifling aberration. Since the late Council of the Vatican, essential Montanism has become organized in the Latin churches. For what are the new revelations and oracles of the pontiff but the delirium of another claimant to the voice and inspiration of the paraclete? Poor Tertullian, the sad influences of his decline and folly have been fatally felt in all the subsequent history of the West, but, surely subscribers to the modern creed of the Vatican have reason to speak gently of their father's fall to Dollinger, with the old Catholic remnant only, is left the right to name the Montanists heretics or to upbraid Tertullian as a lapser from Catholicity. From Dr. Holmes, I append the following introductory notice. 1. Quintus Septimius Florens Tertullianus, as our author is called in the MSS, of his works, is thus noticed by Jerome in his Catalogus Scriptoris Ecclesiasticarum, Tertullian, a presbyter, the first Latin writer after Victor and Apollonius, was a native of the province of Africa and city of Carthage. The son of a proconsular centurion, he was a man of a sharp and vehement temper, flourished under Severus and Antoninus Caracalla, and wrote numerous works, which, as they are generally known, I think it unnecessary to particularize. I saw at Concordia, in Italy, an old man named Paulus. He said that when young he had met at Rome with an aged amanuensis of the blessed Cyprian, who told him that Cyprian never passed a day without treating some portion of Tertullian's works, and used frequently to say, Give me any master, meaning Tertullian. After remaining a presbyter of the church until he had attained the middle age of life, Tertullian was, by the envy and contumelious treatment of the Roman clergy, driven to embrace the opinions of Montanus, which he has mentioned in several of his works under the title of the New Prophecy. He is reported to have lived to a very advanced age and to have composed many other works which are not extant. We add Bishop Kay's notes on this extract, in an abridged shape. The correctness of some parts of this account has been questioned. Doubts have been entertained whether Tertullian was a presbyter, although these have solely arisen from Roman Catholic objections to a married priesthood, for it is certain that he was married, there being among his works two treatises addressed to his wife. Another question has been raised respecting the place where Tertullian officiated as a presbyter whether at Carthage or at Rome. That he at one time resided at Carthage may be inferred from Jerome's statement, 
and is rendered certain by several passages of his own writings, Alex supposes that the notion of his having been a presbyter of the Roman Church owed its rise to what Jerome said of the envy and abuse of the Roman clergy impelling him to espouse the party of Montanus, Optatus, and the author of the work De He Rezibus, which Sermon edited under tile title of Predestinatus, expressly call him a Carthaginian presbyter, Samler, however, in a dissertation inserted in his edition of Tertullian's works, contends that he was a presbyter of the Roman Church, Eusebius tells us that he was accurately acquainted with the Roman laws, and on other accounts a distinguished person at Rome. Tertullian displays, moreover, a knowledge of the proceedings of the Roman Church with respect to Martian and Valentinus, who were once members of it, which could scarcely have been obtained by one who had not himself been numbered amongst its presbyters. Sendler admits that, after Tertullian seceded from the Church, he left and returned to Carthage. Jerome does not inform us whether Tertullian was born of Christian parents, or was converted to Christianity. There are passages in his writings which seem to imply that he had been a Gentile, yet he may perhaps mean to describe, not his own condition, but that of Gentiles in general, before their conversion. Alex and the majority of commentators understand them literally, as well as some other passages in which he speaks of his own infirmities and sinfulness. His writings show that he flourished at the period specified by Jerome that is, during the reigns of Severus and Antoninus Caracalla, or between the years AD 193 and 216, but they supply no precise information respecting the date of his birth, or any of the principal occurrences of his life. Alex places his birth about 145 or 150, his conversion to Christianity about AD 185, his marriage about 186, his admission to the priesthood about 192, his adoption of the opinions of Montanus about 199, and his death about AD 220. But these dates, it must be understood, rest entirely on conjecture. 2. Tertullian's work against Martian, as it happens, is, as to its date, the best authenticated perhaps the only well authenticated particular connected with the author's life. He himself as mentions the fifteenth year of the reign of Severus as the time when he was writing the work, Ad 15. Jam Severi Imperatoris. This agrees with Jerome's chronicle, where occurs this note, Anno 2223 Severi ex v superscripto Tertullianus. Celebrator. This year is assigned to the year of our Lord 207 but notwithstanding the certainty of this date, it is far from clear that it describes more than the time of the publication of the first look. On the contrary, it is nearly certain that the other books, although connected manifestly enough in the author's argument and purpose, compare the initial and the final chapters of the several books, were yet issued at separate times. Noah Selt shows that between the book 1 and books 2, 4. Tertullian issued his De Prascript, Hayrit, and previous to Book V. He published his tracts, De Carni Christi and the Resurrection Carnis, after giving the incontestable date of the 15. of Severus for the first book. He says it is a mistake to suppose that the other books were published with it. He adds, although we cannot undertake to determine whether Tertullian issued his books to, 3, 4, against Martian, together or separately, or in what year, we yet venture to affirm that Book V. appeared apart from the rest. For the tract de Rezer, Carnus appears from its second chapter to have been published after the tract de Carni Christi, in which latter work, Chapter 7, he quotes a passage from the fourth book against Martian, but in his Book V. against Martian, Chapter 10, he refers to his work de Rezer, Carnus, which circumstance makes it evident that Tertullian published his Book V at a different time from his book 4. In his book 1 he announces his intention, chapter 1, of some time or other completing his tract de prescript, Hayrit, but in his book, De Carni Christi, chapter 2, he mentions how he had completed it, comma, a conclusive proof that his book 1 against Martian preceded the other books. 3. Respecting Martian himself, the most formidable heretic who had as yet opposed revealed truth, enough will turn up in this treatise with the notes which we have added an explanation, to satisfy the reader. It will, however, be convenient to give here a few introductory particulars of him. Tertullian mentions Martian as being, with valentness, in communion with the church at Rome, 
under the episcopate of the blessed Eleutherus, he goes on to charge them with ever restless curiosity, with which they infected even the brethren, and informs us that they were more than once put out of communion marching, indeed, with the two hundred sisters which he brought into the church, he goes on to say, that being at last condemned to the banishment of a perpetual separation, they sowed abroad the poisons of their doctrines, afterwards, when Marcin, having professed penitence, agreed to the terms offered to him, that he should receive a reconciliation on condition that he brought back to the church the rest also, whom he had trained up for perdition, he was prevented by death. He was a native of Sinope and Pontus, of which city, according to an account preserved by Epiphanius, which, however, is somewhat doubtful, his father was bishop, and of high character both for his orthodoxy and exemplary practice, he came to Rome soon after the death of Hyginus, probably about AD 141 or 142, and soon after his arrival he adopted the heresy of Sertan. 4. It is an interesting question as to what edition of the Holy Scriptures Tertullian used in his very copious quotations. It may at once be asserted that he did not cite from the Hebrew, although some writers have claimed for him, among his varied learning, a knowledge of the sacred language. B.P. K. observes, page 61, n. 1, that he sometimes speaks as if he was acquainted with Hebrew, and refers to the anti martian 4. 39, the adverb proxm v, and the adverb, judios 9, be this as it may, it is manifest that Tertullian scripture passages never resemble the Hebrew, but in nearly every instance the Septuagint, whenever, as is most frequently the case, that version differs from the original. In the New Testament there is, as might be expected, a tolerably close conformity to the Greek. There is, however, it must be allowed a sufficiently frequent variation from the letter of both the Greek Testaments to justify Sandler's suspicion that Tertullian always quoted from the Old Latin version, whatever that might have been, which was current in the African Church in the 2nd and 3rd centuries. The most valuable part of Sandler's Dissertatio de Varia et Inserta in Dolororum Q. S. F. Tertullian is his investigation of this very point. In section 4. He endeavors to prove this proposition. Hic scripter non in manibus habuit gracos libros sacros, and he states his conclusion thus, Certissimum estate nec tertullianum nec cyprianum nec ulum scriptra me latinis alis ecclesiasticis pervicere unquam ad gracorum libro rem octoritatum civil maxim obscurat contrary lectio occurrit, and again, ex his satis certum estate, latino satis diu secutos fuis octoritatum quorum libro rem adversis griscos. Nec concessus nisi serius, cum Augustini ad hieronym I nova octertus juvervi dretcher. It is not ignorance of Greek which is imputed to Tertullian, for he is said to have well understood that language, and even to have composed in it, he probably followed the Latin, as writers now usually quote the authorized English, as being current and best known among their readers. Independent feeling, also, would have weight with such a temper as Tertullian's to say nothing of the suspicion which largely prevailed in the African branch of the Latin Church, that the Greek copies of the scriptures were much corrupted by the heretics, who were chiefly, if not wholly, Greeks or Greek-speaking persons. v. Whatever perverting effect Tertullian's secession to the sect of Montanans may have had on his judgment in his latest writings, it did not vitiate the work against Martian. With a few trivial exceptions, this treatise may be read by the strictest Catholic without any feeling of annoyance. His lapse to Montanism is set down conjecturally as having taken place A.D. 199. Jerome, we have seen, attributed the event to his quarrel with the Roman clergy, but this is at least doubtful, nor must it be forgotten that Tertullian's mind seems to have been peculiarly suited by nature to adopt the mystical notions and ascetic principles of Montanus. It is satisfactory to find that, on the whole, the authority of Tertullian, as the learned Dr. Burton says, upon great points of doctrine is considered to be little, if at all, affected by his becoming a Montanist. Lectures on Ecclesiastes, Volume 2. p. 234. Besides the different works which are expressly mentioned in the notes of this volume, recourse has been had by the translator to depends his writers, trans, volume 1 pages 69-86. Tillemont's Memoirs Hist. 3. 
85-103, Dr. Smith's Greek and Roman Biography, Articles Martian and Tertullian, Schaff's Article, in Herzog's Cyclopedia, on Tertullian, Munder's Primordia Ecl, African E, pages 118 to 150, Robertson's Churchist. Volume 1 pages 70 to 77, Dr. P. Schaffshist. Of Christian Church, New York, 1859, pp.511519, and Archdeacon Evans' Biography of the Early Church, Volume 1, Lives of Martian, pages 93 to 122, and Tertullian, pp. 325-363. This last work, though of a popular cast, shows a good deal of research and learning, expressed in the pleasant style of the once popular author of the Rectory of Vale Head. The translator has mentioned these works, because they are all quite accessible to the general reader, and will give him adequate information concerning the subject treated in the present volume. To this introduction of Dr. Holmes must be added that of Mr. Thelwall, the translator of the third volume in the Edinburgh series, as follows, to arrange chronologically the works especially if numerous, of an author whose own date is known with tolerable precision, is not always or necessarily easy. Witness the controversies as to the succession of St. Paul's epistles. To do this in the case of an author whose own date is itself a matter of controversy may therefore be reasonably expected to be still less so, and such is the predicament of him who attempts to perform this task for Tertullian. I propose to give a specimen or two of the difficulties with which the task is beset and then to lay before the reader briefly a summary of the results at which eminent scholars, who have devoted much time and thought to the subject, have arrived. Such a course, I think, will at once afford him means of judging of the absolute impossibility of arriving at definite certainty in the matter, and induce him to excuse me if I prefer furnishing him with materials from which to deduce his own conclusions, rather than venturing on an ex cathedra decision on so doubtful a subject. One. The book, as Dr. Holmes has reminded us, of the date of which we seem to have the surest evidence, is adverb, Mark. 1. This book was in course of writing, as its author himself, c. 15, tells us, in the fifteenth year of the empire of Severus. Now this date would be clear if there were no doubt as to which year of our era corresponds to Tertullian's fifteenth of Severus. Pamlius, however, says Dr. Holmes, makes it a decog. Clinton, whose authority is more recent and better, 207. 2. Another book which promises to give some clue to its date is the De Palio. The writer uses these phrases, presentus imperil triplex vertus, dio tot augustus in union faventi, which show that there were at the time three persons unitedly bearing the title Augusti not Caesars only, but the still higher Augusti semicolon while the remainder of the context, as well as the opening of C. I indicates a time of peace of some considerable duration, a time of plenty, and a time during and previous to which great changes had taken place in the general aspect of the Roman Empire, and some particular traitor had been discovered and frustrated. Such a combination of circumstances might seem to fix the date with some degree of assurance, but unhappily, as K reminds us, commentators cannot agree as to who the three Augusti are, some say Severus, Caracalla, and Albinus. Some say Severus, Caracalla, and Gaeta. Hence we have a difference of some twelve years or thereabouts in the computations. For Albinus was defeated by Severus in person, and fell by his own hand, in AD 197, and Gaeta, Severus' second son, brother of Caracalla, was not associated by his father with himself and his other son as Augustus until AD 208, though he had received the title of Caesar ten years before in the same year in which Caracalla had received that of Augustus. For my own part, I may perhaps be allowed to say that I should incline to agree, like Salmasius, with those who assign the later date. The limits of the present introduction forbid my entering at large into my reasons for so doing. I am, however, supported in it by the authority of Neander. In one point, though, I should hesitate to agree with Oller who appears to follow Salmasius and others here in common namely, in understanding the expression et cacto et rubo subdili familiaritatis convulso of Albinus. It seems to me the words might with more propriety be applied to Plotinus, and that in the word familiaritatis we may see, 
after Tertullian's fashion, a play upon the meaning, with a reference not only to the long-standing but mischievous intimacy which existed between Severus and his countrymen, perhaps fellow townsmen, Plotinus, who for his harshness and cruelty is fitly compared to the prickly cactus. He alludes likewise to the alliance which this ambitious Praetorian PR erect had contrived to contract with the family of the emperor, by the marriage of his daughter Plotilla to Caracalla, an event which, as it turned out, led to his own death. Thus in the rubbo there may be a reference to the ambitious and conceited bramble of Jotham's parable, and perhaps, too, to the thistle of Jehoshes. If this be so, the date would be at least approximately fixed, as Plotinus did not marry his daughter to Caracalla till AD 203, and was himself put to death in the following year, 204, while Gaeta, as we have seen, was made Augustus in 208. 3. The date of the Apology, however, is perhaps at once the most contested, and the most strikingly illustrative of the difficulties to which allusion has been made. It is not surprising that its date should have been more disputed than that of other pieces, inasmuch as it is the best known, and, for some reasons, the most interesting and famous, of all our author's productions. In fact, the dates assigned to it by different authorities vary from Moshiim's 198 to that suggested by the very learned Alex, who assigns it to 217. 4. Once more, in the tract De Monogamia, c. 3, the author says that since the date of St. Paul's first epistle to the Corinthians about 160 years had elapsed. Here, again, did we only know with certainty the precise date of that epistle? we could ascertain about the date of the tract, but, a, the date of the epistle is itself variously given, Burton giving it as early as AD 52, Michaelis and Mill as late as 57, and, b, Tertullian only says, Armus Sursider C. Alex. Exin Productis, while the way in which, in the ad net, within the short space of three chapters, he states first in 150, and then, in c. 9 that 300, years had not elapsed since the rise of the Christian name, leads us to think that here again he only desires to speak in round numbers, meaning perhaps more than 150, but less than 170. These specimens must suffice, though it might be easy to add to them. There is, however, another classification of our author's writings which has been attempted, finding the haplessness of strict chronological accuracy. Commentators have seized on the idea that peradventure there might be found at all events some internal marks by which to determine which of them were written before, which after, the writer's secession to Montanism. It may be confessed that this attempt has been somewhat more successful than the other, yet even here there are two formidable obstacles standing in our way. The first and greatest is, that the natural temper of Tertullian was from the first so akin to the spirit of Montanism, that, unless there occur distinct allusions to the new prophecy, or expressions specially connected with Montanistic phraseology, the general tone of any treatise is not a very safe guide. The second is, that the subject matter of some of the treatises is not such as to afford much scope for the introduction of the peculiarities of a sect which professed to differ in discipline only, not doctrine, from the church at large. Still the result of this classification seems to show one important feature of agreement between commentators, however they may differ upon details, and that is, that considerably the larger part of our author's rather voluminous productions must have been subsequent to his lamented secession. I think the best way to give the reader means for forming his own judgment will be, as I have said, to lay before him in parallel columns a tabular view of the disposition of the books by Dr. Neander and Bishop K. These two modern writers, having given particular care to the subject, bringing to bear upon it all the advantages derived from wide reading, eminent abilities, and a diligent study of the works of preceding writers on the same questions, have a special right to be heard upon the matter in hand, and I think, if I may be allowed to say so, that, for calm judgment, and minute acquaintance with his author, I shall not be accused of undue partiality if I express my opinion that, as far as my own observation goes, the palm must be awarded to the bishop. In this view I am supported by the fact that the accomplished Professor Ramsey, as follows Dr. K's arrangement. I premise that Dr. Neander adopts a threefold division, into, 1, 
writings which were occasioned by the relation of the Christians to the heathen, and refer to their vindication of Christianity against the heathen, attacks on heathenism, the sufferings and conduct of Christians under persecution, and the intercourse of Christians with heathens, two, writings which relate to Christian and church life, and to ecclesiastical discipline three, the dogmatic and dogmatical controversial treatises, and under each head he subdivides into Neander K1, Premontanist, 11, Premontanist, probably, 2, Montanist 1721, 2, Montanist, certainly, 10 4, works respecting which nothing certain can be pronounced 33, the A, Premontanist writings, B, Postmontanist writings, thus leaving no room for what Kate calls works respecting which nothing certain can be pronounced, for the sake of clearness, this order has not been followed in the table, on the other side, it will be seen that Dr. K, while not assuming to speak with more than a reasonable probability, is careful so to arrange the treatises under each head as to show the order, so far as it is discoverable, in which the books under that head were published, that is, if one book is quoted in another book, the book so quoted, if distinctly referred to as already before the world, is plainly anterior to that in which it is quoted. Thus, then, have, a comparison of these two lists will show that the difference between the two great authorities is, as K remarks, not great, and with respect to some of the tracks on which we differ, the learned author expresses himself with great diffidence. The main difference, in fact, is that which affects two tracks upon kindred subjects the Despectaculus, and Idololatria, the Decultu Feminarum, a subject akin to the other two, and the adverb, Judeos, with reference to all these, except the last, to which I believe the Archdeacon does not once refer, the Bishop's opinion appears to have the support of Archdeacon Evans, whose learned and interesting essay, referred to in the note, appears in a volume published in 1837, Dr. K's Lectures, on which his book is founded, were delivered in 1825, of the date of his first edition I am not aware, Dr. Neander's Antignosticus also first appeared in 1825, the preface to his second edition bears date July 1, 1849, as to the adverb, Judios, I confess I agree with Neander in thinking that, at all events from the beginning of c. 9, it is spurious, if it be urged that Jerome expressly quotes it as Tertullian's, I reply, Jerome so quotes it, I believe, when he is expounding Daniel. Now all that the adverb, Judd, has to say about Daniel ends with the end of C. 8. It is therefore quite compatible with the fact thus stated to recognize the earlier half of the book as genuine, and to reject the rest, beginning, as it happens, just after the 8th chapter, as spurious. Perhaps Dr. Neander's Jewish birth and training peculiarly fit him to be heard on this question. Nor do I think Professor Ramsey, in the article above alluded to, has quite seen the force of Kay's own remarks on Neander. What he does say is equally creditable to his candor and his accuracy, namely, the instances alleged by Dr. Neander, in proof of this position, are undoubtedly very remarkable, but if the concluding chapters of the tract are spurious, no ground seems to be left for asserting that the genuine portion was posterior to the third book against Martian, and none, consequently, for asserting that it was written by a Montanist, with which remark I must draw these observations on the genuine extant works of Tertullian to a close. The next point to which a brief reference must be made is the lost ivories of Tertullian. Lists of these are given both by Oler and by K. viz. 1. A book on Aaron's robes mentioned by Jerome, Epist. 128, Ad Fabio Lamba Vest Sacerdoti, Tom. 2. p. 586, Op. Ed. Bent. 2. A Book on the Superstition of the Age. 3. A Book on the Submission of the Soul. 4. A Book on the Flesh and the Soul. Knows. 2, 3, and 4 are known only by their titles which are found in the index to Tertullian's works given in the Codex Agoberti, but the tracts themselves are not extant in the Miss, which appears to have once contained five, a book on paradise, named in the index, and referred to in Da Anima 55, adverb, Mark. 3. 12, and 6, a book on the hope of the faithful, also named in the index, and referred to adverb, Mark. 
3. 24, and by Jerome in his account of Papias, and on his 36, and by Genadius of Marseille, 7, 6 books on ecstasy, with a seventh in reply to Apollonius, see Jerome, c. 2, j. a. Fabricius on the words of the unknown author whom the Jesuit sermoned edited under the name Predestinatus, who gathers thence that Soter, Pope of the city, and Apollonius, Bishop of the Ephesians, wrote a book against the Montanists, it replied to whom Tertullian, a Carthaginian presbyter, wrote, J. Pamlius thinks these seven books were originally published at Greek, 8, a book in reply to the Apelsites, that is the followers of Apels, referred to in De Carne Christi, c. 8, 9, a book on the origin of the soul, in reply to Hermogenes, referred to Inda Anima, c. c. 1, 3, 22, 24, 10, a book on fate, referred to by Fulgentius Planchids, p. 562, Merck, also referred to as either written, or intended to be written, by Tertullian himself, De Anima, c. 20. Jerome states that there was extant, or had been extant, a book on fate under the name of Minucius Felix, written indeed by a perspicuous author, but not in the style of Minucius Felix. This, Pamlius judged, should perhaps be rather ascribed to Tertullian. 11. A book on the Trinity. Jerome says Novation wrote a large volume on the Trinity, as if making an epitome of a work of Tertullian's which most men not knowing regard it as Cyprian's. Novation's book stood in Tertullian's name in the MSS, of J. Gangnius, who was the first to edit it, in a Momsperi Miss, which Sig. Gilinius used, and in others. 12. A book addressed to a philosophic friend on the Straits of Matrimony. Both K. and Oler are in doubt whether Jerome's words, by which some have been led to conclude that Tertullian wrote some book or books on this and kindred subjects really imply as much, or whether they may not refer merely to those tracts and passages in his extant writings which touch upon such matters. K. hesitates to think that the book to a philosophic friend is the same as the Die Exhortatiotes Castitatis, because Jerome says Tertullian wrote on the subject of celibacy in his youth, but as K. takes what Jerome elsewhere says of Tertullian's leaving the church about the middle of his age to mean his spiritual age, the same sense might attach to his words here too and thus obviate the bishop's difficulty. There are some other works which have been attributed to Tertullian on circumcision, on animals clean and unclean, on the truth that God is a judge which Oler likewise rejects, believing that the expressions of Jerome refer only to passages in the Antimartian and other extant works. To Novation Jerome does ascribe a distinct work on circumcision, and this may, camp. 2. Just above have given rise to the view that Tertullian had written one also. There were, moreover, three treatises at least written by Tertullian in Greek. They are, 1, a book on public shows, c. de car, c. 6, 2, a book on baptism, c. de rapt, c. 15, 3, a book on the veiling of virgins, c. de v, v, c. 1, Olerods de j. Pamlius in his epistle dedicatory to Philip II, of Spain, makes mention of a Greek copy of Tertullian in the library of that king. This report, however, since nothing has ever been seen or heard of the said copy from that time, Oler judges to be erroneous. It remains briefly to notice the confessedly spurious works which the editions of Tertullian generally have appended to them. With these K does not deal. The fragment, adverbomnes overuses. Oler attributes to Victorinus Pet Avianensis, that is, Victorinus Bishop of Peta, on the Drave, in Austrian Styria. It was once thought he ought to be called Pictaviensis, that is of Poixers, but John Lonoy has shown this to be an error as Victorinus is said by Jerome to have understood Greek better than Latin, hence his works are excellent for the sense, but mean as to the style. Cave believes him to have been a Greek by birth. Cassiodorus states him to have been once a professor of rhetoric. Jerome's statement agrees with the style of the tract in question, and Jerome distinctly says Victorinus did write it versus omnes heresis. Alex leaves the question of its authorship quite uncertain. If Victorinus be the author, the book falls clearly within the anti nicene period, for Victorinus fell a martyr in the Diocletian persecution, probably about AD 303.
The next fragment of the execrable gods of the heathens is of quite uncertain authorship. Uller would attribute it to some declaimer not quite ignorant of Tertullian's writings, but certainly not to Tertullian himself. Lastly we come to the metrical fragment. Concerning these, it is perhaps impossible to assign them to their rightful owners. Uller has not troubled himself much about them, but he seems to regard the Jonah as worthy of more regard than the rest for he seems to have intended giving more labor to its editing at some future time. Whether he has ever done so, or given us his German version of Tertullian's own works, which, see Dale Seju Verit, he distinctly promises in his preface, I do not know. Perhaps the best thing to be done under the circumstances is to give the judgment of the learned Peter Elix. It may be premised that by the celebrated George Fabricius who published his great work, Poetarum Veterum Ecclesiasticarum Opera Christiana, etc., in 1564 the five books in reply to Martian, and the judgment of the Lord, are ascribed to Tertullian, the Genesis and Sodom to Cyprian. Pamlius likewise seems to have ascribed the five books, the Jonah, and the Sodom to Tertullian, and according to Lardner, Bishop Bull likewise attributed the five books to him. They have been generally ascribed to the Victorinus above mentioned. Tillemont, among others, thinks they may well enough be his Rigaltius is content to demonstrate that they are not Tertullians, but leaves the real authorship without attempting to decide it. Of the others the same eminent critic says, they seem to have been written at Carthage, at an age not far removed from Tertullians. Alex, after observing that Pamlius is inconsistent with himself in attributing the Genesis and Sodom at one time to Tertullian, at another to Cyprian, rejects both views equally, and assigns the Genesis with some confidence to Salvian, a presbyter of Marseille, whose floor with cave gives sir. 440, a contemporary of Genadius, and a copious author. To this it is, Alex thinks, that Genadius alludes in his catalogue of illustrious men. C. 77, the judgment of the Lord Alex ascribes to one V. Racundus, an African bishop, whose date he finds it difficult to decide exactly. He refers to two of the name, one Bishop of Tunis, whom Victor of Tunis in his chronicle mentions as having died in exile at Chalcedon AD 552, the other Bishop of Noba, who visited Carthage with many others AD 482, at the summons of King Huneric to answer there for their faith semicolon and would ascribe the poem to the former, thinking that he finds an allusion to it in the article upon that V. Recundus in the De Viris Illustribus of Isidore of Seville. Oler agrees with him. The five books Alex seems to hint may be attributed to some imitator of the Victorinus of Peton named above. Oler attributes them rather to one Victorinus, or Victor, of Marseille, a rhetorician, who died A.D. 450. He appears in G. Fabricius as Claudius Marius Victorinus, writer of a commentary on Genesis, and an epistle ad Salomon in Mabata, both in verse, and of some considerable length. Tertullian of Patience, translated by the Reverend S. Thelwall. Chapter 1. Of Patience Generally, and Tertullian's O.W. An unworthiness to treat of IT. I fully confess unto the Lord God that it has been rash enough, if not even impudent, in me to have dared compose a treatise on patience, for practicing which I am all unfit, being a man of no goodness, whereas it were becoming that such as have addressed themselves to the demonstration and commendation of some particular thing, should themselves first be conspicuous in the practice of that thing, and should regulate the constancy of their ca ownishing by the authority of their personal conduct, for fear their words blush at the deficiency of their deeds, and would that this blushing would bring a remedy. So that shame for not exhibiting that which we go to suggest to others should prove a tutorship into exhibiting it, except that the magnitude of some good things just as of some ills too is insupportable, so that only the grace of divine inspiration is effectual for attaining and practicing them. For what is most good rests most with God, nor does any other than he who possesses it dispense it, as he deems me to each. And so to discuss about that which it is not given one to enjoy, will be, as it were, a solace, after the manner of invalids, who since they are without health, know not how to be silent about its blessings. So I, most miserable, ever sick with the heats of impatience, must of necessity sigh after, and invoke, and persistently plead for, that health of patience which I possess not, while I recall to mind, and, 
in the contemplation of my own weakness, digest, the truth, that the good health of faith, and the soundness of the Lord's discipline, accrue not easily to any unless patience sit by his side. So is patience set over the things of God, that one can obey no precept, fulfill no work well pleasing to the Lord, if estranged from it. The good of it, even they who live outside it, honor with the name of highest virtue. Philosophers indeed, who are accounted animals of some considerable wisdom, assign it so high a place, that, while they are mutually at discord with the various fancies of their sex and rivalries of their sentiments, yet, having a community of regard for patience alone, to this one of their pursuits they have joined in granting peace, for it they conspire, for it they league, it, in their affectation of virtue, they unanimously pursue, concerning patience they exhibit all their ostentation of wisdom. Grand testimony this is to it in that it incites even the vain schools of the world unto praise and glory. Or is it rather an injury, in that a thing divine is bandied among worldly sciences? But let them look to that, who shall presently be ashamed of their wisdom, destroyed and disgraced together with the world, it lives in. Chapter 2, God Himself an Example of Patience To us no human affectation of canine equanimity, modeled by insensibility, furnishes the warrant for exercising patience but the divine arrangement of a living and celestial discipline, holding up before us God 708 himself in the very first place as an example of patience, who scatters equally over just and unjust the bloom of this light, who suffers the good offices of the seasons, the services of the elements, the tributes of entire nature, to accrue at once to worthy and unworthy, bearing with the most ungrateful nations, adoring as they do the toys of the arts and the works of their own hands persecuting his name together with his family, bearing with luxury, avarice, iniquity, malignity, waxing insolent daily, so that by his own patience he disparages himself, for the cause why many believe not in the Lord is that they are so long without knowing that he is wroth with the world. Chap 3, Jesus Christ in his incarnation and work a more imitable example thereof. And this species of the divine patience indeed being, as it were, at a distance may perhaps be esteemed as among things too high for us, but what is that which, in a certain way, has been grasped by hand among men openly on the earth? God suffers himself to be conceived in a mother's womb, and awaits the time for birth, and, when born, bears the delay of growing up, and, when grown up, is not eager to be recognized, but is furthermore contumelious to himself, and is baptized by his own servant and repels with words alone the assaults of the tempter, while from being Lord he becomes master, teaching man to escape death, having been trained to the exercise of the absolute forbearance of offended patience. He did not strive, he did not cry aloud, nor did any hear his voice in the streets. He did not break the bruised reed, the smoking flax he did not quench, for the prophet's nay, the attestation of God himself, placing his own spirit together with patience in its entirety, in his son had not falsely spoken. There was none desirous of cleaving to him whom he did not receive. No one's table or roof did he despise, indeed, himself ministered to the washing of the disciples' feet, not sinners, not publicans, did he repel, not with that city even which had refused to receive him was he wroth, when even the disciples had wished that the celestial fires should be forthwith hurled on so consumelious a town. He cared for the ungrateful, he yielded to his ensnarers. This were a small matter, if he had not had in his company even his own betrayer, and steadfastly abstained from pointing him out. Moreover, while he is being betrayed, while he is being led up as a sheep for a victim, for so he no more opens his mouth than a lamb under the power of the shearer, he to whom, had he willed it, legions of angels would at one word have presented themselves from the heavens approved not the avenging sword of even one disciple the patience of the Lord was wounded in, the wound of, Malchus. And so, too, he cursed for the time to come the works of the sword, and, by the restoration of health, made satisfaction to him whom himself had not hurt, through patience, the mother of mercy. I pass by in silence, the fact, that he is crucified, for this was the end for which he had come yet had the death which must be undergone need of contumelies likewise, nay, but, when about to depart, he wished to be sated with the pleasure of patience. He is spitted on, scourged, derided, clad foully, 
more foully crowned. Wondrous is the faith of equanimity. He who had set beforehand the concealing of himself in man's shape, imitated not of man's impatience. Hence, even more than from any other trait, ought ye, Pharisees, to have recognized the Lord. Patience of this kind none of men would achieve. Such and so mighty evidence is the very magnitude of which proves to be among the nations indeed a cause for rejection of the faith, but among us its reason and rearing proves manifestly enough, not by the sermons only, in enjoining, but likewise by the sufferings of the Lord in enduring, to them to whom it is given to believe, that is the effect and excellence of some inherent propriety. Patience is God's nature. Chapter 4 Duty of imitating our Master taught us by slaves, even by beasts. Obedient imitation is founded on patience. Therefore, if we see all servants of probity and right feeling shaping their conduct suitably to the disposition of their Lord, if, that is, the art of deserving favor is obedience, while the rule of obedience is a compliant subjection, how much more does it behove us to be found with a character in accordance with our Lord, comma servants as we are of the 709 living God, whose judgment on his servants turns not on a fetter or a cap of freedom, but on an eternity either of penalty or of salvation, for the shunning of which severity or the courting of which liberality there needs a diligence and obedience as great as are the combinations themselves which the severity utters or the promises which the liberality freely makes. And yet we exact obedience not from men only, who have the bond of their slavery under their chin, or in any other legal way are debtors to obedience. But even from cattle, even from brutes, understanding that they have been provided and delivered for our uses by the Lord, shall, then, creatures which God makes subject to us be better than we in the discipline of obedience? Finally, the creatures, which obey, acknowledge their masters. Do we hesitate to listen diligently to him to whom alone we are subjected that is, the Lord? But how unjust is it, how ungrateful likewise, not to repay from yourself the same which, through the indulgence of your neighbor, you obtain from others, to him through whom you obtain it. Nor needs there more words on the exhibition of obedience due from us to the Lord God, for the acknowledgement of God understands what is incumbent on it. Lest, however, we seem to have inserted remarks on obedience as something irrelevant. Let us remember, that obedience itself is drawn from patience. Never does an impatient man render it, or a patient fail to find pleasure in it. Who, then, could treat largely, enough, of the good of that patience which the Lord God, the demonstrator and acceptor of all good things, carried about in his own self? To whom, again, would it be doubtful that every good thing ought, because it pertains to God? to be earnestly pursued with the whole mind by such as pertain to God, by means of which, considerations, both commendation and exhortation on the subject of patience are briefly, and as it were in the compendium of a prescriptive rule, established. Chap. V. As God is the author of patience so the devil is of impatience. Nevertheless, the proceeding of a discussion on the necessaries of faith is not idle, because it is not unfruitful. In edification no loquacity is base if it be base at any time. And so, if the discourse be concerning some particular good, the subject requires us to review also the contrary of that good. For you will throw more light on what is to be pursued, if you first give a digest of what is to be avoided. Let us therefore consider, concerning impatience, whether just as patience in God, so its adversary quality have been born and detected in our adversary that from this consideration may appear how primarily adverse it is to faith. For that which has been conceived by God's rival, of course is not friendly to God's things. The discord of things is the same as the discord of their authors. Further, since God is best, the devil on the contrary worst, of beings, by their own very diversity they testify that neither works for the other, so that anything of good can no more seem to be effected for us by the evil one than anything of evil by the good. Therefore I detect the nativity of impatience in the devil himself, at that very time when he impatiently bore that the Lord God subjected the universal works which he had made to his own image, that is, to man. For if he had endured, that, he would not have grieved, nor would he have envied man if he had not grieved. Accordingly he deceived him, because he had envied him, but he had envied because he had grieved, he had grieved because, of course, he had not patiently borne. What that angel of perdition first was malicious or impatient I scorn to inquire, 
since manifest it is that either impatience took its rise together with malice, or else malice from impatience, that subsequently they conspired between themselves, and that they grew up indivisible in one paternal bosom, but, however, having been instructed, by his own experiment, what innate unto sinning was that which he had been the first to feel, and by means of which he 710 had entered on his course of delinquency, he called the same to his assistance for the thrusting of man into crime. The woman, immediately on being met by him I may say so without rashness was, through his very speech with her, breathed on by a spirit infected with impatience, so certain is it that she would never have sinned at all, if she had honored the divine edict by maintaining her patience to the end. What, of the fact, that she endured not to have been met alone, but in the presence of Adam, not yet her husband, not yet bound to lend her his ears, she is impatient of keeping silence, and makes him the transmitter of that which she had imbibed from the evil one. Therefore another human being, too, perishes through the impatience of the one, presently, too, perishes of himself, through his own impatience committed in each respect, both in regard of God's premonition and in regard of the devil's cheatery, not enduring to observe the former nor to refute the latter. Hence, whence, the origin, of delinquency, arose the first origin of judgment, hence, whence man was induced to offend, God began to be wroth, whence, came the first indignation in God, thence, came, his first patience, who, content at that time with malediction only, refrained in the devil's case from the instant infliction of punishment, else what crime, before this guilt of impatience, is imputed to man, innocent he was, and in intimate friendship with God, and the husbandman of paradise, but when once he succumbed to impatience, he quite ceased to be of sweet savor to God, he quite ceased to be able to endure things celestial. Thenceforward, a creature given to earth, and ejected from the sight of God, he begins to be easily turned by impatience unto every use offensive to God. For straightway that impatience conceived of the devil's seed, produced, in the fecundity of malice, anger as her son, and when brought forth, trained him in her own arts. For that very thing which had immersed Adam and Eve in death, taught their son, too to begin with murder. It would be idle for me to ascribe this to impatience, if Cain, that first homicide and first fratricide, had borne with equanimity and not impatiently the refusal by the Lord of his own oblations if he is not wroth with his own brother if, finally, he took away no one's life. Since, then, he could neither have killed unless he had been wroth, nor have been wroth unless he had been impatient. He demonstrates that what he did through wrath must be referred to that by which wrath was suggested during this cradle time of impatience, then, in a certain sense, in her infancy. But how great presently were her augmentations. And no wonder, if she has been the first delinquent, it is a consequence that, because she has been the first, therefore she is the only parent stem, too, to every delinquency pouring down from her own fount various veins of crimes. Of murder we have spoken, but, being from the very beginning the outcome of anger, whatever causes besides it shortly found for itself it lays collectively on the account of impatience, as to its own origin. For whether from private enmities, or for the sake of prey, anyone perpetrates that wickedness, the earlier step is his becoming impatient of either the hatred or the avarice. Whatever compels a man, it is not possible that without impatience of itself it can be perfected indeed. Whoever committed adultery without impatience of lust. Moreover, if in females the sale of their modesty is forced by the price, of course it is by impatience of contemning gain that this sale is regulated. These, I mention, as the principal delinquencies in the sight of the Lord, for, to speak compendiously, every sin is ascribable to impatience. Evil is impatience of good. None immodest is not impatient of modesty, dishonest of honesty, impious of piety, unquiet of quietness. In order that each individual may become evil he will be unable to persevere in being good. How, therefore, can such a hydra of delinquencies fail to offend the Lord, the disapprover of evils? Is it not manifest that it was through impatience that Israel himself also always failed in his duty toward God, from that time when, forgetful of the heavenly arm whereby he had been drawn out of his Egyptian affliction, he demands from Aaron gods as his guides, when he pours down for an idol the contributions of his gold, for the so necessary delays of Moses, while he met with God, 
he had borne with impatience, after the edible rain 711 of the manna, after the watery following of the rock, they despair of the Lord in not enduring a three days thirst, for this also is laid to their charge by the Lord as impatience, and not to rove through individual cases there was no instance in which it was not by failing in duty through impatience that they perished. How, moreover, did they lay hands on the prophets, except through impatience of hearing them? On the Lord moreover himself, through impatience likewise of seeing him? But had they entered the path of patience? they would have been set free. Chapter, Vi. Patience both antecedent and subsequent to faith. Accordingly it is patience which is both subsequent and antecedent to faith. In short, Abraham believed God, and was accredited by him with righteousness, but it was patience which proved his faith, when he was bitten to emulate his son, with a view to, I would not say the temptation, but, the typical attestation of his faith. But God knew whom he had accredited with righteousness. So heavy a precept, the perfect execution whereof was not even pleasing to the Lord, he patiently both heard, and, if God had willed, would have fulfilled. Deservedly then was he blessed, because he was faithful, deservedly faithful, because patient. So faith, illumined by patience, when it was becoming propagated among the nations through Abraham's seed, which is Christ, and was superinducing grace over the law, made patience her preeminent coadjutrix for amplifying and fulfilling the law, because that alone had been lacking unto the doctrine of righteousness. For men were of old wont to require eye for eye, and tooth for tooth and to repay with usury evil with evil, for, as yet, patience was not on earth, because faith was not either. Of course, meantime, impatience used to enjoy the opportunities which the law gave. That was easy while the Lord and Master of Patience was absent. But after he has supervened, and has united the grace of faith with patience, now it is no longer lawful to assail even with word, nor to say fool even, without danger of the judgment. Anger has been prohibited, our spirits retained, the petulance of the hand checked, the poison of the tongue extracted. The law has found more than it has lost, while Christ says, Love your personal enemies, and bless your cursors and pray for your persecutors, that ye may be sons of your heavenly Father. Do you see whom patience gains for us as a father? In this principal precept the universal discipline of patience is succinctly comprised, since evil doing is not conceded even when it is deserved. Chap 7, The Causes of Impatience, and Their Correspondent Precepts. Now, however, while we run through the causes of impatience, all the other precepts also will answer in their own places. If our spirit is aroused by the loss of property, it is caught onished by the Lord's scriptures, in almost every place, to a contemning of the world, nor is there any more powerful exhortation to contempt of money submitted, to us, than, the fact, the Lord himself is found amid no riches. He always justifies the poor, for condemns the rich. So he foreministered to patience loss, and to opulence contempt as portion, demonstrating, by means of, his own, repudiation of riches, that hurts done to them also are not to be much regarded. Of that, therefore, which we have not the smallest need to seek after, because the Lord did not seek after it either, we ought to endure without heart sickness the cutting down or taking away. Covetousness, the Spirit of the Lord has through the Apostle pronounced the root of all evils. Let us not interpret that covetousness as consisting merely in the concupiscence of what is another's, for even what seems ours is another's, for nothing is ours, since all things are God's, whose are we also ourselves. And so, if, when suffering from the loss, we feel impatiently, grieving for what is lost from what is not our own, we shall be detected as bordering on covetousness. We seek what is another's when we will brook losing what is another's. He who is greatly stirred with impatience of a loss, does, by giving things earthly the precedence over things heavenly, sin directly against God, for the Spirit, which he has received from the Lord, he 712 greatly shocks for the sake of a worldly matter. Willingly, therefore, let us lose things earthly, let us keep things heavenly. Perish the whole world so I may make patience my gain. In truth, I know not whether he who has not made up his mind to endure with constancy the loss of somewhat of his, either by theft, or else by force, or else even by carelessness, would himself readily or heartily lay hand on his own property in the cause of almsgiving, for who that endures not at all to be cut by another, 
himself draws the sword on his own body, patience and losses is an exercise in bestowing and communicating, who fears not to lose, finds it not irksome to give, else how will one, when he has two coats, give the one of them to the naked, unless he be a man likewise to offer to one who takes away his coat his cloak as well, how shall we fashion to us friends from mammon? If we love it so much as not to put up with its loss, we shall perish together with the lost mammon. Why do we find here, where it is our business to lose? To exhibit impatience at all losses is the Gentiles' business, who give money the precedence perhaps over their soul, for so they do, when, in their cupidities of lucre, they encounter the gainful perils of commerce on the sea, when, for money's sake, even in the forum, there is nothing which damnation, itself would fear which they hesitate to essay, when they hire themselves for sport and the camp, when, after the manner of wild beasts, they play the bandit along the highway. But us, according to the diversity by which we are distinguished from them, it becomes to lay down not our soul for money, but money for our soul, whether spontaneously in bestowing or patiently in losing. Chapter 8 Of Patience Under Personal Violence and Malediction We who carry about our very soul our very body, exposed in this world to injury from all, and exhibit patience under that injury, shall we be hurt at the loss of less important things? Far from a servant of Christ be such a defilement as that the patience which has been prepared for greater temptations should forsake him in frivolous ones. If one attempt to provoke you by manual violence, the monition of the Lord is at hand, to him, he saith, who smiteth thee on the face. Turn the other cheek likewise, let outrageousness be wearied out by your patience. Whatever that blow may be, conjoined with pain and contumely, it shall receive a heavier one from the Lord. You wound that outrageous one more by enduring, for he will be beaten by him for whose sake you endure. If the tongue's bitterness break out in malediction or reproach, look back at the saying, when they curse you, rejoice. The Lord himself was cursed in the eye of the law and yet is he the only blessed one. Let us servants, therefore, follow our Lord closely, and be cursed patiently, that we may be able to be blessed. If I hear with too little equanimity some wanton or wicked word uttered against me, I must of necessity either myself retaliate the bitterness, or else I shall be racked with mute impatience. When, then, on being cursed, I smite, with my tongue, how shall I be found to have followed the doctrine of the Lord? in which it has been delivered that a man is defiled, not by the defilements of vessels, but of the things which are sent forth out of his mouth. Again, it is said that impeachment awaits us for every vain and needless word. It follows that, from whatever the Lord keeps us, the same he admonishes us to bear patiently from another. I will add, somewhat, touching the pleasure of patience. For every injury, whether inflicted by tongue or hand, when it has lighted upon patience, will be dismissed with the same fate as, some weapon launched against and blunted on a rock of most steadfast hardness, for it will wholly fall then and there with bootless and fruitless labor, and sometimes will recoil and spend its rage on him who sent it out, with retorted impetus. No doubt the reason why anyone hurts you is that you may be pained, because the hurter's enjoyment consists in the pain of the hurt. When, then, you have upset his enjoyment by not being pained, he must needs be pained by the loss of his enjoyment. Then you not only go 713 and hurt away, which even alone is enough for you, but gratified, into the bargain, by your adversary's disappointment, and revenged by his pain. This is the utility and the pleasure of patience. Chapter 9 Of Patience Under Bereavement Not even that species of impatience under the loss of our dear ones is excused, where some assertion of a right to grief facts the patron to it. For the consideration of the Apostle's declaration must be set before us, who says, Be not overwhelmed with sadness at the falling asleep of any one, just as the nations are who are without hope, and justly, or, believing the resurrection of Christ we believe also in our own, for whose sake he both died and rose again. Since, then, there is certainty as to the resurrection of the dead, grief for death is needless, and impatience of grief is needless. For why should you grieve, if you believe that, your loved one, is not perished? Why should you bear impatiently the temporary withdrawal of him who you believe will return? That which you think to be death is departure. He who goes before us is not to be lamented, 
though by all means to be longed for, that longing also must be tempered with patience. For why should you bear without moderation the fact that one is gone away whom you will presently follow? Besides, impatience in matters of this kind bodes ill for our hope and is a dealing in sincerely with the faith. And we wound Christ when we accept not with equanimity the summoning out of this world of any by him, as if they were to be pitied. I desire, says the Apostle, to be now received, and to be with Christ. How far better a desire does he exhibit? If, then, we grieve impatiently over such as have attained the desire of Christians, we show unwillingness ourselves to attain it. Chapter 10. Of Revenge There is, too. Another chief spur of impatience, the lust of revenge, dealing with a business either of glory or else of malice. But glory, on the one hand, is everywhere vain, and malice, on the other, is always odious to the Lord, in this case indeed most of all, when, being provoked by a neighbor's malice, it constitutes itself superior in following out revenge, and by paying wickedness doubles that which has once been done. Revenge, in the estimation of error seems a solace of pain, in the estimation of truth, on the contrary, it is convicted of malignity. For what difference is there between provoker and provoked, except that the former is detected as prior in evil doing, but the latter as posterior? Yet each stands impeached of hurting a man in the eye of the Lord, who both prohibits and condemns every wickedness. In evil doing there is no account taken of order nor does place separate what similarity conjoins. And the precept is absolute, that evil is not to be repaid with evil, like deed involves like merit. How shall we observe that principle, if in our loathing we shall not loathe revenge? What honor, moreover, shall we be offering to the Lord God, if we arrogate to ourselves the arbitrament of vengeance? We are corrupt or thin vessels, with our own servant boys, if they assume to themselves the right of vengeance on their fellow servants, we are gravely offended, while such as make us the offering of their patience we not only approve as mindful of humility, of servitude, affectionately jealous of the right of their Lord's honor, but we make them an ampler satisfaction than they would have pre-exacted for themselves. Is there any risk of a different result in the case of the Lord so just in estimating, so potent in executing? Why, then, do we believe him a judge? if not an avenger too. This he promises that he will be to us in return, saying, Vengeance belongeth to me, and I will avenge, that is, leave patience to me, and I will reward patience. For when he says, Judge not, lest ye be judged, does he not require patience? For he will refrain from judging another, but he who shall be patient in not revenging himself, who judges in order to pardon, and if he shall pardon, Still he has taken care to indulge the impatience of a judger, and has taken away the honor of the one judge, that is, God. How many mischances had impatience of this kind been wont to run into? How oft has it repented of its revenge? How oft has its vehemence been found worse than the causes which led to it? Exclamation mark Inasmuch as nothing undertaken with impatience can be effected without impetuosity, nothing done with impetuosity fails either to stumble, or else to fall altogether. 714 nor else to vanish headlong. Moreover, if you avenge yourself too slightly, you will be mad, if too amply, you will have to bear the burden. What have I to do with vengeance, the measure of which, through impatience of pain, I am unable to regulate? Whereas, if I shall repose on patience, I shall not feel pain, if I shall not feel pain, I shall not desire to avenge myself. Chapter 11 Further reasons for practicing patience. ITS connection with the Beatitudes. After these principal material causes of impatience, registered to the best of our ability, why should we wander out of our way among the rest? Comma, what are found at home? What abroad? Wide and effusive is the evil one's operation, hurling manifold irritations of our spirit, and sometimes trifling ones, sometimes very great. But the trifling ones you may contempt from their very littleness to the very great ones you may yield in regard of their overpoweringness, where the injury is less, there is no necessity for impatience, but where the injury is greater, there more necessary is the remedy for the injury patience. Let us strive, therefore, to endure the inflictions of the evil one, that the counter zeal of our equanimity may mock the zeal of the foe. If, however, we ourselves, either by imprudence or else voluntarily, draw upon ourselves anything, let us meet with equal patience what we have to blame ourselves for. Moreover, 
If we believe that some inflictions are sent on us by the Lord, to whom should we more exhibit patience than to the Lord? Nay, He teaches us to give thanks and rejoice, over and above, at being thought worthy of divine chastisement. Whom I love, saith He, I chasten, O blessed servant, on whose amendment the Lord is intent, with whom He deigns to be wroth, whom He does not deceive by dissembling His reproofs. On every side, therefore, we are bound to the duty of exercising patience, from whatever quarter, either by our own errors or else by the snares of the evil one, we incur the Lord's reproofs. Of that duty great is the reward namely, happiness. For whom but the patient has the Lord called happy, in saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of the heavens. No one, assuredly, is poor in spirit, except he be humble. Well, who is humble? except he be patient. For no one can abase himself without patience, in the first instance, to bear the act of abasement. Blessed, saith he, are the weepers and mourners, who, without patience, is tolerant of such unhappinesses. And so to such, consolation and laughter are promised. Blessed are the gentle, under this term, surely, the impatient cannot possibly be classed. Again, when he marks the peacemakers with the same title of felicity, and names them sons of God, pray have the impatient any affinity with peace. Even a fool may perceive that. When, however, he says, rejoice and exult, as often as they shall curse and persecute you, for very great is your reward in heaven. Of course it is not to the patience of exaltation that he makes that promise, because no one will exult in adversities unless he have first learned to contend them. No one will contend them unless he have learned to practice patience. Chapter 12 certain other divine precepts, the apostolic description of charity, their connection with patience, as regards the rule of peace, which is so pleasing to God, who in the world that is prone to impatience will even once forgive his brother, I will not say seven times, or seven times seven times, who that is contemplating a suit against his adversary will compose the matter by agreement, unless he first begin by lopping off chagrin, hard-heartedness, and bitterness which are in fact the poisonous outgrowths of impatience. How will you remit, and remission shall be granted you? If the absence of patience makes you tenacious of a wrong, no one who is at variance with his brother in his mind, will finish offering his duteous gift at the altar, unless he first, with intent to reconciliate his brother, return to patience. If the sun go down over our wrath, we are in jeopardy, we are not allowed to remain one day without patience. But. However, since patience takes the lead in every species of salutary discipline, what 715 wonder that she likewise ministers to repentance, accustomed as repentance is to come to the rescue of such as have fallen, when, on a disjunction of wedlock, for that cause, I mean, which makes it lawful, whether for husband or wife, to persist in the perpetual observance of widowhood, she waits for, she yearns for. She persuades by her entreaties, repentance and all who are one day to enter salvation. How great a blessing she confers on each. The one she prevents from becoming an adulterer, the other she amends. So, too, she is found in those holy examples touching patience in the Lord's parables. The shepherd's patience seeks and finds the straying you, for impatience would easily despise one you, but patience undertakes the labor of the quest and the patient burden-bearer carries home on his shoulders the forsaken sinner. That prodigal son also the father's patience receives, and clothes, and feeds, and makes excuses for, in the presence of the angry brother's impatience. He, therefore, who had perished is saved, because he entered on the way of repentance. Repentance perishes not, because it finds patience to welcome it. For by whose teachings but those of patience is charity the highest sacrament of the faith the treasure house of the Christian name, which the Apostle commends with the whole strength of the Holy Spirit trained. Charity, he says, is long-suffering, thus she applies patience, is beneficent, patience does no evil, is not emulous, that certainly is a peculiar mark of patience, savors not of violence, she has drawn her self-restraint from patience, is not puffed up, is not violent, for that pertains not unto patience, nor does she seek her own if, she offers her own, provided she may benefit her neighbors, nor is irritable, if she were, what would she have left to impatience? Accordingly he says, charity endures all things, 
tolerates all things, of course because she is patient, justly, then, will she never fail, for all other things will be cancelled, will have their consummation. Tongues, sciences, prophecies, become exhausted, faith, hope, charity, are permanent, faith, which Christ's patience introduced, hope, which man's patience waits for, charity, which patience accompanies, with God as master. Chapter, 13, of bodily patience. Thus far, finally, of patience simple and uniform, and as it exists merely in the mind, though in many forms likewise I labor after it in body, for the purpose of winning the Lord, inasmuch as it is equality which has been exhibited by the Lord himself in bodily virtue as well. If it is true that the ruling mind easily communicates the gifts of the Spirit with its bodily habitation, what, therefore, is the business of patience in the body? In the first place, it is the affliction of the flesh a victim able to appease the Lord by means of the sacrifice of humiliation in making the libation to the Lord of sordid raiment, together with scantiness of food, content with simple diet and the pure drink of water and conjoining fasts to all this in inuring herself to sackcloth and ashes. This bodily patience adds a grace to our prayers for good, a strength to our prayers against evil, this opens the ears of Christ our God, dissipates severity, elicits clemency. Thus that Babylonish king, after being exiled from human form in his seven years squalor and neglect, because he had offended the Lord, by the bodily immolation of patience not only recovered his kingdom, but what is more to be desired by a man-made satisfaction to God. Further, if we set down in order the higher and happier grades of bodily patience, we find that it is she who is entrusted by holiness with the care of continence of the flesh, she keeps the widow, and sets on the virgin the seal and raises the self-made eunuch to the realms of heaven. That which springs from a virtue of the mind is perfected in the flesh, and, finally, by the patience of the flesh does battle under persecution. If flight press hard, the flesh wars with the inconvenience of flight, if imprisonment over 716 take us, the flesh, still was, in bonds, the flesh in the chive, the flesh in solitude, and in that want of light, and in that patience of the world's misusage. When, however, it is led forth unto the final proof of happiness, unto the occasion of the second baptism, unto the act of ascending the divine seat. No patience is more needed there than badly patience. If the spirit is willing, but the flesh, without patience, weak, where, save in patience, is the safety of the spirit, and of the flesh itself. But when the Lord says this about the flesh, pronouncing it weak, he shows what need there is of strengthening, it that is by patience to meet every preparation for subverting or punishing faith, that it may bear with all constancy stripes, fire, cross, beasts sword, all which prophets and apostles, by enduring, conquered. Chapter, 14, The Power of This Twofold Patience, The Spiritual and the Bodily, Exemplified in the Saints of O.L.D., With this strength of patience, Esaias is cut asunder, and ceases not to speak concerning the Lord, Stephen is stoned, and prays for pardon to his foes. Oh, happy also he who met all the violence of the devil by the exertion of every species of patience exclamation mark whom neither the driving away of his cattle nor those riches of his and sheep, nor the sweeping away of his children in one swoop of ruin, nor, finally, the agony of his own body in, one universal, wound, estranged from the patience and the faith which he had plighted to the Lord whom the devil smote with all his might in vain, for by all his pains he was not drawn away from his reverence for God, but he has been set up as an example and testimony to us, for the thorough accomplishment of patience as well in spirit as in flesh, as well in mind as in body, in order that we succumb neither to damages of our worldly goods, nor to losses of those who are dearest nor even to bodily afflictions. What a beer for the devil did God erect in the person of that hero. What a banner did he rear over the enemy of his glory, when, at every bitter message, that man uttered nothing out of his mouth but thanks to God, while he denounced his wife, now quite wearied with ills, and urging him to resort to crooked remedies. How did God smile, how was the evil one cut asunder? while Job with mighty equanimity kept scraping off the unclean overflow of his own ulcer, while he sportively replaced the vermin that break at thence, in the same caves and feeding places of his pitted flesh. And so, 
When all the darts of temptations had blunted themselves against the corselet and shield of his patience, that instrument of God's victory not only presently recovered from God the soundness of his body, but possessed in redoubled measure what he had lost. And if he had wished to have his children also restored, he might again have been called father, but he preferred to have them restored him in that day. Such joy as that secure so entirely concerning the Lord he deferred, meantime he endured a voluntary bereavement, that he might not live without some, exercise of, patience. Chapter, 15 General Summary of the Virtues and Effects of Patience So amply sufficient a depositary of patience is God. If it be a wrong which you deposit in his care, he is an avenger, if a loss, he is a restorer, if pain, he is a healer, if death, he is a reviver. What honor is granted to patience, to have God as her debtor? And not without reason, for she keeps all his decrees, she has to do with all his mandates. She fortifies faith, is the pilot of peace assists charity, establishes humility, waits long for repentance, sets dear seal on confession, rules the flesh, preserves the spirit, bridles the tongue, restrains the hand, tramples temptations underfoot, drives away scandals, gives their crowning grace to martyrdoms, consoles the poor, teaches the rich moderation, overstrains not the weak, exhausts not the strong, is the delight of the believer, invites the Gentile commands the servant to his Lord, and his Lord to God, adorns the woman, makes the man approved, is loved in childhood, praised in youth, looked up to in age, is beauteous in either sex, in every time of life. Come, now, see whether we have a general idea of her mean and habit. Her countenance is tranquil and peaceful, her brow serene contracted by no wrinkle of sadness or of anger. Her eyebrows evenly relaxed 717 and gladsome wise, with eyes downcast in humility, not in unhappiness, her mouth sealed with the honorable mark of silence, her hue such as theirs who are without care and without guilt, the motion of her head frequent against the devil, and her laugh threatening, her clothing, moreover, about her bosom white and well fitted to her person, as being neither inflated nor disturbed. For patience sits on the throne of that calmest and gentlest spirit, who is not found in the roll of the whirlwind, nor in the leaden hue of the cloud but is of soft serenity, open and simple, whom Elias saw at his third essay. For where God is, there too is his foster child, namely patience. When God's spirit descends, then patience accompanies him indivisibly. If we do not give admission to her together with the spirit, will always tarry with us? Nay, I know not whether he would remain any longer. Without his companion and handmaid, he must of necessity be straightened in every place and at every time. Whatever blow his enemy may inflict he will be unable to endure alone, being without the instrumental means of enduring. Chapter 16 The patience of the heathen very different from Christian patience. There's doomed to perdition. Ours destined to salvation. This is the rule, this the discipline. These the works of patience which is heavenly and true, that is, of Christian patience, not false and disgraceful, like as is that patience of the nations of the earth. For in order that in this also the devil might rival the Lord, he has as it were quite on a par, except that the very diversity of evil and good is exactly on a par with their magnitude, taught his disciples also a patience of his own, that, I mean, which, making husbands venal for dowry, and teaching them to trade in panderings, makes them subject to the power of their wives, which, with feigned affection, undergoes every toil of forced complacence, with a view to ensnaring the childless, which makes the slaves of the belly submit to contumelious patronage, in the subjection of their liberty to their gullet. Such pursuits of patience the Gentiles are acquainted with, and they eagerly seize a name of so great goodness to apply it to foul practices. Patient they live of rivals, and of the rich, and of such as give them invitations, impatient of God alone. But let their own and their leader's patience look to itself a patience which the subterraneous fire awaits. Let us, on the other hand, love the patience of God, the patience of Christ, let us repay to him the patience which he has paid down for us. Let us offer to him the patience of the Spirit, the patience of the flesh believing as we do in the resurrection of flesh and spirit. Tertullian on Baptism Translated by the Rev. S. Thelwall Chapter 1 The Introduction Origin of the Treatise 
Epi is our sacrament of water, in that, by washing away the sins of our early blindness, we are set free and admitted into eternal life. A treatise on this matter will not be superfluous, instructing not only such as are just becoming formed, in the faith, but them who, content with having simply believed, without full examination of the grounds of the traditions, carry, in mind, through, ignorance, an untried though probable faith. The consequence is, that a wiper of the Canaanite heresy, lately conversant in this quarter, has carried away a great number with her most venomous doctrine, making it her first aim to destroy baptism, which is quite in accordance with nature. The vipers and asps and basilisks themselves generally do affect arid and waterless places. But we, little fishes, after the example of our ixk, S204 greater than S Jesus Christ, are born in water, nor have we safety in any other way than by permanently abiding in water, so that most monstrous creature, who had no right to teach even sound doctrine, knew full well how to kill the little fishes, by taking them away from the water. Chapter 2 The Very Simplicity of God's Means of Working a stumbling block to the carnal mind. Well, but how great is the force of perversity for so shaking the faith or entirely preventing its reception, that it impugns it on the very principles of which the faith consists. There is absolutely nothing which makes men's minds more obdurate than the simplicity of the divine works which are visible in the act, when compared with the grandeur which is promised thereto in the effect, so that from the very fact, that with so great simplicity, without bump, without any considerable novelty of preparation, finally, without expense, a man is dipped in water, and amid the utterance of some few words, is sprinkled, and then rises again, not much, or not at all. The cleaner, the consequent attainment of eternity s is esteemed the more incredible. I am a deceiver if, on the contrary, it is not from their circumstance, and preparation, and expense, that idols solemnities or mysteries get their credit and authority built up. Oh, miserable incredulity, which quite denies to God his own properties, simplicity and power. What then, is it not wonderful, too, that death should be washed away by bathing? But it is the more to be believed if the wonderfulness be the reason why it is not believed. For what does it behove divine works to be in their quality, except that they be above all wonder? We also ourselves wonder but it is because we believe. Incredulity, on the other hand, wonders, but does not believe, for the symbol acts it wonders at, as if they were vain, the grand results, as if they were impossible, and grant that it be just, as you think. Sufficient to meet each point is the divine declaration which has forerun, the foolish things of the world hath God elected to confound its wisdom, and, the things very difficult with men are easy with God, for if God is wise and powerful, which even they who pass him by do not deny, it is with good reason that he lays the material causes of his own operation in the 670 contraries of wisdom and of power, that is, in foolishness and impossibility, since every virtue receives its cause from those things by which it is called forth. Chapter 3 Water chosen as a vehicle of divine operation and wherefore, ITS prominence first of all in creation, mindful of this declaration as of a conclusive prescript, we nevertheless proceed to treat the question, how foolish and impossible it is to be formed anew by water. In what respect, pray, has this material substance merited an office of so high dignity? The authority, I suppose, of the liquid element has to be examined. This however, is found in abundance, and that from the very beginning, the water is one of those things which, before all the furnishing of the world, were quiescent with God in a yet unshapen state. In the first beginning, says Scripture, God made the heaven and the earth, but the earth was invisible, and unorganized, and darkness was over the abyss, and the Spirit of the Lord was hovering over the waters. The first thing, O man, which you have to venerate, is the age of the waters and that their substance is ancient, the second, their dignity, in that they were the seed of the divine spirit, more pleasing to him, no doubt, than all the other than existing elements, for the darkness was total thus far, shapeless, without the ornament of stars, and the abyss gloomy, and the earth unfurnished, and the heaven unwrought, water alone always a perfect, gladsome, simple material substance, pure in itself supplied a worthy vehicle to God. 
What of the fact that waters were in some way the regulating powers by which the disposition of the world thenceforward was constituted by God? Or the suspension of the celestial firmament in the midst he caused by dividing the waters? The suspension of the dry land he accomplished by separating the waters, after the world had been hereupon set in order through its elements, when inhabitants were given it. The waters were the first to receive the precept to bring forth living creatures. Water was the first to produce that which had life, that it might be no wonder in baptism if waters know how to give life. For was not the work of fashioning man himself also achieved with the aid of waters? Suitable material is found in the earth, yet not apartment for the purpose unless it be moist and juicy, which, earth, the waters, separated the fourth day before into their own place temper with their remaining moisture to a clay consistency. If, from that time onward, I go forward in recounting universally, or at more length, the evidences of the authority of this element which I can adduce to show how great is its power or its grace, how many ingenious devices, how many functions, how useful an instrumentality, it affords the world, I fear I may seem to have collected rather the praises of water than the reasons of baptism, Although I should thereby teach all the more fully, that it is not to be doubted that God has made the material substance which he has disposed throughout all his products and works, obey him also in his own peculiar sacraments, that the material substance which governs terrestrial life acts as agent likewise in the celestial, chapter, 4, the primeval hovering of the Spirit of God over the waters typical of baptism. The universal element of water thus made a channel of sanctification, resemblance between the outward sign and the inward grace. But it will suffice to have this called at the outset those points in which with all is recognized that primary principle of baptism, comma, which was even then foreknoted by the very attitude assumed for a type of baptism, comma, that the Spirit of God, who hovered over the waters from the beginning, would continue to linger over the waters of the baptized, but a holy thing, of course, hovered over a holy, or else, from that which hovered over that which was hovered over bore the holiness, since it is necessary that in every case an underlying material substance should catch the quality of that which overhangs it, most of all a corporeal of a spiritual, adapted, as the spiritual is, to the subtleness of its substance both for penetrating and insinuating. Thus the nature of the waters, sanctified by the Holy One, itself conceived with all the power of sanctifying. Let no one say, why then, are we, pray, baptized with the very waters which then existed in the first beginning, not with those waters, of course, except in so far as the genus indeed is one, but the species very many, but what is an attribute to the genus reappears likewise in the species, and accordingly it makes no 671 difference whether a man be washed in a sea or a pool, a stream or a fount, a lac or a trough, nor is there any distinction between those whom John baptized in the Jordan and those whom Peter baptized in the Tiber, unless with all the eunuch whom Philip baptized in the midst of his journeys with chance water, derived therefrom more or less of salvation than others. All waters, therefore, in virtue of the pristine privilege of their origin, do, after invocation of God, attain the sacramental power of sanctification, or the Spirit immediately supervenes from the heavens, and rests over the waters, sanctifying them from himself, and being thus sanctified, they imbibe at the same time the power of sanctifying albeit the similitude may be admitted to be suitable to the simple act, that, since we are defiled by sins, as it were by dirt, we should be washed from those stains in waters. But as sins do not show themselves in our flesh, inasmuch as no one carries on his skin the spot of idolatry, or fornication, or fraud, so persons of that kind are foul in the spirit, which is the author of the sin, or the spirit is Lord, the flesh servant. Yet they each mutually share the guilt, the spirit, on the ground of command, the flesh, of subservience. Therefore, after the waters have been in a manner endued with medicinal virtue through the intervention of the angel, the spirit is corporeally washed in the waters, and the flesh is in the same spiritually cleansed. Chapter 5. Use made of water by the heathen, type of the angel at the pool of Bethsaida. Well, but the nations who are strangers to all understanding of spiritual powers, ascribe to their idols the imbuing of waters with the self-same efficacy. So they do, but they cheat themselves with waters which are widowed, 
or washing is the channel through which they are initiated into some sacred rites of some notorious Isis or Mithras. The gods themselves likewise they honor by washings. Moreover, by carrying water around, and sprinkling it, they everywhere expiate country seats, houses, temples, and whole cities, at all events, at the Apollinarian and Eleusinian games they are baptized, and they presume that the effect of their doing that is their regeneration and the remission of the penalties due to their perjuries. Among the ancients, again, whoever had defiled himself with murder, was wont to go in quest of purifying waters. Therefore, if the mere nature of water, in that it is the appropriate material for washing away, leads men to flatter themselves with the belief in omens of purification, how much more truly will waters render that service through the authority of God, by whom all their nature has been constituted. If men think that water is endowed with a medicinal virtue by religion, what religion is more effectual than that of the living God? Which fact being acknowledged, we recognize here also the zeal of the devil rivaling the things of God, while we find him, too, practicing baptism in his subjects. What similarity is there? The unclean cleanses. The ruiner sets free. The damned absolves, he will, forsooth, destroy his own work, by washing away the sins which himself inspires. These, remarks, have been set down by way of testimony against such as reject the faith, if they put no trust in the things of God, the spurious imitations of which, in the case of God's rival, they do trust in. Are there not other cases too, in which, without any sacrament, unclean spirits brood on waters? in spurious imitation of that brooding of the divine spirit in the very beginning, witness all shady founts, and all unfrequented brooks, and the ponds in the baths, and the conduits and private houses, or the cisterns and wells which are said to have the property of spiriting away, through the power, that is, of a hurtful spirit, men whom waters have drowned or affected with madness or with fear, they call nymph caught, or lymphatic, or hydrophobic. Why have we adduced these instances, lest any think it too hard for belief that a holy angel of God should grant his presence to waters, to temper them to man's salvation, while the evil angel holds frequent profane commerce with the self-same element to man's ruin, if it seems a novelty for an angel to be present in waters, an example of what was to come to pass has forerun, an angel, by his intervention was wont to stir the pool at Bethsaida. They who were complaining of ill health used to watch for him. For whoever had been the first to descend into them, after his washing, ceased to complain. This figure of corporeal healing sang of a 672 spiritual healing, according to the rule by which things carnal are always antecedent as figurative of things spiritual. And thus, when the grace of God advanced to higher degrees among men, an accession of efficacy was granted to the waters and to the angel. They who were wont to remedy bodily defects, now heal the spirit. They who used to work temporal salvation, now renew eternal. They who did set free but once in the year, now save peoples in the body daily. Death being done away through ablution of sins, the guilt being removed. Of course the penalty is removed too. Thus man will be restored for God to his likeness who in days bygone had been conformed to the image of God, the image is counted, to be, in his form, the likeness in his eternity, for he receives again that spirit of God which he had then first received from his afflatus, but had afterward lost through sin. Chapter Vida the angel the forerunner of the Holy Spirit, meaning contained in the baptismal formula, not that in the waters we obtain the Holy Spirit, but in the water, under, the witness of, the angel. We are cleansed, and prepared for the Holy Spirit. In this case also a type has proceeded. For thus was John beforehand the Lord's forerunner, preparing his ways. Thus, too, does the angel, the witness of baptism, make the path straight for the Holy Spirit, who is about to come upon us, by the washing away of sins, in which faith, sealed in, the name of, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, obtains. For if in the mouth of three witnesses every word shall stand, while, through the benediction, we have the same, three, as witnesses of our faith whom we have as sureties of our salvation to how much more does the number of the divine names suffice for the assurance of our hope likewise. Moreover, after the pledging both of the attestation of faith and the promise of salvation under three witnesses, there is added, of necessity, mention of the church, inasmuch as, 
wherever there are three, that is, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, there is the Church, which is a body of three. Chapter 7 of the Unction After this, when we have issued from the font, we are thoroughly anointed with the blessed unction, comma, a practice derived from the old discipline, wherein on entering the priesthood, then were wont to be anointed with oil from a horn, ever since Aaron was anointed by Moses, when Aaron is called Christ, from the chrism, which is the unction, which, when made spiritual, furnished an appropriate name to the Lord, because he was anointed with the Spirit by God the Father, as written in the Acts. For truly they were gathered together in this city against thy holy Son whom thou hast anointed. Thus, too, in our case, the unction runs cornally, that is on the body, but profits spiritually, in the same way as the act of baptism itself too is carnal, in that we are plunged in water, but the effect spiritual, in that we are freed from sins. Chapter 8 Of the Imposition of Hands Types of the deluge and the dove. In the next place, the hand is laid on us, invoking and inviting the Holy Spirit through benediction. Shall it be granted possible for human ingenuity to summon a spirit into water, and, by the application of hands from above, to animate their union into one body with another spirit of so clear sound? And shall it not be possible for God, in the case of his own organ, to produce, by means of holy hands, a sublime spiritual modulation? But this, as well as the former, is derived from the old sacramental rite in which Jacob blessed his grandsons, born of Joseph, Ephraim and Manasses, with his hands laid on them and interchanged, and indeed so transversely slanted one over the other, that, by delineating Christ, they even portended the future benediction into Christ. Then, 673 over our cleansed and blessed bodies willingly descends from the Father that holiest spirit, over the waters of baptism, recognizing as it were his primeval seat, he reposes, he who, glided down on the Lord in the shape of a dove, in order that the nature of the Holy Spirit might be declared by means of the creature, the emblem, of simplicity and innocence, because even in her bodily structure the dove is without literal gall, and accordingly he says, be ye simple as doves, even this is not without the supporting evidence of a preceding figure, for just as, after the waters of the deluge, by which the old iniquity was purged after the baptism, so to say, of the world a dove was the herald which announced to the earth the assuagement of celestial wrath, when she had been sent her way out of the ark, and had returned with the olive branch, a sign which even among the nations is the foretoken of peace, so by the self same law of heavenly effect, to earth that is, to our flesh as it emerges from the font, after its soul sins flies the dove and the Holy Spirit, bringing us the peace of God, sent out from the heavens. Where is the church, the typified Arkansas? But the world return unto sin, in which point baptism would ill be compared to the deluge, and so it is destined to fire, just as the man too is, who after baptism renews his sins, so that this also ought to be accepted as a sign for our admonition. Chapter 9, Types of the Red Sea, and the Water from the Rock. How many? Therefore, are the pleas of nature, how many the privileges of grace, how many the solemnities of discipline, the figures, the preparations, the prayers, which have ordained the sanctity of water. First, indeed, when the people, set unconditionally free, escaped the violence of the Egyptian king by crossing over through water, it was water that extinguished the king himself, with his entire forces. What figure more manifestly fulfilled in the sacrament of baptism? The nations are set free from the world by means of water, to wit, and the devil, their old tyrant, they leave quite behind, overwhelmed in the water. Again, water is restored from its defect of bitterness to its native grace of sweetness by the tree of Moses. That tree was Christ, restoring, to wit, of himself, the veins of sometime envenomed and bitter nature into the all salutary waters of baptism. This is the water which flowed continuously down for the people from the accompanying rock. For if Christ is the rock, without doubt we see baptism blessed by the water in Christ. How mighty is the grace of water, in the sight of God and his Christ, for the confirmation of baptism. Never is Christ without water, if, that is, he is himself baptized in water, inaugurates in water the first rudimentary displays of his power, when invited to the nuptials, invites the thirsty, when he makes a discourse, 
to his own sempaternal water, approves, when teaching concerning love, among works of charity, a cup of water offered to a poor, child, recruits his strength at a well, walks over the water, willingly crosses the sea, ministers water to his disciples, onward even to the passion does the witness of baptism last, while he is being surrendered to the cross, water intervenes, witness Pilate's hands, when he is wounded, forth from his side bursts water, witness the soldier's lands, chapter 10 dot of John's baptism, we have spoken, so far as our moderate ability permitted, of the generals which form the groundwork of the sanctity of baptism, I will now, equally to the best of my power, proceed to the rest of its character, touching certain minor questions, the baptism announced by John formed the subject, even at that time, of a question, proposed by the Lord himself indeed to the Pharisees, whether the baptism were heavenly, or truly earthly, about which they were unable to give a consistent answer, 674 inasmuch as they understood not, because they believed not, but we, with but as poor measure of understanding as of faith, are able to determine that that baptism was divine indeed, yet in respect of the command, not in respect of efficacy too in that we read that John was sent by the Lord to perform this duty, but human in its nature, for it conveyed nothing celestial, but it foreministered to things celestial, being, to it, appointed over repentance, which is in man's power. In fact, the doctors of the law and the Pharisees, who were unwilling to believe, did not repent either, but if repentance is a thing human, its baptism must necessarily be of the same nature, else, if it had been celestial, it would have given both the Holy Spirit and remission of sins, but none either pardons sins or freely grants the Spirit save God only. Even the Lord himself said that the Spirit would not descend on any other condition, but that he should first descend to the Father. What the Lord was not yet conferring, of course the servant could not furnish. Accordingly, in the Acts of the Apostles, we find that men who had John's baptism had not received the Holy Spirit, whom they knew not even by hearing. That, then, was no celestial thing which furnished no celestial endowments, whereas the very thing which was celestial in John the spirit of prophecy so completely failed, after the transfer of the whole spirit to the Lord, that he presently sent to inquire whether he whom he had himself preached, whom he had pointed out when coming to him, were he, and so the baptism of repentance was dealt with as if it were a candidate for the remission and sanctification shortly about to follow in Christ. For in that John used to preach baptism for the remission of sins, the declaration was made with reference to future remission, if it be true, as it is, that repentance is antecedent, remission subsequent, and this is preparing the way, but he who prepares does not himself perfect, but procures for another to perfect. John himself professes that the celestial things are not his, but Christ's, by saying, he who is from the earth speaketh concerning the earth. He who comes from the realms above is above all, and again, by saying that he baptized in repentance only, but that one would surely come who would baptize in the spirit and fire, of course because true and stable faith is baptized with water, unto salvation, per attended and weak faith is baptized with fire, unto judgment. Chapter 11, Answer to the objection that the Lord did not baptize, but behold, say some, the Lord came, and baptize not. For we read, and yet he used not to baptize, but his disciples, apostrophe as if, in truth, John had preached that he would baptize with his own hands. Of course, his words are not so to be understood, but as simply spoken after an ordinary manner, just as, for instance, we say, the emperor set forth an edict, or, the prefect cudgeled him, pray does the emperor in person set forth? or the prefect in person cudgel, one whose ministers do a thing is always said to do it, so he will baptize you will have to be understood as standing for, to him, or into him, you will be baptized, but let not, the fact, that he himself baptized not trouble any, for into whom should he baptize, into repentance, of what use, then, do you make his forerunner, into remission of sins, which he used to give by a word, into himself, whom by humility he was concealing, into the Holy Spirit, who had not yet descended from the Father, into the church, which his apostles had not yet founded, and thus it was with the self-same baptism of John that his disciples used to baptize, as ministers, 
with which John before had baptized as for honor, let none think it was with some other, because no other exists, except that of Christ subsequently, which at that time, of course, could not be given by his disciples, inasmuch as the glory of the Lord had not yet been fully attained, nor the efficacy of the font established through the passion and the resurrection, because neither can our death see dissolution except by the Lord's passion, nor our life be restored without his resurrection. Chapter 12 Of the Necessity of Baptism to Salvation When, however, the prescript is laid down that without baptism, Salvation is attainable 675 by none, chiefly on the ground of that declaration of the Lord, who says, Unless one be born of water, he hath not life, there arise immediately scrupulous, nay rather audacious, doubts on the part of some, how, in accordance with that prescript, salvation is attainable by the apostles, whom Paul accepted we do not find baptized in the Lord, nay, since Paul is the only one of them who has put on the garment of Christ's baptism, either the peril of all the others who lack the water of Christ is prejudged, that the prescript may be maintained, or else the prescript is rescinded if salvation has been ordained even for the unbaptized. I have heard the Lord as my witness doubts of that kind, that none may imagine me so abandoned as to excogitate, unprovoked, in the license of my pen, ideas which would inspire others with scruple, and now, as far as I shall be able, I will reply to them who affirm that the apostles were unbaptized, for if they had undergone the human baptism of John, and were longing for that of the Lord, then since the Lord himself had defined baptism to be one, saying to Peter, who was desirous of being thoroughly bathed, he who hath once bathed hath no necessity to wash a second time, which, of course, he would not have said at all to one not baptized, even here we have a conspicuous proof against those who, in order to destroy the sacrament of water, deprive the apostles even of John's baptism, can it seem credible that the way of the Lord, that is, the baptism of John, had not then been prepared in those persons who were being destined to often the way of the Lord throughout the whole world? The Lord himself, though no repentance was due from him, was baptized, was baptism not necessary for sinners? As for the fact, then, that others were not baptized they, however, were not companions of Christ, but enemies of the faith, doctors of the law and Pharisees, from which fact is gathered an additional suggestion, that, since the opposers of the Lord refused to be baptized, they who followed the Lord were baptized, and were not like-minded with their own rivals, especially when, if there were anyone to whom they glare, the Lord had exalted John above him, by the testimony, saying, Among them who are born of women there is none greater than John the Baptist. Others make the suggestion, forced enough, clearly that the apostles then served the turn of baptism weaned in their little ship, were sprinkled and covered with the waves, that Peter himself also was immersed enough when he walked on the sea. It is, however, as I think, one thing to be sprinkled or intercepted by the violence of the sea, another thing to be baptized in obedience to the discipline of religion. But that little ship did present a figure of the church, in that she is disquieted in the sea that is, in the world, by the waves, that is, by persecutions and temptations, the Lord, through patience, sleeping as it were, until, roused in their last extremities by the prayers of the saints, he checks the world, and restores tranquility to his own. Now, whether they were baptized in any manner whatever, or whether they continued unbathed to the end so that even that saying of the Lord touching the one bath does, under the person of Peter, Merely regard us still, to determine concerning the salvation of the apostles is audacious enough, because on them the prerogative even of first choice, and thereafter of undivided intimacy, might be able to confer the compendious grace of baptism, seeing they, I think, followed him who was wont to promise salvation to every believer, by faith, he would say, hath saved thee, and, thy sins shall be remitted thee, on thy believing, of course, albeit thou be not yet baptized, if that was one thing to the apostles, I know not in the faith of what things it was, that, roused by one word of the Lord, one left the toll booth behind forever, another deserted father and ship, and the craft by which he gained his living, a third, who disdained his father's obsequies, fulfilled, before he heard it, that highest precept of the Lord, he who prefers father or mother to me, is not worthy of me, chapter. 
13. Another objection. Abraham pleased God without being baptized. Answer thereto. O.L.D. Things must give place to new, and baptism is now a law. Here, then, those miscreants provoke 676 questions. And so they say, Baptism is not necessary for them to whom faith is sufficient. For with all, Abraham pleased God by a sacrament of no water, but of faith. But in all cases it is the later things which have a conclusive force, and the subsequent which prevail over the antecedent. Grant that, in days gone by, there was salvation by means of bare faith, before the passion and resurrection of the Lord. But now that faith has been enlarged, and has become a faith which believes in his nativity, passion, and resurrection, there has been an amplification added w the sacrament, viz, the sealing act of baptism, the clothing, in some sense, of the faith which before was bare, and which cannot exist now without its proper law. For the law of baptizing has been imposed, and the formula prescribed, go, he saith, teach the nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The comparison with this law of that definition, unless a man have been reborn of water and spirit, he shall not enter into the kingdom of the heavens, has tied faith to the necessity of baptism, accordingly. All thereafter who became believers used to be baptized. Then it was, too, that Paul, when he believed, was baptized. And this is the meaning of the precept which the Lord had given him when smitten with the plague of loss of sight, saying, Arise, and enter Damascus, there shall be demonstrated to thee what thou oughtest to do, to it be baptized, which was the only thing lacking to him, that point accepted, he bade sufficiently learned and believed the Nazarene to be the Lord, the Son of God, chap 14, of Paul's assertion, that he had not been sent to baptize, but they roll back an objection from that apostle himself, in that he said, for Christ sent me not to baptize, as if by this argument baptism were done away, for if so, why did he baptize Gaius, and Crispus? and the house of Stephan is, however, even if Christ had not sent him to baptize, yet he had given other apostles the precept to baptize, but these words were written to the Corinthians in regard of the circumstances of that particular time, seeing that schisms and dissensions were agitated among them, while one attributes everything to Paul, another to Apollos, for which reason the peacemaking apostle, for fear he should seem to claim all gifts for himself says that he had been sent not to baptize, but to preach, for preaching is the prior thing, baptizing the posterior. Therefore the preaching came first, but I think baptizing with all was lawful to him to whom preaching was. Chap 15, Unity of Baptism, Remarks on Heretical Any Jewish Baptism, I know not whether any further point has mooted to bring baptism into controversy, permit me to call to mind what I have omitted above, lest I seem to break off the train of impending thoughts in the middle. There is to us one, and but one, baptism, as well according to the Lord's Gospel as according to the Apostles' letters, inasmuch as he says, one God, and one baptism, and one church in the heavens. But it must be admitted that the question, what rules are to be observed with regard to heretics, is worthy of being treated, for it is to us that that assertion refers. Heretics, however, have no fellowship in our discipline, whom the mere fact of their excommunication testifies to be outsiders, I am not bound to recognize in them a thing which is enjoined on me, because they and we have not the same God, nor one that is, the same Christ, and therefore their baptism is not one with ours either, because it is not the same, a baptism which, since they have it not duly, doubtless they have not at all, nor is that capable of being counted which is not had, thus they cannot receive it either, because they have it not, but this point has already received a fuller discussion from us in Greek, we enter, then, the font once our sins washed away, because they ought never to be repeated, but the Jewish Israel bathes daily, because he is daily being defiled, and, for fear that defilement should be practiced among us also, therefore was the definition touching the one bathing made, happy water, which once washes away, which does not mock sinners, with vain hopes, which does not, by 677 being infected with the repetition of impurities, again defile them whom it has washed. Chap. 16, of the second baptism with blood, we have indeed, likewise, a second font, itself with all one with the former, 
of blood, to wit, concerning which the Lord said, I have to be baptized with a baptism, when he had been baptized already, for he had come by means of water and blood, just as John has written, that he might be baptized by the water, glorified by the blood, to make us, in like manner, called by water, chosen by blood. These two baptisms he sent out from the wound in his pierced side, in order that they who believed in his blood might be bathed with the water. They who had been bathed in the water might likewise drink the blood. This is the baptism which both stands in lieu of the frontal bathing when it has not been received, and restores it when lost. Chapter 17 Of the Power of Conferring Baptism For concluding our brief subject, it remains to put you in mind also of the due observance of giving and receiving baptism, of giving it, the chief priest, who is the bishop, as the right, in the next place, the presbyters and deacons, yet not without the bishop's authority, on account of the honor of the church, which being preserved, peace is preserved, beside these, even laymen have the right, for what is equally received can be equally given, unless bishops, or priests, or deacons, be on the spot, either disciples are called that is to the work, the word of the Lord ought not to be hidden by any, in like manner, too, baptism, which is equally God's property, can be administered by all, but how much more is the rule of reverence and modesty incumbent on laymen seeing that these powers belong to their superiors lest they assume to themselves the specific function of the bishop. Emulation of the episcopal office is the mother of schisms. The most holy apostle has said, that all things are lawful, but not all expedient. Let it suffice assuredly, in cases of necessity, to avail yourself, of that rules, if at any time circumstance either of place, or of time, or of person compels you, so to do, for then the steadfast courage of the succor, when the situation of the endangered one is urgent, is exceptionally admissible, inasmuch as he will be guilty of a human creature's loss if he shall refrain from bestowing what he had free liberty to bestow, but the woman of pertness, who has usurped the power to teach, will of course not give birth for herself likewise to a rite of baptizing unless some new beast shall arise like the former, so that, just as the one abolished baptism, so some other should in her own right confer it. But if the writings which wrongly go under Paul's name, claim Thecla's example as a license for women's teaching and baptizing, let them know that, in Asia, the presbyter who composed that writing, as if he were augmenting Paul's fame from his own store, after being convicted, and confessing that he had done it from love of Paul, was removed from his office, or how credible would it seem, that he who has not permitted a woman even to learn with overboldness, should give a female the power of teaching and of baptizing, let them be silent, he says, and at home consult their own husbands, chapter, 18, of the persons to whom, and the time when, baptism is to be administered, but they whose office it is, know that baptism is not rashly to be administered, give to everyone who beggeth thee, as a reference of its own, appertaining especially to almsgiving. On the contrary, this precept is rather to be looked at carefully. Give not the holy thing to the dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine, and, lay not hands easily on any, share not other men's sins. If Philip so easily baptized the chamberlain, let us reflect that a manifest and conspicuous evidence that the Lord deemed him worthy 678 had been interposed. The Spirit had enjoined Philip to proceed to that road. The eunuch himself, too, was not found idle, nor as one who was suddenly seized with an eager desire to be baptized. But, after going up to the temple for prayer's sake, being intently engaged on the divine scripture, was thus suitably discovered to whom God had, unasked sent an apostle, which one, again, the spirit bade adjoin himself to the chamberlain's chariot, the scripture which he was reading falls inopportunely with his faith, Philip, being requested, is taken to sit beside him, the Lord is pointed out, faith lingers not, water needs no waiting for, the work is completed, and the apostle snatched away, but Paul too was, in fact, speedily baptized, for Simon, his host, speedily recognized him to be an appointed vessel of election. God's approbation sends sure premonitory tokens before it. Every petition may both deceive and be deceived. And so, according to the circumstances and disposition, and even age, of each individual, the delay of baptism is preferable, 
principally, however, in the case of little children, for why is it necessary if baptism itself is not so necessary that the sponsors likewise should be thrust into danger, who both themselves, by reason of mortality, may fail to fulfill their promises, and may be disappointed by the development of an evil disposition, in those for whom they stood. The Lord does indeed say, Forbid them not to come unto me, let them come. Then, while they were growing up, let them come while they were learning. While they were learning with her to come, let them become Christians when they have become able to know Christ. Why does the innocent period of life hasten to the remission of sins? More caution will be exercised in worldly matters, so that one who is not trusted with earthly substance is trusted with divine. Let them know how to ask for salvation, that you may seem, at least, to have given to him that asketh. For no less cause must the unwedded also be deferred in whom the ground of temptation is prepared, alike in such as never were wedded by means of their maturity, and in the widowed by means of their freedom until they either marry, or else be more fully strengthened for continence. If any understand the way the import of baptism, they will fear its reception more than its delay. Sound faith is secure of salvation. Chapter 19 Of the times most suitable for baptism the Passover affords a more than usually solemn day for baptism, when, with all, the Lord's passion, in which we are baptized, was completed, nor will it be incongruous to interpret figuratively the fact that, when the Lord was about to celebrate the last Passover, he said to the disciples who were sent to make preparation, ye will meet a man bearing water, he points out the place for celebrating the Passover by the sign of water, after that, Pentecost is a most joyous space for conferring baptisms, wherein, too, the resurrection of the Lord was repeatedly proved among the disciples, and the hope of the advent of the Lord indirectly pointed to, in that, at that time, when he had been received back into the heavens, the angels told the apostles that he would so come, as he had withal ascended into the heavens, at Pentecost, of course. But, moreover, when Jeremiah says, and I will gather them together from the extremities of the land in the feast day. He signifies the day of the Passover and of Pentecost, which is properly a feast day. However, every day is the Lord's. Every hour, every time, is a part meant for baptism. If there is a difference in the solemnity, distinction there is none in the grace. Chapter 20 Of Preparation for and Conduct After the reception of baptism, they who are about to enter baptism ought to pray with repeated prayers, fasts, and bendings of the knee, and vigils all the night through, and with a confession of all by 679 gone sins, that they may express the meaning even of the baptism of John, they were baptized, saith, the scripture, confessing their own sins, to us it is matter for thankfulness if we do now publicly confess our iniquities or our turpitudes, for we do at the same time both make satisfaction for our former sins, by mortification of our flesh and spirit, and lay beforehand the foundation of defenses against the temptations which will closely follow. Watch and pray, saith the Lord, lest ye fall into temptation, and the reason, I believe, why they were tempted was, that they fell asleep, so that they deserted the Lord when apprehended, and he who continued to stand by him, and use the sword even denied him thrice, for with all the word had gone before, that no one untempted should attain the celestial kingdoms, the Lord himself forthwith after baptism temptations surrounded, when in forty days he had kept fast, then, some one will say, it becomes us, too, rather to fast after baptism, well, and who forbids you, unless it be the necessity for joy, and the thanksgiving for salvation, but so far as I, with my poor powers, Understand, the Lord figuratively retorted upon Israel the reproach they had east and the Lord. For the people, after crossing the sea, and being carried about in the desert during forty years, although they were there nourished with divine supplies, nevertheless were more mindful of their belly and their gullet than of God. Thereupon the Lord, driven apart into desert places after baptism, showed, by maintaining a fast of forty days that the man of God lives not by bread alone, but by the word of God, and that temptations incident to fullness or immoderation of appetite are shattered by abstinence. Therefore, blessed ones, whom the grace of God awaits, when you ascend from that most sacred fond of your new birth, 
and spread your hands for the first time in the house of your mother, together with your brethren, ask from the Father, ask from the Lord, that his own specialties of grace and distributions of gifts may be supplied you. Ask, saith he, and ye shall receive. Well, you have asked, and have received, you have knocked, and it has been opened to you. Only, I pray that, when you are asking, you be mindful likewise of Tertullian the sinner. Tertullian on Exhortation to Chastity Chapter 1. Introduction Virginity classified under three several species. I doubt not, brother, that after the permission and peace of your wife, you, being wholly bent upon the composing of your mind, to a fight frame, are seriously thinking about the end of your lone life, and of course are standing in need of counsel. Although, in cases of this kind, each individual ought to hold colloquy with his own faith, and consult its strength. Still, inasmuch as, in this, particular, species trial, the necessity of the flesh, which generally is faith's antagonist at the bar of the same inner consciousness, to which I have alluded, sets cogitation astir, faith has need of counsel from without, as an advocate, as it were, to oppose the necessities of the flesh, which necessity, indeed, may very easily be circumscribed, if the will rather than the indulgence of God be considered. No one deserves, favor, by availing himself of the indulgence, but by rendering a prompt obedience to the will, of his master. The will of God is our sanctification, for he wishes his image, us to become likewise his likeness, that we may be holy just as himself is holy. That good sanctification, I mean I distribute into several species, that in some one of those species we may be found. The first species is, virginity from one's birth. The second, virginity from one's birth, that is, from the font, which, second virginity, either in the marriage state keeps, its subject, pure by mutual compact or else perseveres in widowhood from choice, a third grade remains, monogamy, when, after the interception of a marriage once contracted, there is thereafter a renunciation of sexual connection. The first virginity is, the virginity, of happiness, and consists in, total ignorance of that from which you will afterwards wish to be freed, the second, of virtue, and consists in, contemning that the power of which you know full well, the remaining species, that, of marrying no more after the disjunction of matrimony by death, besides being the glory of virtue, is, the glory, of moderation likewise, for moderation is the not regretting a thing which has been taken away, and taken away by the Lord God, without whose will neither does a leaf glide down from a tree, nor a sparrow of one farthing's worth fall to the earth. Chapter 2 the blame of our misdeeds not to be cast upon God. The one power which rests with man is the power of volition. What moderation, in short, is there in that utterance, the Lord gave, the Lord hath taken away, as seemed, good, to the Lord, so hath it been done. And accordingly, if we renew nuptials which have been taken away, doubtless we strive against the will of God, willing to have over again a thing which he has not willed us to have, for had he willed that we should, he would not have taken it away, unless we interpret this, too, to be the will of God, as if he again willed us to have what he just now did not will. It is not the part of good and solid faith to refer all things to the will of God in such a manner as that, and that each individual should so flatter himself by saying that nothing is done without his permission as to make us fail to understand that there is a something in our own power, else every sin will be excused if we persist in contending that nothing is done by us without the will of God, and that definition will go to the destruction of, our, whole discipline, nay, even of God himself, if either he produce by his own will things which he wills not, or else there is nothing which God wills not, but as there are some things which he forbids, against which he denounces even eternal punishment for, of course, things which he forbids, and by which withal he is offended, he does not will so too, on the contrary, what he does will, he enjoins and sets down as acceptable, and repays with the reward of eternity. And so, when we have learned from his precepts each, class of actions, what he does not will and what he does, we still have a volition and an arbitrating power of electing the one, just as it is written, Behold, I have set before thee good and evil, 
for thou hast tasted of the tree of knowledge, and accordingly we ought not to lay to the account of the Lord's will that which lies subject to our own choice, on the hypothesis, that he does not will, or else, positively, nils what is good, who does nil what is evil. Thus, it is a volition of our own when we will what is evil, in antagonism to God's will, who wills what is good. Further, if you inquire whence comes that volition whereby we will anything in antagonism to the will of God, I shall say, it has its source in ourselves. And I shall not make the assertion rashly for you must needs correspond to the seed once you spring if indeed it be true, as it is, that the originator of our race and our sin, Adam, willed the sin which he committed, for the devil did not impose upon him the volition to sin, but subministered material to the volition. On the other hand, the will of God had come to be a question of obedience. In like manner you, too, if you fail to obey God, who has trained you by setting before you the precept of free action, will, through the liberty of your will, willingly turn into the downward course of doing what God kneels, and thus you think yourself to have been subverted by the devil, who, albeit he does will that you should will something which God nils still does not make you will it inasmuch as he do not reduce those our protoplasts to the volition of sin, nay, nor, did reduce them at all, against their will, or in ignorance as to what God nilled, for, of course, he nilled, a thing, to be done when he made death the destined consequence of its commission. Thus the work of the devil is one, to make trial whether you do will that which it rests with you to will. But when you have willed, it follows that he subjects you to himself, not by having wrought volition in you, but by having found a favorable opportunity in your volition. Therefore, since the only thing which is in our power is volition and it is herein that our mind toward God is put to proof, whether we will the things which coincide with his will deeply and anxiously must the will of God be pondered again and again, I say, to see, what even in secret he may will. Chapter 3 of indulgence and pure volition. The question illustrated, for what things are manifest we all know, and in what sense these very things are manifest must be thoroughly examined. For, albeit some things seem to savor of the will of God, seeing that they are allowed by him, it does not forthwith follow that everything which is permitted proceeds out of the mere and absolute will of him who permits. Indulgence is the source of all permission. And albeit indulgence is not independent of volition, Still, inasmuch as it has its cause in him to whom the indulgence is granted, it comes, as it were, from unwilling volition, having experienced the producing cause of itself which constrains volition. See what is the nature of a volition of which some second party is the cause. There is, again, a second species of pure volition to be considered. God wills us to do some acts pleasing to himself, in which it is not indulgence which patronizes, but discipline which lords it. If, however, he has given a preference over these to some other acts, acts, of course, which he more wills is there doubt that the acts which we are to pursue are those which he more wills, since those which he less wills, because he wills others more, are to be similarly regarded as if he do not will them. For, by showing what he more wills, he has effaced the lesser volition by the greater. And in as far as he has proposed each volition, to your knowledge, in so far has he defined it to be your duty to pursue that which he has declared that he more wills. Then, if the object of his declaring has been that you may pursue that which he more wills, doubtless, unless you do so, you savor of contrariety to his volition, by savoring of contrariety to his superior volition, and you rather offend than merit reward, by doing what he wills indeed, and rejecting what he more wills. Partly, you sin. Partly, if you sin not, still you deserve no reward. Moreover, is not even the unwillingness to deserve reward a sin. If, therefore, second marriage finds the source of its allowance in that will of God which is called indulgence, we shall deny that that which has indulgence for its cause is volition pure, if in that to which some other that, namely, which regards continence as more desirable is preferred as superior, we shall have learned, by what has been argued above, that the not superior is rescinded by the superior. Suffer me to have touched upon these considerations, in order that I may now follow the course of the Apostle's words. But, in this first place, I shall not be thought irreligious if I remark on what he himself professes, namely, 
that he has introduced all indulgence in regard to marriage from his own, judgment that is, from human sense, not from divine prescript, for, withal, when he has laid down the definitive rule with reference to the widowed and the unwedded, that they are to marry if they cannot contain, because better it is to marry than to burn, he turns round to the other class, and says, but to the wedded I make official declaration not indeed I, but the Lord, thus he shows, by the transfer of his own personality to the Lord, that what he had said above he had pronounced not in the Lord's person, but in his own, better it is to marry than to burn. Now, although that expression pertain to such as are apprehended by the faith in an unwedded or widowed condition, still, inasmuch as all cling to it with a view to license in the way of marrying, I should wish to give a thorough treatment to the inquiry what kind of good he is pointing out which is better than a penalty, which cannot seem good but by comparison with something very bad, so that the reason why marrying is good, is that burning is worse. Good is worthy of the name if it continue to keep that name without comparison, I say not with evil, but even with some second good, so that, even if it is compared to some other good, and is by some other cast into the shade, it do nevertheless remain in possession of the name good. If, however, it is the nature of an evil which is the means which compels the predicating good, it is not so much good as a species of inferior evil, which by being obscured by a superior evil is driven to the name of good. Take away, in short, the condition of comparison, so as not to say, better it is to marry than to burn, and I question whether you will have the hardihood to say, better it is to marry not adding what that is which is better, therefore what is not better, of course is not good either, inasmuch as you have taken away and removed the condition of comparison, which, while it makes the thing better, so compels it to be regarded as good, better it is to marry than to burn is to be understood in the same way as, better it is to lack one eye than two, if, however, you withdraw from the comparison, it will not be better to have one eye, inasmuch as it is not good either. Let none therefore catch at a defense, of marriage, from this paragraph, which properly refers to the unmarried and widows, for whom no, matrimonial, conjunction is yet reckoned, although I hope I have shown that even such must understand the nature of the permission. Chapter 4, Further Remarks Upon the Apostle's Language However, touching second marriage, we know plainly that the Apostle has pronounced, thou t being loosed from a wife, seek not a wife, but if thou shalt marry, thou wilt not sin. Still, as in the former case, he has introduced the order of this discourse to from his personal suggestion, not from a divine precept. But there is a wide difference between a precept of God and a suggestion of man. Precept of the Lord, says he, I have not, but I give advice, as having obtained mercy of the Lord to be faithful. In fact, neither in the Gospel nor in Paul's own epistles will you find a precept of God as the source whence repetition of marriage is permitted, whence the doctrine that unity, of marriage must be observed derives confirmation, inasmuch as that which is not found to be permitted by the Lord is acknowledged to be forbidden. Add, to this consideration, the fact, that even this very introduction of human advice, as if already beginning to reflect upon its own extravagance, immediately restrains and recalls itself, while lifts up joints, however, such shall have pressure of the flesh, while he says that he spares them, while he adds that the time is wound up, so that it behoves even such as have wives to act as if they had not, while he compares the solicitude of the wedded and of the unwedded, for, in teaching, by means of these considerations, the reasons why marrying is not expedient, he dissuades from that to which he had above granted indulgence, and this is the case with regard to first marriage, how much more with regard to second, when, however, he exhorts us to the imitation of his own example, of course, in showing what he does wish us to be, that is, continent, he equally declares what he does not wish us to be, that is, incontinent, thus he, too, while he wills one thing, gives no spontaneous or true permission to that which he hills, for had he willed, he would not have permitted, nay, rather, he would have commanded, but see again, a woman when her husband is dead, he says, can marry, if she wished to marry any one, only in the Lord. Ah! But happier will she be, he says, if she shall remain permanently as she is, 
According to my opinion, I think, moreover, I too have the Spirit of God, we see two advices, that whereby, above, he grants the indulgence of marrying, and that whereby, just afterwards, he teaches continence with regard to marrying, to which, then, you say, shall we ascend, look at them carefully, and choose, in granting indulgence, he alleges the advice of a prudent man, in enjoining continence, he affirms the advice of the Holy Spirit, follow the admonition which has divinity for its patron. It is true that believers likewise have the Spirit of God, but not all believers are apostles. When then, he who had called himself a believer, added thereafter that he had the Spirit of God, which no one would doubt even in the case of an, ordinary, believer, his reason for saying so was, that he might reassert for himself apostolic dignity. For apostles have the Holy Spirit properly, who have him fully, in the operations of prophecy, and the efficacy of, healing, virtues, and the evidences of tongues, not partially, as all others have. Thus he attached the Holy Spirit's authority to that form, of advice, to which he willed us rather to attend, and forthwith it became not an advice of the Holy Spirit, but, in consideration of his majesty. A precept. Chapter 5. Unity of marriage taught by ITS First Institution, and by the Apostles application of that primal type to Christ and the Church. For the laying down of the law of once marrying, the very origin of the human race is our authority, witnessing as it emphatically does what God constituted in the beginning for a type to be examined with care by posterity. For when he had molded man, and had foreseen that a peer was necessary for him, he borrowed from his ribs one, and fashioned for him one woman, whereas, of course, neither the artificer nor the material would have been insufficient, for the creation of more. There were more ribs in Adam, and hands that knew no weariness in God, but not more wives in the eye of God. And accordingly the man of God, Adam, and the woman of God, Eve, discharging mutually, the duties of, one marriage, sanctioned for mankind the type by, the considerations of the authoritative precedent of their origin and the primal will of God. Finally, there shall be, said he, two in one flesh, not three nor four. On any other hypothesis, there would no longer be one flesh, nor two, joined, into one flesh. These will be so, if the conjunction and the growing together in unity take place once for all. If, however, it take place, a second time, or oftener, immediately, the flesh, ceases to be one, and there will not be two, joined, into one flesh, but plainly one rib, divided, into more. But when the apostle interprets, the two shall be, joined, into one flesh of the church and Christ, according to the spiritual nuptials of the church and Christ, for Christ is one, and one is his church. We are bound to recognize a duplication and additional enforcement for us of the law of unity of marriage, not only in accordance with the foundation of our race, but in accordance with the sacrament of Christ. From one marriage do we derive our origin in each case, carnally in Adam, spiritually in Christ. The two births combine in laying down one prescriptive rule of monogamy. In regard of each of the two, is he degenerate who transgresses the limit of monogamy? Plurality of marriage began with an accursed man. Lamech was the first who, by marrying himself to two women, caused three to be, joined, into one flesh. Chap, vi. The objection from the polygamy of the patriarchs answered. But with all the blessed patriarchs, you say, made mingled alliances not only with more wives, than one, but with concubines likewise. Shall that, then, make it lawful for us also to marry without limit, I grant that it will, if there still remain type sacraments of something future for your nuptials to figure, or if even now there is room for that command, go and multiply, that is, if no other command has yet supervened, the time is already wound up, it remains that both they who have wives act as if they had not, for, of course, by enjoining continence, and restraining concubatins, the seminary of our race, this latter command, has abolished that grow and multiply, as I think, moreover, each pronouncement and arrangement is, the act, of one and the same God, who did then, indeed, in the beginning, send forth the sowing of the race by an indulgent laxity granted to the reins of connubial alliances, until the world should be replenished, 
until the material of the new discipline should attain to forwardness, now, however, at the extreme boundaries of the times, has checked, the command, which he had sent out, and recalled the indulgence which he had granted, not without a reasonable ground for the extension, of that indulgence, in the beginning, and no imitation of it in the end. Laxity is always allowed to the beginning, of things. The reason why any one plants a wood and lets it grow, is that at his own time he may cut it. The wood was the old order, which is being pruned down by the new gospel, in which with all the axe has been laid as the roots. So, too, eye for eye, and tooth for tooth, has now grown old, ever since let none render evil for evil grew young. I think, moreover, that even with the view to human institutions and decrees, things later prevail over things primitive. Chapter 7 Even the OLD discipline was not without precedence to enforce monogamy, but in this as in other respects, the new has brought in a higher perfection. Why, moreover, should we not rather recognize, from among, the store of, primitive precedence, those which communicate with the later, order of things, in respect of discipline, and transmit to novelty the typical form of antiquity. For look, in the old law I find the pruning knife applied to the license of repeated marriage. There is a caution in Leviticus, my priests shall not pluralize marriages. I may affirm even that that is plural which is not once for all, that which is not unity is number. In short, after unity begins number. Unity, moreover, is everything which is once for all. But for Christ was reserved, as in all other points so in this also, the fulfilling of the law. Thence, therefore, among us the prescript is more fully and more carefully laid down, that they who are chosen into the sacerdotal order must be men of one marriage, which rule is so rigidly observed, that I remember some removed from their office for digamy. But you will say, then all others may, marry more than once, whom he accepts. Vain shall we be if we think that what is not lawful for priests is lawful for laics. Are not even we laics priests? It is written, a kingdom also, and priests to his God and Father, hath he made us. It is the authority of the Church, and the honor which has acquired sanctity through the joint session of the order, which has established the difference between the order and the laity. Accordingly, where there is no joint session of the ecclesiastical order, you offer, and baptize, and are priest, alone for yourself, but where three are, a church is, albeit they be laics, for each individual lives by his own faith nor is there exception of persons with God, since it is not hearers of the law who are justified by the Lord, but doers, according to what the Apostle with all says. Therefore, if you have the right of a priest and your own person, in cases of necessity, it behoves you to have likewise the discipline of a priest whenever it may be necessary to have the fight of a priest. If you are a digamist, do you baptize? If you are a digamist, do you offer how much more capital? A crime, is it for a digamist laic to act as a priest, when the priest himself, if he term digamist, is deprived of the power of acting the priest, but to necessity, you say, indulgence is granted, no necessity is excusable which is avoidable, in a word, shun to be found guilty of digamy, and you do not expose yourself to the necessity of administering what a digamist may not lawfully administer, God wills us all to he so conditioned as to be ready at all times and places to undertake, the duties of, his sacraments. There is one God, one faith, one discipline too. So truly is this the case, that unless the laics as well observe the rules which are to guide the choice of presbyters, how will there be presbyters at all, who are chosen to that office from among the laics? Hence we are bound to contend that the command to abstain from second marriage relates first to the laic, so long as no other can be a presbyter than a laic, provided he of being once far all a husband. Chapter 8 If I t be granted that second marriage is lawful, yet all things lawful are not expedient, let it now be granted that repetition of marriage is lawful, if everything which is lawful is good. The same apostle exclaims, all things are lawful, but all are not profitable. Pray. Can what is not profitable be called good? If even things which do not make for salvation are lawful, it follows that even things which are not good are lawful. But what will it be your duty rather to choose, that which is good because it is lawful, 
or that which is so because it is profitable. A wide difference I take to exist between license and salvation. Concerning the good it is not said it is lawful, inasmuch as good does not expect to be permitted, but to be assumed. But that is permitted about which a doubt exists whether it be good, which may likewise not be permitted, if it have not some first, extrinsic, cause of us being colon inasmuch as it is on account of the danger of incontinence that second marriage, for instance, is permitted colon because, unless the license of some not, absolutely, good thing were subject, so our choice, there were no means of proving to render the willing obedience to the divine will, and who to his own power, which of us follows presentiality, and which embraces the opportunity of license. License, for the most part, is a trial of discipline since it is through trial that discipline is proved, and through license that trial operates. Thus it comes to pass that all things are lawful, but not all are expedient, so long as, it remains true that, whoever has a permission granted is, thereby, tried, and is, consequently, judged during the process of trial in, the case of the particular, permission, apostles, withal, had a license to marry, and lead wives about, with them, they had a license, too, to live by the gospel, but he who, when occasion required, did not use this right, provokes us to imitate his own example, teaching us that our probation consists in that wherein licenses lay the groundwork for the experimental proof of abstinence. Chapter 9 Second Marriage A Species of Adultery Marriage itself impugned, as akin to adultery. If we look deeply into his meanings, and interpret them, Second marriage will have to be termed no other than a species of fornication. For, since he says that married persons make this their solicitude, how to please one another, not, of course, morally, for a good solicitude he would not impugn, and, since, he wishes them to be understood to be solicitous about dress, and ornament, and every kind of personal attraction, with a view to increasing their power of allurement, since, moreover, to please by personal beauty and dress is the genius of carnal concupiscence, which again is the cause of fornication. Pray, does second marriage seem to you to border upon fornication, since in it are detected those ingredients which are appropriate to fornication? The Lord himself said, Whoever has seen a woman with a view to concupiscence has already violated her in his heart. But has he who has seen her with a view to marriage done so less or more? What if he have even married her question mark which he would not do had he not desired her with a view to marriage, and seen her with a view to concupiscence? Unless it is possible for a wife to be married whom you have not seen or desired, I grant it makes a wide difference whether a married man or an unmarried desire another woman, every woman. However, even to an unmarried man, is another, so long as she belongs to someone else, nor yet is the mean through which she becomes a married woman any other than that through which withal, she becomes, an adulteress. It is laws which seem to make the difference between marriage and fornication, through diversity of illicitness, not through the nature of the thing itself. Besides, what is the thing which takes place in all men and women to produce marriage and fornication? Commixture of the flesh, of course, the concupiscence whereof the Lord put on the same footing with fornication. Then, says, someone, are you by this time destroying first that is, single marriage too? And, if so, not without reason, inasmuch as it, too, consists of that which is the essence of fornication. Accordingly, the best thing for a man is not to touch a woman and accordingly the virgins is the principal sanctity, because it is free from affinity with fornication. And since these considerations may be advanced, even in the case of first and single marriage, to forward the cause of continence, how much more will they afford a prejudgment for refusing second marriage? Be thankful if God has once for all granted you indulgence to marry. Thankful, moreover. You will be if you know not that he has granted you that indulgence a second time. But you abuse indulgence if you avail yourself of it without moderation. Moderation is understood, to be derived, from modus, a limit. It does not suffice you to have fallen back, by marrying, from that highest grade of immaculate virginity, but you roll yourself down into yet a third, and into a fourth, and perhaps into more, after you have failed to be continent in the second stage. Inasmuch as he who has treated about contracting second marriages has not will to prohibit even more. Marry we, therefore, 
daily, and marrying, let us be overtaken by the last day, like Saddam and Gomorrah, that day when the woe pronounced over such as are with child and giving such shall be fulfilled, that is, over the married and the incontinent, for from marriage result wombs, and breasts, and infants, and when an end of marrying, I believe after the end of living, chapter, ex application of the subject, advantages of widowhood, renounce we things carnal, that we may at length bear fruits spiritual, seize the opportunity albeit not earnestly desired, yet favorable of not having any one to whom to pay a debt, and by whom to be, yourself, repaid you have ceased to be a debtor, happy man you have released your debtor. Sustain the loss. What if you come to feel that what we have called a loss is a gain? For continence will be a mean whereby you will traffic in a mighty substance of sanctity. By parsimony of the flesh you will gain the spirit. For let us ponder over our conscience itself, to see, how different the man feels himself when he chances to be deprived of his wife. He savors spiritually. If he is making prayer to the Lord, he is near heaven. If he is bending over the scriptures, he is holy in them. If he is singing a psalm, he satisfies himself. If he is adjuring a demon, he is confident in himself. Accordingly, the apostle added, the recommendation of, a temporary abstinence for the sake of adding an efficacy to prayers, that we might know that what is profitable for a time should be always practiced by us, that it may be always profitable, daily, every moment, prayer is necessary to men, of course continence, is so. 2. Since prayer is necessary, prayer proceeds from conscience, if the conscience blush, prayer blushes, it is the spirit which conducts prayer to God, if the spirit be self-accused of a blushing conscience, how will it have the hardihood to conduct prayer to the altar, seeing that, if prayer, blush, the holy minister, of prayer, itself is suffused too, for there is a prophetic utterance of the Old Testament, holy shall ye be, because God is holy. And again, with the holy thou shalt be sanctified, and with the innocent man thou shalt be innocent, and with the elect, elect. For it is our duty so to walk in the Lord's discipline as is worthy, not according to the filthy concupiscences of the flesh. For so, too, does the apostle say, that to savor according to the flesh is death, but to savor according to the spirit is life eternal. In Jesus Christ our Lord, again. Through the holy prophetess Prisca the gospel is thus preached, that the holy minister knows how to minister sanctity, for purity, says she, is harmonious, and they, see visions, and, turning their face downward, they even hear manifest voices, as salutary as they are with all secret. If this dulling, of the spiritual faculties, even when the carnal nature is allowed room for exercise in first marriage, averts the holy spirit how much more when it is brought into play in second marriage. Chapter 11, The more the wives, the greater the distraction of the spirit. For, in that case, the shame is double, inasmuch as, in second marriage, two wives beset the same husband one in spirit, one in flesh. For the first wife you cannot hate, for whom you retain an even more religious affection, as being already received into the Lord's presence, for whose spirit you make request, for whom you render and you will law oblations. Will you stand, then, before the Lord with as many wives as you commemorate in prayer, and will you offer for two, and will you commend those two, to God, by the ministry of a priest ordained, to his sacred office, on the score of monogamy, or else consecrated, there are two, on the score even of virginity, surrounded by widows married but to one husband, and will your sacrifice ascend with unabashed front? Umped among all the other, graces, of a good mind will you request for yourself and for your wife chastity. Chapter 12, Excuse is commonly urged in defense of second marriage. Their futility, especially in the case of Christians, pointed out. I am aware of the excuses by which we color our insatiable carnal appetite. Our pretexts are, the necessities of props to lean on, a house to be managed, a family to be governed, chests and keys to be guarded the wool spinning to be dispensed, food to be attended to, cares to be generally lessened. Of course the houses of none but married men fare well, the families of celibates, the estates of eunuchs, the fortunes of military men, or of such as travel without wives, have gone to rack and ruin. For are not we, too, soldiers? Soldiers, indeed, 
subject to all the stricter discipline, that we are subject to so great a general? Are not we, too, travelers in this world? Why moreover, Christian, are you so conditioned, that you cannot, so travel, without a wife? In my present, widowed, state, too, a consort in domestic works is necessary. Then, take some spiritual wife. Take to yourself from among the widows one fair in faith, dowered with poverty, sealed with age. You will, thus, make a good marriage. A plurality of such wives is pleasing to God. But Christians concern themselves about posterity to whom there is no tomorrow. Shall the servant of God yearn after heirs? who has disinherited himself from the world. And is it to be a reason for man to repeat marriage, if from his first, marriage, he have no children, and shall he thus have, as the first benefit, resulting therefrom, this, that he should desire longer life, when the apostle himself is in haste to be with the Lord. Assuredly, most free will he be from encumbrance and persecutions, most constant in martyrdoms, most prompt in distributions of his goods, most temperate in acquisitions, lastly, undistracted by cares will he die, when he has left children behind him perhaps to perform the last rites over his grave. Is it then, perchance, in forecast for the commonwealth that such, marriages are contracted? For fear the states fail, if no rising generations be trained up? For fear the rights of law, for fear the branches of commerce, sink quite into decay? For fear the temples be quite forsaken? For fear there be none to raise the acclaim, the lion for the Christians? For, these are the acclaims which they desire to hear who go in quest of offspring. Let the well-known burdensomeness of children especially in our case suffice to counsel widowhood, children, whom men are compelled by laws to undertake, the charge of, because no wise man would ever willingly have desired sons. What, then, will you do if you succeed in filling your new wife with your own conscientious scruples? Are you to dissolve the conception by aid of drags? I think to us it is no more lawful to hurt, a child, in process of birth, than one, already, horn. But perhaps at that time of your wife's pregnancy you will have the hardihood to beg from God a remedy for so grave a solicitude, which, when it lay in your own power, you refused. Some, naturally, barren woman, I suppose, or, some woman, of an age already feeling the chill of years, will be the object of your forecasting search, a course prudent enough, and, above all, worthy of a believer, for there is no woman whom we have believed to have born, a child, when barren or old, when God so willed, which he is all the more likely to do if any one, by the presumption of this foresight of his own, provoke emulation on the part of God, and fine, we know a case among our brethren, in which one of them took a barren woman in second marriage for his daughter's sake, and became as well for the second time a father as for the second time a husband. Chapter 13, Examples from among the heathen, as well as from the church, to enforce the foregoing exhortation. To this my exhortation, best beloved brother, there are added even heathenish examples, which have often been set by ourselves as well, as by others, in evidence when anything good and pleasing to God is, even among strangers, recognized and honored with a testimony. In short, monogamy among the heathen is so held in highest honor, that even virgins, when legitimately marrying, have a woman never married but once appointed them as brideswoman. And if you say that this is for the sake of the omen, of course it is for the sake of a good omen, again, that in some solemnities and official functions, single husbandhood takes the precedence, at all events, the wife of a Fleman must be but once married, which is the law of the Fleman, himself, too, for the fact that the chief pontiff himself must not iterate marriage is, of course, a glory to monogamy. When, however, Satan affects God's sacraments, it is a challenge to us, nay, rather, a cause for blushing, if we are slow to exhibit to God a countenance which some render to the devil, by perpetuity sometimes of virginity, sometimes of widowhood. We have heard of Vesta's virgins, and Juno's at the town of Achaia, and Apollo's among the Delphians, and Minerva's and Diana's in some places. We have heard, too, of continent men, and, among others, the priests of the famous Egyptian bull, women, moreover, dedicated, to the African seers, in whose honor they even spontaneously abdicate matrimony 
and so live to old age, shunning thenceforward all contact with males, even so much as the kisses of their sons. The devil, forsooth, has discovered, after voluptuousness, even a chastity which shall work perdition, that the guilt may be all the deeper of the Christian who refuses the chastity which helps to salvation. A testimony to us shall be, too, some of heathendom's women, who have won renown for their obstinate persistence in single husbandhood, some Dido, for instance, who, refugee as she was on alien soil, when she ought rather to have desired, without any external solicitation, marriage with a king, did yet, for fear of experiencing a second union, prefer, contrarywise, to burn rather than to marry, or the famous Lucretia, who, albeit it was but once, by force, and against her will, that she had suffered a strange man, washed her stained flesh in her own blood, lest she should live, when no longer single husbanded in her own esteem. A little more care will furnish you with more examples from our own, sisters, and those indeed, superior to the others, inasmuch as it is a greater thing to live in chastity than to die for it. Easier it is to lay down your life because you have lost the blessing than to keep by living that for which you would rather die outright. How many men, therefore, and how many women, in ecclesiastical orders, owe their position to continents, who have preferred to be wedded to God, who have risked toward the honor of their flesh, and who have already dedicated themselves as sons of that future age, by slaying in themselves the concupiscence of lust, and that whole propensity which could not be admitted within paradise. Whence it is presumable that such as shall wish to be received within paradise, ought at last to begin to cease from that thing from which paradise is intact. Translated by the Reverend S. Stelwell. Tertullian on modesty modesty, the flower of manners, the honor of our bodies, the grace of the sexes, the integrity of the blood, the guarantee of our race, the basis of sanctity, the pre-indication of every good disposition, rare though it is, and not easily perfected, and scarce ever attained in perpetuity, will yet up to a certain point, linger in the world, if nature shall have laid the preliminary groundwork of it. Discipline persuaded to it, sensorial rigor curbed its excesses on the hypothesis, that is, that every mental good quality is the result either of birth, or else of training, or else of external compulsion. But as the conquering power of things evil is on the increase, which is the characteristic of the last times, things good are now not allowed either to be born, so corrupted are the seminal principles, or to be trained, so deserted are studies, nor to be enforced, so dined are the laws. In fact, the modesty, of which we are now beginning, to treat, is by this time grown so obsolete, that it is not the abjuration, but the moderation of the appetites which modesty is believed to be, and he is held to be chaste enough who has not been to chaste. But let the world's modesty see to itself, together with the world itself, together with its inherent nature, if it was wont to originate in birth, its study, if in training, its servitude, if in compulsion, except that it had been even more unhappy, if it had remained only to prove fruitless, in that it had not been in God's household, that its activities had been exercised. I should prefer no good to a vain good, what profits it, that that should exist whose existence profits not? It is our own good things whose position is now sinking, it is the system of Christian modesty which is being shaken to its foundation, Christian modesty, which derives its all from heaven, its nature, through the layer of regeneration, its discipline, through the instrumentality of preaching, its sensorial rigor, through the judgments which each testament exhibits, and is subject to a more constant external compulsion, arising from the apprehension or the desire of the eternal fire or kingdom. In opposition to this, modesty, could I not have acted the dissembler? I hear that there has even been an edict set forth, and a peremptory one too. The Pontifex Maximus, that is, the Bishop of Bishops issues an edict, I remit, to such as have discharged, the requirements of, repentance, the sins both of adultery and of fornication, O edict, on which cannot be inscribed, good deed, and where shall this liberality be posted up? on the very spot, I suppose, on the very gates of the sensual appetites, beneath the very titles of the sensual appetites, there is the place for promulgating such repentance, where the delinquency itself shall haunt, there is the place to read the pardon, where entrance shall be made under the hope thereof, 
but it is in the church that this edict is read, and in the church that it is pronounced, and the church is a virgin. Far, far from Christ's betrothed be such a proclamation. She, the true, the modest, the saintly, shall be free from stain even of her ears. She has none to whom to make such a promise, and if she have had, she does not make it, since even the earthly temple of God can sooner have been called by the Lord a den of robbers, than of adulterers and fornicators. This too, therefore, shall be account in my indictment against the psychics, against the fellowship of sentiment also which I myself formerly maintained with them, in order that they may the more cast this in my teeth for a mark of fickleness. Repudiation of fellowship is never a pre-indication of sin. As if it were not easier to err with the majority, when it is in the company of the few that truth is loved, but, however, a profitable fickleness shall no more be a disgrace to me, than I should wish a hurtful one to be an ornament. I blush not at an error, which I have ceased to hold, because I am delighted at having ceased to hold it, because I recognize myself to be better and more modest. No one blushes at his own improvement. Even in Christ, knowledge had its stages of growth, through which stages the apostle too past, when I was a child, he says, as a child I spake, as a child I understood, but when I became a man, those things which had been the child's I abandoned, so truly did he turn away from his early opinions, nor did he sin, by becoming an emulator not of ancestral, but of Christian traditions, wishing even the precision of them who advise the retention of circumcision and would that the same fate might befall those two, who obtrunk at the pure and true integrity of the flesh, amputating not the extremest superficies, but the inmost image of modesty itself, while they promise pardon to adulterers and fornicators, in the teeth of the primary discipline of the Christian name, a discipline to which heathendom itself bears such emphatic witness, that it strives to punish that discipline in the persons of our females rather by defilements of the flesh than tortures, wishing to wrest from them that which they hold dearer than life. But now this glory is being extinguished, and that by means of those who ought with all the more constancy, to refuse concession of any pardon to defilements of this kind, that they make the fear of succumbing to adultery and fornication their reason for marrying as often as they please, since better it is to marry than to burn. No doubt it is for continence sake, that incontinence is necessary the burning, will be extinguished by fires. Why, then, do they with all grant indulgence, under the name of repentance, to crimes for which they furnish remedies by their law of multinuptialism? For remedies will be idle, while crimes are indulged, and crimes will remain, if remedies are idle. And so, either way, they trifle with solicitude and negligence, by taking emptiest precaution against crimes, to which they grant quarter, and granting absurd est quarter to crimes, against which they take precaution, whereas either precaution is not to be taken where quarter is given, or quarter not given where precaution is taken, for they take precaution, as if they were unwilling that something should be committed, but grant indulgence, as if they were willing it should be committed, whereas, if they be unwilling it should be committed, they ought not to grant indulgence, if they be willing to grant indulgence, they ought not to take precaution. For, again, adultery and fornication will not be ranked at the same time among the moderate, and among the greatest sins, so that each course may be equally open with regard to them, the solicitude which takes precaution, and the security which grants indulgence. But since they are such as to hold the culminating place among crimes, there is no room at once for their indulgence, as if they were moderate, and for their precaution, as if they were greatest, but by us precaution is thus also taken against the greatest, or, if you will, highest, crimes, namely, in that it is not permitted, after believing, to know even a second marriage. Differentiated though it be, to be sure, from the work of adultery and fornication by the nuptial and dotal tablets, and accordingly, with the utmost strictness, we excommunicate digamists, as bringing infamy upon the paraclete by the irregularity of their discipline, the self-same liminal limit we fix for adulterers also and fornicators, dooming them to pour forth tears barren of peace, and to regain from the church no ampler return than the publication of their disgrace. Chapter. Second, God just as well as merciful, accordingly, mercy must not be indiscriminate. 
But, say they, God is good, and most good, and pitiful hearted, and a pitier, and abundant in pitiful heartedness, which he holds dearer than all sacrifice, not thinking the sinner's death of so much worth as his repentance, a saviour of all men, most of all of believers. And so it will be becoming for the sons of God too to be pitiful hearted and peacemakers, giving in their turn, just as Christ with all hath given to us, not judging, that we be not judged. For to his own Lord a man standeth or falleth, who art thou, to judge another's servant? Remit, and remission shall be made to thee. Such and so great futilities of this wherewith they flatter God, and pander to themselves, effeminating rather than invigorating discipline, with how cogent and contrary, arguments, are we for our part able to rebut, arguments, which set before us warningly the severity of God, and provoke our own constancy? Because, albeit God is by nature good, still he is just too. For, from the nature of the case, just as he knows how to heal, so does he with all know how to smite, making peace, but with all creating evils, preferring repentance, but with all commanding Jeremiah not to pray for the aversion of ills on behalf of the sinful people, since, if they shall have fasted, saith he, I will not listen to their entreaty. And again, and pray not thou unto on behalf of the people, and request not on their behalf in prayer and supplication, since I will not listen to them, in the time wherein they shall have invoked me, in the time of their affliction. And further, above, the same preferrer of mercy above sacrifice, says, And pray not thou unto on behalf of this people, and request not, that they may obtain mercy, and approach not on their behalf unto me, since I will not listen to them, of course when they sue for mercy, when out of repentance they weep and fast, and when they offer their self-affliction to God. For God is jealous, and is one who is not contemptuously derided derided, namely, by such as flatter his goodness, and who, albeit patient, yet threatens, through I say at an end of, his, patience. I have held my peace, shall I with all always hold my peace and endure? I have been quiet as, a woman, in birth throes, I will arise, and will make, them, to grow arid. For a fire shall proceed before his face, and shall utterly burn his enemies, striking down not the body only, but the souls too, into hell. Besides, the Lord himself demonstrates the manner in which he threatens such as judge, for with what judgment ye judge, judgment shall be given on you. Thus he has not prohibited judging, but taught, how to do it. Whence the apostle with all judges, and that in a case of fornication, that such a man must be surrendered to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, chiding them likewise, because brethren were not judged at the bar of the saints, for he goes on and says, to what purpose is it, for me to judge those who are without, but you remit, in order that remission may be granted you by God. The sins which are, thus, cleansed are such as a man may have committed against his brother, not against God. We profess, in short, in our prayer, that we will grant remission to our debtors, but it is not becoming to distend further, on the ground of the authority of such scriptures, the cable of contention with alternate pull into diverse directions, so that one, scripture, may seem to draw tight, another to relax, the reins of discipline in uncertainty, as it were, and the latter. To debase the remedial aid of repentance through lenity, the former to refuse it through austerity. Further, the authority of scripture will stand within its own limits, without reciprocal opposition. The remedial aid of repentance is determined by its own conditions, without unlimited concession, and the causes of it themselves are interiorly distinguished without confusion in the proposition. We agree that the causes of repentance are sins. These we divide into two issues, some will be remissible, some irremissible, in accordance wherewith it will be doubtful to no one, that some deserve chastisement, some condemnation. Every sin is dischargeable either by pardon, or else by penalty, by pardon as the result of chastisement, by penalty as the result of condemnation. Touching this difference, we have not only already premised certain antithetical passages of the scriptures, on one hand retaining, on the other remitting, sins, but John too, will teach us, if any knoweth his brother, to be sinning a sin not unto death, he shall request, and life shall be given to him, because he is not sinning unto death, this will be remissible. There is a sin unto death, not for this do I say, that any is to request this will be irremissible. 
so, where there is the efficacious power of making request, there likewise is that of remission, where there is no efficacious power of making request, there equally is none of remission either. According to this difference of sins, the condition of repentance also is discriminated. There will be a condition which may possibly obtain pardon, in the case, namely, of a remissible sin. There will be a condition which can by no means obtain it, in the case, namely, of an irremissible sin. And it remains to examine specially, with regard to the position of adultery and fornication, to which class of sins they ought to be assigned. Chapter. Third, an objection anticipated before the discussion above promised is commenced. But before doing this, I will make short work with an answer, which meets us from the opposite side, in reference to that species of repentance which we are just defining as being without pardon. Why, if, say they, there is a repentance which lacks pardon, it immediately follows, that such repentance must with all be wholly unpracticed by you. For nothing is to be done in vain. Now repentance will be practiced in vain, if it is without pardon. But all repentance is to be practiced. Therefore let, us allow that, all obtains pardon, that it may not be practiced in vain, because it will not be to be practiced, if it be practiced in vain. Now, in vain it is practiced, if it shall lack pardon. Justly, then, do they allege, this argument, against us, since they have usurpingly kept in their own power the fruit of this as of other repentance that is, pardon, for, so far as they are concerned, at whose hands, repentance, obtains man's peace, it is in vain, as regards us, however, who remember that the Lord alone concedes, the pardon of, sins, and of course of mortal ones, it will not be practiced in vain. For, the repentance, being referred back to the Lord, and thenceforward lying prostrate before him, will by this very fact the rather avail to win pardon, that it gains it by entreaty from God alone, that it believes not, that man's peace is adequate to its guilt, that as far as regards the church it prefers the blush of shame to the privilege of communion. For before her doors it stands, and by the example of its own stigma admonishes all others, and calls at the same time to its own aid the brethren's tears, and returns with an even richer merchandise their compassion, namely, than their communion. And if it reaps not the harvest of peace here, yet it sows the seed of it with the Lord, nor does it lose, but prepares, its fruit. It will not fail of emolument, if it do not fail in duty. Thus, neither is such repentance vain, nor such discipline harsh, both on a God. The former, by laying no flattering unction to itself, will more readily win success, the latter, by assuming nothing to itself, will more fully aid. Chapter. Fourth, Adultery and Fornication Synonymous. Having defined the distinction, between the kinds, of repentance, we are by this time, then, able to return to the assessment of the sins, whether they be such as can obtain pardon at the hand of men. In the first place, as for the fact, that we call adultery likewise fornication, usage requires, us so to do. Faith, with all, has a familiar acquaintance with sundry appellate ons. So, in every one of our little works, we carefully guard usage. Besides, if I shall say adulterium, and if stuprum, the indictment of contamination of the flesh will be one and the same. For it makes no difference, whether a man assaults another's bride or widow, provided it be not his own female, just as there is no difference made by places, whether it be in chambers, or in towers, that modesty is massacred. Every homicide, even outside a wood, is banditry. So too, whoever enjoys any other than nuptial intercourse, in whatever place, and in the person of whatever woman, makes himself guilty of adultery and fornication. Accordingly, among us, secret connections as well, connections, that is, not first professed in presence of the church, run risk of being judged akin to adultery and fornication, nor must we let them, if thereafter woven together by the covering of marriage, elude the charge. But all the other frenzies of passions, impious both toward the bodies, and toward the sexes beyond the laws of nature, we banish not only from the threshold, but from all shelter of the church, because they are not sins, but monstrosities. Chapter 5 of the Prohibition of Adultery in the Decalogue. 
of how deep guilt, then, adultery, which is likewise a matter of fornication, in accordance with its criminal function, is to be accounted, the law of God first comes to hand to show us, if it is true, as it is, that after interdicting the superstitious service of alien gods, and the making of idols themselves, after commending, to religious observance, the veneration of the Sabbath, after commanding a religious regard toward parents second, only to that, toward God, that law, laid, as the next substratum, in strengthening and fortifying such counts, no other precept than thou shalt not commit adultery, for after spiritual chastity and sanctity followed corporeal integrity, and this, the law, accordingly fortified, by immediately prohibiting its foe, adultery, understand, Consequently, what kind of sin, that must be, the repression of which, the law, ordained next to, that of, idolatry. Nothing that is a second is remote from the first, nothing is so dose to the first as the second. That which results from the first is, in a sense, another first, and so adultery is bordering on idolatry. For idolatry withal, often cast as a reproach upon the people under the name of adultery and fornication, will be alike conjoined therewith in fate as in following, will be alike co-heir therewith in condemnation as in coordination. Yet further, premising thou shalt not commit adultery, the law, adjoins, thou shalt not kill, it honored adultery, of course, to which it gives the precedence over murder, in the very forefront of the most holy law, among the primary counts of the celestial edict, marking it with the inscription of the very principal sins. From its place you may discern the measure, from its rank the station, from its neighborhood the merit, of each thing. Even evil has a dignity, consisting in being stationed at the summit, or else in the center, of the superlatively bad. I behold a certain pomp and circumstance of adultery, on the one side, idolatry goes before, and leads the way, on the other, murder follows in company, worthily, without doubt, has she taken her seat between the two most conspicuous eminences of misdeeds, and has completely filled the vacant space, as it were, in their midst, with an equal majesty of crime, enclosed by such flanks, encircled and supported by such ribs, who shall dislocate her from the corporate mass of coherences, from the bond of neighbor crimes, from the embrace of kindred wickednesses, so as to set apart her alone for the enjoyment of repentance, will not on one side idolatry, on the other murder, detain her, and, if they have any voice, reclaim, this is our wedge, this our compacting power, by, the standard of, idolatry we are measured, by her disjunctive intervention we are conjoined, to her, out jutting from our midst, we are united, the divine scripture has made us concorporate, the very letters are our glue, herself can no longer exist without us, many and many a time do I, idolatry, subminister occasion to adultery, witness my groves and my mounts, and the living waters, and the very temples and cities, what mighty agents we are for overthrowing modesty, I also, murder, sometimes exert myself on behalf of adultery, to omit tragedies, witness nowadays the poisoners, witness the magicians, how many seductions I avenge, how many rivalries I revenge, how many guards, how many informers, how many accomplices, I make away with, witness the midwives likewise, how many adulterous conceptions are slaughtered. Even among Christians there is no adultery without us. Wherever the business of the unclean spirit is, there are idolatries, wherever a man, by being polluted, is slain, there too is murder. Therefore the remedial aids of repentance will not be suitable to them, or else they will likewise be to us. We either detain adultery, or else follow her. These words the sins themselves do speak. If the sins are deficient in speech, hard by, the door of the church, stands an idolater. Hard by stands a murderer, in their midst stands too, an adulterer. Alike, as the duty of repentance bids, they sit in sackcloth and bristle in ashes, with the self-same weeping they groan, with the self-same prayers they make their circuits, with the self-same knees they supplicate, the self-same mother they invoke. What doest thou, gentlest and humanest discipline? Either to all these will it be thy duty so to be, for blessed are the peacemakers, or else, if not to all, it will be thy duty, to range thyself on our side. Dost thou once for all condemn the idolater and the murderer, but take the adulterer out from their midst, the adulterer, the successor of the idolater, the predecessor of the murderer, the colleague of each, 
it is an accepting of person, the more pitiable repentances thou hast left, unpitied, behind. Chapter 6. Examples of such offenses under the old dispensation no pattern for the disciples of the new. But even the old has examples of vengeance upon such offenses. Plainly, if you show by what patronages of heavenly precedents and precepts it is, that you open to adultery alone, and therein to fornication also the gate of repentance, at this very line our hostile encounter will forthwith cross swords. Yet I must necessarily prescribe you a law, not to stretch out your hand after the old things, not to look backwards, for the old things are passed away, according to Isaiah, and a renewing hath been renewed, according to Jeremiah, and forgetful of former things, we are reaching forward, according to the Apostle, and the Law and the Prophets, were, until John, according to the Lord. For even if we are just now beginning with the law and demonstrating, the nature of, adultery, it is justly with that phase of the law which Christ has not dissolved, but fulfilled. For it is the burdens of the law which were until John, not the remedial virtues. It is the yokes of works that have been rejected, not those of disciplines. Liberty in Christ has done no injury to innocence. The law of piety, sanctity, humanity, truth chastity, justice, mercy, benevolence, modesty, remains in its entirety, in which law blessed the man who shall meditate by day and by night. About that, law, the same David, says, again, the law of the Lord unblameable converting souls, the statutes of the Lord, are, direct, delighting hearts, the precept of the Lord far shining, enlightening eyes. Thus too, the Apostle, and so the law indeed is holy, and the precept holy and most good thou shalt not commit adultery, of course. But he had with all said above, are we, then, making void the law through faith? Far be it, but we are establishing the law for Sithenos, points, which, being even now interdicted by the New Testament, are prohibited by an even more emphatic precept, instead of, thou shalt not commit adultery, whoever shall have seen with a view to concupiscence, hath already committed adultery in his own heart, and instead of, thou shalt not kill, whoever shall have said to his brother, Ratcha, shall be in danger of hell. Ask, yourself, whether the law of not committing adultery be still in force, to which has been added that of not indulging concupiscence. Besides, if any precedents, taken from the old dispensation, shall favor you in, the secrecy of, your bosom, they shall not be set in opposition to this discipline, which we are maintaining. For it is in vain, that an additional law has been reared, condemning the origin even of sins, that is, concupiscences and wills no less than the actual deeds, if the fact, that pardon was of old in some cases, conceded to adultery is to be a reason, why it shall be conceded at the present day, what will be the reward attaching to the restrictions imposed upon the more fully developed discipline of the present day, except that the Ida, discipline, may be made the agent for granting indulgence to your prostitution. In that case, you will grant pardon to the idolater too, and to every apostate, because we find the people itself, so often guilty of these crimes, as often reinstated in their former privileges. You will maintain communion too, with the murderer, because Ahab, by deprecation, washed away, the guilt of, Naboth's blood, and David, by confession, purged Uriah's slaughter, together with its cause, adultery, that done, you will condone incests too, for Lot's sake, and fornications combined with incest, for Judah's sake, and base marriages with prostitutes for Hosea's sake, and not only the frequent repetition of marriage, but its simultaneous plurality, for our father's sakes, for, of come, it is meet, that there should also be a perfect equality of grace in regard of all deeds to which indulgence was in days bygone granted. If on the ground of some pristine precedent pardon is claimed for adultery, we too, indeed have precedents in the soft same antiquity on the side of our opinion, precedents, of judgment not merely not waived, but even summarily executed upon fornication. And of course it is a sufficient one, that so vast a number, the number, of 24,000 of the people, when they committed fornication with the daughters of Madian, fell in one plague. But, with the light of the glory of Christ, I prefer to derive discipline from Christ. 
grant that the pristine days may have had, if the psychics please even a right of, indulging, every immodesty, grant that, before Christ, the flesh may have disported itself, nay, may have perished before its Lord went to seek and bring it back, not yet was it worthy of the gift of salvation, not yet apt for the office of sanctity, it was still, up to that time, accounted as being an Adam, with its own vicious nature, easily indulging concupiscence, after whatever it had seen to be attractive to the sight, and looking back at the lower things, and checking its itching with fig leaves. Universally inherent was the virus of lust, the dregs which are formed out of milk contain it, dregs, fitted, for so doing, in that even the waters themselves had not yet been bathed. But when the word of God descended into flesh, flesh, not unsealed even by marriage, and the word was made flesh, flesh, never to be unsealed by marriage, which was to find its way to the tree not of incontinence, but of endurance, which was to taste from that tree not anything sweet, but something bitter, which was to pertain, not to the infernal regions, but to heaven, which was to be precinct, not with the leaves of lasciviousness, but the flowers of holiness, which was to impart to the waters its own purities thenceforth. Whatever flesh in Christ has lost its pristine soils, is now a thing different, emerges in a new state, no longer, generated, of the slime of natural seed, nor of the grime of concupiscence, but of pure water and a clean spirit. And, accordingly, why excuse it on the ground of pristine precedent? It did not bear the names of body of Christ, of members of Christ, of temple of God, at the time when it used to obtain pardon for adultery, and thus if, from the moment, when it changed its condition, and having been baptized into Christ put on Christ, and was redeemed with a great price, the blood, to wit, of the Lord and Lamb, you take hold of any one precedent, be it precept, or law, or sentence, of indulgence granted, or to be granted, to adultery and fornication, you have. Likewise at our hands a definition of the time from which the age of the question dates. Chapter 7 of the parables of the lost you and the lost drachma. You shall have leave to begin with the parables, where you have the lost you resought by the Lord, and carried back on his shoulders. Let the very paintings upon your cups, come forward to show, whether even in them the figurative meaning of that sheep will shine through, the outward semblance, to teach, whether a Christian or heathen sinner be the object it aims at in the matter of restoration. For we put in a demurrer arising out of the teaching of nature, out of the law of ear and tongue, out of the soundness of the mental faculty, to the effect, that such answers are always given as are called forth, by the question, answers, that is, to the, questions, which call them forth, that which was calling forth, an answer in the present case, was, I take it, the fact that the Pharisees were muttering an indignation at the Lord's admitting to his society heathen publicans and sinners, and communicating with them in food, when, in reply to this, the Lord had figured the restoration of the lost you, to whom else is it credible, that he configured it, but to the lost heathen, about whom the question was then in hand, not about a Christian, who up to, that time had no existence, else, what kind of, Hypothesis, is it that the Lord, like a quibbler in answering, omitting the present subject matter which it was his duty to refute, should spend his labor about one yet future, but a sheep properly means a Christian, and the Lord's flock is the people of the church, and the good shepherd is Christ, and hence in the sheep we must understand a Christian who has heard from the church's flock. In that case, you make the Lord, to have given no answer to the Pharisees muttering, but to your presumption. And yet you will be bound so to defend that presumption, as to deny that the, points, which you think applicable to Christians, are referable to a heathen. Tell me, is not all mankind one flock of God? Is not the same God both Lord and Shepherd of the universal nations? Who more perishes from God than the heathen, so long as he errs? Who is more resought by God than the heathen, when he is recalled by Christ? In fact, it is among heathens, that this order finds antecedent place, if, that is, Christians are not otherwise made out of heathens than by being first lost, and resought by God, and carried back by Christ. So likewise ought this order to be kept, that we may interpret any such, figure, with reference to those in whom it finds prior place. But you, I take it, would wish this, that he should represent the years lost not from a flock, but from an ark or a chest. 
In like manner, albeit he calls the remaining number of the heathens righteous, it does not follow that he shows them to be Christians, dealing as he is with Jews, and at that very moment refuting them, because they were indignant at the hope of the heathens. But in order to express, in opposition to the Pharisees' envy, his own grace and goodwill even in regard of one heathen, he preferred the salvation of one sinner by repentance to this by righteousness, or else, pray, were the Jews not righteous, and such as had no need of repentance, having, as they had, as pillages of discipline and instruments of fear, the law and the prophets, he set them therefore in the parable, and if not such as they were, yet such as they ought to have been, that they might blush the more, when they heard, that repentance was necessary to others, and not to themselves. Similarly, the parable of the drachma, as being called forth out of the same subject matter, we equally interpret with reference to a heathen, albeit it had been lost in a house, as it were in the church, albeit found by aid of a lamp, as it would by aid of God's word. Nay, but this whole world is the one house of all, in which world it is more the heathen, who is found in darkness, whom the grace of God enlightens, than the Christian, who is already in God's light. Finally, it is one straying which is ascribed to the you and the drachma, and this is an evidence in my favor, for if the parables had been composed with a view to a Christian sinner, after the loss of his faith, a second loss and restoration of them would have been noted. I will now withdraw for a short time from this position, in order that I may, even by withdrawing, the more recommend it, when I shall have succeeded even thus also, in confuting the presumption of the opposite side. I admit that the sinner portrayed in each parable is one who is already a Christian, yet not that on this account, must he be affirmed to be such an one as can be restored, through repentance, from the crime of adultery and fornication. For although he be said to have perished, there will be the kind of perdition to treat of, inasmuch as the you perish not by dying, but by straying, and the drachma not by being destroyed, but by being hidden. In this sense, a thing which is safe may be said to have perished. Therefore the believer, too, perishes, by lapsing out of, the right path, into a public exhibition of charioteering frenzy, or gladiatorial gore, or scenic foulness, or athletic vanity, or else if he has lent the aid of any special arts of curiosity to sports, to the convivialities of heathen solemnity, to official exigence, to the ministry of another's idolatry, if he has impaled himself upon some word of ambiguous denial, or else of blasphemy. For some such cause he has been driven outside the flock, or even himself, perhaps, by anger, by pride, by jealousy, as, in fact, often happens, by disdaining to submit to chastisement, has broken away, from it, he ought to be resought and recalled. That which can be recovered does not perish, unless it persist in remaining outside. You will well interpret the parable by recalling the sinner, while he is still living. But, for the adulterer and fornicator, I who is there who has not pronounced him to be dead immediately upon commission of the crime, with what face, will you restore to the flock one who is dead, on the authority of that parable which recalls the sheep not dead? Finally, if you are mindful of the prophets, when they are chiding the shepherds, there is a word I think it is Ezekiel's, shepherds, hold, you devour the milk, and clothe you with the fleeces, what is strong ye have slain, what is weak ye have not tended, what is shattered ye have not bound, what has been driven out ye have not brought back, what has perished ye have not resought. Pray, does he withal upbraid them at all concerning, that which is dead, that they have taken no care, to restore that too to the flock. Plainly, he makes it an additional reproach, that they have caused the sheep to perish, and to be eaten up by the beasts of the field, nor can they either perish mortally, or be eaten up, if they are left remaining. Is it not possible, granting, that yous which have been mortally lost, and eaten up, are recovered, that, in accordance also with the example of the drachma, lost and found again, even within the house of God, the church, there may be some sins of a moderate character, proportionable to the small size and the weight of a drachma, which, lurking in the same church, and by and by in the same discovered, forthwith are brought to an end in the same with the joy of amendment. But of adultery and fornication it is not a drachma, but a talent, which is the measure, and for searching them out there is need, not of the javelin light of a lamp, but of the spear-like ray of the entire sun. 
No sooner has such a man made his appearance than he is expelled from the church, nor does he remain there, nor does he cause joy to the church which discovers him, but grief, nor does he invite the congratulation of her neighbors, but the fellowship and sadness of the surrounding fraternities. By comparison, even in this way, of this our interpretation with this, the arguments of both the you and the drachma will all the more refer to the heathen, that they cannot possibly apply to the Christian guilty of the sin for the sake, of which they are rested into a forced application to the Christian on the opposite side. Chapter 8 of the Prodigal Son. But, however, the majority of interpreters of the parables are deceived by the self same result as is a very frequent occurrence in the case of embroidering garments with purple. When you think that you have judiciously harmonized the proportions of the hues, and believe yourself to have succeeded in skillfully giving vividness to their mutual combination, presently, when each body, of color, and, the various, lights are fully developed, the convicted diversity will expose all the error, in the self-same darkness, accordingly, with regard to the parable of the two, sons also, they are led by some figures, occurring in it, which harmonize in hue with the present, state of things, to wander out of the path of the true light of that comparison which the subject matter of the parable presents. For they set down, as represented in the two sons, two peoples, the eider the Jewish, the younger the Christian, for they cannot in the sequel arrange for the Christian sinner, in the person of the younger son, to obtain pardon, unless in the person of the eider they first portray the Jewish. Now, if I shall succeed in showing, that the Jewish fails, to suit the comparison of the elder son, the consequence of course will be, that the Christian will not be admissible, as represented, by the joint figure of the younger son. For although the Jew would all be called a son, and an elder one, inasmuch as he had priority in adoption, although to, he envy the Christian the reconciliation of God the Father, a point which the opposite side most eagerly catches at, still it will be no speech of a Jew to the Father, behold, in how many years do I serve thee, and thy precept have I never transgressed. For when has the Jew not been a transgressor of the law, hearing with the ear, and not hearing? holding in hatred him who reproveth in the gates, and in scorn holy speech, so too, it will be no speech of the father to the Jew, thou art always with me, and all mine are thine. For the Jews are pronounced apostate sons, begotten indeed and raised on high, but who have not understood the Lord, and who have quite forsaken the Lord, and have provoked unto anger the Holy One of Israel, that all things, plainly, were conceded to the Jew, we shall admit, but he has likewise had every more savory morsel torn from his throat, not to say the very land of paternal promise, and accordingly the Jew at the present day, no less than the younger son, having squandered God's substance, is a beggar in alien territory, serving even until now its princes, that is, the princes of this world, seek, therefore, the Christians some other as their brother, for the Jew the parable does not admit, much more aptly would they have matched the Christian with the elder, and the Jew with the younger son, according to the analogy of faith, if the order of each people as intimated from Rebecca's womb permitted the inversion, only that, in that case, the concluding paragraph would oppose them, for it will he fitting for the Christian to rejoice, and not to grieve, at the restoration of Israel. If it be true, as it is, that the whole of our hope is intimately united with the remaining expectation of Israel, thus, even if some, features in the parable, are favorable, yet by others of a contrary significance the thorough carrying out of this comparison is destroyed, although, albeit all points be capable of corresponding with mirror-like accuracy, there he won cardinal danger in interpretations the danger, lest the felicity of our comparisons be tempered with a different. Aim from that which the subject matter of each particular parable has bidden us, temper it. For we remember, to have seen, actors with all, white accommodating allegorical gestures to their ditties, giving expression to such as are far different from the immediate plot, and scene, and character, and yet with the utmost congruity, but away with extraordinary ingenuity, for it has nothing to do with our subject. Thus heretics too, apply the self same parables where they list, and exclude them, in other cases, not where they ought, with the utmost aptitude. Why the utmost aptitude? Because from the very beginning they have molded together the very subject matters of their doctrines in accordance with the opportune incidences of the parables. Loosed as they are from the constraints of the rule of truth, they have had leisure, of course, to search into, and put together those things of which the parables seem, to be symbolical. Chapter 9 
certain general principles of parabolic interpretation. These applied to the parables now under consideration, especially to that of the prodigal son. We, however, who do not make the parables the sources, whence we devise our subject matters, but the subject matters the sources, whence we interpret the parables, do not labor hard either, to twist all things, into shape, in the exposition, while we take care to avoid all contradictions. 100 sheep. And why, to be sure 10 drachmas. And what is that besom? Necessary it was, that he who was desiring to express the extreme pleasure which the salvation of one sinner gives to God, should name some special quantity of a numerical whole from which to describe, that one had perished. Necessary it was, that the style of one engaged, in searching for a drachma in a house, should be aptly fitted with the helpful accompaniment of a besom as well as of a lamp. For curious niceties of this kind not only render some things suspected, but, by the subtlety of forced explanations, generally lead away from the truth. There are, moreover, some points which are just simply introduced with a view to the structure and disposition and texture of the parable, in order that they may be worked up throughout to the end for which the typical example is being provided. Now, of course the parable of the two sons will point to the same end as those of the drachma and the you, for it has the self-same cause, to call it forth, as those to which it coheres, and the self-same muttering, of course, of the Pharisees at the intercourse between the Lord and heathens, or else, if any doubt sat in the land of Judea, subjugated as it had been long, since by the hand of Pompey and of Lucullus, the publicans were heathens, let him read Deuteronomy, there shall be no tribute wear of the sons of Israel nor would the name of publicans have been so execrable in the eyes of the Lord, unless as being a strange name, a name, of such as put up the pathways of the very sky, and earth, and sea, for sale. Moreover, when, the writer, adjoins sinners to publicans, it does not follow, that he shows them to have been Jews, albeit some may possibly have been so, but by placing on a par the one genus of heathens some sinners by office, that is, publicans, some by nature, that is, not publicans, he has drawn a distinction between them. Besides, the Lord would not have been censured for partaking of food with Jews, but with heathens, from whose board the Jewish discipline excludes its disciples. Now we must proceed, in the case of the prodigal son, to consider first, that which is more useful, for no adjustment of examples, albeit in the most nicely poised balance, shall be admitted, if it shall prove to be most hurtful to salvation. But the whole system of salvation, as it is comprised in the maintenance of discipline, we see as being subverted by that interpretation which is affected by the opposite side. For if it is a Christian who, after wandering far from his father, squanders, by living heathenishly, the substance received from God his father, the substance, of course, of baptism, the substance, of course, of the Holy Spirit, and, in consequence, of eternal hope, if, stripped of his mental goods, he has even handed his service over to the prince of the world, who else but the devil, and by him being appointed over the business of feeding swine of tending and clean spirits, to wit, has recovered his senses so as to return to his father, the result will be, that, not adulterers and fornicators, but idolaters, and blasphemers, and renegades, and every class of apostates, will by this parable make satisfaction to the father, and in this way, it may, rather, be said that, the whole substance of the sacrament is most truly wasted away. For who will fear to squander what he has the power of afterwards recovering? Who will be careful to preserve to perpetuity, what he will be able to lose not to perpetuity? Security in sin, is likewise an appetite for it. Therefore the apostate with all will recover his former garment, the robe of the Holy Spirit, and a renewal of the ring, the sign and seal of baptism, and Christ will again be slaughtered, and he will recline on that couch from which such as are unworthily clad, are wont to be lifted by the torturers, and cast away into darkness, much more such as have been stripped. It is therefore a further step, if it is not expedient, any more than reasonable, that the story of the prodigal son should apply to a Christian. Wherefore, if the image of a son is not entirely suitable to a Jew either, our interpretation shall be simply governed with an eye to the object the Lord had in view. The Lord had come, of course, to save that which had perished, a physician, necessary to the sick more than to the whole. This fact he was in the habit both of typifying in parables, and preaching in direct statements. 
who among men perishes, who falls from health, but he who knows not the Lord, who is safe and sound, but he who knows the Lord. These two classes, brothers by birth, this parable also will signify. See whether the heathen have in God the Father the substance of origin, and wisdom, and natural power of God would recognition, by means of which power the apostle with all notes that in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom knew not God, wisdom, which, of course, it had received originally from God, this, substance accordingly, he squandered, having been cast by his moral habits far from the Lord, amid the errors and allurements and appetites of the world, where, compelled by hunger after truth, he handed himself over to the prince of this age. He set him over swine, to feed that flock familiar to demons, where he would not be master of a supply of vital food, and at the same time would see others, engaged, in a divine work, having abundance of heavenly bread. He remembers his father, God, he returns to him, when he has been satisfied, he receives again the pristine garment, the condition, to wit, which Adam by transgression had lost. The ring also he is then wont to receive for the first time, wherewith, after being interrogated, he publicly seals the agreement of faith, and thus thenceforward feeds upon the fatness of the Lord's body, the Eucharist, to wit. This will be the prodigal son, who never in days bygone was thrifty, who was from the first prodigal, because not from the first a Christian. Him withal, returning from the world to the Father's embraces, the Pharisees mourned over, in the persons of the publicans and sinners. And accordingly to this point alone the elder brother's envy is adapted, not because the Jews were innocent, and obedient to God, but because they envied the nation's salvation, being plainly they who ought to have been ever with the Father. And of course it is immediately over the first calling of the Christian, that the Jew groans, not over his second restoration, for the former reflects its wrap even upon the heathen, but the latter, which takes place in the churches, is not known even to the Jews. I think that I have advanced interpretations more consonant with the subject matter of the parables, and the congruity of things, and the preservation of disciplines. But if the view with which the opposite party is eager to mold the you, and the drachma, and the voluptuousness of the son to the shape of the Christian sinner, is that they may endow adultery and fornication with, the gift of, repentance, it will be fitting either that all other crimes equally capital should be conceded remissible, or else that their peers, adultery and fornication, should be retained inconcessible. But it is more, to the point, that it is not lawful to draw conclusions about anything else than the subject which was immediately in hand. In short, if it were lawful to transfer the parables to other ends, than they were originally intended for, it would be rather to martyrdom, that we would direct the hope drawn from those now in question. For that is the only thing which, after all his substance has been squandered, will be able to restore the sun, and will joyfully proclaim, that the drachma has been found, albeit among all, rubbish, on a dung heap, and will carry back into the flock on the shoulders of the Lord himself the you, fugitive though she have been over all that is rough and rugged. But we prefer, if it must be so, to be less wise in the scriptures, than to be wise against them. We are as much bound to keep the sense of the Lord as his precept. Transgression in interpretation, is not lighter than in conversation. Chapter 10, Repentance more competent to heathens than to Christians. When, therefore, the yoke which forbade the discussion of these parables with a view to the heathens, has been shaken off, and a necessity once for all discerned or admitted of not interpreting otherwise than is, suitable to, the subject matter of the proposition, they contend in the next place, that the official proclamation of repentance is not even applicable to heathens. Since their sins are not amenable to it, imputable as they are to ignorance, which nature alone renders culpable before God. Hence the remedies are unintelligible to such to whom the perils themselves are unintelligible, whereas the principle of repentance finds there its corresponding place, where sin is committed with conscience and will, where both the fault and the favor are intelligible, that he who mourns, he who prostrates himself, is he who knows both what he has lost, and what he will recover, if he makes to God the offering of his repentance, to God who, of course, offers that repentance rather to sons than to strangers was that, then, the reason why Jonah thought not repentance necessary to the heathen Ninevites, when he tergiversated in the duty of preaching, or did he rather, foreseeing the mercy of God poured forth even upon strangers, fear that that mercy would, as it were, destroy, the credit of, his proclamation, and accordingly, 
for the sake of a profane city, not yet possessed of a knowledge of God. Still sinning in ignorance, did the prophet well nigh perish, except that he suffered a typical example of the Lord's passion, which was to redeem heathens as well, as others, on their repentance. It is enough for me that even John, when strewing the Lord's ways, was the herald of repentance no less to such as were on military service and to publicans, than to the sons of Abraham. The Lord himself presumed repentance on the part of the Sidonians and Tyrians, if they had seen the evidences of his miracles. May, but I will even contend, that repentance is more competent to natural sinners than to voluntary. For he will merit its fruit who has not yet used more than he who has already with all abused it, and remedies will be more effective on their first application than when outworn. No doubt the Lord is kind to the unthankful, rather than to the ignorant, and merciful to the reprobates sooner than to such as have yet had no probation, so that in suits offered to his clemency do not rather incur his anger than his caresses, and he does not more willingly impart to strangers that clemency, which, in the case of his own sons, he has lost, seeing that he has thus adopted the Gentiles. While the Jews make sport of his patience. But what the psychics mean, is this that God, the judge of righteousness, prefers the repentance to the death of that sinner who has preferred death to repentance. If this is so, it is by sinning, that we merit favor. Come, you rope walker upon modesty, and chastity, and every kind of sexual sanctity, who, by the instrumentality of a discipline of this nature remote from the path of truth, mount with uncertain footstep upon a most slender thread, balancing flesh with spirit, moderating your animal principle by faith, tempering your right by fear, why are you thus wholly engaged in a single step? Go on, if you succeed in finding power and will, while you are so secure, and as it were upon solid ground. For if any wavering of the flesh, any distraction of the mind, any wandering of the eye, shall chance to shake you down from your equipoise, God is good. To his own, children, not to heathens, he opens his bosom, a second repentance will await you, you will again, from being an adulterer, be a Christian. These, please, you, will urge to me, most benignant interpreter of God, but I would yield my ground to you, if the scripture of the shepherd, which is the only one which favors adulterers, had deserved to find a place in the divine canon, if it had not been habitually judged by every council of churches, even of your own, among apocryphal and false writings, itself adulterous, and hence a patroness of its comrades, from which in other respects, two, you derive initiation, to which, perchance, that shepherd will play the patron whom you depict upon your, sacramental, chalice, depict, I say, as, himself with all a prostitutor of the Christian sacrament, and hence, worthily both the idol of drunkenness, and the brise of adultery by which the chalice will quickly be followed, a chalice, from which, you sip nothing more readily, than, the flavor of, the you of, your, second repentance, I, however, imbibe the scriptures of that shepherd who cannot be broken. Him John forthwith offers me, together with the layer and duty of repentance, and offers him as, saying, bear worthy fruits of repentance, and say not, we have Abraham, as our, father, for fear, to wit, lest they should again take flattering unctions for delinquency from the grace, shown to the fathers for God is able from these stones to raise sons to Abraham. Thus it follows that we too, must judge, such as sin no more bearing worthy fruits of repentance. For what more ripens is the fruit of repentance than the achievement of emendation? But even if pardon is rather the fruit of repentance, even pardon cannot coexist without the cessation from sin. So is the cessation from sin the root of pardon, that pardon may be the fruit of repentance. Chapter 11 From Parables Tertullian comes to consider definite acts of the Lord. From the side of its pertinence to the gospel, the question of the parables indeed has by this time been disposed of. If, however, the Lord, by his deeds with all, issued any such proclamation in favor of sinners, as when he permitted contact even with his own body to the woman, a sinner, washing, as she did, his feet with tears, and wiping them with her hair, and inaugurating his sepulture with ointment, as when to the Samaritaness, not an adulteress by her now sixth marriage, but a prostitute, he showed, what he did show readily to anyone, who he was, no benefit is hence conferred upon our adversaries, even if it had been to such as were already Christians that he, in these several cases, granted pardon. 
for we now affirm, this is lawful to the Lord alone, may the power of his indulgence be operative at the present day, at those times, however, in which he lived on earth we lay this down definitively, that it is no prejudgment against us, if pardon used to be conferred on sinners, even Jewish ones. For Christian discipline dates from the renewing of the testament, and, as we have premised, from the redemption of flesh that is, the Lord's passion. None was perfect before the discovery of the order of faith, none a Christian before the resumption of Christ to heaven, none holy before the manifestation of the Holy Spirit from heaven, the determiner of discipline itself. Chapter 12 of the verdict of the apostles, assembled in council, upon the subject of adultery, accordingly, these who have received another paracletin, and through the apostles, a paraclete, whom, not recognizing him even in his special prophets, they no longer possess in the apostles either, come, now, let them, even from the apostolic instrument, teach us the possibility, that the stains of a flesh which after baptism has been repolluted, can by repentance be washed away. Do we not, in the apostles also, recognize the form of the old law with regard to the demonstration of adultery, how great, a crime, it is, lest perchance it be esteemed more trivial in the new stage of disciplines than in the old, when first the gospel thundered, and shook the old system to its base, when dispute was being held on the question of retaining or not the law, this is the first rule which the apostles, on the authority of the Holy Spirit, sent out to those who were already beginning to be gathered to their side out of the nations, it has seemed, but, say they, to the Holy Spirit, and to us to cast upon you no ampler weight than that, of those, things, from which it is necessary, that abstinence be observed, from sacrifices, and from fornications, and from blood, by abstaining from which ye act rightly, the Holy Spirit carrying you. Sufficient it is, that in this place with all there has been preserved to adultery and fornication the post of their own honor between idolatry and murder, for the interdict upon blood we shall understand to be, an interdict, much more upon human blood. Well, then, in what light do the apostles will those crimes, to appear which alone they select, in the way of careful guarding against, from the pristine law, which alone they prescribe as necessarily to be abstained from? Not that they permit others, but that these alone they put in the foremost rank, of course is not remissible, they, who, for the heathen's sake, made the other burdens of the law remissible. Why, then, do they release our neck from so heavy a yoke, except to place forever upon those, necks, these compendia of discipline? Why do they indulgently relax so many bonds, except that they may wholly bind us in perpetuity to such as are more necessary? They loosed us from the more numerous, that we might be bound up to abstinence from the more noxious. The matter has been settled by compensation, we have gained much, in order that we may render somewhat. But the compensation is not revocable, if, that is, it will be revoked by iteration, iteration, of adultery, of course, and blood and idolatry, for it will follow that the, burden of, the whole law will be incurred, if the condition of pardon shall be violated. But it is not likely, that the Holy Spirit has come to an agreement with us coming to this agreement even without our asking, whence he is the more to be honored. His engagement none, but an ungrateful man will dissolve. In that event, he will neither accept back what he has discarded, nor discard what he has retained. Of the latest testament the condition is ever immutable, and, of course the public recitation of that decree, and the counsel embodied therein, will cease, only, with the word. He has definitely enough refused pardon to those crimes the careful avoidance whereof he selectively enjoined. He has claimed whatever he has not inferentially conceded. Hence it is that there is no restoration of peace granted by the churches to idolatry or to blood. From which final decision of this, that the apostles should have departed, is, I think, not lawful to believe, or else, if some find it possible to believe so, they will be bound to prove it. Chapter 13 of Saint Paul, and the person whom he urges the Corinthians to forgive. We know plainly at this point too, the suspicions which they raise. For, in fact, they suspect the Apostle Paul of having, in the second, epistle, to the Corinthians, granted pardon to the self-same fornicator whom in the first he has publicly sentenced to be surrendered to Satan, for the destruction of the flesh, impious there as he was to his father's wedlock, as if he subsequently erased his own words, writing, but if any hath wholly saddened, 
he hath not wholly saddened me, but in part, lest I burden you all. Sufficient is such a chiding which is given by many, so that, on the contrary, ye should prefer to forgive and console, lest, perhaps, by more abundant sadness, such an one be devoured. For which reason, I pray you, confirm toward him affection. For to this end with all have I written, that I may learn a proof of you, that in all, things, ye are obedient to me. But if ye shall have forgiven any, so I, for I too, if I have forgiven aught, have forgiven in the person of Christ, lest we be overreached by Satan, since we are not ignorant of his injections. What, reference, is understood here to the fornicator, what to the contaminator of his father's bed, what to the Christian, who had overstepped the shamelessness of heathens, since, of course, he would have absolved by a special pardon one whom he had condemned by a special anger. He is more obscure in his pity than in his indignation. He is more open in his austerity than in his lenity. And yet, generally, anger is more readily indirect than indulgence. Things of a sadder are more wont to hesitate than things of a more joyous cast. Of course the question in hand, concerns a moderate indulgence, which, moderation in the indulgence, was now, if ever, to be divined, when it is usual for all the greatest indulgences not to be granted without public proclamation, so far, are they from being granted, without particularization. Why, do you yourself, when introducing into the church, for the purpose of melting the brotherhood by his prayers, the repentant adulterer, lead into the midst and prostrate him, all in hair cloth and ashes, a compound of disgrace and horror, before the widows, before the elders, suing for the tears of all, licking the footprints of all, clasping the knees of all, and do you, good shepherd and blessed father that you are, to bring about the, desired, end of the man, grace your harangue with all the allurements of mercy in your power, and under the parable of the you go in quest of your goats, do you, for fear lest your you again take a leap out from the flock, as if that were no more lawful for the future which was not even once lawful fill. All the rest likewise full of apprehension at the very moment of granting indulgence, and would the apostle so carelessly have granted indulgence to the atrocious licentiousness of fornication burdened with incest, as not at least to have exacted from the criminal even this legally established garb of repentance which you ought to have learned from him, as to have uttered no commination on the past, no allocution touching the future. May, more, he goes further, and beseeches that they would confirm toward him affection, as if he were making satisfaction to him, not as if he were granting an indulgence. And yet I hear, him speak of, affection, not communion, as, he writes, with all to the Thessalonians, but if any obey not our word through the epistle, him mark, and associate not with him, that he may feel Lord, not regarding, him, as an enemy, but rebuking as a brother. Accordingly, he could have said, that to a fornicator, too, affection only was conceded, not communion as well, to an incestuous man, however, not even affection whom he would, to be sure, have bidden to be banished from their midst much more, of course, from their mind. But he was apprehensive, lest they should be overreached by Satan with regard to the loss of that person whom himself had cast forth to Satan, or else lest, by abundance of mourning, he should be devoured whom he had sentenced to destruction of the flesh. Here they go so far as to interpret destruction of the flesh the office of repentance, in that by fasts, and squalor, and every species of neglect and studious ill-treatment devoted to the extermination of the flesh, it seems to make satisfaction to God, so that they argue, that that fornicator, that incestuous person rather, having been delivered by the apostle to Satan, not with a view to perdition, but with a view to emendation, on the hypothesis that subsequently he would, on account of the destruction that is, the general affliction, of the flesh, attain pardon, therefore did actually attain it. Plainly, the self-same apostle delivered to Satan him and Aeus and Alexander, that they might be amended into not blaspheming, as he writes to his Timotheus, but with all himself says, that a stake was given him, an angel of Satan, by which he was to be buffeted, lest he should exalt himself, if they touch upon this, instance, with all, in order to lead us to understand that such as were delivered to Sam by him, were so delivered, with a view to emendation, not to perdition, what similarity is there between blasphemy and incest? 
and a soul entirely free from these, nay, rather related from no other source than the highest sanctity and all innocence, which, elation of soul, was being restrained in the apostle by buffets, if you will, by means, as they say, of pain in the ear or head, incest, however, and blasphemy, deserve to have delivered the entire persons of men to Satan himself for a possession, not to an angel of his. And, there is yet another point, for about this, it makes a difference, nay, rather with all in regard to this it is of the utmost consequence, that we find those men delivered by the apostle to Satan, but to the apostle himself an angel of Satan given. Lastly, when Paul is praying the Lord for its removal, what does he hear? Hold my grace sufficient, for virtue is perfected in infirmity. This they who are surrendered to Satan cannot hear. Moreover, if the crime of Immanuelus and Alexander blasphemy, to wit, is irremissible in this, and in the future age, of course the apostle would not, in opposition to the determinate decision of the Lord, have given to Satan, under a hope of pardon, men already sunken from the faith into blasphemy, whence too, he pronounced them shipwreck with regard to faith, having no longer the solace of the ship, the church, for to those who, after believing, have struck upon, the rock of, blasphemy, pardon is denied, on the other hand, heathens, and heretics are daily emerging out of blasphemy, but even if he did say, I delivered them to Satan, that they might receive the discipline of not blaspheming, he said it of the rest, who, by their deliverance to Satan that is, their projection outside the church, had to be trained in the knowledge, that there must be no blaspheming. So, therefore, the incestuous fornicator too, he delivered, not with a view to emendation, but with a view to perdition, to Satan, to whom he had already, by sinning above an heathen, gone over, that they might learn there must be no fornicating. Finally, he says, for the destruction of the flesh, not its torture condemning the actual substance through which he had fallen out, of the faith, which substance had already perished immediately on the loss of baptism in order that the spirit, he says, may be saved in the day of the Lord. And, here, again, is a difficulty, for let this point be inquired into, whether the man's own spirit will be saved. In that case, a spirit polluted with so great a wickedness will be saved, the object of the perdition of the flesh being, that the spirit may be saved in penalty. In that case, the interpretation which is contrary to ours will recognize a penalty without the flesh, if we lose the resurrection of the flesh. It remains, therefore, that his meaning was, that that spirit which is accounted to exist in the church must be presented saved, that is, untainted by the contagion of impurities in the day of the Lord, by the ejection of the incestuous fornicator, if, that is, he subjoins, know ye not, that a little leaven spoileth the savour of the whole lump, and yet incestuous fornication was not a little, but a large, leaven, chapter, 14th, the same subject continued, and, these intervening points having accordingly been got rid of, I return to the second of Corinthians, in order to prove, that this saying also of the apostle, sufficient to such a man be this rebuke which, is administered, by many, is not suitable to the person of the fornicator. For if he had sentenced him to be surrendered to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, of course he had condemned, rather than rebuked him some other, then, it was to whom he willed the rebuke to be sufficient, if, that is, the fornicator had incurred not rebuke from his sentence, but condemnation. For I offer you with all, for your investigation, this very question, whether there were in the first epistle others too, who wholly saddened the apostle by acting disorderly, and were wholly saddened by him, through incurring, his, rebuke, according to the sense of the second epistle, of whom some particular one may in that, second epistle, have received pardon. Directly, moreover, our attention to the entire first epistle, written, that I may so say, as a whole, not with ink, but with gall, swelling, indignant, disdainful, comminatory, invidious, and shaped through, a series of, individual charges, with an eye to certain individuals who were, as it were, the proprietors of those charges? For so had schisms, and emulations, and discussions, and presumptions, and elations, and contentions required, that they should be laden with invidiousness, and rebuffed with curt reproof, and filed down by haughtiness, and deterred by austerity. And what kind of invidiousness is the pungency of humility? 
To God I give thanks, that I have baptized none of you, except Crispus and Gaius, lest any say, that I have baptized in mine own name. For neither did I judge to know anything among you but Jesus Christ, and him crucified. And, I think, God hath selected us the apostles hindmost, like men appointed to fight with wild beasts, since we have been made a spectacle to this world, both to angels and to men, and, we have been made the offscarings of this world, the refuse of all, and, am I not free, am I not an apostle, have I not seen Christ Jesus a Lord? With what kind of superciliousness, on the contrary, was he compelled to declare, but to me, it is of small moment, that I be interrogated by you, or by a human court day, for neither am I conscious to myself, of any guilt, and, my glory none shall make empty. Know ye not, that we are to judge angels? Again, of how open censure, does the free expression, find utterance, how manifest the edge of the spiritual sword, in words like these, ye are already enriched, ye are already satiated, ye are already reigning. And, if any thinks himself to know, he knoweth not yet how it behaves him to know I is he not even then smiting someone's face, in saying, for whom maketh thee to differ? What, moreover, hast thou which thou hast not received? Why gloriest thou, as if thou have not received? Is he not withal smiting them upon the mouth, in saying, but some, in, their, conscience, even until now eat as if, it were, an idle sacrifice? But, so sinning, by shocking the weak consciences of the brethren thoroughly, they will sin against Christ. By this time, indeed, he mentions individuals, by name, or have we not a power of eating, and of drinking, and of leading about women? just as the other apostles withal, and the brethren of the Lord, and Cephas? And, if others attain to, a share, in power over you, may, not we rather? In like manner he pricks them too, with an individualizing pen. Wherefore, let him who thinketh himself to be standing, see lest he fall. And, if any seemeth to be contentious, we have not such a custom, nor, has, the church of the Lord with such a final clause, as the following, wound up with a malediction, if any loveth not the Lord Jesus, be he anathema miranatha, he is, of course, striking same particular individual through. But I will rather take my stand at that point, where the apostle is more fervent, where the fornicator himself has troubled others also, as if I be not about to come unto you, some are inflated. But I will come with more speed, if the Lord shall have permitted, and will learn not the speech of those who are inflated, but the power. For the kingdom of God is not in speech, but in power. And what will ye, shall I come unto you in a rod, or in a spirit of lenity? For what was to succeed? There is heard among you generally fornication, and such fornication as not, hurt, even among the Gentiles, that one should have his own father's wife. And are ye inflated, and have ye not rather mourned, that he who hath committed such a deed may be taken away from the midst of you? For whom were they to mourn? Of course, for one dead. To whom were they to mourn? Of course, to the Lord, in order that in some way or other he may be taken away from the midst of them, not, of course in order, that he may be put outside the church. For a thing would not have been requested of God which came within the official province of the president, of the church, but, what would be requested of him was, that through death, not only this death common to all, but one specially appropriate to that very flesh which was already a corpse, a tomb leprous with a remediable uncleanness, he might, morefully, than by simple excommunication, incur the penalty of being taken away from the church. And accordingly, in so far as it was meantime possible for him to be taken away, he had judged such an one, to be surrendered to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. For it followed that flesh which was being cast forth to the devil should be accursed, in order that it might be discarded from the sacrament of blessing, never to return into the camp of the church. And thus we see in this place the apostle's severity divided, against one who was inflated, and one who was incestuous, we see the apostle, armed against the one with a rod, against the other with a sentence, a rod, which he was threatening, a sentence, which he was executing, the former, we see, still brandishing, the latter instantaneously hurtling, the one, wherewith he was rebuking, and, the other, wherewith he was condemning. And certain it is, that forthwith thereafter the rebuked one indeed trembled beneath the menace of the uplifted rod, but the condemned perished under the instant infliction of the penalty. 
Immediately the former retreated fearing the blow, the latter paying the penalty. When a letter of the self-same apostle is sent a second time to the Corinthians, pardon is granted plainly, but it is uncertain to whom, because neither person nor cause is advertised. I will compare the cases with the senses. If the incestuous man is set before us, on the same platform will be the inflated man too. Surely the analogy of the case is sufficiently maintained, when the inflated is rebuked, but the incestuous is condemned. To the inflated pardon is granted, but after rebuke, to the incestuous no pardon seems to have been granted, as under condemnation. If it was to him for whom it was feared, that he might be devoured by mourning, that pardon was being granted, the rebuked one was still in danger of being devoured, losing heart on account of the combination, and mourning on account of the rebuke. The condemned one, however, was permanently accounted as already devoured, alike by his fault, and by his sentence, accounted, that is, as one, who had not to mourn, but to suffer that which, before suffering it, he might have mourned. If the reason why pardon was being granted, was lest we should be defrauded by Satan, the loss against which precaution was being taken, had to do with, that which had not yet perished. No precaution is taken in the use of a thing finally dispatched, but in the case of a thing still safe. But the condemned one, condemned to, to the possession of Satan had already perished from the church at the moment, when he had committed such a deed, not to say with all at the moment of being forsworn by the church itself. How should, the church, fear to suffer a fraudulent loss of him whom she had already lost on his eruption, and whom, after condemnation, she could not have held? Lastly, to what will it be becoming for a judge to grant indulgence, to that which by a formal pronouncement he has decisively settled, or to that which by an interlocutory sentence he has left in suspense? And, of course, I am speaking of, that judge who is not wont to rebuild those things which he has destroyed, lest he be held a transgressor. Come, now, if he had not wholly saddened, so many persons in the first epistle, if he had rebuked none, had terrified none, if he had smitten the incestuous man alone, if, for his cause, he had sent none into panic, had struck inflated one with consternation, would it not be better for you to suspect, and more believing for you to argue, that rather some one far different had been in the same predicament at that time among the Corinthians, so that, rebuked, and terrified, and already wounded with mourning, he therefore the moderate nature of his fault permitting it subsequently received pardon, than that you should interpret that, pardon is granted, to an incestuous fornicator? For this you had been bound to read, even if not in an epistle, yet impressed upon the very character of the apostle, by, his, modesty more clearly than by the instrumentality of a pen, not to steep, to wit, Paul, the apostle of Christ, the teacher of the nations in faith and verity, the vessel of election, the founder of churches, the censor of discipline, in the guilt of, levity so great, as that he should either have condemned rashly one whom he was presently to absolve, or else rashly absolved one whom he had not rashly condemned, albeit on the ground of that fornication which is the result of simple immodesty, not to say on the ground of incestuous nuptials and impious voluptuousness and parasitical lust, lust, which he had refused to compare even with, the lusts of, the nations, for fear it should be set down to the account of custom, lust, on which he would sit in judgment though absent for fear the culprit should gain the time. Lust, which he had condemned, after calling to his aid even the Lord's power, for fear the sentence should seem human. Therefore he has trifled both with his own spirit, and with the angel of the church, and with the power of the Lord, if he rescinded what by their counsel he had formerly pronounced. Chapter 15. The same subject continued. If you hammer out the sequel of that epistle, to illustrate the meaning of the apostle, neither will that sequel be found to square with the obliteration of incest, lest even here the apostle be put to the blush by the incongruity of his later meanings. For what kind, of hypothesis, is it, that the very moment, after making a largesse of restoration to the privileges of ecclesiastical peace to an incestuous fornicator, he should forthwith have proceeded to accumulate exhortations about turning away from impurities, about pruning away of blemishes, about exhortations to deeds of sanctity, as if he had decreed nothing of a contrary nature just before. 
compare, in short, and see, whether it be his province to say, wherefore, having this ministration, in accordance with, the fact, that we have obtained mercy, we faint not, but renounce the secret things of disgrace, who has just released from condemnation one manifestly convicted of, not disgrace merely, but crime too, whether it be mis province, again, to excuse a conspicuous immodesty, who, among the counts of his own labors, after straits and pressures, after fasts and vigils, has named chastity also, whether it be, once more, his province to receive back into communion whatsoever reprobates, who writes, for what society, is there, between righteousness and iniquity, what communion, moreover, between light and darkness, what consonance between Christ and Belial, or what part for a believer with, an unbeliever, or what agreement between the temple of God and idols, will he not deserve to hear constantly, the reply, and in what manner, do you make a separation between things which, in the former part of your epistle, by restitution of the incestuous one, you have joined, for by his restoration to concorporate unity with the church, righteousness is made to have fellowship with iniquity, darkness has communion with light, Belial is consonant with Christ, and believer shares the sacraments with unbeliever, and idols may see to themselves, the very vitiator of the temple of God is converted into a temple of God, for here too, he sap, for ye are a temple of the living God, for he saith, that I will dwell in you, and will walk in, you, and will be their God, and they shall be to me a people. Wherefore depart from the midst of them, be separate, and touch not the unclean. This, thread of discourse, also you spin out, O Apostle, when at the very moment you yourself are offering your hand to so huge a whirlpool of impurities, nay, you superad yet further, having therefore this promise, beloved, cleanse we ourselves out from every defilement of flesh and spirit, perfecting chastity in God's fear. I pray you, had he who fixes such, exhortations, in our minds been recalling some notorious fornicator into the church, or is his reason for writing it, to prevent himself from appearing to you in the present day, to have so recalled him, these, words of his, will be in duty bound alike to serve as a prescriptive rule for the foregone, and a prejudgment for the following, parts of the epistle, for in saying, toward the end of the epistle, lest, when I shall have come, God humble me, and I bewail many of those who have formerly sinned, and have not repented of the impurity which they have committed, the fornication, and the vileness, he did not, of course, determine that they were to be received hack, by him into the church, if they should have entered, the path of, repentance whom he was to find in the church, but that they were to be bewailed, and indubitably ejected, that they might lose, the benefit of, repentance. And, besides, it is not congruous that he, who had above asserted that there was no communion between light and darkness, righteousness and iniquity, should in this place have been indicating somewhat touching communion. But all such are ignorant of the apostle as understand anything in a sense, contrary to the nature and design of the man himself, contrary to the norm and rule of his doctrines, so as to presume that he, a teacher of every sanctity, even by his own example, an execrator and expiator of every impurity, and universally consistent with himself in these points, restored ecclesiastical privileges to an incestuous person sooner than to some more. Mild Defender. Chapter. 16th, General Consistency of the Apostle. Necessary it is, therefore, that the character of the Apostle should be continuously pointed out to them, whom I will maintain to be such in the second of Corinthians with all, as I know, him to be, in all his letters. He it is, who even in the first, Epistle, was the first of all, the Apostles, to dedicate the temple of God. Know ye not, that ye are the temple of God, and that in you the Lord dwells, who, likewise, for the consecrating, and purifying that temple, wrote the law pertaining to the temple keepers, if any shall have marred the temple of God, him shall God mar, for the temple of God is holy, wick, temple, are ye, come, now, who in the world has, ever, redintegrated one who has been marred by God, that is, delivered to Satan with a view to destruction of the flesh, after subjoining for that reason, let none seduce himself, that is, let none presume, that one marred by God can possibly be redintegrated anew, 
just as, again, among all other crimes, nay, even before all others when affirming that adulterers, and fornicators, and effeminates, and cohabitors with males, will not attain the kingdom of God, he premised, do not err to wit, if you think they will attain it, but to them from whom the kingdom is taken away, of course the life which exists in the kingdom is not permitted either. Moreover, by superadding, but such indeed ye have been, but ye have received ablution, but ye have been sanctified, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and in the Spirit of our God, in as far as he puts on the paid side of the account such sins before baptism, in so far after baptism he determines them irremissible, if it is true, as it is, that they are not allowed to receive ablution in you. Recognize too, in what follows, Paul, in the character of, an immovable column of discipline and its rules, meats for the belly, and the belly for meats, God maketh a full end both of the one, and of the others, but the body not for fornication, but for God, for let us make man, said God, conformable, to our image and likeness, and God made man, conformable, to the image and likeness of God made he him, the Lord for the body, yes, for the word was made flesh. Moreover, God both raised up the Lord, and will raise up us through his own power, on account, to wit, of the union of our body with him. And accordingly, know ye not your bodies, to be, members of Christ? Because Christ too, is God's temple. Overturn this temple, and I will in three days space resuscitate it. Taking away the members of Christ, shall I make, them, members of an harlot? Know ye not, that whoever is agglutinated to an harlot is made one body? For the two shall be, made, into one flesh, but whoever is agglutinated to the Lord is one spirit? Flee fornication, if revocable by pardon, in what sense am I to flee it, to turn adulterer anew? I shall gain nothing, if I do flee it, I shall be one body, to which by communion I shall be agglutinated. Every sin which a human being, may have committed, is extraneous to the body, but whoever fornicateth, sinneth against his own body. And, for fear you should fly to that statement for a license to fornication, on the ground, that you will be sinning against a thing which is yours, not the Lord's, he takes you away from yourself, and awards you, according to his previous disposition, to Christ, and ye are not your own, immediately opposing, thereto. For bought ye are with a price, the blood, to wit, of the Lord, glorify and extol the Lord in your body, see whether he who gives this injunction be likely to have pardoned one who has disgraced the Lord, and who has cast him down from, the empire of, his body, and this indeed through incest. If you wish to imbibe to the utmost all knowledge of the apostle, in order to understand with what an axe of censorship he lops, and eradicates, and extirpates, every forest of lusts, for fear of permitting ought to regain strength and sprout again, behold him desiring souls, to keep a fast from the legitimate fruit of nature the apple, I mean, of marriage, but with regard to what ye wrote. Good it is for a man, to have no contact with a woman, but, on account of fornication, let each one have his own wife, let husband to wife, and wife to husband, render what is due. Who but must know, that it was against his will, that he relaxed the bond of this good, in order to prevent fornication. But if he either has granted, or does grant, indulgence to fornication, of course he has frustrated the design of his own remedy, and will be bound forthwith, to put the curb upon the nuptials of continence, if the fornication for the sake, of which those nuptials are permitted, shall cease to be feared. For, a fornication, which has indulgence granted it will not be feared. And yet he professes, that he has granted the use of marriage by way of indulgence, not of command. For he wills all to be on a level with himself. But when things lawful are, only, granted by way of indulgence, who hope for things unlawful? To the unmarried also, and widows, he says, it is good, by his example, to persevere in their present state, but if they were too weak, to marry, because it is preferable to marry than to bum. With what fires, I pray you, is it preferable to burn, the fires, of concupiscence, or, the fires, of penalty? Nay, but if fornication is pardonable, it will not be an object of concupiscence. But it is more, the manner, of an apostle to take forethought for the fires of penalty. Wherefore, if it is penalty which burns, it follows that fornication, which penalty awaits, is not pardonable.
Meantime with all, while prohibiting divorce, he uses the Lord's precept against adultery as an instrument for providing, in place of divorce, either perseverance in widowhood, or else a reconciliation of peace, inasmuch as whoever, shall have dismissed a wife, for any cause, except the cause of adultery, maketh her commit adultery, and he who marrieth one dismissed by a husband committeth adultery, what powerful remedies does the Holy Spirit furnish, to prevent? to wit, the commission anew of that which he wills not should anew be pardoned. Now, if in all cases he says it is best for a man thus to be, thou art joined to a wife seek not loosing, that you may give no occasion to adultery, thou art loosed from a wife, seek not a wife, that you may reserve an opportunity for yourself, but withal, if thou shalt, have married a wife, and if a virgin shall have married, she sinneth not, pressure, however, of the flesh such shall have, even. Here he is granting a permission by way of sparing them. On the other hand, he lays it down, that the time is wound up, in order that even they who have wives may be, as if they had them not. For the fashion of this world is passing away, this world, no longer, to wit, requiting, the command, grow and multiply. Thus he wills us to pass our life without anxiety, because the unmarried care about the Lord, how they may please God, the married, however, muse about the world, how they may please their spouse. Thus he pronounces, that the preserver of a virgin doeth better than her giver in marriage. Thus too, he discriminatingly judges her to be more blessed, who, after losing her husband subsequently to her entrance into the faith, lovingly embraces the opportunity of widowhood. Thus he commends us divine all these counsels of continence, I think, he says, I too have the Spirit of God. Who is this your most audacious asserter of all immodesty, plainly a most faithful advocate of the adulterous, and fornicators, and incestuous, in whose honor he has undertaken this cause against the Holy Spirit, so that he recites a false testimony from, the writings of, his apostle. No such indulgence granted Paul, who endeavors to obliterate necessity of the flesh wholly from, the list of, even honorable pretexts, for marriage unions. He does grant indulgence, I allow, not to adulteries, but to nuptials. He does spare, I allow, marriages, not harlotries. He tries to avoid giving pardon even to nature, for fear he may flatter guilt. He is studious to put restraints upon the union, which is heir to blessing, for fear that which is heir to curse be excused. This, one possibility, was left him, to purge the flesh from, natural, dregs, for, cleanse it, from, foul, stains he cannot, but this is the usual way with perverse and ignorant heretics, yes, and by this time even with psychics universally, to arm themselves with the opportune support of some one ambiguous passage, in opposition to the disciplined host of sentences of the entire document, chapter, 17th, consistency of the apostle in his other epistles, challenge me to front the apostolic line of battle, look at his epistles, they all keep guard in defense of modesty, of chastity, of sanctity, they all aim their missiles against the interests of luxury, and the seriousness, and lust, what, in short, does he write to the Thessalonians with all, for our consolation, originated, not of seduction, nor of impurity, and, this is the will of God, your sanctification, that ye abstain from fornication, that each one know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor, not in the lust of concupiscence, as the nations which are ignorant of God. What do the Galatians read? Manifest are the works of the flesh. What are these? Among the first he has set fornication, impurity, lasciviousness, concerning, which I foretell you, as I have foretold, that whoever do such acts are not to attain by inheritance the kingdom of God. The Romans, moreover, what learning is more impressed upon them than that there must be no dereliction of the Lord after believing? What, then, say we, do we persevere in sin, in order that grace may superabound? Far be it. We, who are dead to sin, how shall we live in it still? Are ye ignorant, that we who have been baptized in Christ have been baptized into his death? Buried with him, then, we have been, through the baptism into the death, in order that, as Christ hath risen again from the dead, so we too may walk in newness of life. For if we have been buried together in the likeness of his death, why, we shall be, in that, of, his, resurrection too, knowing this, that our old man hath, been crucified together with him. 
but if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall live too, with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, no more death, that, death no more hath domination over him, for in that he died to sin, he died once for all, but in that he liveth, to God he liveth, thus too, repute ye yourselves dead indeed to sin, but living to God through Christ Jesus, therefore, Christ being once for all dead, none who, subsequently to Christ, has died, can live again to sin, and especially to so heinous a sin. Else, if fornication and adultery may by possibility be anew admissible, Christ with all will be able anew to die. Moreover, the apostle is urgent, in prohibiting sin from reigning in our mortal body, whose infirmity of the flesh in you. For as ye have tendered your members to serve our impurity and iniquity, so too now tender them servants to righteousness unto holiness. For even if he has affirmed that good dwelleth not in his flesh, yet, he means, according to the law of the letter, in which he was, but according to the law of the spirit, to which he annexes us, he frees us from the infirmity of the flesh. For the law, he says, of the spirit of life hath manumitted thee from the law of sin and of death. For albeit he may appear to be partly disputing from the standpoint of Judaism, yet it is to us, that he is directing the integrity and plenitude of the rules of discipline, for whose sake soever, laboring, as we were, in the law, God hath sent, through flesh, his own son, in similitude of flesh of sin, and, became of sin, hath condemned sin in the flesh, in order that the righteousness of the law, he says, might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to flesh, but according to the Spirit. For they who walk according to flesh are sensible as to those things which are the fleshes, and they who walk according to the Spirit those which are the spirits. Moreover, he has affirmed the sense of the flesh to be death, hence to enmity, and enmity toward God, and that they who are in the flesh, that is, in the sense of the flesh, cannot please God, and, if ye live according to flesh, he says, it will come to pass that ye die, but, what do we understand the sense of the flesh and the life of the flesh to mean, except whatever it shames, one, to pronounce, for the other, works, of the flesh even an apostle would have named, similarly, two, when writing, to the Ephesians, while recalling past, deeds, he warns, them, concerning the future, in which we too had our conversation, doing the concupiscences and pleasures of the flesh, branding, in fine, such as had denied themselves, Christians, to wit on the score of having delivered themselves up to the working of every impunity, but ye, he says, not so have learnt Christ, and again he says thus, let him who was wont to steal, steal no more. But, similarly, let him who was wont to commit adultery hitherto, not commit adultery, and he who was wont to fornicate hitherto, not fornicate, for he would have added these, admonitions, too, had he been in the habit of extending pardon to such, or at all willed it to be extended, who, not willing pollution to be contracted even by a word, says, let no base speech proceed out of your mouth again, but let fornication, and every impurity not be even named among you, as become our saints, so far is it from being excused, knowing this, that every fornicator or impure, person, hath not God's kingdom, let none seduce you with empty words, on this account come out the wrath of God upon the sons of unbelief, who seduces with empty words, but he who states in a public harangue, that adultery is remissible, not seeing into the fact, that its very foundations have been dug out by the apostle, when he puts restraints upon drunkennesses and revelings, as with all here, and be not inebriated with wine, in which is voluptuousness, he demonstrates to, to the Colossians, what members they are to mortify upon earth, fornication, impurity, lust, evil concupiscence, and base talk, yield up, by this time, to so many in such sentences, the one, passage, to which you cling, paucity is cast into the shade by multitude, doubt by certainty, obscurity by plainness, even if, for certain, the apostle had granted pardon to fornication to that Corinthian, it would be another instance of his ones for all contravening his own practice to meet the requirement of the time. He circumcised Timotheus alone, and yet did away with circumcision. Chapter 18th, Answer to a Psychical Objection. But these, 
passages, says, our opponent, will pertain to the interdiction of all immodesty, and the enforcing of all modesty, yet without prejudice to the place of pardon, which, pardon, is not forthwith quite tonight, when sins are condemned, since the time of the pardon is concurrent with the condemnation which it excludes. This piece of shrewdness on the part of the psychics was, naturally, sequent, and accordingly we have reserved for this place the cautions which, even in the times of antiquity, were openly taken with a view to the refusing of ecclesiastical communion to cases of this kind. For even in the Proverbs, which we call Peromii, Solomon specially, treats, of the adulterer, as being, nowhere admissible to expiation, but the adulterer, he says, through indigence of senses acquireth perdition to his own soul, sustaineth dolors and disgraces. His ignominy, moreover, shall not be wiped away for the age. For indignation, full of jealousy, will not spare the man in the day of judgment. If you think this said about a heathen, at all events about believers you have already heard, it said, through Isaiah, go out from the midst of them, and be separate, and touch not the impure. You have at the very outset of the Psalms, blessed the man who hath not gone astray in the counsel of the impious, nor stood in the way of sinners, and sat in the state chair of pestilence, whose voice, withal, is heard, subsequently, I have not sat with the conclave of vanity, and with them who act iniquitously will I not enter this, has to do with the church of such as act ill, and with the impious will I not sit, and, I will wash with the innocent mine hands, and thine altar will I surround, Lord as being a host in himself inasmuch as indeed with an holy, man, holy thou wilt be, and with an innocent man, innocent thou wilt be, and with an elect, elect thou wilt be, and with a perverse, perverse thou wilt be, and elsewhere, but to the sinner saith the Lord, why expoundest thou my righteous acts, and tackest up my testament through thy mouth? If thou sawest a thief, thou ranest with him, and with adulterers thy portion thou madest, deriving his instructions, therefore, from hence, the apostle too says, I wrote to you in the epistle, not to be mingled up with fornicators, not, of course, with the fornicators of this world, and so forth else it behoved you to go out from the world. But now I write to you, if any is named a brother among you, being, a fornicator, or an idolater for what so intimately joined, or a defrauder for what so near akin, and so on, with such to take no food even, not to say the Eucharist, because, to wit, with all a little leaven spoileth the flavor of the whole lump. Again to Timotheus, lay hands on no one hastily, nor communicate with other sins. Again to the Ephesians, be not, then, partners with them, for ye were at one time darkness, and yet more earnestly, communicate not with the unfruitful works of darkness, nay rather with all convict them. For, the things, which are done by them in secrecy it is disgraceful even to utter. What more disgraceful than a modest is? If, moreover, even from a brother who walketh idly he warns the Thessalonians to withdraw themselves, how much more with all from a fornicator? For these are the deliberate judgments of Christ, loving the church, who hath delivered himself up for her, that he may sanctify her, purifying her utterly by the layer of water, in the word, that he may present the church to himself glorious, not having stain or wrinkle of course after the laver, but, that, she may be holy and without reproach. Thereafter, to wit, being without wrinkle as a virgin, without stain of fornication, as a spouse, without disgrace of vileness, as having been utterly purified. What if, even here, you should conceive to reply, that communion is indeed denied to sinners, very especially such as had been polluted by the flesh, but, only, for the present, to be restored, to wit, as the result of penitential suing, in accordance with that clemency of God which prefers a sinner's repentance to his death. For this fundamental ground of your opinion must be universally attacked. We say, accordingly, that if it had been competent to the divine clemency, to have guaranteed the demonstration of itself even to the post-baptismally lapsed, the apostle would have said thus, communicate not with the works of darkness, unless they shall have repented, and, with such take not food even, unless after they shall have wiped, with rolling at their feet, the shoes of the brethren, and, him who shall have marred the temple of God, shall God mar, unless he shall have shaken off from his head in the church the ashes of all hearths. For it had been his duty, in the case of those things which he had condemned, 
to have equally determined the extent to which he had, and had conditionally, condemned them, whether he had condemned them with a temporary and conditional, and not a perpetual, seventy, however, since in all epistles he both prohibits such a character, so sinning, after believing, from being admitted, to the society of believers, and, if admitted, detrudes him from communion, without hope of any condition or time, he sides more with our opinion, pointing out that the repentance which the Lord prefers, is that which before believing, before baptism, is esteemed better than the death of the sinner, the sinner, I say, once for all to be washed through the grace of Christ, who once for all has suffered death for our sins. For this, rule, even in his own person, the apostle has laid down. For, when affirming that Christ came for this end, that he might save sinners, of whom himself had been the first, what does he add? And I obtained mercy, because I did ignorantly in unbelief. Thus that clemency of God, preferring the repentance of a sinner to his death, looks at such as are ignorant still, and still unbelieving for the sake of whose liberation Christ came, not, at such, as already know God, and have learnt the sacrament of the faith. But if the clemency of God is applicable to such as are ignorant still, and unbelieving, of course it follows, that repentance invites clemency to itself, without prejudice to that species of repentance after believing, which either, for lighter sins, will be able to obtain pardon from the bishop, or else, for greater and irremissible ones, from God only. Chapter 19 Objections from the Revelation in the First Epistle of Saint John refuted. But how far are we to treat of Paul, since even John appears to give some secret countenance to the opposite side, as if in the Apocalypse he has manifestly assigned to fornication the auxiliary aid of repentance, where, to the angel of the fire Tyrenes, the Spirit sends a message that he hath against him that he kept, in communion, the woman Jezebel, who calleth herself a prophet, and teacheth, and sedeseth my servants unto fornicating and eating of idle sacrifice. And I gave her bounteously a space of time, that she might enter upon repentance, nor is she willing to enter upon it on the count of fornication. Behold, I will give her into a bed, and her adulterers with herself into greatest pressure, unless they shall have repented of her works. I am content with the fact that, between apostles, there is a common agreement in rules of faith and of discipline. For, whether, it be, I, says, Paul, or they, thus we preach. Accordingly, it is material to the interest of the whole sacrament, to believe nothing conceded by John, which has been taffy refused by Paul. This harmony of the Holy Spirit whoever observes, shall by him be conducted into his meanings. For, the angel of the fire Tyrene church, was secretly introducing into the church, and urging justly to repentance, an heretical woman, who had taken upon herself to teach what she had learned from the Nicolaitans. For who has a doubt that an heretic, deceived by, a spurious baptismal, right, upon discovering his mischance, and expiating it by repentance, both attains pardon, and is restored to the bosom of the church, whence even among us, as being on a par with an heathen, nay even more than heathen, an heretic likewise, such an one, is purged through the baptism of truth from each character, and admitted, to the church. Or else, if you are certain, that that woman had, after a living faith, subsequently expired, and turned heretic, in order that you may claim pardon as a result of repentance, not as it were for an heretical, but as it were for a believing, sinner, let her, I grant, repent, but with the view of ceasing from adultery, not however in the prospect of restoration, to church fellowship, as well. For this will be a repentance which we too, acknowledge to be due much more, than you do, but which we reserve, for pardon, to God. In short, this apocalypse, in its later passages, has assigned the infamous and fornicators, as well as the cowardly, and unbelieving, and murderers, and sorcerers, and idolaters, who have been guilty of any such crime, while professing the faith, to the lake of fire, without any conditional condemnation. For it will not appear to savor of, a bearing upon, heathens, since it has, just, pronounced with regard to believers, they who shall have conquered, shall have this inheritance, and I will be to them a god, and they to me for sons, and so has subjoined, but to the cowardly, and unbelieving, and infamous, and fornicators, and murderers, and sorcerers, and idolaters shall be, a share in the lake of fire and sulphur, which, lake, is the second death. 
Thus too, again blessed they who act according to the precepts, that they may have power over the tree of life, and over the gates, for entering into the holy city, dogs, sorcerers, fornicators, murderers, out, of, courts, such as do not act according to the precepts, for to be sent out is the portion of those who have been with them. Moreover what have I to do to judge them who are without, had preceded, the sentence is now in question. From the epistle also of John they forthwith call, a proof, it is said, the blood of his son purifieth us utterly from every sin, always then, and in every form, we will sin, if always and from every sin he utterly purifies us, or else, if not always, not again after believing, and if not from sin, not again from fornication. But what is the point whence, John, has started, he had predicated God to be light, and that darkness is not in him, and that we lie, if we say, that we have communion with him, and walk in darkness, if, however, he sap, we walk in the light, we shall have communion with him, and the blood of Jesus Christ our Lord purifieth us utterly from every sin, walking, then, in the light, do we sin, and, sinning in the light, shall we be utterly purified by no means. For he who sins is not in the light, but in darkness. Whence too, he points out the mode in which we shall be utterly purified from sin, walking in the light, in which sin cannot be committed. Accordingly, the sense in which he says we are utterly purified is, not in so far as we sin, but in so far as we do not sin. For, walking in the light, but not having communion with darkness, we shall act as they that are utterly purified, sin not being quite laid down but not being wittingly committed. For this is the virtue of the Lord's blood, that such as it has already purified from sin, and thenceforward has set in the light, it renders thenceforward pure, if they shall continue to persevere walking in the light. But he subjoins, you say, if we say, that we have not sin, we are seducing ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, faithful and just is he to remit them to us, and utterly purify us from every unrighteousness. Does he say from impurity? Or else, if that is so, then, he utterly purifies us, from idolatry too. But there is a difference in the sense. For see yet again, if we say, he says, that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. All the more fully, little children, these things have I written to you, lest ye sin, and if ye shall have sinned, an advocate we have with God the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and, he is the propitiation for our sins. According to these words, you say, it will be admitted both that we sin, and that we have pardoned. What, then, will become, of your theory, when, proceeding, with the epistle, I find something different? For he affirms, that we do not sin at all, and to this end he treats at large, that he may make no such concession, setting forth that sins have been once for all deleted by Christ, not subsequently to obtain pardon, in which statement the sense requires us, to apply the statement, to an admonition to chastity. Every one, he says, who hath this hope, maketh himself chaste, because he too is chaste. Every one who doeth sin, doeth with all iniquity, and sin is iniquity. And ye know that he hath, been manifested to take away sins henceforth, of course, to be no more incurred, if it is true, as it is, that he subjoins, every one who abideth in him sinneth not, every one who sinneth neither hath seen nor knoweth him. Little children, let none seduce you. Every one who doeth righteousness is righteous, as he withal is righteous. He who doeth sin is of the devil, inasmuch as the devil sinneth from the beginning. For unto this end, was manifested the Son of God, to undo the works of the devil, for he has undone them withal, by setting man free through baptism, the handwriting of death having been made a gift of to him, and accordingly, he who is being born of God doeth not sin, because the seed of God abideth in him, and he cannot sin, because he hath, been born of God. Herein are manifest the sons of God and the sons of the devil, wherein, except it be, thus, the former by not sinning, from the time, that they were born from God, the latter by sinning, because they are from the devil, just as if they never were born from God. But if he says, he who is not righteous is not of God, how shall he who is not modest again become, a son, of God, who has already ceased to be so? 
It is therefore nearly equivalent to saying that John has forgotten himself, asserting, in the former part of his epistle, that we are not without sin, but now prescribing that we do not sin at all, and in the one case flattering us somewhat with hope of pardon, but in the other as setting with all stringency that whoever may have sinned are no sons of God, but away with the thought, for not even we ourselves forget the distinction between sins, which was the starting point of our digression. And, a right distinction it was, for John has here sanctioned it, in that there are some sins of daily committal, to which we all are liable, for who will be free from the accident of either being angry unjustly, and retaining his anger beyond sunset, or else even using manual violence or else carelessly speaking evil, or else rashly swearing, or else forfeiting his plighted word or else lying. From bashfulness or necessity? In businesses, in official duties, in trade, in food, in sight, in hearing, by how great temptations are we plied, so that, if there were no pardon for such sins as these, salvation would be unattainable to any, of these, then, there will be pardoned, through the successful suppliant of the Father, Christ, but there are two, the contraries of these, as the graver and destructive ones, such as are incapable of pardoned murder, idolatry, fraud, apostasy, blasphemy, and, have come to, adultery and fornication, and if there be any other violation of the temple of God, for these Christ will no more be the successful header, these will not at all be incurred by one who has been born of God, who will cease to be the son of God, if he do incur them. Thus John's rule of diversity will be established, arranging as he does a distinction of sins, while he now admits, and now denies, that the sons of God sin. For, in making these assertions, he was looking forward to the final clause of his letter, and for that, final clause, he was laying his preliminary bases, intending to say, in the end, more manifestly, if any now of his brother, to be sinning a sin not unto death. He shall make request, and the Lord shall give life to him who sinneth not unto death. For there is a sin unto death, not concerning that do I say, that one should make request. He, too, as I have been, was mindful that Jeremiah had been prohibited by God to deprecate him, on behalf of a people which was committing mortal sins. Every unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin unto death. But we know, that every one who hath, been born of God sinneth not, to wit, the sin which is unto death. Thus there is no course left for you, but either to deny, that adultery and fornication are mortal sins, or else to confess them irremissible, for which it is not permitted even to make successful intercession. Chapter 20 From Apostolic Teaching Tertullian turns to that of companions of the Apostles, and of the Law. The discipline, therefore, of the apostles properly, so called, indeed, instructs and determinately directs, as a principal point, the overseer of all sanctity as regards the temple of God to the universal eradication of every sacrilegious outrage upon modesty, without any mention of restoration. I wish, however, redundantly to superb the testimony likewise of one particular comrade of the apostles, a testimony, aptly suited for confirming, by most proximate right, the discipline of his masters. For there is extant with all an epistle to the Hebrews under the name of Barnabas, a man sufficiently accredited by God, as being one whom Paul has stationed next to himself in the uninterrupted observance of abstinence, or else, I alone and Barnabas, have not we the power of working? And, of course, the episphere of Barnabas is more generally received among the churches than that apocryphal shepherd of adulterers. Warning, accordingly, the disciples to omit all first principles, and strive rather after perfection, and not lay again the foundations of repentance from the works of the dead, he says, for impossible it is, that they who have once been illuminated, and have tasted the heavenly gift, and have participated in the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the word of God, and found it sweet, when they shall, their age already. Setting have fallen away, should be again recalled unto repentance, crucifying again for themselves the Son of God, and dishonouring him. For the earth which hath drunk the rain often descending upon it, and hath borne grass apt for them on whose account it is tilled withal, attaineth God's blessing, but if it bring forth thorns, it is reprobate, and nigh as to cursing, whose end is, deemed, unto utter burning. He who learnt this from apostles, and taught it with apostles, never knew of any second repentance promised by apostles to the adulterer and fornicator. 
for excellently was he wont to interpret the law, and keep its figures even in, the dispensation of, the truth itself. It was with a reference, in short, to this species of discipline, that the caution was taken in the case of the leper, but if the speckled appearance shall have become efflorescent over the skin, and shall have covered the whole skin from the head even unto the feet through all the visible surface, then the priest, when he shall have seen, shall utterly cleanse him, since he hath wholly turned into white he is clean. But on the day, that there shall have been seen in such an one quick color, he is defiled, the law, would of the man who is wholly turned from the pristine habit of the flesh to the whiteness of faith, which, faith, is esteemed a defect and blemish in, the eyes of, the world, and is wholly made new. To be understood to be clean, as being no longer speckled, no longer dappled with the pristine and the new, intermixed, if, However, after the reversal, of the sentence of uncleanness, or of the old nature shall have revived with its tendencies, that which was beginning, to be thought utterly dead to sin in his flesh must again be judged unclean, and must no more be expiated by the priest. Thus adultery, sprouting again from the pristine stock, and wholly blemishing the unity of a new color from which it had been excluded, is a defect, that admits of no cleansing. Again, in the case of a house, if any spots and cavities in the party walls had been reported to the priest, before he entered to inspect that house he bids all, its contents, be taken away from it, thus the belongings of the house would not be unclean. Then the priest, if, upon entering, he had found greenish or reddish cavities, and their appearance to the sight deeper down within the body of the party wall, was to go out to the gate, and separate the house for a period within seven days. Then, upon returning on the seventh day, if he should have perceived the taint, to have become diffused in the party walls, he was to order those stones in which the taint of the leprosy had been to be extracted, and cast away outside the city into an unclean place, and other stones, polished and sound, to be taken and replaced in the stead of the first, and the house to be plastered with other mortar. For, in coming to the high priest of the Father Christ all impediments must first be taken away, in the space of a week, that the house which remains, the flesh and the soul, may be clean, and when the word of God has entered it, and has found stains of red and green, forthwith must the deadly and sanguinary passions be extracted, and cast away out of doors for the apocalypse what thou has set death upon a green horse, but a warrior upon a red, and in their stead, must be under strewn stones polished, and apt for conjunction, and firm, such as are made, by God, into, sons, of Abraham, that thus the man may be fit for God. But if, after the recovery and reformation, the priest again perceived in the same house sort of the pristine disorders and blemishes, he pronounced it unclean, and bad the timbers, and the stones, and all the structure of it, to be pulled down, and cast away into an unclean place. This will be the man, flesh and soul, who, subsequently to reformation, after baptism and the entrance of the priests, again resumes the scabs and stains of the flesh, and is case away outside the city into an unclean place, surrendered, to wit, to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, and is no more rebuilt in the church after his ruin. So too, with regard to lying with a female slave, who had been betrothed to an husband, but not yet redeemed, not yet set free, provision, says, the law, shall be made for her, and she shall not die, because she was not yet manumitted for him for whom she was being kept. For flesh not yet manumitted to Christ, for whom it was being kept, used to be contaminated with impunity, so now, after manumission, it no more receives pardon. Chapter. 21st, of the difference between discipline and power, and of the power of the keys. If the apostles understood these, figurative meanings of the law, better, of course they were more careful, with regard to them than even apostolic men. But I will descend even to this point of contest now, making a separation between the doctrine of apostles and their power. Discipline governs a man, power sets a seal upon him, apart from the fact, that power is the spirit, but the spirit is God. What, moreover, used, the Spirit, to teach, that there must be no communicating with the works of darkness, observe what he bids, who, moreover, was able to forgive sins, this is his alone prerogative, for who remitteth sins but God alone, and, of course, who but he can remit, mortal sins, such as have been committed against himself, and against his temple, 
4. As far as you are concerned, such as are chargeable with offense against you personally, you are commanded, in the person of Peter, to forgive even seventy times sevenfold. And so, if it were agreed, that even the blessed apostles had granted any such indulgence, to any crime, the pardon of which, comes, from God, not from man, it would be competent, for them, to have done so, not in the exercise of discipline, but of power. For they both raised the dead, which God alone, can do, and restored the debilitated to their integrity, which none but Christ, can do, nay, they inflicted plagues too, which Christ would not do, for it did not beseem him to be severe who had come to suffer. Smitten were both Ananias and Elymas, Ananias with death, Elymas with blindness in order, that by this very fact it might be proved that Christ had had the power of doing even such, miracles. So too, had the prophets, of old, granted to the repentant the pardon of murder, and the width of adultery, inasmuch as they gave, at the same time, manifest proofs of seventy. Exhibit therefore even now to me, apostolic sir, prophetic evidences, that I may recognize your divine virtue, and vindicate to yourself the power of remitting such sins. If, however, you have had the functions of discipline alone allotted you, and, the duty, of presiding not imperially, but ministerially, who or how great are you, that you should grant indulgence, who, by exhibiting neither the prophetic nor the apostolic character, lack that virtue whose property it is to indulge. But, you say, the church has the power of forgiving sins. This I acknowledge and judge more, than you, I, who have the paraclete himself in the persons of the new prophets, saying, the church has the power to forgive sins, but I will not do it, lest they commit others with all. What if a pseudo-prophetic spirit has made that declaration? May, but it would have been more the part of a subverter on the one hand, to commend himself on the score of clemency, and on the other, to influence all others to sin. Or if, again, the pseudo-prophetic spirit, has been eager to affect this, sentiment, in accordance with the spirit of truth, it follows that the spirit of truth has indeed the power of indulgently granting pardon to fornicators, but wills not to do it, if it involve evil to the majority. I now inquire into your opinion, to see, from what source you usurp this right to the church. If, because the Lord has said to Peter, upon this rock will I build my church, to thee have I given the keys of the heavenly kingdom, or, whatsoever thou shalt have bound, or loosed in earth, shall be bound, or loosed in the heavens, you therefore presume, that the power of binding and loosing, has derived to you, that is, to every church akin to Peter, what sort of man are you, subverting and wholly changing the manifest intention of the Lord, conferring, as that intention did, this, gift, personally upon Peter, on thee, he says, will I build my church, and, I will give to thee the keys, not to the church, and, whatsoever thou shall have based or bound, not what they shall have loosed or bound, for so with all the result teaches, in, Peter, himself the church was reared, that is, through, Peter, himself, Peter, himself essayed the key, you see what, key, men of Israel, let what I say sink into your ears, Jesus the Nazarene, a man destined by God for you, and so forth. Peter, himself, therefore, was the first to unbar, in Christ's baptism, the entrance to the heavenly kingdom, in which, kingdom, are loosed the sins, that were before time bound, and those which have not been loosed are bound, in accordance with true salvation, and Ananias he bound with the bond of death, and the weak in his feet he absolved from his defect of health. Moreover, in that dispute about the observance or non-observance of the law, Peter was the first of all to be endued with the Spirit, and, after making preface touching the calling of the nations, to say, and now why, are ye tempting the Lord, concerning the imposition upon the brethren of a yoke which neither we nor our fathers were able to support? But however, through the grace of Jesus we believe, that we shall be saved them the same way as they. This sentence both loosed those parts of the law which were abandoned, and bound those which were reserved. Hence the power of loosing, and of binding committed to Peter, had nothing to do with the capital sins of believers, and if the Lord had given him a precept, that he must grant pardon to a brother sinning against him even seventy times sevenfold, of course he would have commanded him to bind that is, to retain, nothing subsequently, unless perchance such, sins, as one may have committed against the Lord, not against a brother. For the forgiveness of, sins, 
committed in the case of a man is a prejudgment against the remission of sins against God. What, now, has this to do, with the church, and, your, church, indeed, psychic? For, in accordance with the person of Peter, it is to spiritual men, that this power will correspondently appertain, either to an apostle, or else to a prophet. For the very church itself is, properly and principally, the Spirit himself, in whom is the trinity of the one divinity Father, Son and Holy Spirit. The Spirit, combines that church which the Lord has made to consist in three, and thus, from that time forward, every number, of persons, who may have combined together into this faith is accounted a church, from the author and consecrator, of the church, and accordingly the church, it is true, will forgive sins, but, it will be, the church of the spirit, by means of a spiritual man, not the church which consists of a number of bishops, for the right and arbitrament is the Lord's, not the servants, God's himself, not the priests, chapter, 22nd, of martyrs, and their intercession on behalf of scandalous offenders. But you go so far as to lavish this power upon martyrs withal. No sooner has any one, acting on a preconceived arrangement, put on the bonds, bonds, moreover, which, in the nominal custody now in vogue, are soft ones than adulterers beset him, fornicators gain access to him, instantly prayers echo around him, instantly pools of tears from the eyes, of all the polluted surround him, nor are there any who are more diligent in purchasing entrance into the prison than they who have lost, the fellowship of, the church. Men and women are violated in the darkness with which the habitual indulgence of lusts has plainly familiarized them, and they seek peace at the hands of those who are risking their own. Others betake them to the mines, and return, in the character of communicants, from thence, where by this time another martyrdom is necessary for sins committed after martyrdom. Well, who on earth, and in the flesh is faultless? What martyr continues to be, an inhabitant of the world supplicating, pence in hand, subject to physician and usurer? Suppose, now, your martyr beneath the glaive, with head already steadily poised, suppose him on the cross, with body already outstretched, suppose him at the stake, with the lion already let loose, suppose him on the axle, with the fire already heaped, in the very certainty, I say, and possession of martyrdom, who permits man to condone, offenses, which are to be reserved for God by whom those, offenses, have been condemned without discharge, which not even apostles, so far as I know, martyrs with all themselves have judged condonable. In short, Paul had already fought with beasts at Ephesus, when he decreed destruction to the incestuous person. Let it suffice to the martyr, to have purged his own sins, it is a part of ingratitude, or of pride to lavish upon others also what one has obtained at a high price who has redeemed another's death by his own, but the Son of God alone. For even in his very passion he set the robber free. For to this end had he come, that, being himself pure from sin, and in all respects holy, he might undergo death on behalf of sinners. Similarly, you who emulate him in condoning sins, if you yourself have done no sin, plainly suffer in my stead. If, however, you are a sinner, how will the oil of your puny torch be able to suffice for you and for me? I have, even now, a test whereby to prove, the presence of, Christ, in you. If Christ is in the martyr for this reason, that the martyr may absolve adulterers and fornicators, let him tell publicly the secrets of the heart, that he may thus concede, pardon to, sins, and he is Christ. For thus it was, that the Lord Jesus Christ showed his power, why think ye evil in your hearts? For which is easier, to say to the paralytic, Thy sins are omitted thee, or, rise and walk. Therefore, that ye may know the Son of Man, to have the power upon earth of remitting sins, I say to thee, paralytic, rise, and walk. If the Lord set so much store by the proof of his power as to reveal thoughts, and so impart health by his command, lest he should not be believed to have the power of remitting sins, it is not lawful for me to believe the same power, to reside, in any one, whoever he be, without the same proofs. In the act, however, of urgently entreating from a martyr pardon for adulterers and fornicators, you yourself confess that crimes of that nature are not to be washed away, except by the martyrdom of the criminal himself, while you presume, they can be washed away, by another's if this is so, then martyrdom will be another baptism. For I have withal, Sethi, another baptism. 
whence too, it was that there flowed out of the wound in the Lord's side water and blood, the materials of either baptism, I ought, then, by the first baptism to to, have the fight of, setting another free, if I can buy the second, and we must necessarily force upon the mind, of our opponents this conclusion, whatever authority, whatever reason, restores ecclesiastical peace to the adulterer and fornicator, the same will be bound to come to the aid of the murderer and idolater in their repentance, at all events, of the apostate, and of course of him whom, in the battle of his confession, after hard struggling with torments, savagery has overthrown. Besides, it were unworthy of God, and of his mercy, who prefers the repentance of a sinner to his death, that they should have easier return into, the bosom of, the church who had fallen in heat of passion, than they who had fallen in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Indignation urges us to speak, contaminated bodies you will recall, rather than gory ones, which repentance is more pitiable, that which prostrates tickled flesh, or lacerated which pardon is, in all causes, more justly concessible, that which a voluntary, or that which an involuntary, sinner implores. No one is compelled with his will to apostatize, no one against his will commits fornication. Lust is exposed to no violence, except itself, it knows no coercion whatever. Apostasy, on the contrary, what ingenuities of butchery and tribes of penal inflictions enforce which has more truly apostatized, he who has lost Christ amid agonies, or, he who has done so, amid the lights, he who when losing him grieved, or he who when losing him sported, and yet those scars graven on the Christian combatant, scars, of course, enviable in the eyes of Christ, because they yearned after conquest, and thus also glorious, because failing to conquer they yielded, scars, after which even the devil himself yet sighs, scars, with an infelicity of their own, but a chaste one, with a repentance that mourns, but blushes not to the Lord for pardon will anew be remitted to such, because their apostasy was express wearable. In their case alone is the flesh weak, nay, no flesh so strong, as that which crushes out the spirit. Translated by the Reverend S. L. Wall. Tertullian on Monogamy Chapter 1. Different views in regard to marriage held by heretics, psychic, and spiritualists. Heretics do away with marriages, psychics accumulate them, the former many not even once, the latter not only once. What dost thou, law of the Creator? between alien eunuchs and thine own grooms, thou complainest as much of the over-obedience of thine own household as of the contempt of strangers, they who abuse thee, do thee equal hurt with them who use thee not, in fact, neither is such continence laudable because it is heretical, nor such license defensible because it is psychical, the former is blasphemous, the latter wanton, the former destroys the god of marriages, the latter puts him to the blush among us, however, whom the recognition of spiritual gifts entitles to be deservedly called spiritual, continence is as religious as license is modest, since both the one and the other are in harmony with the Creator. Continence honors the law of marriage, license tempers it, the former is not forced, the latter is regulated, the former recognizes the power of free choice, the latter recognizes a limit. We admit one marriage, just as we do one God. The law of marriage reaps an accession of honor where it is associated with shamefacedness, but to the psychics, since they receive not the spirit, the things which are the spirits are not pleasing. Thus, so long as the things which are the spirits please them not, the things which are of the flesh will please, as being the contraries of the spirit, the flesh, saith, the apostle, lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, but what will the flesh thus after? except what is more of the flesh, for which reason withal, in the beginning, it became estranged from the spirit, my spirit, saith, God, shall not permanently abide in these men eternally, for that they are flesh. Chapter 2 The spiritualists vindicated from the charge of novelty, and so they upbraid the discipline of monogamy with being a heresy, nor is there any other cause whence they find themselves compelled to deny the paraclet more than the fact that they esteem him to be the institutor of a novel discipline, and a discipline which they find most harsh, so that this is already the first ground on which we must join issue in a general handling of the subject, whether there is room for maintaining that the paraclet has taught any such thing as can either be charged with novelty, in opposition to Catholic tradition, or with burdensomeness, in opposition to the light burden of the Lord.
Now concerning each point the Lord himself has pronounced, for in saying, I still have many things to say unto you, but ye are not yet able to bear them, when the Holy Spirit shall be come, he will lead you into all truth, he sufficiently, of course, sets before us that he will bring such, teachings, as may be esteemed a light novel, as having never before been published, and finally burdensome, as if that were the reason why they were not published, it follows, you say, that by this line of argument, anything you please which is novel and burdensome may be ascribed to the paraclete, even if it have come from the adversary spirit, no, of course, for the adversary spirit would be apparent from the diversity of his preaching, beginning by adulterating the rule of faith, and so, going on to, adulterating the order of discipline, because the corruption of that which holds the first grade, that is, of faith, which is prior to discipline, comes first. A man must of necessity hold heretical views of God first, and then of his institution, but the paraclete, having many things to teach fully which the Lord deferred till he came, according to the predefinition, will begin by bearing emphatic witness to Christ, as being, such as we believe, him to be, together with the whole order of God the Creator, and will glorify him, and will bring to remembrance concerning him, and when he has thus been recognized, as the promised comforter, on the ground of the cardinal rule, he will reveal those many things which appertain to disciplines, while the integrity of his preaching commands credit for these, revelations, albeit they be novel, inasmuch as they are, now in course of revelation, albeit they be burdensome, inasmuch as not even now are they found bearable, revelations, however, of none other Christ than, the one, who said that he had with all other many things which were to be fully taught by the paraclete, no less burdensome to men of our own day than to them, by whom they were then not yet able to be born. Chapter 3 The question of novelty further considered in connection with the words of the Lord and his apostles. But, as for the question, whether monogamy be burdensome, let the still shameless infirmity of the flesh look to that, let us meantime come to an agreement as to whether it be novel, this, even, broader assertion we make, that even if the paraclete had in this our day definitely prescribed a virginity or continence total and absolute, so as not to permit the heat of the flesh to foam itself down even in single marriage, even thus he would seem to be introducing nothing of novelty, seeing that the Lord himself opens the kingdoms of the heavens to eunuchs, as being himself, withal, a virgin, to whom looking, the apostle also himself too for this reason abstinent gives the preference to continence, yes, you say, but saving the law of marriage, saving it, plainly, then we will see under what limitations, nevertheless already destroying it, in so far as he gives the preference to continence, good, he says, it is, for a man not to have contact with a woman, it follows that it is evil to have contact with her, for nothing is contrary to good except evil, and accordingly, he says, it remains, that both they who have wives so be as if they have not, that it may be the more binding on them who have not to abstain from having them, he renders reasons, likewise, for so advising, that the unmarried think about God, but the married about how, in, their, marriage, each may please his, partner, and I may contend, that what is permitted is not absolutely good, for what is absolutely good is not permitted, but needs no asking to make it lawful, permission has its cause sometimes even in necessity, finally, in this case, there is no volition on the part of him who permits marriage, for his volition points another way, I will, he says, that you also be as I too, and when he shows that, so to abide, is better, what, pray, does he demonstrate himself to will, but what he has promised is better, and thus, if he permits something other than what he is willed permitted not voluntarily, but of necessity he shows that what he has unwillingly granted as an indulgence is not absolutely good, finally, when he says, better it is to marry than to burn, what sort of good must that be understood to be which is better than a penalty, which cannot seem better except when compared to a thing very bad, good is that which keeps this name per se, without comparison I say not with an evil, but even with some other good, so that, even if it be compared to an overshadowed by another good, it nevertheless remains in, possession of, the name of good, if, on the other hand, comparison with evil is the mean which obliges it to be called good, it is not so much good as a species of inferior evil, which, 
when obscured by a higher evil, is driven to the name of good, taken away, in short, the condition, so as not to say, better it is to marry than to burn, and I question whether you will have the hardihood to say, better, it is, to marry, not adding that what it is better, is done, then, it becomes not better, and while not better, not good either, the condition being taken away which, while making it better than another thing, in that sense obliges it to be considered good, better it is to lose one eye than two. If, however, you withdraw from the comparison of either evil, it will not be better to have one a, because it is not even good. What, now, if he accommodatingly grants all indulgence to marry on the ground of his own, that is, of human, sense, out of the necessity which we have mentioned, inasmuch as better it is to marry than to burn. In fact, when he turns to the second case, by saying, but to the married I officially announce not I, but the Lord he shows that those things which he had said above had not been, the dictates, of the Lord's authority, but of human judgment. When, however, he turns their minds back to continence, but I will you also to be, I think, moreover, he says, I too have the Spirit of God, in order that, if he had granted any indulgence out of necessity, that, by the Holy Spirit's authority, he might recall, but John, too, when advising us that we ought so to walk as the Lord with all did, of course admonished us to walk as well in accordance with sanctity of the flesh, as in accordance with his example in other respects. Accordingly he says more manifestly, and every, man, who hath this hope in him maketh himself chaste, just as himself with all is chaste, or elsewhere, again, we read, Be ye holy just as he withal was holy in the flesh, namely, for of the spirit he would not have said, that, inasmuch as the spirit is without any external influence recognized as holy, nor does he wait to be admonished to sanctity, which is his proper nature, but the flesh is taught sanctity, and that withal, in Christ, was holy. Therefore, if all these, considerations, obliterate the license of marrying, whether we look into the condition on which the license is granted, or the preference of continence which is imposed. Why, after the apostles, could not the same spirit, supervening for the purpose of conducting disciplehood into all truth through the gradations of the times, according to what the preacher says, a time to everything, impose by this time a final bridle upon the flesh, no longer obliquely calling us away from marriage, but openly, since now more than ever, the time has become wound up, about 160 years having elapsed since then, would you not spontaneously ponder, thus, in your own mind, this discipline is old, shown beforehand, even at that early date, in the Lord's flesh and will, and, successively thereafter in both the counsels and the examples of his apostles, of whom we are destined to this sanctity, nothing of novelty is the paraclet introducing, what he premonished, he is, now, definitively appointing, what he deferred. He is, now, exacting, and presently, by revolving these thoughts, you will easily persuade yourself that it was much more competent to the paraclet to preach unity of marriage, who could withal have preached its annulling, and that it is more credible that he should have tempered what it would have become him even to have abolished, if you understand what Christ's will is. Herein also you ought to recognize the paraclet in his character of comforter, in that he excuses your infirmity from the stringency of, an absolute continence. Chapter, 4, Waving Allusion to the Paraclet, Tertullian comes to the consideration of the ancient scriptures, and their testimony on the subject in hand, waving, now, the mention of the Paraclet, as of some authority of our own. Evolve we the common instruments of the primitive scriptures. This very thing is demonstrable by us, that the rule of monogamy is neither novel nor strange, nay rather, is both ancient, and proper to Christians, so that you may be sensible that the paraclet is rather its restitutor than institutor. As for what pertains to antiquity, what more ancient formal type can be brought forward, than the very original fount of the human race? One female did God fashion for the male, culling one rib of his, and, of course, one, out of a plurality. But, moreover, in the introductory speech which preceded the work itself, he said, it is not good for the man that he be alone, let us make an help meet for him. For he would have said helpers if he had destined him to have more wives, than one. He added, 
two, a law concerning the future, if, that is, the words, and two shall be, made, into one flesh not three, nor more, else they would be no more two if, there were, more were prophetically uttered, the law stood, firm, in short, the unity of marriage lasted to the very end in the case of the authors of our race, not because there were no other women, but because the reason why there were none was that the first fruits of the race might not be contaminated by a double marriage, otherwise, had God willed, there could with all have been, others, at all events, he might have taken from the abundance of his own daughters having no less than Eve, taken, out of his own bones and flesh if piety had allowed it to be done, but where the first crime, is found homicide, inaugurated in fratricide no crime was so worthy of the second place as a double marriage, for it makes no difference whether a man have had two wives singly, or whether individuals, taken, at the same time have made two, the number of, the individuals, conjoined and separate is the same, still, God's institution, after once for all suffering violence through Lamech, remained firm to the very end of that race, second Lamech there arose none, in the way of being husband to two wives, what scripture does not note, it denies, other iniquities provoke the deluge, iniquities, once for all avenged, whatever was their nature, not, however, seventy-seven times, which, is the vengeance which, double marriages have deserved, but again, the reformation of the second human race is traced from monogamy as its mother, once more, two, joined, into one flesh undertake, the duty of, growing and multiplying, Noah, namely, and his wife, and their sons, in single marriage, even in the very animals monogamy is recognized, for fear that even beasts should be born of adultery, out of all beasts, he said, God, out of all flesh, two shall thou lead into the ark, that they may live with thee, male and female, they shall be, taken, from all flying animals according to, their, kind and from all creepers of the earth according to their kind, two out of all shall enter unto thee, male and female, in the same formula, two, he doth orders sets of sevens, made up of pairs, to be gathered to him, consisting of male and female one male and one female what more shall I say, even unclean birds were not allowed to enter with two females each, chapter 5. Connection of these primeval testimonies with Christ, thus far for the testimony of things primordial, and the sanction of our origin, and the prejudgment of the divine institution, which of course is a law, not, merely, a memorial inasmuch as, if it was, so done from the beginning, we find ourselves directed to the beginning by Christ, just as, in the question of divorce, by saying that that had been permitted by Moses on account of their hard-heartedness but from the beginning it had not been so, he doubtless recalls to the beginning the, law of, the individuality of marriage, and accordingly, those whom God from the beginning conjoined, two into one flesh, man shall not at the present day separate, the apostle, two, writing to the Ephesians, says that God had proposed in himself, at the dispensation of the fulfillment of the times, to recall to the head, that is, to the beginning, things universal in Christ, which are above the heavens and above the earth in him, so, two, the two letters of Greece, the first and the last, the Lord assumes to himself, as figures of the beginning and end, which concur in himself, so that, just as Alpha rolls until it reaches Omega, and again Omega rolls back till it reaches Alpha, in the same way he might show that in himself is both the downward course of the beginning unto the end, and the backward course of the end up to the beginning, so that every economy, ending in him through whom it began comma through the word of God, that is, who was made flesh comma may have an end correspondent to its beginning, and so truly in Christ are all things recalled to the beginning, that even faith returns from circumcision to the integrity of that, original, flesh, as it was from the beginning, and freedom of meats and abstinence from blood alone, as it was from the beginning, and the individuality of marriage, as it was from the beginning, and the restriction of divorce, which was not from the beginning, and lastly, the whole man into paradise, where he was from the beginning, why, then, ought he not to restore Adam thither at least as a monogamist, who cannot present him in so entire perfection as he was when dismissed thence, accordingly, so far as pertains to the restitution of the beginning, the logic both of the dispensation you live under, and of your hope, exact this from you, 
that what was from the beginning, should be, in accordance with the beginning, which, beginning, you find counted in Adam, and recounted in Noah. Make your election, in which of the twain you account your beginning, in both. The sensorial power of monogamy claims you for itself, but again, if the beginning passes on to the end, as alpha to omega, as the end passes back to the beginning, as omega to alpha, and thus our origin is transferred to Christ, the animal to the spiritual inasmuch as, that was, not first which is spiritual, but, that, which animal, then what spiritual, let us, in like manner, as before, see whether you owe this very, same, thing to the second origin also, whether the last Adam also meet you in the self same form as the first, since the last Adam, that is, Christ, was entirely unwedded, as was even the first Adam before his exile, but, presenting to your weakness the gift of the example of his own flesh, the more perfect Adam that is, Christ, more perfect on this account as well, as on others, that he was more entirely pure stands before you, if you are willing, to copy him, as a voluntary celibate in the flesh, if, however, you are unequal, to that perfection, he stands before you a monogamist in spirit, having one church as his spouse, according to the figure of Adam and of Eve, which, figure, the apostle interprets of that great sacrament of Christ in the church, teaching that, to the spiritual, it was analogous to the carnal monogamy, you see, therefore, after what manner, renewing your origin even in Christ, you cannot trace down that, origin, without the profession of monogamy, unless, that is, you be in flesh what he is in spirit, albeit with all, what he was in flesh, you equally ought to have been, chapter, vi. the case of Abraham, an ITS bearing on the present question, but let us proceed with our inquiry into some eminent chief fathers of our origin, for there are some to whom our monogamous parents Adam and Noah are not pleasing, nor perhaps Christ either, to Abraham, in fine, they appeal, prohibited though they are to acknowledge any other father than God, grant, now, that Abraham is our father, grant, too, that Paul is, in the gospel, says he, I have begotten you, show yourself a son even of Abraham, for your origin in him, you must know, is not referable to every period of his life, there is a definite time at which he is your father, for if faith is the source whence we are reckoned to Abraham as his sons, as the apostle teaches, saying to the Galatians, you know, consequently, that, they, who are of faith, these are sons of Abraham, when did Abraham believe God and it was accounted to him for righteousness? I suppose when still in monogamy, since, he was, not yet in circumcision, but if afterwards, he changed to either, opposite to digamy through cohabitation with his handmaid, and to circumcision through the seal of the testament you cannot acknowledge him as your father except at that time when he believed God, if it is true that it is according to faith that you are his son, not according to flesh, else. If it be the later Abraham whom you follow as your father that is, the digamist, Abraham receive him with all in his circumcision. If you reject his circumcision, it follows that you will refuse his digamy too. Two characters of his mutually diverse in two several ways. You will not be able to blend. His digamy began with circumcision, his monogamy with uncircumcision. You receive digamy, admit circumcision too. You retain uncircumcision. You are bound to monogamy too. Moreover, so true is it that it is of the monogamist Abraham that you are the son, just as of the uncircumcised, that if you be circumcised you immediately cease to be his son, inasmuch as you will not be of faith, but of the seal of a faith which had been justified in uncircumcision. You bear the apostle, learn, of him, together with the Galatians, in like manner, too, if you have involved yourself in digamy. You are not the son of that Abraham whose faith proceeded in monogamy, for albeit it is subsequently that he is called a father of many nations, still it is of those nations, who, as the fruit of the faith which precedes digamy, had to be accounted sons of Abraham, thenceforward let matters see to themselves, figures are one thing, laws another, images are one thing, statutes another, images pass away when fulfilled. Statutes remain permanently to be fulfilled, images prophesy, statutes govern, what that digamy of Abraham portends, the same apostle fully teaches, the interpreter of each testament, 
just as he likewise lays it down that our seed is called in Isaac. If you are of the free woman, and belong to Isaac, he, at all events, maintained unity of marriage to the last. These accordingly, I suppose, are they in whom my origin is counted. All others I ignore, and if I glance around at their examples, examples, of some David heaping up marriages for himself even through sanguinary means, of some Solomon rich in wives as well as in other riches you are bidden to follow the better things, and you have with all Joseph but once wedded, and on this score I venture to say better than his father, you have Moses, the intimate eyewitness of God, you have Aaron the chief priest, the second Moses, also, of the second people, who led our representatives into the, possession of, the promise of God, in whom the name, of Jesus, was first inaugurated, was no digamist. Chapter, 7, from Patriarchal, Tertullian comes to legal, precedence. After the ancient examples of the patriarchs, let us equally pass on to the ancient documents of the legal scriptures, that we may treat in order of all our canon. And since there are some who sometimes assert that they have nothing to do with the law, which Christ has not dissolved, but fulfilled, sometimes catch at such parts of the law as they choose. Plainly do we too assert that the law has deceased in this sense, that its burdens according to the sentence of the apostles which not even the fathers were able to sustain, have wholly ceased, such, parts, however, as relate to righteousness not only permanently remain reserved, but even amplified, in order, to be sure, that our righteousness may be able to redound above the righteousness of the scribes and of the Pharisees. If righteousness must, of course chastity must too. If, then, for as much as there is in the law a precept that a man is to take in marriage the wife of his brother if he have died without children, for the purpose of raising up seed to his brother, and this may happen repeatedly to the same person, according to that crafty question of the Sadducees, Men for that reason think that frequency of marriage is permitted in other cases as well. It will be their duty to understand first the reason of the precept itself, and thus they will come to know that that reason, now ceasing, is among those parts of the law which have been cancelled. Necessary it was that there should be a succession to the marriage of a brother if he died childless. First, because that ancient benediction, grow and multiply, had still to run its course. Secondly, because the sins of the fathers used to be exacted even from the sons. Thirdly, because eunuchs and barren persons used to be regarded as ignominious, and thus, for fear that such as had died childless, not from natural inability, but from being prematurely overtaken by death, should be judged equally accursed, with the other class, for this reason of vicarious and, so to say, posthumous offspring used to be supplied them. But, now, when the extremity of the times has cancelled, the command, grow and multiply, since the apostle superinduces, another command, it remaineth, that both they who have wives so be as if they have not, because the time is compressed, and the sour grape chewed by the fathers has ceased to set the son's teeth on edge, for, each one shall die in his own sin, and eunuchs not only have lost ignominy, but have even deserved grace, being invited into the kingdoms of the heavens. The law of succeeding to the wife of a brother being buried, its contrary has obtained that of not succeeding to the wife of a brother. And thus, as we have said before, what has ceased to be valid, on the cessation of its reason, cannot furnish a ground of argument to another. Therefore a wife, when her husband is dead, will not marry. For if she marry, she will of course be marrying, his, brother, for all we are brethren. Again, the woman, if intending to marry, as to marry in the Lord, that is, not to an heathen, but to a brother, inasmuch as even the ancient law forbids marriage with members of another tribe, since, moreover, even in Leviticus there is a caution, whoever shall have taken, his, brother's wife, is uncleanness turpitude, without children shall die, beyond doubt, while the man is prohibited from marrying a second time, the woman is prohibited too, having no one to marry except a brother, in what way? Then, an agreement shall be established between the apostle and the law, which he is not impugning in its entirety, shall be shown when we shall have come to his own epistle. Meantime, so far as pertains to the law, the lines of argument drawn from it are more suitable for us, than for our opponents. In short, the same, law, 
prohibits priests from marrying a second time, the daughter also of a priest at bids, if widowed or repudiated, if she have had no seed, to return into her father's home and be nourished from his bread. The reason why, it is said, if she have had no seed, is not that if she have she may marry again for how much more will she abstain from marrying if she have sons question mark but that, if she have, she may be nourished by her son rather than by her father, in order that the son, too, may carry out the precept of God, honor father and mother, us, moreover, Jesus, the father's highest and great priest, clothing us from his own store inasmuch as they who are baptized in Christ have put on Christ has made priests to God his father, according to John, for the reason why he recalled that young man who was hastening to his father's obsequies, is that he may show that we are called priests by him, priests, whom the law used to forbid to be present at the sepulture of parents, over every dead soul, it says, the priest shall not enter, and over his own father and over his own mother he shall not be contaminated, does it follow that we too are bound to observe this prohibition, no, of course, for our one father, God, lives, and our mother, the church, and neither are we dead who live to God, nor do we bury our dead, inasmuch as they too, are living in Christ. At all events, priests we are called by Christ, debtors to monogamy, in accordance with the pristine law of God, which prophesied at that time of us in its own priests. Chapter 8, from the law Tertullian comes to the Gospel. He begins with examples before proceeding to dogmas, turning now to the law, which is properly ours that is, to the Gospel by what kind of examples are we met until we come to definite dogmas, behold, there immediately present themselves to us, on the threshold as it were, the two priestesses of Christian sanctity, monogamy and continence, one modest, in Zechariah the priest, one absolute, in John the forerunner, one appeasing God, one preaching Christ, one proclaiming a perfect priest, one exhibiting more than a prophet, him, namely, who has not only preached or personally pointed out, but even baptized Christ, for who is more worthily to perform the initiatory rite on the body of the Lord, than flesh similar in kind to that which conceived and gave birth to that body, and indeed it was a virgin, about to marry once for all after her delivery, who gave birth to Christ, in order that each title of sanctity might be fulfilled in Christ's parentage, by means of a mother who was both virgin, and wife of one husband, again, when he is presented as an infant in the temple, who is it who receives him into his hands, who is the first to recognize him in spirit, a man just and circumspect, and of course no digamist, which is plain, even, from this consideration, lest, otherwise, Christ should presently be more worthily preached by a woman, an aged widow, and the wife of one man, who, living devoted to the temple, was, already, giving in her own person a sufficient token what sort of persons ought to be the adherents to the spiritual temple comma that is, the church, such eyewitnesses the Lord in infancy found, no different ones had he in adult age, Peter alone do I find through, the mention of, his mother-in-law, to have been married, in August I am led to presume him by consideration of the church, which, built upon him, was destined to appoint every grade of her order for monogamists, the rest, while I do not find them married, I must of necessity understand to have been either eunuchs or continent, nor indeed, if, among the Greeks, in accordance with the carelessness of custom, women and wives are classed under a common name however, there is a name proper to wives shall we therefore so interpret Paul as if he demonstrates the apostles to have had wives, or if he are disputing about marriages, as he does in the sequel, where the apostle could better have named some particular example, it would appear right for him to say, for have we not the power of leading about wives, like the other apostles and Cephas, but when he subjoins those, expressions which show his abstinence from, insisting on, the supply of maintenance, saying, for have we not the power of eating and drinking, he does not demonstrate that wives were led about by the apostles, whom even such as have not still have the power of eating and drinking, but simply women, who used to minister to them in a stone way, as they did, when accompanying the Lord. But further, if Christ reproves the scribes and Pharisees, sitting in the official chair of Moses, but not doing what they taught, what kind of supposition?
Is it that he himself withal should set upon his own official chairmen who were mindful rather to enjoin, but, not likewise to practice sanctity of the flesh, which, sanctity, he had in no ways recommended to their teaching and practicing question mark first by his own example, then by all other arguments, while he tells, them, that the kingdom of heavens is children's, while he associates with these, children, others who, after marriage, remained, or became virgins, while he calls, them, to, copy, the simplicity of the dove, a bird not merely innocuous, but modest too, and whereof one male knows one female, while he denies the Samaritan woman's, partner to be, a husband, that he may show that manifold husbandry is adultery, while, in the revelation of his own glory, he prefers, from among so many saints and prophets, to have with him Moses and Elias the one a monogamist, the other a voluntary celibate, for Elias was nothing else than John, who came in the power and spirit of Elias, while that man gluttonous and toping, the frequenter of luncheons and suppers, in the company of publicans and sinners, sups once for all at a single marriage, though, of course, many were marrying, around him, for he willed to attend, marriages, only so often as, he willed, them to be, chapter, 9, from examples Tertullian passes to direct dogmatic teachings, he begins with the Lord's teaching, but grant that these argumentations may be thought to be forced and founded on conjectures, if no dogmatic teachings have stood parallel with them which the Lord uttered in treating of divorce, which, permitted formerly, he now prohibits, first because from the beginning it was not so, like plurality of marriage, secondly, because what God hath conjoined, man shall not separate, for fear, namely, that he contravene the Lord, for he alone shall separate who is conjoined, separate, moreover, not through the harshness of divorce, which, harshness, he censures and restrains, but through the debt of death, if, indeed, one of two sparrows falleth not on the ground without the Father's will. Therefore if those whom God has conjoined man shall not separate by divorce, it is equally congruous that those whom God has separated by death man is not to conjoin by marriage, the joining of the separation will be just as contrary to God's will as would have been the separation of the conjunction, so far as regards the non-destruction of the will of God, and the restriction of the law of the beginning, but another reason, too, conspires, nay, not another, but, one which imposed the law of the beginning, and moved the will of God to prohibit divorce, the fact that Ho shall have dismissed his wife, except on the ground of adultery, makes her commit adultery and who shall have married a woman, dismissed by her husband, of course commits adultery, a divorced woman cannot even marry legitimately, and if she commit any such act without the name of marriage, does it not fall under the category of adultery, in that adultery is crime in the way of marriage, such is God's verdict, within straighter limits than men's, that universally, whether through marriage or promiscuously, the admission of a second man, to intercourse, is pronounced adultery by him, for let us see what marriage is in the eye of God, and thus we shall learn what adultery equally is, marriage is, this, when God joins two into one flesh, or else, finding, them already, joined in the same flesh, has given his seal to the conjunction, adultery is, this, when, the two having been in whatsoever way disjoined, other nay, rather alien flesh is mingled, with either, flesh concerning which it cannot be affirmed. This is flesh out of my flesh, and this bone out of my bones. For this, once for all done and pronounced, as from the beginning, so now too, cannot apply to other flesh. Accordingly, it will be without cause that you will say that God wills not a divorced woman to be joined to another man while her husband liveth, as if he do will it when he is dead, whereas if she is not bound to him when dead, no more is she when living, alike when divorce dissevers marriage as when death does, she will not be bound to him by whom the binding medium has been broken off, to whom, then, will she be bound, in the eye of God, it matters not whether she marry during her life or after his death, for it is not against him that she sins, but against herself, any sin which a man may have committed is external to the body, but, who commits adultery sins against his own body, but as we have previously laid down above whoever shall intermingle with himself other flesh, 
over and above that pristine flesh which God either conjoined into two or else found, already, conjoined, commits adultery, and the reason why he has abolished divorce, which was not from the beginning, is, that he may strengthen that which was from the beginning the permanent conjunction, namely, of two into one flesh, for fear that necessity or opportunity for a third union of flesh may make an eruption, into his dominion, permitting divorce to no cause but one if, that is, the, evil, against which precaution is taken chance to have occurred beforehand, so true, moreover, is it that divorce was not from the beginning, that among the Romans it is not till after the 600th year from the building of the city that this kind of hard-heartedness is set down as having been committed, but they indulge in promiscuous adulteries, even without divorcing, their partners, to us, even if we do divorce them, even marriage will not be lawful. Chapter 10. Street. Paul's teaching on the subject. From this point I see that we are challenged by an appeal to the Apostle, for the more easy apprehension of whose meaning we must all the more earnestly inculcate, the assertion, that a woman is more bound when her husband is dead not to admit, to marriage, another husband. For let us reflect that divorce either is caused by discord, or else causes discord, whereas death is an event resulting from the law of God, not from an offense of man and that it is a debt which all owe, even the unmarried. Therefore, if the divorced woman, who has been separated, from her husband in soul as well as body, through discord, anger, hatred, and the causes of these injury, or contumely, or whatsoever cause of complaint is bound to a personal enemy, not to say a husband, how much more will one who, neither by her own nor her husband's fault, but by an event resulting from the Lord's law, has been not separated from, but left behind by her consort, be his, even when dead, to whom, even when dead, she owes, the debt of, concord, from him from whom she has heard no, word of, divorce she does not turn away, with him she is, to whom she has written no, document of, divorce, him whom she was unwilling to have lost, she retains, she has within her the license of the mind, which represents to a man, an imaginary enjoyment, all things which he has not, in short, I ask the woman herself, tell me, sister, have you sent your husband before you, to his rest, in peace, what will she answer, will she say, in discord, in that case she is the more bound to him with whom she has a cause, to plead, at the bar of God, she who is bound, to another, has not departed, from him, but, will she say, in peace, in that case, she must necessarily persevere in that, peace, with him whom she will no longer have the power to divorce, not that she would, even if she had been able to divorce him, have been marriageable. Indeed, she prays for his soul, and requests refreshment for him meanwhile, and fellowship, with him, in the first resurrection, and she offers, her sacrifice, on the anniversaries of his falling asleep, for, unless she does these deeds, she has in the true sense divorced him, so far as in her lies, and indeed the more iniquitously inasmuch as she did it, as far as was in her power because she had no power to do it, and with the more indignity, inasmuch as it is with more indignity of her reason for doing it is, because he did not deserve it, or else showing, pray, cease to be after death, according to the teaching of some Epicurus, and not according to that of Christ. But if we believe the resurrection of the dead, of course we shall be bound to them with whom we are destined to rise, to render an account the one of the other. But if in that age they will neither marry nor be given in marriage, but will be equal to angels, is not the fact that there will be no restitution of the conjugal relation the reason why we shall not be bound to our departed consorts? Nay, but the more shall we be bound to them, because we are destined to a better estate destined as we are to rise to a spiritual consortship, to recognize as well our own selves as them who are ours, else how shall we sing thanks to God to eternity? If there shall remain in us no sense and memory of this debt, if we shall be reformed in substance, not in consciousness, consequently, we who shall be with God shall be together, since we shall all be with the one God albeit the wages be various, albeit there be many mansions in the house of the same father having labored for the one penny of the self same hire, that is, of eternal life, in which, eternal life, God wills to less separate them whom he has conjoined, 
than in this lesser life, he forbids them to be separated, since this is so, how will a woman have room for another husband, who is, even to futurity, in the possession of her own, moreover, we speak to each sex, even if our discourse address itself but to the one, inasmuch as one discipline is incumbent, on both, she will have one in spirit, one in flesh, this will be adultery, a conscious affection of one woman for two men, if the one has been disjoined from her flesh, but remains in her heart in that place where even cogitation without carnal contact achieves beforehand both adultery by concupiscence, and matrimony by volition he is to the sour her husband, possessing the very thing which is the mean whereby he became so her mind, namely, in which withal, if another shall find a habitation, this will be a crime, besides, excluded he is not, if he has withdrawn from vile or carnal commerce, a more honorable husband is he, in proportion as he has become more pure. Chapter 11, further remarks upon St. Paul's teaching, grant, now, that you marry in the Lord, in accordance with the law and the apostle if, notwithstanding, you care even about this with what face do you request, the solemnizing of, a matrimony which is unlawful to those of whom you request it, of a monogamous bishop, of presbyters and deacons bound by the same solemn engagement, of widows whose order you have in your own person refused, and they, plainly, will give husbands and wives as they would morsels of bread, for this is the rendering of to everyone who asketh thee thou shalt give, and they will join you together in a virgin church, the one betrothed of the one Christ, and you will pray for your husbands, the new and the old. Make your election, to which of the twain you will play the adulteress, I think, to both. But if you have any wisdom, be silent on behalf of the dead one. Let your silence be to him a divorce, already endorsed in the dodo gifts of another. In this way you will earn the new husband's favor. If you forget the old, you ought to take more pains to please him for whose sake you have not preferred to please God. Such, convict, the psychics will have it the apostle approved or else totally failed to think about, when he wrote, the woman is bound for such length of time as her husband liveth, but if he shall have died, she is free, whom she will let her marry, only in the Lord, for it is out of this passage that they draw their defense of the license of second marriage, nay, even of, marriages, to any amount, if of second, marriage, that which has ceased to be one stop for all is open to any and every number, but the sense in which the apostle did write will be apparent, if first an agreement be come to that he did not write it in the sense of which the psychics avail themselves, such an agreement, moreover, will be come to if one first recall to mind those, passages, which are diverse from the passage in question, when tried by the standard of doctrine, of volition, and of Paul's own discipline, for, if he permits second nuptials, which were not from the beginning, how does he affirm that all things are being recollected to the beginning in Christ, if he wills us to iterate conjugal connections? How does he maintain that our seed is called in the but once married Isaac as its author? How does he make monogamy the base of his disposition of the whole ecclesiastical order, if this rule does not antecedently hold good in the case of laics, from whose ranks the ecclesiastical order proceeds? How does he call away from the enjoyment of marriage such as are still in the married position? saying that the time is wound up, if he calls back again into marriage such as through death had escaped from marriage, if these, passages, are diverse from that one about which the present question is, it will be agreed, as we have said, that he did not write in that sense thought of which the psychics avail themselves, inasmuch as it is easier, of belief, that that one passage should have some explanation agreeable with the others, than that an apostle should seem to have taught, principles, mutually diverse, that explanation we shall be able to discover in the subject matter itself. What was the subject matter which led the Apostle to write such words? The inexperience of a new and just rising church, which he was rearing, to wit, with milk, not yet with a solid food of stronger doctrine, an experience so great, that that infancy of faith prevented them from yet knowing what they were to do in regard of carnal and sexual necessity, the very phases themselves of this inexperience are intelligible from the apostles, rescripts, when he says, but concerning these things, which ye write, good it is for a man not to touch a woman, but, on account of fornications, let each one have his own wife, he shows that there were who, having been apprehended by the faith in, 
the state of marriage, were apprehensive that it might not be lawful for them thenceforward to enjoy their marriage, because they had believed on the holy flesh of Christ, and yet it is by way of allowance that he makes the concession, not by way of command, that is, indulging, not enjoining, the practice. On the other hand, he willed rather that all should be what he himself was. Similarly, too, in sending the rescript on, the subject of divorce, he demonstrates that some had been thinking over that also, chiefly because with all they did not suppose that they were to persevere, after faith, in hidden marriages. They sought counsel, further, concerning virgins for precept of the Lord there was none, and were told, that it is good for a man if he so remain permanently, so, of course, as he may have been found by the faith, thou hast been bound to a wife, seek not loosing, thou hast been loosed from a wife, seek not a wife, but if thou shalt have taken to, thyself, a wife, thou hast not sinned, because to one who, before believing, had been loosed from a wife, she will not be counted a second wife who, subsequently to believing, is the first, for it is from, the time of our, believing that our life itself dates its origin. But here he says that he is sparing them, else pressure of the flesh would shortly follow, in consequence of the straits of the times, which shunned the encumbrances of marriage. Yeah, rather solicitude must be felt about turning the Lord's favor than a husband's, and thus he recalls his permission. So, then, in the very same passage in which he definitely rules that each one ought permanently to remain in that calling in which he shall be called, adding, a woman is bound so long as her husband liveth, but if he shall have fallen asleep, she is free, whom she shall wish let her marry, only in the Lord. He hence also demonstrates that such a woman is to be understood as has with all herself been found, by the faith, loosed from a husband. Similarly as the husband loosed from the wife the loosing having taken place through death. Of course, not through divorce, inasmuch as to the divorced he would grant no permission to marry in the teeth of the primary precept, and so a woman, if she shall have married, will not sin, because he will not be reckoned a second husband who is, subsequently to her believing, the first, any more, than a wife thus taken will be counted a second wife, and so truly is this the case, that he therefore adds, only in the Lord, because the question and agitation was about her who had had a heathen husband, and had believed subsequently to losing him, for fear, to wit that she might presume herself able to marry a heathen even after believing. Albeit not even this is an object of care to the psychics, let us plainly know that, in the Greek original, it does not stand in the form which, through the either crafty or simple alteration of two syllables, has gone out into common use, but if her husband shall haze fallen asleep, as if it were speaking of the future, and thereby seem to pertain to her who has lost her husband when already in a believing state. If this indeed had been so, license let loose without limit would have granted a fresh husband as often as one had been lost, without it any such modesty in marrying as is congruous even to heathens. But even if it had been so, as if referring to future Tim, e, if any, woman's husband shall have died, even the future would just as much pertain to her whose husband shall die before she believed. Take it which way you will, provided you do not overturn the rest, for since these other passages agree to the sense given above, thou hast been called a slave, care not, thou hast been called in uncircumcision, be not circumcised, thou hast been called in circumcision, become not uncircumcised, with which concurs, thou hast been bound to a wife. Seek not loosing, thou hast been loosed from a wife, seek not a wife. Manifest enough it is that these passages pertain to such as, finding themselves in a new and recent calling, were consulting, the apostle, on the subject of those, circumstantial conditions, in which they had been apprehended by the faith. This will be the interpretation of that passage, to be examined as to whether it be congruous with the time and the occasion and with the examples and arguments preceding as well as with the sentences and senses succeeding, and primarily with the individual advice and practice of the Apostle himself. For nothing is so much to be guarded as, the care, that no one be found self-contradictory. Chapter 12, The Explanation of the Passage Offered by the Psychics Considered, Listen, with all, to the very subtle argumentation on the contrary side, so true is it. Say, 
our opponents, that the Apostle has permitted the iteration of marriage, that it is only such as are in the clerical order that he has stringently bound to the yoke of monogamy, that which he prescribes to certain individuals, he does not prescribe to all, does it then follow, too, that to bishops alone he does not prescribe what he does enjoin upon all, if what he does prescribe to bishops he does not enjoin upon all, or is it therefore to all because to bishops, and therefore to bishops because to all, for whence is it that the bishops and clergy come, is it not from all if all are not bound to monogamy, whence are monogamists, to he taken, into the clerical rank, will some separate order of monogamists have to be instituted, from which to make selection for the clerical body? But when we are extolling and inflating ourselves in opposition to the clergy, then we are all one, then we are all priests, because he hath made us priests to his God and Father. When we are challenged to a thorough equalization with the sacerdotal discipline, we lay down the priestly fillets, and, still, are on a par. The question in hand, when the apostle was writing, was with reference to ecclesiastical orders what son of men ought to be ordained. It was therefore fitting that all the form of the common discipline should be set forth on its forefront, as an edict to be in a certain sense universally and carefully attended to, that the laity might the better know that they must themselves observe that order which was indispensable to their overseers and that even the office of honor itself might not flatter itself in anything tending to license, as if on the ground of privilege of position, the Holy Spirit foresaw that some would say, all things are lawful to bishops, just as that bishop of Eutene of years feared not even the scant Indian law, why, how many digamists, too, preside in your churches, insulting the apostle, of course, at all events, not blushing when these passages are run under their presidency, come, now, you who think that an exceptional law of monogamy is made with reference to bishops, abandon with all your remaining disciplinary titles, which, together with monogamy, are ascribed to bishops, refuse to be irreprehensible, sober, of good morals, orderly, hospitable, easy to be taught, nay, indeed, given to wine, prompt with the hand to strike, combative, money-loving, not ruling your house nor caring for your children's discipline, no, nor courting good renown even from strangers. For if bishops have a law of their own teaching monogamy, the other characteristics, likewise, which will be the fitting concomitants of monogamy, will have been written, exclusively, for bishops, with laics, however, to whom monogamy is not suitable, the other characteristics, also have nothing to do, thus, psychic, you have, if you please, evade in the bonds of discipline in its entirety, be consistent in prescribing, that what is enjoined upon certain, individuals, is not enjoined upon all, or else, if the other, characteristics, indeed are common, but monogamy is imposed upon bishops alone, tell me, pray, whether they alone are to be pronounced Christians upon whom is conferred the entirety of discipline, chapter, 13. Further objections from St. Paul answered, but again, writing to Timotheus, he wills the very young, women, to marry, bear children, act the housewife. He is, here, directing, his speech, to such as he denotes above very young widows, who, after being, apprehended in widowhood, and, subsequently, wooed for some length of time, after they have had Christ in their affections, wish to marry, having judgment because they have rescinded the first faith, that, faith, to wit, by which they were found in widowhood, and, after professing it, do not persevere, for which reason he wills them to marry, for fear of their subsequently rescinding the first faith of professed widowhood, not to sanction their marrying as often as ever they may refuse to persevere in a widowhood plied with temptation nay, rather, spent in indulgence, we read him with all writing to the Romans, but the woman who is under an husband, is bound to her husband, while living, but if he shall have died, she has been emancipated from the law of the husband. Doubtless, then, the husband living, she will be thought to commit adultery if she shall have been joined to a second husband. If, however, the husband shall have died, she has been freed from, his, law, that she is not an adulteress if made, wife, to another husband, but treat the sequel as well in order that this sense which flatters you, may evade, 
your grasp, and so, he says, my brethren, be ye too made dead to the law through the body of Christ, that ye may be made, subject, to a second covenant to him, namely, who hath risen from the dead, that we may bear fruit to God. For when we were in the flesh, the passions of sin, which, passions, used to be efficiently caused through the law, wrought, in our members unto the bearing of fruit to death, but now we have been emancipated from the law, being dead, to that, in which we used to be held, unto the serving of God in newness of spirit, and not in oldness of letter. Therefore, if he bids us be made dead to the law through the body of Christ, which is the church, which consists in the spirit of newness, not through the letter of oldness, that is, of the law, taking you away from the law, which does not keep a wife, when her husband is dead, from becoming, wife, to another husband he reduces you to, subjection to, the contrary condition, that you are not to marry when you have lost your husband, and in as far as you would not be accounted an adulteress if you became, wife, to a second husband after the death of your, first, husband, if you were still bound to act in, subjection to, the law, in so far as a result of the diversity of, your, condition, he does prejudge you, guilty, of adultery if, after the death of your husband, you do marry another, inasmuch as you have now been made dead to the law, it cannot be lawful for you. Now that you have withdrawn from that, law, in the eye of which it was lawful for you. Chapter 14, even if the permission had been given by Saint Paul in the sense which the psychics allege, it was merely like the mosaic permission of divorce a condescension to human hard-heartedness. Now, if the apostle had even absolutely permitted marriage when one's partner has been lost subsequently to conversion to the faith, he would have done, just as he did, the other actions, which he did adversely to the strict letter of his own rule, to suit the circumstances of the times, circumcising Timothy's on account of supposititious false brethren and leading certain shaven men into the temple on account of the observant watchfulness of the Jews he who chastises the Galatians when they desire to live in, observance of, the law. But so did circumstances require him to become all things to all, in order to gain all, travailing and birth with them until Christ should be formed in them, and cherishing, as it were a nurse, the little ones of faith, by teaching them some things by way of indulgence not by way of command for it is one thing to indulge, another to bid permitting a temporary license of remarriage on account of the weakness of the flesh, just as Moses of divorcing on account of the hardness of the heart, and here, accordingly, we will render the supplement of this, his, meaning, for if Christ abrogated what Moses enjoined, because from the beginning was not so, and this being so Christ will not therefore be reputed to have come from some other power, why may not the paraclete, too, have abrogated an indulgence which Paul granted because second marriage with all was not from the beginning without deserving on this account to be regarded with suspicion, as if he were an alien spirit, provided only that the superinduction be worthy of God and of Christ. If it was worthy of God and of Christ to check hard-heartedness when the time for its indulgence was fully expired, why should it not might be more worthy both of God and of Christ to shake off infirmity of the flesh when the time is already marked wound up? If it is just that marriage be not severed, it is, of course, honorable too that it be not iterated. In short, in the estimation of the world, each is accounted a mark of good discipline, one under the name of concord, one, of modesty, hardness of heart drain till Christ's time. Let infirmity of the flesh, be content to, have reigned till the time of the paraclete. The new law abrogated divorce it had, somewhat, to abrogate, the new prophecy, abrogates, second marriage, which is, no less a divorce of the former, marriage, but the hardness of heart yielded to Christ more readily than the infirmity of the flesh, the latter claims Paul in its own support more than the former Moses, if, indeed, it is claiming him in its support when it catches, at his indulgence, but, refuses his prescript eluding his more deliberate opinions and his constant wills, not suffering us to render to the apostle the, obedience, which he prefers. And how long will this most shameless infirmity persevere in waging a war of extermination against the better things? The time for its indulgence was, the interval, until the paraclet began his operations, to whose coming were deferred by the Lord, 
the things, which in H's day could not be endured, which it is now no longer competent for any one to be unable to endure, seeing that he through whom the power of enduring is granted is not wanting. How long shall we allege the flesh? Because the Lord said, The flesh is weak, but he has withal premised that the spirit is prompt, in order that the spirit may vanquish the flesh that the weak may yield to the stronger. For again he says, Let him who is able to receive, receive, that is, let him who is not able go his way. That rich man did go his way who had not received the precept of dividing his substance to the needy and what was abandoned by the Lord to his own opinion, nor will harshness be on this account imputed to Christ, the fount of the vicious action of each individual free will. Behold, saith he, I have set before thee good and evil, choose that which is good, if you cannot, because you will not for that you can if you will he has shown, because he has proposed each to your free will you ought to depart from him whose will you do not. Chapter 15 Unfairness of charging the disciples of the new prophecy with harshness the charge rather to be retorted upon the psychics. What harshness, therefore, is here on our part, if we renounce, communion with, such as do not the will of God? What heresy, if we judge second marriage, as being unlawful, akin to adultery? For what is adultery but unlawful marriage? The apostle sets a brand upon those who were wont entirely to forbid marriage, who were wont at the same time to lay an interdict on meats which God has created. We, however, no more do away with marriage if we abjure its repetition, and we reprobate meats if we fast oftener, than others. It is one thing to do away with, another to regulate, it is one thing to, lay down the law of not marrying, it is another to fix the limit to marrying. To speak plainly, if they who reproach us with harshness, or esteem heresy, to exist, in this, our, cause. Foster the infirmity of the flesh to such a degree as to think it must have support accorded to it in frequency of marriage. Why do they in another case neither accord it support nor foster it with indulgence when, namely, torments have reduced it to a denial of the faith? For, of course, that infirmity is more capable of excuse which has fallen in battle than that which has fallen in the bedchamber, that which has succumbed on the rack than that which has succumbed on the bridal bed, that which has yielded to cruelty, then that which has yielded to appetite, that which has been overcome groaning, then that which has been overcome in heat. But the former they excommunicate, because it has not endured unto the end, the latter they prop up, as if with all it has endured unto the end. Propose the question, why each has not endured unto the end? and you will find the cause of that infirmity, to be more honorable which has been unable to sustain savagery, than, of that, which, has been unable to sustain, modesty, and yet not even a blood wrung not to say an immodest defection does the infirmity of the flesh excuse. Chapter 16 Weakness of the Pleas Urged in Defense of Second Marriage But I smile when, the plea of, infirmity of the flesh is advanced in opposition, to us, Infirmity, which is, rather, to be called the height of strength. Iteration of marriage is an affair of strength. To rise again from the ease of continence to the works of the flesh, is, a thing requiting, substantial reins. Such infirmity is equal, to a third, and a fourth, and even, perhaps, a seventh marriage, as, being a thing, which increases its strength as often as its weakness, which will no longer have, the support of, an apostle's authority, but of some Hermogens want to marry more women than he paints, for in him matter is abundant, whence he presumes that even the soul is material, and therefore much more, than other men, he has not the spirit from God, being no longer even a psychic, because even his physical element is not derived from God's afflatus, what if a man allege indigence, so as to profess that his flesh is openly prostituted, and given in marriage for the sake of maintenance, forgetting that there is to be no careful thought about food and clothing. He has God, to look to, the foster father even of ravens, the rearer even of flowers. What if he plead the loneliness of his home? As if one woman afforded company to a man ever on the eve of flight. He has, of course, a widow, at hand, whom it will be lawful for him to take. Not one such wife, but even a plurality, it is permitted to have. What if a man thinks on posterity? 
with thoughts like the eyes of Lot's wife, so that a man is to make the fact that from his former marriage he has had no children a reason for repeating marriage. A Christian, forsooth, will seek heirs, disinherited as he is from the entire world. He has brethren, he has the church as his mother. The case is different if men believe that, at the bar of Christ, as well, as of Rome, Action is taken on the principle of the Julian laws, and imagine that the unmarried and childless cannot receive their portion in full, in accordance with the testament of God. Let such, as thus think, then, marry to the very end, that in this confusion of flesh they, like Sodom and Gomorrah, and the day of the deluge, may be overtaken by the fated final end of the world. A third saying let the mad, let us eat, and drink, and really, for tomorrow we shall die, not reflecting that the woe, denounced, on such as are with child, and are giving suck, will fall far more heavily and bitterly in the universal shaking of the entire world than it did in the devastation of one fraction of Judea. Let them accumulate by their narrated marriages fruits right seasonable for the last time's breasts heaving, and wombs qualmish, and infants whimpering. Let them prepare for Antichrist, children, upon whom he may more passionately than Pharaoh, spend his savagery. He will lead to the murderous midwives. Chapter 17, in examples see our wife shame upon this infirmity of the flesh, they will have plainly a specious privilege to plead before Christ the everlasting infirmity of the flesh, but upon this infirmity, will sit in judgment no longer an Isaac, our monogamist father, or a John, a note and voluntary celibate of Christ's, or a Judith, daughter of Merari or so many other examples of saints. Edens are wont to be destined our judges. There will arise the queen of Carthage, and give sentence upon the Christians, who, refugee as she was, living on alien soil, and at that very time the originator of so mighty a state, whereas she ought unasked to have craved royal nuptials, yet, for fear she should experience a second marriage, preferred on the contrary rather to burn than to marry. Her assessor will be the Roman matron who, having all be eat it was through nocturnal violence, nevertheless known another man, washed away with blood the stain of her flesh, that she might avenge upon her own person, the honor of, monogamy, there have been, too, who preferred to die for their husbands rather than marry after their husband's death, to idols, at all events, both monogamy and widowhood serve as apparitors, on fortuna mulibra, as on mother Matata, none but a once wedded woman hangs the wreath, once for all do the Pontifex Maximus and the wife of a Flamin marry, the priestesses of Sears, even during the lifetime and with the consent of their husbands, are widowed by amicable separation. There are, too, who may judge as on the ground of absolute continence, the virgins of Vesta, and of the Achaean Juno, and of the Scythian Diana, and of the Pythian Apollo. On the ground of continence the priests likewise of the famous Egyptian bull will judge the infirmity of Christians. Blush. O flesh, who hast put on Christ, suffice it thee once for all to marry, whereto from the beginning thou wast created, whereto by the end thou art being recalled, return at least to the former Adam, if to the last thou canst not, once for all did he taste of the tree, once for all felt concupiscence, once for all veiled his shame, once for all blushed in the presence of God, once for all concealed his guilty hue, once for all was exiled from the paradise of holiness. Once for all thenceforward married, if you were in him, you have your norm, if you have passed over into Christ, you will be bound to be, yet, better, exhibit, to us, a third Adam, and him a digamist, and then you will be able to be what, between the two, you cannot, translate it by the Reverend S. Thelwall, Tertullian on Prayer, by the Relevant S. Thelwall. Chapter 1. General Introduction, The Spirit of God and the word of God, and the reason of God word of reason, and reason and spirit of word Jesus Christ our Lord, namely, who is both the one and the other comma has determined for us, the disciples of the New Testament, a new form of prayer, for in this particular also it was needful that new wine should be laid up in new skins, and a new breadth be sown to a new garment, besides, whatever had been in bygone days, has either been quite changed, as circumcision, or else supplemented, as the rest of the law, or else fulfilled, as prophecy, or else perfected, as faith itself, 
for the new grace of God has renewed all things from carnal unto spiritual, by superinducing the gospel, the obliterator of the whole ancient bygone system, in which our Lord Jesus Christ has been approved as the Spirit of God, and the Word of God, and the reason of God, the Spirit, by which he was mighty, the Word, by which he taught, the reason, by which he came. So the prayer composed by Christ has been composed of three parts, in speech, by which prayer is enunciated, in spirit, by which alone it prevails. Even John had taught his disciples to pray, but all John's doings were laid as groundwork for Christ, until, when he had increased just as the same John used to foreannounce that it was needful that he should increase and himself decrease the whole work of the forerunner passed over, together with his spirit itself, unto the Lord. Therefore, after what form of words John taught to pray is not extant, because earthly things have given place to heavenly. He who is from the earth, says John, speaketh earthly things, and he who is here from the heavens speaketh those things which he hath seen. And what is the Lord Christ's as this method of praying is that is not heavenly. And so, blessed brethren, let us consider his heavenly wisdom. First, touching the precept of praying secretly, whereby he exacted man's faith that he should be confident that the sight and hearing of Almighty God are present beneath roofs, and extend even into the secret place, and required modesty and faith, that it should offer its religious homage to him alone, whom it believed to see and to hear everywhere. Further, since wisdom succeeded in the following precept, let it in like manner appertain unto faith, and the modesty of faith, that we think not that the Lord must be approached with a train of words, who, we are certain, takes unsolicited foresight for his own. And yet that very brevity and let this make for the third grade of wisdom is supported on the substance of a great and blessed interpretation, and is as diffuse in meaning as it is compressed in words. For it has embraced not only the special duties of prayer, be it veneration of God or petition for man, but almost every discourse of the Lord, every record of his discipline, so that, in fact, in the prayer is comprised an epitome of the whole gospel. 682 Chapter 2 The First Clause The prayer begins with a testimony to God, and with the reward of faith, when we say, Our Father who art in the heavens, for, in so saying, we at once pray to God, and commend faith, whose reward this appellation is. It is written, To them who believed on him he gave power to be called sons of God. However, our Lord very frequently proclaimed God as a Father to us, nay, even gave a precept that we call no one on earth Father, but the Father whom we have in the heavens, and so, in thus praying, we are likewise obeying the precept, happy they who recognize their Father. This is the reproach that is brought against Israel, to which the Spirit attests heaven and earth, saying, I have begotten sons, and they have not recognized me. Moreover, in saying Father, we also call him God. That appellation is one both of filial duty and of power. Again, in the Father the Son is invoked, for I, saith he, and the Father are one. Nor is even our mother the church passed by, if, that is, in the Father and the Son is recognized the mother, from whom arises the name both of Father and of Son. In one general term, then, or word, we both honor God, together with his own, and are mindful of the precept and set a mark on such as have forgotten their father. Chapter 3 The Second Clause The name of God the Father had been published to none. Even Moses, who had interrogated him on that very point, had heard a different name. To us it has been revealed in the Son, for the Son is now the Father's new name. I am come, saith he, in the Father's name, and again, Father, glorify thy name, and more openly, I have manifested thy name to men, that name. Therefore, we pray may be hallowed, not that it is becoming for men to wish God well, as if there were any other by whom he may be wished well, or as if he would suffer unless we do so wish. Plainly, it is universally becoming for God to be blessed in every place and time, on account of the memory of his benefits ever due from every man. But this petition also serves the turn of a blessing, otherwise, when is the name of God not holy, and hallowed through himself? Seeing that of himself he sanctifies all others he to whom that surrounding circle of angels cease not to say, Holy, 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 and likewise, therefore, we too, candidates for angelhood, if we succeed in deserving it, 
begin even here on earth to learn by heart that strain hereafter to be raised unto God, in the function of future glory, so far, for the glory of God. On the other hand, for our own petition, when we say, Hallowed be thy name, we pray this, that it may be hallowed in us who are in him, as well in all others for whom the grace of God is still waiting, that we may obey this precept, too, in praying for all, even for our personal enemies, and therefore with suspended utterance, not saying, hallowed be it in us, we say comma in all, chapter, 4, the third clause, according to this model, we subjoin, thy will be done in the heavens and on the earth. Not that there is some power withstanding to prevent God's will being done, and we pray for him the successful achievement of his will, but we pray for his will to be done in all, for, by figurative interpretation of flesh and spirit, we are heaven and earth, albeit, even if it is to be understood simply, still the sense of the petition is the same, that in us God's will be done on earth, to make it possible, namely, for it to be done also in the heavens, what, moreover, does God will, but that we should walk according to his discipline, we make petition, then, that he supply us with the substance of his will, and the capacity to do it, that we may be saved both in the heavens and on earth, because the sum of his will is the salvation of them whom he has adopted. There is, too, that will of God which the Lord accomplished in preaching, in working, in enduring, for if he himself proclaimed that he did not his own, but the Father's will. Without doubt those things which he used to do were the Father's will, unto which things, as unto exemplars, we are now provoked, to preach, to work, to endure even 683 unto death, and we need the will of God, that we may be able to fulfill these duties, again, in saying, Thy will be done, we are even wishing well to ourselves, in so far that there is nothing of evil in the will of God, even if, proportionably to each one's deserts somewhat other is imposed on us, so by this expression we premonish our own selves unto patience. The Lord also, when he had wished to demonstrate to us, even in his own flesh, the flesh's infirmity, by the reality of suffering, said, Father, remove this thy cup, and remembering himself, added, Save that not my will, but thine be done. Himself was the will and the power of the Father, and yet, for the demonstration of the patience which was due, he gave himself up to the Father's will. Chapter 5. The fourth clause, Thy kingdom come, has also reference to that whereto thy will be done refers in us, that is, for when does God not reign, in whose hand is the heart of all kings? But whatever we wish for ourselves we augur for him, and to him we attribute what from him we expect. And so, if the manifestation of the Lord's kingdom pertains unto the will of God and unto our anxious expectation, how do some pray for some protraction of the age, when the kingdom of God, which we pray may arrive, tends unto the consummation of the age? Our wish is, that our reign be hastened, not our servitude protracted, even if it had not been prescribed in the prayer that we should ask for the advent of the kingdom, we should, unbidden, have sent forth that cry, hastening toward the realization of our hope, the souls of the martyrs beneath the altar cry in jealousy unto the Lord how long? Lord, dost thou not avenge our blood on the inhabitants of the earth? For, of course, their avenging is regulated by the end of the age. Nay, Lord, thy kingdom come with all speed cometh the prayer of Christians the confusion of the heathen, the exaltation of angels, for the sake of which we suffer, nay, rather, for the sake of which we pray. Chapter, Vi. The fifth clause. But how gracefully has the divine wisdom arranged the order of the prayer? so that after things heavenly that is, after the name of God, the will of God, and the kingdom of God it should give earthly necessities also room for a petition, for the Lord had with all issued his edict, seek ye first the kingdom, and then even these shall be added, albeit we may rather understand, give us this day our daily bread, spiritually, for Christ is our bread, because Christ is life, and bread is life, I am, saith he, the bread of life and, a little above, the bread is the word of the living God, who came down from the heavens, then we find, too, that his body is reckoned in bread, this is my body. And so, in petitioning for daily bread, we ask for perpetuity in Christ, and indivisibility from his body, but, because that word is admissible in a carnal sense too, 
it cannot be so used without their religious remembrance with all of spiritual discipline, for, the Lord, commands that bread be prayed for, which is the only food necessary for believers, for all other things the nations seek after, the like lesson he both inculcates by examples, and repeatedly handles in parables, when he says, Doth a father take away bread from his children, and hand it to dogs, and again, Doth a father give his son a stone when he asks for bread, for he thus shows what it is that sons expect from their father, nay, even that nocturnal knocker knocked for bread, moreover, he justly added, Give us this day, seeing he had previously said, Take no careful thought about the morrow, what ye are to eat, to which subject he also adapted the parable of a man who pondered on an enlargement of his barns for his forthcoming fruits, and on seasons of prolonged security but that very night he dies. Chapter 7. The Sixth Clause. It was suitable that, after contemplating the liberality of God, we should likewise address his clemency, for what will elements 684 profit us, if we are really consigned to them, as it were a bull destined for a victim, the Lord knew himself to be the only guiltless one, and so he teaches that we beg to have our debts remitted us. A petition for pardon is a full confession because he who begs for pardon fully admits his guilt. Thus, too, penitence is demonstrated acceptable to God who desires it rather than the death of the sinner. Moreover, get is, in the scriptures, a figure of guilt, because it is equally due to the sentence of judgment, and is exacted by it. Nor does it evade the justice of exaction, unless the exaction be remitted, just as the Lord remitted to that slave in the parable his debt, for hither does the scope of the whole parable tend for the fact with all, that the same servant, after liberated by his Lord, does not equally spare his own debtor, and, being on that account impeached before his Lord, is made over to the tormentor to pay the uttermost farthing that is, every guilt, however small, corresponds with our profession that we also remit to our debtors, indeed elsewhere, too, in conformity with this form of prayer, he saith, remit and it shall be remitted you. And when Peter had put the question whether remission were to be granted to a brother seven times, nay, saith he, seventy-seven times, in order to remold the law for the better, because in Genesis vengeance was assigned seven times in the case of Cain, but in that of Lamech seventy-seven times. Chapter 8 the seventh or final clause, for the completeness of so brief a prayer he added in order that we should supplicate not touching the remitting merely, but touching the entire averting, of acts of guilt lead us not into temptation, that is, suffer us not to be led into it, by him, of course, who tempts, but far be the thought that the Lord should seem to tempt, as if he either were ignorant of the faith of any, or else were eager to overthrow it, infirmity and malice are characteristics of the devil, for God had commanded even Abraham to make a sacrifice of his son, for the sake not of tempting, but proving, his faith in order through him to make an example for that precept of his, whereby he was, by and by, to enjoin that he should hold no pledges of affection dearer than God. He himself, when tempted by the devil, demonstrated who it is that presides over and is the originator of temptation. This passage he confirms by subsequent ones, saying, Pray that ye be not tempted, yet they were tempted, as they showed, by besetting their Lord, because they had given way rather to sleep than prayer. The final clause, therefore, is consonant, and interprets the sense of led us not into temptation, for this sense is, but convey us away from the evil one. Chapter 9. Recapitulation. In summaries of so few words, how many utterances of the prophets, the gospels, the apostles how many discourses, examples, parables of the Lord, are touched on, how many duties are simultaneously discharged, the honor of God and the Father the testimony of faith in the name, the offering of obedience in the will, the commemoration of hope in the kingdom, the petition for life in the bread, the full acknowledgement of debts in the prayer for their forgiveness, the anxious dread of temptation in the request for protection, what wonder, God alone could teach how he wished himself prayed to, the religious rite of prayer therefore, ordained by himself, and animated, even at the moment when it was issuing out of the divine mouth, by his own spirit, ascends, by its own prerogative, into heaven, 
commending to the Father what the Son has taught. Chapter 10. We may super add prayers of ROWN to the Lord's Prayer, since, however, the Lord, the forcer of human necessities, said separately, after delivering his rule of prayer, Ask, and ye shall receive. And since there are petitions which are made according to the circumstances of each individual, our additional wants have the right after beginning with the legitimate and customary prayers as a foundation, as it were of rearing an outer superstructure of petitions, yet with remembrance of the Master's precepts. 685 Chapter 11 When praying the Father, you are not to be angry with a brother, that we may not be as far from the ears of God as we are from his precepts, the memory of his precepts paves for our prayers a way unto heaven, of which precepts the chief is, that we go not up unto God's altar before we compose whatever of discord or offense we have contracted with our brethren, for what sort of deed is it to approach the peace of God without peace? The remission of debts as while you retain them, how will he appease his father who is angry with his brother, when from the beginning all anger is forbidden us, for even Joseph, when dismissing his brethren for the purpose of fetching their father, said, And be not angry in the way, he warned us, to be sure, at that time, for elsewhere our discipline is called the way, that when, set in the way of prayer, we go not unto the father with anger, after that, the Lord, amplifying the law, openly adds the prohibition of anger against a brother to that of murder, not even by an evil word does he permit it to be vented, ever if we must be angry. Our anger must not be maintained beyond sunset, as the Apostle admonishes, but how rash is it either to pass a day without prayer, while you refuse to make satisfaction to your brother, or else, by perseverance in anger, to lose your prayer. Chapter 12 We must be free likewise from all mental perturbation, nor merely from anger, but altogether from all perturbation of mind, ought the exercise of prayer to be free uttered from a spirit such as the spirit unto whom it is sent, for a defiled spirit cannot be acknowledged by a holy spirit, nor a sad by a joyful, nor a lettered by a free, no one grants reception to his adversary, no one grants admittance except to his compeer. Chapter 13 Of Washing the Hands But what reason is there in going to prayer with hands indeed washed? But the spirit foul question mark and as much as to our hands themselves spiritual purities are necessary, that they may be lifted up pure from falsehood, from murder, from cruelty, from poisonings, from idolatry, and all the other blemishes which, conceived by the spirit, are affected by the operation of the hands. These are the true purities, not those which most are superstitiously careful about, taking water at every prayer even when they are coming from a bath of the whole body. When I was scrupulously making a thorough investigation of this practice, and searching into the reason of it, I ascertained it to be a commemorative act, bearing on the surrender of our Lord. We, howsoever, pray to the Lord, we do not surrender him, nay, we ought even to set ourselves in opposition to the example of his surrenderer, and not, on that account, wash our hands unless any defilement contracted in human intercourse be a conscientious cause for washing them, they are otherwise clean enough, which together with our whole body we once washed in Christ. Chapter 14 Apostrophe Albeit Israel washed daily all his limbs over, yet is he never clean. His hands, at all events, are ever unclean, eternally dyed with the blood of the prophets, and of the Lord himself, and on that account, as being hereditary culprits from their privity to their father's crimes, they do not dare even to raise them unto the Lord, for fear some Isaiah should cry out, for fear Christ should utterly shudder. We, however, not only raise, but even expand them, and, taking our model from the Lord's passion, even in prayer we confess to Christ. Chapter 15 Of Putting O.F.F. Cloaks But since we have touched on one special point of empty observance, it will not be irksome to set our brand likewise on the other points against which the reproach of vanity may deservedly be laid, if, that is, they are observed without the authority of any precept 686 either of the Lord, or else of the Apostles. For matters of this kind belong not to religion, but to superstition, being studied, and forced, and of curious rather than rational ceremony, deserving of restraint, at all events, even on this ground that they put us on a level with Gentiles, as, for example, 
It is the custom of some to make prayer with cloaks doffed, for so do the nations approach their idols, which practice, of course, were its observance becoming, the apostles, who teach concerning the garb of prayer, would have comprehended in their instructions, unless any think that as was in prayer that Paul had left his cloak with Carpus, God, forsooth, would not hear cloaked suppliants, who plainly heard the three saints in the Babylonian king's furnace praying in their trousers and turbans. Chapter 16, of sitting after prayer, again, for the custom which some have of sitting when prayer is ended, I perceive no reason, except that which children give, for what if that Hermes, whose writing is generally inscribed with the title the shepherd, had, after finishing his prayer, not sat down on his bed, but done some other thing, should we maintain that also as a matter for observance, of course not, why, even as it is the sentence, when I had prayed, and had sat down on my bed, is simply put with a view to the order of the narration, not as a model of discipline, else we shall have to pray nowhere except where there is a bed, nay, whoever sits in a chair or on a bench, will act contrary to that writing, further, inasmuch as the nations do alike, in sitting down after adoring their petty images, even on this account the practice deserves to be censured in us because it is observed in the worship of idols, to this is further added the charge of irrelevance common intelligible even to the nations themselves, if they had any sense, if, on the one hand, it is irrelevant to sit under the eye, and over against the eye, of him whom you most of all revere and venerate, how much more, on the other hand, is that deed most irreligious under the eye of the living God, while the angel of prayer is still standing blind unless we are upbraiding God that prayer has wearied us. Chapter 17 Of Elevated Hands But we more commend our prayers to God when we pray with modesty and humility, with not even our hands too loftily elevated, but elevated temperately and becomingly, and not even our countenance over boldly uplifted. For that publican who prayed with humility and dejection not merely in his supplication, but in his countenance too, Wend his way more justified than the shameless Pharisee, the sounds of our voice, likewise, should be subdued, else, if we are to be heard for our noise, how large windpipes should we need, but God is the hearer not of the voice, but of the heart, just as he is its inspector, the demon of the Pythian oracle says, and I do understand the mute, and plainly hear the speechless one, do the ears of God wait for sound, how, then, could Jonah's prayer find way out unto heaven from the depth of the whale's belly, through the entrails of so huge a beast, from the very abysses, through so huge a mass of sea? What superior advantage will they who pray too loudly gain, except that they annoy their neighbors? Nay, by making their petitions audible, what less error do they commit than if they were to pray in public? Chapter 18 Of the Kiss of Peace Another custom has now become prevalent such as our fasting withhold the kiss of peace, which is the seal of prayer, after prayer made with brethren, but when is peace more to be concluded with brethren than when, at the time of some religious observance, our prayer ascends with more acceptability, that they may themselves participate in our observance, and thereby be mollified for transacting with their brother touching their own peace, what prayer is complete if divorced from the holy kiss, whom does peace impede when rendering service to his Lord, what kind of sacrifice is that from which men depart without peace, whatever our prayer be, it will not be better than the observance of the precept by which we are bidden to conceal our fasts, for now, by abstinence from the kiss, we are known to be fasting, but even if there be some reason for this practice, still, lest you offend against this precept, you may perhaps defer your peace at home, where it is not possible for your fast to be in 687 entirely kept secret, but wherever else you can conceal your observance, you ought to remember the precept. Thus you may satisfy the requirements of discipline abroad and of custom at home. So, too, on the day of the Passover, when the religious observance of a fast is general, and as it were public, we justly forego the kiss, caring nothing to conceal anything which we do in common with all. Chapter 19 Of Stations Similarly, to touching the days of stations, most think that they must not be present at the sacrificial prayers, on the ground that the station must be dissolved by reception of the Lord's body. Does, then, the Eucharist cancel a service devoted to God? 
or bind it more to God, will not your station be more solemn if you have with all stood at God's altar, when the Lord's body has been received and reserved? Each point is secured, both the participation of the sacrifice and the discharge of duty, if the station has received its name from the example of military life for we with all our God's military of course no gladness or sadness chanting to the camp abolishes the stations of the soldiers, for gladness will carry out discipline more willingly, sadness more carefully. Chapter 20 of Women's Dress So far, however, as regards the dress of women, the variety of observance compels us men of no consideration whatever to treat, presumptuously indeed, after the Most Holy Apostle, except in so far as it will not be presumptuously if we treat the subject in accordance with the Apostle, touching modesty of dress and ornamentation, indeed. The prescription of Peter likewise is plain, checking as he does with the same mouth, because with the same spirit, as Paul, the glory of garments, and the pride of gold, and the meretricious elaboration of the hair. Chapter 21 Of Virgins But that point which is promiscuously observed throughout the churches, whether virgins ought to be veiled or no, must be treated of. For they who allow to virgins immunity from head covering, appear to rest on this, that the Apostle has not defined virgins by name, but women, as to be veiled, nor the sex generally, so as to save females, but a class of the sex, by saying women, for if he had named the sex by saying females, he would have made his limit absolute for every woman. But while he names one class of the sex, he separates another class by being silent, for, they say, he might either have named virgins specially, or generally by a compendious term, females. Chapter 22 Answer to the foregoing arguments They who make this concession ought to reflect on the nature of the word itself what is the meaning of woman from the very first records of the sacred writings. Here they find it to be the name of the sex, not a class of the sex, if, that is, God gave to Eve, when she had not yet known a man, the surname woman and female, female, whereby the sex generally, woman hereby a class of the sex, is marked. So, since at that time the as yet unwedded Eve was called by the word woman, that word has been made common even to a virgin, nor is it wonderful that the apostle guided, of course, by the same spirit by whom, as all the divine scripture, so that book Genesis, was drawn up has used the self same word in writing women, which, by the example of Eve unwedded, is applicable too to a virgin, in fact, all the other passages are in consonance herewith, for even by this very fact, that he has not named virgins, as he does in another place where he is teaching touching marrying, he sufficiently predicates that his remark is made touching every woman, and touching the whole sex, and that there is no distinction made between a virgin and any other, while he does not name her at all, for he who elsewhere namely, where the difference requires remembers to make the distinction, moreover, he makes it by designating each species by their appropriate names, wishes, where he makes no distinction, while he does not name each, no difference to be understood. What of the fact that in the Greek speech, in which the apostle wrote his letters, it is usual to say, women rather than females, that is, Gunakas 688, Gunakas, rather than Cleus, Thelius, therefore if that word, which by interpretation represents what female, femina, represents, is frequently used instead of the name of the sex. He has named the sex insane Gunica, but in the sex even the virgin is embraced. But, with all, the declaration is plain, every woman, saith he, praying and prophesying with head uncovered, dishonoreth her own head. What is every woman, but woman of every age, of every rank, of every condition, by saying every he accepts not of womanhood? just as he accepts not of manhood either from not being covered, for just so he says, every man, as, then, in the masculine sex, under the name of man even the youth is forbidden to be veiled, so, too, in the feminine, under the name of woman, even the virgin is bidden to be veiled, equally in each sex let the younger age follow the discipline of the elder, or else let the male virgins, too, be veiled, if the female virgins with all are not veiled, because they are not mentioned by name. Let man and youth be different, if woman and virgin are different, for indeed it is on account of the angels that he saith women must be veiled, 
because on account of the daughters of men angels revolted from God, who then, would contend that women alone that is, such as were already wedded and had lost their virginity were the objects of angelic concupiscence, unless virgins are incapable of excelling in beauty and finding lovers, nay, let us see whether it were not virgins alone whom they lusted after, since scriptures saith the daughters of men, inasmuch as it might have named wives of men, or females, indifferently, likewise, in that it saith, and they took them to themselves for wives, it does so on this ground, that, of course, such are received for wives as are devoid of the title, but it would have expressed itself differently concerning such as were not thus devoid, and so, they who are named, are devoid as much of widowhood as of virginity. So completely has Paul by naming the sex generally, mingled daughters and species together in the genus. Again, while he says that nature herself, which has assigned hair as a tegument and ornament to women, teaches that veiling is the duty of females, has not the same tegument and the same honor of the head been assigned also to virgins. If it is shameful for a woman to be shorn it is similarly so to a virgin too, from them, then, to whom is assigned one in the same law of the head, one and the same discipline of the head is exacted comma, which extends, even unto those virgins whom their childhood defends, for from the first a virgin was named female, this custom, in short, even Israel observes. But if Israel did not observe it, our law, amplified and supplemented, would vindicate the addition for itself, let it be excused for imposing the veil on virgins also, under our dispensation, let that age which is ignorant of its sex retain the privilege of simplicity, for both Eve and Adam, when it befell them to be wise, forthwith veiled what they had learned to know, at all events, with regard to those in whom girlhood has changed, into maturity. Their age ought to remember its duties as to nature, so also, to discipline, for they are being transferred to the rank of women both in their persons and in their functions. No one is a virgin from the time when she is capable of marriage, seeing that, in her, age has by that time been wedded to its own husband, that is, to time. But some particular virgin has devoted herself to God, from that very moment she both changes the fashion of her hair, and converts all her garb into that of a woman. Let her, then, maintain the character holy, and perform the whole function of a virgin, what she conceals for the sake of God, let her cover quite over, it is our business to entrust to the knowledge of God alone that which the grace of God effects in us, test we receive from man the reward we hope for from God, why do you denude before God what you cover 689 before men, will you be more modest in public than in the church, if your self-devotion is a grace of God, and you have received it, why do you boast, saith he, as if you have not received it, why, by your ostentation of yourself, do you judge others, is it that, by your boasting, you invite others unto good, nay, but even you yourself run the risk of losing, if you boast, and you drive others unto the same perils what is assumed from love of boasting is easily destroyed, be veiled, virgin, if virgin you are, for you ought to blush, if you are a virgin, shrink from, the gaze of, many eyes, let no one wonder at your face, let no one perceive your falsehood, you do well in falsely assuming the married character, if you veil your head, nay, you do not seem to assume it falsely, for you are wedded to Christ, to him you have surrendered your body, act as becomes your husband's discipline, if he bids the brides of others to be veiled, his own, of course, much more. But each individual man is not to think that the institution of his predecessor is to be overturned. Many yield up their own judgment, and its consistency, to the custom of others. Granted that virgins be not compelled to be veiled, at all events such as voluntarily are so should not be prohibited, who, likewise, cannot deny themselves to be virgins, content, in the security of a good conscience before God, to damage their own fame, touching such, however, as are betrothed, I can with constancy above my small measure pronounce and attest that they are to be veiled from that day forth on which they shuddered at the first bodily touch of a man by kiss and hand, for in them everything has been forded, their age, through maturity, their flesh, through age, their spirit, through consciousness, their modesty, through the experience of the kiss their hope, through expectation, their mind through volition, and Rebecca is example enough for us, who, 
when her betrothed had been pointed out, veiled herself for marriage merely on recognition of him. Chapter 23 of Kneeling In the Master of Kneeling also prayer is subject to diversity of observance, through the act of some few who abstain from kneeling on the Sabbath, and since this dissension is particularly on its trial before the churches, the Lord will give his grace that the dissensions may either yield, or else indulge their opinion without offense to others. We, however, just as we have received, only on the day of the Lord's resurrection ought to guard not only against kneeling, but every posture and office of solicitude, deferring even our businesses lest we give any place to the devil. Similarly, too, in the period of Pentecost, which period we distinguish by the same solemnity of exaltation, but who would hesitate every day to prostrate himself before God, at least in the first prayer with which we enter on the daylight, at fasts, moreover, and stations, no prayer should be made without kneeling, and the remaining customary marks of humility, for, then, we are not only praying, but deprecating, and making satisfaction to God our Lord. Touching times of prayer nothing at all has been prescribed, except clearly to pray at every time and every place. Chapter 24 Of Place for Prayer But how in every place, since we are prohibited, from praying, in public, in every place, he means, which opportunity or even necessity, may have rendered suitable, for that which was done by the apostles, who, in jail, in the audience of the prisoners, began praying and singing to God, is not considered to have been done contrary to the precept, nor yet that which was done by Paul, who in the ship, in presence of all, made thanksgiving to God. Chapter 25 Of Time for Prayer Touching the time, however, the extrinsic observance of certain hours will not be unprofitable those common hours, I mean, which mark the intervals of the day the third, the sixth, the ninth which we 690 may find in the scriptures to have been more solemn than the rest. The first infusion of the Holy Spirit into the congregated disciples took place at the third hour. Peter, on the day on which he experienced the vision of universal community, exhibited, in that small vessel, had ascended into the more lofty parts of the house, for prayer's sake at the sixth hour, the same, apostle, was going into the temple, with John, at the ninth hour, when he restored the paralytic to his health, albeit these practices stand simply without any precept for their observance, still it may be granted a good thing to establish some definite presumption, which may both add stringency to the admonition to, pray, and may, as it were by law, tear us out from our businesses unto such a duty, so that what we read to have been observed by Daniel also, in accordance, of course, with Israel's discipline we pray at least not less than thrice in the day, debtors as we are to three Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, of course, in addition to our regular prayers which are due, without any admonition, on the entrance of light and of night, but, with all, it becomes believers not to take food, and not to go to the bath, before interposing a prayer, for the refreshments and nourishments of the Spirit are to be held prior to those of the flesh and things heavenly prior to things earthly. Chapter 26 Of the Parting of Brethren You will not dismiss a brother who has entered your house without prayer. Have you seen, says Scripture, a brother? You have seen your Lord, especially a stranger, lest perhaps he be an angel. But again, when received yourself by brethren, you will not make earthly refreshments prior to heavenly for your faith will forthwith be judged. Or else how will you according to the precept say, peace to this house, unless you exchange mutual peace with them who are in the house? Chapter 27 Of Subjoining a Psalm The more diligent in prayer are wont to subjoin in their prayers the Hallelujah, and such kind of psalms, in the closes of which the company respond. And, of course, every institution is excellent which, for the extolling and honoring of God, aims unitedly to bring him enriched prayer as a choice victim. Chapter 28 Of the Spiritual Victim which prayer is, for this is the spiritual victim which has abolished the pristine sacrifices. To what purpose, saith he, bring ye, me the multitude of your sacrifices? I am full of holocausts of rams, and I desire not the fat of rams, and the blood of bulls and of goats, for who hath required these from your hands? What, then, God has required the gospel teaches, and our will come, saith he, 
when the true adorers shall adore the Father in spirit and truth. For God is a spirit, and accordingly requires his adorers to be such. We are the true adorers and the true priests, who, praying in spirit, sacrifice, in spirit, prayer, comma, a victim proper and acceptable to God, which assuredly he has required, which he has looked forward to for himself. This victim, devoted from the whole heart, fed on faith, tended by truth, entire in innocence, pure in chastity, garlanded with love, we ought to escort with the pomp of good works, amid psalms and hymns, unto God's altar, to obtain for us all things from God. Chapter 29 Of the Power of Prayer For what has God, who exacts it ever denied to prayer coming from spirit and truth? How mighty specimens of its efficacy do we read, and hear, and believe? Old World Prayer indeed, used to free from fires, and from beasts, and from famine, and yet it had not, then, received its form from Christ. But how far more amply operative is Christian prayer? It does not station the angel of do 691 in mid-fires, nor muzzle lions, nor transfer to the hungry the rustic's bread, it has no delegated grace to avert any sense of suffering, but it supplies the suffering, and the feeling, and the grieving with endurance, it amplifies grace by virtue, that faith may know what she obtains from the Lord, understanding what for God's name's sake she suffers. But in days gone by, with all prayer used to call down plagues, scatter the armies of foes, withhold the wholesome influences of the showers. Now, however, the prayer of righteousness avers all God's anger, keeps bivouac on behalf of personal enemies, makes supplication on behalf of persecutors. Is it wonder if it knows how to extort the reins of heaven? Prayer, which was anti able to procure its fires. Prayer is alone that which vanquishes God. But Christ has willed that it be operative for no evil. He had conferred on it all its virtue in the cause of good. And so it knows nothing save how to recall the souls of the departed from the very path of death, to transform the weak, to restore the sick, to purge the possessed to open prison bars, to loose the bonds of the innocent. Likewise it washes away faults, repels temptations, extinguishes persecutions, consoles the faint-spirited, cheers the high-spirited, escorts travelers, appeases waves, makes robbers stand aghast, nourishes the poor, governs the rich, upraises the fallen, arrests the falling, confirms the standing. Prayer is the wall of faith her arms and missiles against the foe who keeps watch over us on all sides, and, so never walk we unarmed, by day, be we mindful of station, by night, of vigil, under the arms of prayer guard we the standard of our general, await we in prayer the angels trump, the angels, likewise, all pray, every creature prays, cattle and wild beasts pray and bend their knees, and when they issue from their lairs and lairs, they look up heavenward with no idle mouth making their breath vibrate after their own manner. Nay, the birds too, rising out of the nest, upraise themselves heavenward, and, instead of hands, expand the cross of their wings, and say somewhat to seem like prayer. What more then, touching the office of prayer? Even the Lord himself prayed, to whom be honor and virtue unto the ages of the ages. Tertullian on the Apparel of Women Book 1 Chapter 1 Introduction modesty and apparel becoming to women, in memory of the introduction of sin into the world through a woman, if there dwelt upon earth a faith as great as is the reward of faith which is expected in the heavens, no one of you at all, best beloved sisters, from the time, that she had first known the Lord, and learned, the truth, concerning her own, that is, woman's, condition, would have desired too gladsome, not to say too ostentatious, a style of dress, so as not rather to go about, in humble garb, and rather to affect meanness of appearance, walking about as eve mourning and repentant, in order that by every garb of penitence she might the more fully expiate that which she derives from eve, the ignominy, I mean, of the first sin, and the odium, attaching to her as a cause, of human perdition. In pains and in anxieties dost thou bear, children, woman, and toward thine husband by inclination, and he lords it over thee. And do you not know that you are, each, an Eve? The sentence of God on this sex of yours lives in this age, the guilt must of necessity live too. You are the devil's gateway, you are the unsealer of that, 
forbidden tree. You are the first deserter of the divine law. You are she who persuaded him whom the devil was not valiant enough to attack. You destroyed so easily God's image, man. On account of your desert, that is, death even the son of God had to die. And do you think about adorning yourself over and above your tunics of skins? Come, now, if from the beginning of the world the Milesians shared sheep, and the Syrians spun trees, and the Tyrians died, and the Phrygians embroidered with the needle, and the Babylonians with the loom, and pearls gleamed, and onyx stones flashed, if gold itself also had already issued, with the cupidity, which accompanies it, from the ground, if the mirror too, already had license to lie so largely. Eve, expelled from paradise, Eve, already dead, would also have coveted these things, I imagine. No more, then, ought she now to crave, or be acquainted with, if she desires to live again, what, when she was living, she had neither had nor known. Accordingly these things are all the baggage of woman in her condemned and dead state, instituted as if to swell the pump of her funeral. Chapter 2, The Origin of Female Ornamentation, Traced Back to the Angels Who Had Fallen. For they, with all, who instituted them are assigned, under condemnation, to the penalty of death, those angels, to wit, who rushed from heaven on the daughters of men, so that this ignominy also attaches to woman. For when to an age much more ignorant, than ours, they had disclosed certain well-concealed material substances, and several not well-revealed scientific arts, if it is true, that they had laid bare the operations of metallurgy, and had divulged the natural properties of herbs, and had promulgated the powers of enchantments, and had traced out every curious art. Even to the interpretation of the stars, they conferred properly, and as it were peculiarly upon women that instrumental mean of womanly ostentation, the radiances of jewels wherewith necklaces are variegated, and the circlets of gold wherewith the arms are compressed, and the medicaments of orchil with which wools are colored, and that black powder itself wherewith the eyelids and eyelashes are made prominent. What is the quality of these things may be declared meantime, even at this point, from the quality and condition of their teachers, in that sinners could never have either shown or supplied anything conducive to integrity, and lawful lovers anything conducive to chastity, renegade spirits anything conducive to the fear of God. If, these things, are to be called teachings, ill masters must of necessity have taught ill, if as wages of lust, there is nothing base of which the wages are honorable. But why was it of so much importance, to show these things as well as to confer them? Was it that women, without material causes of splendor, and without ingenious contrivances of grace, could not please men, who, while still unadorned, and uncouth and, so, to say crude and rude, had moved, the mind of, angels, or was it, that the lovers would appear sordid, and through gratuitous use contumelious? If they had conferred no, compensating, gift on the women, who had been enticed into connubial connection with them, but these questions admit of no calculation. Women who possessed angels, as husbands, could desire nothing more, they had, forsooth, made a grand match. Assuredly they who, of course, did sometimes think, whence they had fallen, and, after the heated impulses of their lusts, looked up toward heaven, thus requited that very excellence of women, natural beauty, as, having proved, a cause of evil, in order that their good fortune might profit them nothing, but that, being turned from simplicity and sincerity, they, together with, the angels, themselves, might become offensive to God. Sure they were that all ostentation, and ambition, and love of pleasing by carnal means, was displeasing to God. And these are the angels whom we are destined to judge, these are the angels whom in baptism we renounce, these, of course, are the reasons, why they have deserved to be judged by man. What business, then, have their things with their judges? What commerce have they who are to condemn with them who are to be condemned? The same, I take it, as Christ has with Belial. With what consistency, do we mount that, future, judgment seat to pronounce sentence against those whose gifts we, now, seek after? For you too, women as you are, have the self-same angelic nature promised as your award, the self-same sex as men, the self-same advancement to the dignity of judging, does, the Lord, promise you, unless, then, we begin even here to prejudge, by pre-condemning their things, which we are hereafter to condemn in themselves, they will rather judge and condemn us. Chapter, 3, Concerning the Genuineness of the Prophecy of Enoch. 
I am aware, that the scripture of Enoch, which has assigned this order, of action, to angels, is not received by some, because it is not admitted into the Jewish canon either. I suppose they did not think that, having been published before the deluge, it could have safely survived that worldwide calamity, the abolisher of all things. If that is a reason, for rejecting it, let them recall to their memory that Noah, the survivor of the deluge, was the great grandson of Enoch himself, and he, of course, had heard and remembered, from domestic renown and hereditary tradition, concerning his own great grandfather's grace in the sight of God, and concerning all his preachings, since Enoch had given no other charge to Methuselah, than that he should hand on the knowledge of them to his posterity. Noah therefore, no doubt, might have succeeded in the trusteeship of, his, preaching, or, had the case been otherwise, he would not have been silent alike concerning the disposition, of things, made by God, his preserver, and concerning the particular glory of his own house, if, Noah, had not had this, conservative power, by so short a route, there would, still, be this, consideration, to warrant our assertion of, the genuineness of, this scripture, he could equally have renewed it, under the spirit's inspiration, after it had been destroyed by the violence of the deluge. As, after the destruction of Jerusalem by the Babylonian storming of it, every document of the Jewish literature is generally agreed to have been restored through Ezra. But since Enoch in the same scripture, has preached likewise concerning the Lord, nothing at all must be rejected by us which pertains to us, and we read, that every scripture suitable for edification is divinely inspired. By the use it may now seem to have been rejected for that, very, reason, just like all the other, portions, nearly which tell of Christ. Nor, of course, is this fact wonderful, that they did not receive some scriptures which spake of him whom even in person, speaking in their presence, they were not to receive. To these considerations, is added the fact, that Enoch possesses a testimony in the Apostle Jude. Chapter 4, waiving the question of the authors, Tertullian proposes to consider the things on their own merits. Grant now that no mark of pre-condemnation has been branded on womanly pump by the, fact of the, fate of its authors, let nothing be imputed to those angels besides their repudiation of heaven, and, their, carnal marriage, let us examine the qualities of the things themselves, in order that we may detect the purposes also for which they are eagerly desired. Female habit carries with it a twofold idea, dress and ornament. By dress we mean what they call womanly gracing, by ornament, what it is suitable should be called womanly disgracing. The former is accounted, to consist, in gold, and silver, and gems, and garments, the latter in care of the hair, and of the skin, and of those parts of the body which attract the eye. Against the one we lay the charge of ambition, against the other of prostitution, so that even from this early stage, of our discussion, you may look forward and see what, out of, all, these, is suitable, handmade of God, to your discipline, inasmuch as you are assessed on different principles, from other women, those, namely, of humility and chastity. Chapter 5, Gold and Silver Not Superior in Origin, or in Utility to Other Metals. Gold and silver, the principal material causes of worldly splendor, must necessarily be identical, in nature, with that out of which they have their being, they must be, earth, that is, which earth itself is, plainly more glorious, than they, inasmuch as it is only after it has been tearfully wrought by penal labor in the deadly laboratories of a cursed mines, and there left its name of earth in the fire behind it, that, as a fugitive from the mine, it passes from torments to ornaments, from punishments to embellishments, from ignominies to honors. But iron, and brass, and other the vilest material substances, enjoy a parity of condition, with silver and gold, both as to earthly origin and metallurgic operation, in order that, in the estimation of nature, the substance of gold, and of silver may be judged not a whit more noble, than this. But if it is from the quality of utility, that gold and silver derive their glory, why, iron and brass excel them, whose usefulness is so disposed, by the Creator, that they not only discharge functions of their own more numerous and more necessary to human affairs, but do also nonetheless serve the turn of gold and silver, by dint of their own powers, in the service of juster causes. For not only are rings made of iron, but the memory of antiquity still preserves, the fame of, certain vessels for eating and drinking made out of brass. 
let the insane plenteousness of gold and silver look to it, if it serves to make utensils even for foul purposes. At all events, neither is the field tilled by means of gold, nor the ship fastened together by the strength of silver. No mattock plunges a golden edge into the ground, no nail drives a silver point into planks. I leave unnoticed the fact, that the needs of our whole life are dependent upon iron and brass, whereas those rich materials themselves, requiring both to be dug up out of mines, and needing a forging process in every use, to which they are put, are helpless without the laborious vigor of iron and brass. Already, therefore, we must judge, whence it is that, so high dignity accrues to gold and silver, since they get precedence over material substances which are not only cousin German to them in point of origin, but more powerful in point of usefulness. Chapter 6, Of Precious Stones and Pearls. But, in the next place, what am I to interpret those jewels to be which vie with gold in haughtiness, except little pebbles and stones and paltry particles of the self-same earth? but yet not necessary either for laying down foundations, or rearing party walls, or supporting pediments, or giving density to roofs. The only edifice which they know how to rear is this silly pride of women, because they require slow rubbing, that they may shine, and artful underlaying, that they may show to advantage, and careful piercing, that they may hang, and, because they, render to gold a mutual assistance in meretricious allurement. But whatever it is that ambition fishes up from the British or the Indian Sea, it is a kind of conch not more pleasing in savour than I do not say the oyster and the sea snail, but, even the giant mussel. For let me add, that I know conches, which acts, sweet fruits of the sea. But if that, foreign, conch suffers from some internal pustule, that ought to be regarded rather as its defect than as its glory, and although it be called pearl, still something else must be understood than some hard, round excrescence of the fish. Some say too, that gems are culled from the foreheads of dragons, just as in the brains of fishes there is a certain stony substance. This also was wanting to the Christian woman, that she may add a grace to herself from the serpent. Is it thus, that she will set her heel on the devil's head, while she heaps ornaments, taken, from his head on her own neck, or on her very head? Chapter 7, Rarity the only cause which makes such things valuable. It is only from their rarity and outlandishness that all these things possess their grace, in short, within their own native limits they are not held of so high worth. Abundance is always contumelious toward itself. There are some barbarians with whom, because gold is indigenous and plentiful, it is customary to keep, the criminals, in their convict establishments chained with gold, and to lay the wicked with riches the more guilty, the more wealthy, at last there has really been found a way, to prevent even gold from being loved. We have also seen at Rome the nobility of gems blushing in the presence of our matrons at the contemptuous usage of the Parthians and Meds, and the rest of their own fellow countrymen, only that, their gems, are not generally worn with a view to ostentation. Emeralds lurk in their belts, and the sword, that hangs, below their bosom alone is witness to the cylindrical stones, that decorate its hilt, and the massive single pearls on their boots, are fain to get lifted out of the mud. In short, they carry nothing so richly gemmed, as that which ought not to be gemmed if it is, either, not conspicuous, or else is conspicuous, only that it may be shown to be also neglected. Chapter 8, The same rule holds with regard to colors. God's creatures generally not to be used, except for the purposes to which he has appointed them. Similarly too, do even the servants of those barbarians cause the glory, to fade from the colors of our garments, by wearing the like, nay, even their party walls use slightingly, to supply the place of painting, the Tyrian and the violet colored and the grand royal hangings, which you laboriously undo and metamorphose. Purple with them is more paltry than red ochre, and justly, for what legitimate honor can garments derive from adulteration with illegitimate colors? That which he himself has not produced, is not pleasing to God, unless he was unable to order sheep to be born with purple and sky blue fleeces. If he was able, then plainly he was unwilling, what God willed not, of course ought not to be fashioned. Those things, then, are not the best by nature, which are not from God, the author of nature. Thus they are understood to be from the devil, from the corrupter of nature, for there is no other whose they can be, if they are not gods, because what are not gods must necessarily be his rivals. But, beside the devil and his angels, other rival of God there is none. 
Again, if the material substances are of God, it does not immediately follow that such ways of enjoying them among men, are so too. It is matter for inquiry not only whence come conscious, but what sphere of embellishment is assigned them, and where it is, that they exhibit their beauty. For all those profane pleasures of worldly shows, as we have already published a volume of their own about them, a, and, even idolatry itself, derive their material causes from the creatures of God. Yet a Christian ought not to attach himself to the frenzies of the Ratsacourse, or the atrocities of the arena, or the turpitudes of the stage, simply because God has given to man the horse, and the panther, and the power of speech, just as a Christian cannot commit idolatry with impunity either, because the incense, and the wine, and the fire which feeds, thereon, and the animals which are made the victims, are God's workmanship, since even the material thing which is adored is God's, creature. Thus then too, with regard to their active use, does the origin of the material substances, which descends from God, excuse, that use, as foreign to God, as guilty for sooth of worldly glory. Chapter 9, God's distribution must regulate our desires, otherwise we become the prey of ambition and its attendant evils. For, as some particular things distributed by God over certain individual lands, and some one particular tract of sea, are mutually foreign one to the other, they are reciprocally either neglected or desired, desired, among foreigners, as being rarities, neglected, rightly, if anywhere, among their own compatriots, because in them there is no such fervid longing for a glory which, among its own home folk, is frigid. But, However, the rareness and outlandishness which arise out of that distribution of possessions which God has ordered as he willed, ever finding favor in the eyes of strangers, excites, from the simple fact of not having what God has made native to other places, the concupiscence of having it. Hence is educed another vice, that of immoderate having, because although, perhaps, having may be permissible, still a limit is bound, to be observed. This, second vice, will be ambition, and hence too, its name is to be interpreted, in that from concupiscence ambient in the mind it is born, with a view to the desire of glory, a grand desire, for sooth, which, as we have said, is recommended neither by nature nor by truth, but by a vicious passion of the mind, namely, concupiscence, and there are other vices connected with ambition and glory. Thus they have withal enhanced the cost of things, in order that, thereby, they might add fuel to themselves also, for concupiscence becomes proportionably greater as it has set a higher value upon the thing, which it has eagerly desired. From the smallest caskets, is produced an ample patrimony, on a single thread, is suspended a million of cestuses, one delicate neck carries about it forests and islands. The slend lobes of the ears exhaust a fortune, and the left hand, with its every finger, sports with a several money bag. Such is the strength of ambition, equal, to bearing on one small body, and that a woman's, the product of so copious wealth. Book 2nd. Chapter 1. Introduction. Modesty to be observed not only in its essence, but in its accessories. Handmaids of the living God, my fellow servants and sisters, the right which I enjoy with you, I, the most meanest in that right of fellow servantship and brotherhood emboldens me to address to you a discourse, not, of course, of affection, but paving the way for affection and the cause of your salvation, that salvation, and not, the salvation, of women only, but likewise of men consists in the exhibition principally of modesty. For since, by the introduction into an appropriation us of the Holy Spirit, we are all the temple of God, modesty is the sacristan and priestess of that temple, who is to suffer nothing unclean, or profane to be introduced, into it, for fear that the God who inhabits it should be offended, and quite forsake the polluted abode. But on the present occasion we, are to speak, not about modesty, for the enjoining, and exacting of which the divine precepts which press, upon us, on every side are sufficient, but about the matters, which pertain to it, that is, the manner in which it behoves you to walk. For most women, which very thing I trust God may permit me, with a view, of course, to my own personal censure, to censure in all, either from simple ignorance, or else from dissimulation, had the hardihood so to walk, as if modesty consisted only in the, bare, integrity of the flesh, and in turning away from, actual, fornication, and there were no need for anything extrinsic. 
to boot, in the matter, I mean, of the arrangement of dress and ornament, the studied graces of form and brilliance, wearing in their gait the self same appearance as the women of the nations, from whom the sense of true modesty is absent, because in those who know not God, the guardian and master of truth, there is nothing true, for if any modesty can be believed, to exist, in Gentiles, it is plain, that it must be imperfect, and undisciplined to such a degree that, although it be actively tenacious of itself in the mind up to a certain point, it yet allows itself to relax into licentious extravagances of attire, just in accordance with Gentile perversity, in craving after that of which it carefully shuns the effect. How many a one, in short, is there who does not earnestly desire even to look pleasing to strangers, who does not on that very account take care, to have herself painted out, and denies that she has, ever, been an object of, carnal, appetite, and yet, granting that even this is a practice familiar to Gentile modesty, namely, not actually to commit the sin, but still to be willing to do so, or even not to be willing, yet still not quite to refuse, what wonder, for all things which are not gods are perverse. Let those women therefore look to it, who, by not holding fast the whole good, easily mingle with evil even what they do hold fast. Necessary it is, that you turn aside from them, as in all other things, so also in your gait, since you ought to be perfect, as your Father who is in the heavens. Chapter 2, Perfect Modesty Will Abstain From Whatever Tends to Sin, As Well As From Sin Itself. Difference Between Trust and Presumption. If secure ourselves, we must not put temptation in the way of others, we must love our neighbor as ourself. You must know that in the eye of perfect, that is, Christian, modesty, carnal, desire of oneself, on the part of others, is not only not to be desired, but even execrated, by you, first, because the study of making personal grace, which we know to be naturally the inviter of lust, a mean of pleasing, does not spring from a sound conscience. Why therefore excite toward yourself that evil, passion, why invite, that, to which you profess yourself a stranger, secondly, because we ought not to open a way to temptations, which, by their instancy, sometimes achieve, a wickedness, which God expels from them who are his, or, at all events, put the spirit into a thorough tumult by, presenting, a stumbling block, to it. We ought indeed to walk so hollowly, and with so entire substantiality of faith, as to be confident and secure in regard of our own conscience, desiring that that, gift, may abide in us to the end, yet not presuming, that it will. For he who presumes feels less apprehension, he who feels less apprehension takes less precaution, he who takes less precaution runs more risk. Fear is the foundation of salvation, presumption is an impediment to fear. More useful, then, is it to apprehend, that we may possibly fail, than to presume that we cannot, for apprehending will lead us to fear, fearing to caution, and caution to salvation. On the other hand, if we presume, there will be neither fear nor caution to save us. He who acts securely, and not at the same time warily, possesses no safe and firm security, whereas he who is wary will be truly able to be secure. For his own servants, may the Lord by his mercy, take care that to them, it may be lawful even to presume on his goodness. But why are we a, source of, danger to our neighbor? Why do we import concupiscence into our neighbor, which concupiscence, if God, in amplifying the law, do not dissociate in, the way of, penalty from the actual commission of fornication, I know not, whether he allows impunity to him who has been the cause of perdition to some other. For that other, as soon as he has felt concupiscence after your beauty, and has mentally already committed, the deed, which his concupiscence pointed to, perishes, and you have been made the sword which destroys him, so that, albeit you be free from the, actual, crime, you are not free from the odium, attaching to it, as, when a robbery has been committed on some man's estate. The, actual, crime indeed will not be laid to the owner's charge, while yet the domain is branded with ignominy, and, the owner himself aspersed with the infamy. Are we to paint ourselves out, that our neighbors may perish? Where, then, is, the command, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself? Care not merely about your own, things, but, about your, neighbors? No enunciation of the Holy Spirit ought to be, confined to the subject immediately in hand merely, and not applied and carried out with a view to every occasion to which its application is useful. 
since, therefore, both our own interest and that of others is implicated in the studious pursuit of most perilous, outward, comeliness, it is time for you to know that not merely must the pageantry of fictitious and elaborate beauty be rejected by you, but that of even natural grace must be obliterated by concealment and negligence, as equally dangerous to the glances of, the beholders, eyes. For, albeit comeliness is not to be censured, as being a bodily happiness, as being an additional outlay of the divine plastic art, as being a kind of goodly garment of the soul, yet it is to be feared, just on account of the injuriousness and violence of sweeters, which, injuriousness and violence, even the father of the faith, Abraham, greatly feared in regard of his own wife's grace, and Isaac, by falsely representing Rebecca as his sister, purchased safety by insult. Chapter 3, Grant, that beauty be not to be feared, still it is to be shunned as unnecessary and vainglorious, let it now be granted that excellence of form be not to be feared, as neither troublesome to its possessors, nor destructive to its desirers, nor perilous to its compartners, let it be thought, to be, not exposed to temptations, not surrounded by stumbling blocks. It is enough, that to angels of God it is not necessary. For, where modesty is, their beauty is idle, because properly the use and fruit of beauty is voluptuousness, unless any one thinks that there is some other harvest for bodily grace to reap. Our women who think that, in furnishing to their neighbor, that which is demanded of beauty, they are furnishing it to themselves also, to augment that, beauty, when, naturally, given them, and to strive after it when not, thus, given, Someone will say, why, then, if voluptuousness be shut out, and chastity let in, may not enjoy the praise of beauty alone, and glory in a bodily good, let whoever finds pleasure, in glorying in the flesh see to that. To us in the first place, there is no studious pursuit of glory, because glory is the essence of exaltation. Now exaltation is incongruous for professors of humility according to God's precepts. Secondly, if all glory is vain and insensate, how much more, glory, in the flesh, especially to us? For even if glorying is, allowable, we ought to wish our sphere of pleasing to lie in the graces of the spirit, not in the flesh, because we are sweeters of things spiritual. In those things wherein our sphere of labor lies, let our joy lie. From the sources, whence we hope for salvation, let us cull our glory. Plainly, a Christian will glory even in the flesh, but, it will be, when it has endured laceration for Christ's sake, in order that the spirit may be crowned in it, not in order, that it may draw the eyes and sighs of youths after it. Thus, or thing, which, from whatever point you look at it, is in your case superfluous, you may justly disdain, if you have it not, and neglect if you have. Let a holy woman, if naturally beautiful, give none so great occasion, for carnal appetite. Certainly, if even she be so, she ought not to set off, her beauty, but even to obscure it. Chapter 4, Concerning the plea of pleasing the husband, as if I were speaking to Gentiles, addressing you with a Gentile precept, and, one which is, common to all, I would say, you are bound to please your husbands only, but you will please them in proportion as you take no care to please others. Be ye without carefulness, blessed, sisters, no wife is ugly to her own husband. She pleased him enough, when she was selected, by him as his wife, whether commended by form or by character. Let none of you think that, if she abstain from the care of her person, she will incur the hatred and aversion of husbands. Every husband is the exactor of chastity, but beauty, a believing, husband, does not require, because we are not captivated by the same graces which the Gentiles think to be, graces, an unbelieving one, on the other hand, even regards with suspicion, just from that infamous opinion of us which the Gentiles have. For whom, then, is it that you cherish your beauty, if for a believer, he does not exact it, if for an unbeliever, he does not believe in it, unless it be artless. Why are you eager to please either one who is suspicious, or else one who desires it not? Chapter 5, Some Refinements in Dress and Personal Appearance Lawful, Some Unlawful, Pigments Come Under the Latter Head. These suggestions are not made to you, of course, to be developed into an entire crudity and wildness of appearance, nor are we seeking to persuade you of the good of squalor and slovenliness, but of the limit and norm and just measure of cultivation of the person. There must be no overstepping of that line to which simple and sufficient refinements limit their desires, that line which is pleasing to God. 
for they who rub their skin with medicaments, stain their cheeks with rouge, make their eyes prominent with antimony, sin against him. To them, I suppose, the plastic skill of God is displeasing. In their own persons, I suppose, they convict, they censure, the artificer of all things. For censure they, do when they're meant, when they add to, his work, taking these their additions, of course, from the adversary artificer. That adversary artificer is a devil. For who would show the way to change the body, but he who by wickedness transfigured man's spirit? He it is, undoubtedly, who adapted ingenious devices of this kind, that in your persons it may be apparent that you, in a certain sense, do violence to God. Whatever is born, is the work of God. Whatever, then, is plastered on, that, is the devil's work. To superinduce on a divine work Satan's ingenuities, how criminal is it? Our servants borrow nothing from our personal enemies, soldiers eagerly desire nothing from the foes of their own general, for, to demand for, your own, use anything from the adversary of him in whose hand you are, is a transgression. Shall a Christian be assisted in anything by that evil one? If he do, I know not whether this name, of Christian will continue, to belong, to him, for he will be his in whose law he eagerly desires to be instructed. But how alien from your schoolings and professions are, these things. How unworthy the Christian name, to wear a fictitious face, you, on whom simplicity in every form is enjoined, to lie in your appearance, you, to whom, lying, with the tongue is not lawful, to seek after what is in others, you, to whom is delivered, the precept of, abstinence, from what is in others, to practice adultery in your mean, you, who make modesty your study, think, blessed, sisters, how will you keep God's precepts, if you shall not keep in your own persons his lineaments? Chapter 6, of DYING the hair, I see some, women, turn, the color of, their hair with saffron, they are ashamed even of their own nation, ashamed, that their procreation did not assign them to Germany and to Gaul, thus, as it is, they transfer their hair, thither, ill, a, most ill, do they augur for themselves with their flame-colored head, and think that graceful which, in fact, they are polluting, may, moreover, the force of the cosmetics burns ruin into the hair, and the constant application of even any undrugged moisture, lays up a store of harm for the head, while the sun's warmth too, so desirable for imparting to the hair at once growth and dryness, is hurtful, what grace is compatible with injury, what beauty with impurities, Shall a Christian woman heap saffron on her head, as upon an altar? For, whatever is wont to be burned to the honor of the unclean spirit, that, unless it is applied for honest, and necessary, and salutary uses, for which God's creature was provided, may seem to be a sacrifice. But, however, God saith, which of you can make a white hair black, or out of a black a white? And so they refute the Lord. Behold! Say they, instead of white or black, we make it yellow, more winning in grace, and yet such as repent of having lived to old age do attempt, to change it even from white to black, O oh, temerity, the age which is the object of our wishes and prayers blushes, for itself, or theft is effected, youth, wherein we have sinned, is sighed after, the opportunity of sobriety is spoiled, far from wisdom's daughters be folly so great, the more old age tries to conceal itself, the more will it be detected. Here is a veritable eternity, in the, perennial, youth of your head. Here we have an incorruptibility to put on, with a view to the new house of the Lord which the divine monarchy promises. Well do you speed toward the Lord, well do you hasten to be quit of this most iniquitous world, to whom it is unsightly to approach, your own, end. Chapter 7, of elaborate dressing of the hair in other ways, and its bearing upon salvation. What service, again, does all the labor spent, in arranging the hair ender to salvation? Why is no rest allowed to your hair, which must now be bound, now loosed, now cultivated, now thinned out? Some are anxious to force their hair into curls, some to let it hang loose and flying, not with good simplicity, the side which, you affix I know not what enormities of subtle and textile brooks, now, after the manner of a helmet of undressed hide, as it were a sheath for the head and a covering for the crown, now, a mass, drawn, backward toward the neck, the wonder is, that there is no, open, contending against the Lord's prescripts. It has been pronounced, that no one can add to his own stature. 
You, however, do add to your weight some kind of rolls, or shield bosses, to be piled upon your necks. If you feel no shame at the enormity, feel some at the pollution, for fear you may be fitting on a holy and Christian head the slough of someone else's head, unclean perchance, guilty perchance and destined to hell, may, rather banish quite away from your free head all this slavery of ornamentation. In vain do you labor to seem adorned, in vain do you call on the aid of all the most skillful manufacturers of false hair. God bids you be veiled, I believe, he does so, for fear the heads of some should be seen. And oh that in that day of Christian exaltation, I, most miserable, as I am, may elevate my head, even though below, the level of, your heels. I shall, then, see whether you will rise with, your, seas and rouge and saffron, and in all that parade of headgear, whether it will be women thus tricked out whom the angels carry up, to meet Christ in the air if these, decorations, are now good, and of God, they will then also present themselves to the rising bodies, and will recognize their several places, but nothing can rise, except flesh and spirit soul and pure, whatever, therefore, does not rise in, the form of, spirit and flesh is condemned, because it is not of God, from things, which are condemned abstain, even at the present day, at the present day, let God see you such as he will see you then. Chap point vie, men not excluded from these remarks on personal adornment. Of course, now, I, a man, as being envious of women, am banishing them quite from their own, domains. Are there, in our case too, some things which, in respect of the sobriety we are to maintain on account of the fear due to God, are disallowed? If it is true, as it is, that in men, for the sake of women, just as in women for the sake of men, there is implanted, by a defect of nature, the will to please, and if the sex of ours acknowledges to itself deceptive trickeries of form peculiarly its own, such as, to cut the beard too sharply, to pluck it out here and there, to shave round about the mouth, to arrange the hair, and disguise its hoariness by dyes, to remove all the incipient down all over the body, to fix, each particular hair, in its place with, some, womanly pigment, to smooth all the rest of the body by the aid of some rough powder or other, then, further, to take every opportunity for consulting the minor, to gaze anxiously into it while, yet, when, once, the knowledge of God has put an end to all wish, to please by means of voluptuous attraction, all these things are rejected as frivolous, as hostile to modesty, for where God is, their modesty is, there is sobriety, her assistant and ally, how, then, shall we practice modesty without her instrumental mean, that is, without sobriety, how, moreover, shall we bring sobriety, to bear on the discharge of, the functions of, modesty, unless seriousness in appearance and in countenance, and in the general aspect of the entire man, mark our carriage. Chapter 9, Excess in Dress, as well as in Personal Culture, to be shunned. Arguments drawn from my core. Seventh. Wherefore, with regard to clothing also, and all the remaining lumber of your self-elaboration, the like pruning off, and retrenchment of too redundant splendor must be the object of your care. For what boots it to exhibit in your face temperance and unaffectedness, and a simplicity altogether worthy of the divine discipline, but to invest all the other parts of the body with the luxurious absurdities of pumps and delicacies? How intimate is the connection which these pumps have with the business of voluptuousness, and how they interfere with modesty, is easily discernible from the fact, that it is by the allied aid of dress, that they prostitute the grace of personal comeliness, so plain is it that if, the pumps, be wanting, they render, that grace, bootless and thankless, as if it were disarmed and wrecked. On the other hand, if natural beauty fails, the supporting aid of outward embellishment supplies a grace, as it were, from its own inherent power. Those times of life, in fact, which are at last blessed with quiet, and withdrawn into the harbor of modesty, the splendor and dignity of dress lure away, from that rest and that harbor, and disquiet seriousness by seductions of appetite, which compensate for the chilly of age by the provocative charms of apparel. First, then, blessed, sisters, Take heed, that you admit not to your use meretricious and prostitutionary garbs and garments, and, in the next place, if there are any of you whom the exigences of riches, or birth, or past dignities, compel to appear in public so gorgeously arrayed as not to appear to have attained wisdom, take heed to temper an evil of this kind, lest, 
Under the pretext of necessity, you give the rain without stint to the indulgence of license. For how will you be able to fulfill the requirements of humility, which are school, profess, if you do not keep within bounds the enjoyment of your riches and elegances, which tend so much to glory? Now it has ever been the wont of glory to exalt, not to humble. Why shall we not use what is our own? Who prohibits your using it? Yet, it must be, in accordance with the Apostle, who warns us to use this world, as if we abuse it not, for the fashion of this world is passing away, and they who buy, are so to act, as if they possessed not. Why so? Because he had laid down the premise, saying, the time is wound up. If, then he shows plainly, that even wives themselves are so to be, had as if they be not had, on account of the straits of the times, what would be his sentiments about these vain appliances of this? Why, are there not many, withal, who so do, and seal themselves up to eunuchhood for the sake of the kingdom of God, spontaneously relinquishing a pleasure so honorable, and, as we know, permitted? Are there not some who prohibit to themselves, the use of, the very creature of God, abstaining from wine and animal food, the enjoyments of which border upon no peril or solicitude, but they sacrifice to God the humility of their soul even in the chase and use of food, sufficiently, therefore, have you too, used your riches and your delicacies, sufficiently have you cut down the fruits of your dowries, before, receiving, the knowledge of saving disciplines, we are they upon whom the ends of the ages have met, having ended their course. We have been predestined by God, before the world was, to arise, in the extreme end of the times. And so we are trained by God for the purpose of chastising, and, so to say, emasculating, the world. We are the circumcision, spiritual and carnal, of all things, for both in the spirit, and in the flesh we circumcise worldly principles. Chapter 10, Tertullian refers again to the question of the origin of all these ornaments and embellishments. It was God, no doubt, who showed the way, to dye wools with the juices of herbs and the humors of conches. It had escaped him, when he was bidding the universe to come into being, to issue a command for, the production of, purple and scarlet sheep. It was God too, who devised by careful thought the manufactures of those very garments which, light and thin, in themselves, were to be heavy in price alone, God who produced such grand implements of gold for confining or parting the hair, God who introduced, the fashion of, finely cut wounds for the ears, and set so high a value upon the tormenting of his own work in the tortures of innocent infancy, learning to suffer with its earliest breath, in order that from those scars of the body, born for the steel, should hang I know not what, precious, grains, which, as we may plainly see, the Parthians insert, in place of studs, upon their very shoes, and yet even the gold itself, the glory of which carries you away, serves a certain race, so Gentile literature tells us, for chains. So true is it, that it is not intrinsic worth, but rarity, which constitutes the goodness, of these things, the excessive labor, moreover, of working them with arts, introduced by the means of the sinful angels, who were the revealers with all of the material substances themselves, joined with their rarity, excited their costliness, and hence a lust on the part of women to possess, that, costliness. But, if the self same angels who disclosed both the material substances of this kind and their charms of gold, I mean, and lustrous stones, and taught men how to work them, and by and by instructed them, among their other, instructions, in, the virtues of, eyelid powder and the dyings of fleeces, have been condemned by God, as Enoch tells us, how shall we please God, while we join the things of those, angels, who, on these accounts, had provoked the anger and the vengeance of God. Now, granting that God did foresee these things, that God permitted them, that Esaias finds fault with no garment of purple, represses no coil, reprobates no crescent-shaped neck ornaments, still let us not, as the Gentiles do, flatter ourselves with thinking, that God is merely a creator, not likewise a downlooker on his own creatures. For how far more usefully and cautiously shall we act, if we hazard the presumption that all these things were indeed provided at the beginning, and placed in the world by God, in order that there should now be means of putting to the proof the discipline of his servants, in order that a license of using, should be the means whereby the experimental trials of continence should be conducted.
do not wise heads of families purposely offer and permit some things to their servants in order to try whether and how they will use the things thus permitted whether they will do so with honesty or with moderation but how far more praiseworthy the servant who abstains entirely who has a wholesome fear even of his lord's indulgence thus therefore the apostle to all things says he are lawful but not all are expedient how much more easily will he fear what is unlawful who has a reverent dread of what is lawful? Chapter 11 Christian women, further, have not the same causes for appearing in public, and hence for dressing in fine array as Gentiles. On the contrary, their appearance should always distinguish them from such. Moreover, what causes have you for appearing in public in excess of grandeur, removed as you are from the occasions which call for such exhibitions? For you neither make the circuit of the temples, nor demand, to be present at, public shows, nor have any acquaintance with the holy days of the Gentiles. Now it is for the sake of all these public gatherings, and of much seeing and being seen, that all pomps, of dress, are exhibited before the public eye, either for the purpose of transacting the trade of voluptuousness, or else of inflating glory. You, however, have no cause of appearing in public, except such as is serious. Either some brother who is sick is visited, or else the sacrifice is offered, or else the word of God is dispensed. Whichever of these you like to name, is a business of sobriety and sanctity, requiring no extraordinary attire, with studious arrangement, and wanton negligence. And if the requirements of Gentile friendships, and of kindly offices call you, why not go forth clad in your own armor, and, all the more, in that, you have to go, to such as are strangers to the faith, so that between the handmaids of God, and of the devil there may be a difference, so that you may be an example to them, and they may be edified in you, so that, as the apostle says, God may be magnified in your body, but magnified he is in the body through modesty, of course too through attire suitable to modesty, well, but it is urged by some, let not the name be blasphemed in us, if we make any derogatory change from our old style and dress, let us, then, not abolish our old vices, let us maintain the same character, if we must maintain the same appearance, as before, and then truly the nations will not blaspheme, a grand blasphemy is that by which it is said, ever since she became a Christian, she walks in poorer garb, will you fear to appear poorer? from the time, that you have been made more wealthy, and fouler, from the time, when you have been made more clean, is it according to the decree of Gentiles, or according to the decree of God, that it becomes Christians to walk, chapter 12, such outward adornments meretricious, and therefore unsuitable to modest women, let us only wish, that we may be no cause for just blasphemy, but how much more provocative of blasphemy is it that you, who are called modest as priestesses, should appear in public decked and painted out after the manner of the immodest, else, if you so do, what inferiority would the poor unhappy victims of the public lusts have, beneath you, whom, albeit some laws were, formerly, won't to restrain them from, the use of, matrimonial and matronly decorations, now, at all events, the daily increasing depravity of the age has raised so nearly to an equality with all the most honorable women, that the difficulty is to distinguish them, and yet, even the scripture suggest, to us the reflection, that meretricious attractivenesses of form are invariably conjoined with and appropriate to bodily prostitution, that powerful state which presides over the seven mountains and very many waters, has merited from the Lord the appellate honor of a prostitute, but what kind of garb is the instrumental mean of her comparison with that appellate on, she sits, to be sure, in purple, and scarlet, and gold, and precious stone, how accursed are the things without, the aid of, which an accursed prostitute could not have been described, it was the fact, that Thamma had painted out, and adorned herself that led Judah, to regard her as a harlot, and thus, because she was hidden beneath her veil, the quality of her garb belying her, as if she had been a harlot, he judged, her to be one, and addressed and bargained with, her as such, whence we gather an additional confirmation of the lesson, that provision must be made in every way against all immodest associations and suspicions, for why is the integrity of a chaste mind defiled by its neighbor's suspicion, why is a thing from which I am averse hoped for in me, why does not my garb pre-announce my character, to prevent my spirit from being wounded by shamelessness through, the channel of, nay grant that it be lawful to assume the appearance of a modest woman, 
to assume that of an immodest is, at all events, not lawful. Chap. Zie, it is not enough that God know us to be chaste, we must seem so before men. Especially in these times of persecution we must endure our bodies to the hardships, which they may not improbably be called to suffer. Perhaps some woman will say, to me it is not necessary to be approved by men, for I do not require the testimony of men. God is the inspector of the heart, that we all know, provided, however, we remember what the same God has said through the apostle, let your probity appear before men. For what purpose, except that malice may have no access at all to you, or that you may be an example and testimony to the evil? Else, what is, that, let your works shine? Why, moreover, does the Lord call us the light of the world? Why has he compared us to a city, built upon a mountain, if we do not shine in, the midst of, darkness, and stand eminent amid them who are sunk down? If you hide your lamp beneath a bushel, you must necessarily be left quite in darkness, and be run against by many. The things which make us luminaries of the world are these, are good works. What is good, moreover, provided it be true and full, loves not darkness, it joys in being seen, and exalts over the very pointings which are made at it. To Christian modesty it is not enough to be so, but to seem so too. For so great ought its plenitude to be, that it may flow out from the mind to the garb, and burst out from the conscience to the outward appearance, so that even from the outside it may gaze, as it were, upon its own furniture, a furniture, such as to be sweeted to retain faith as its inmate perpetually. For such delicacies as tend by their softness and effeminacy, to unman the manliness of faith are to be discarded. Otherwise, I know not whether the wrist that has been wont to be surrounded with the palm leaf-like bracelet will endure till it grow into the numb hardness of its own chain. I know not whether the leg that has rejoiced in the anklet will suffer itself to be squeezed into the jive. I fear the neck, beset with pearl and emerald nooses, will give no room to the broad sword. Wherefore, blessed, sisters, let us meditate on hardships, and we shall not feel them, let us abandon luxuries, and we shall not regret them, let us stand ready to endure every violence, having nothing which we may fear to leave behind, it is these things which are the bonds which retard our hope, let us cast away earthly ornaments, if we desire heavenly, love not gold, in which, one substance, are branded all the sins of the people of Israel. You ought to hate what mind your fathers, what was adored by them who were forsaking God. Even then, we find, gold is food for the fire. But Christians always, and now more than ever, pass their times not in gold but in iron. The stoles of martyrdom are, now, preparing, the angels who are to carry us are, now, being awaited. Do you go forth? to meet them, already arrayed in the cosmetics and ornaments of prophets and apostles, drawing your whiteness from simplicity, your ruddy hue from modesty, painting your eyes with bashfulness, and your mouth with silence, implanting in your ears the words of God, fitting on your necks the yoke of Christ. Submit your head to your husbands, and you will be enough adorned. Busy your hands with spinning, keep your feet at home, and you will please better than by arraying yourselves in gold. Clothe yourselves with the silk of uprightness, the fine linen of holiness, the purple of modesty. Thus painted, you will have God as your lover. Translated by the Reverend S. Thelwall. Tertullian on the Pallium Chapter 1. Time changes nations' dresses, and fortunes, men of Carthage, ever princes of Africa, ennobled by ancient memories, blessed with modern felicities, I rejoice that times are so prosperous with you, that you have leisure to spend, and pleasure to find in criticizing dress, these are the piping times of peace and plenty, blessings rain from the empire, and from the sky. Still, you two of old time wore your garments your tunics of another shape, and indeed they were in repute for the skill of the weft, and the harmony of the hue, and the due proportion of the size, in that they were neither prodigally long across the shins, nor immodestly scanty between the knees, nor niggardly to the arms, nor tight to the hands, but, without being shadowed by even a girdle, arranged to divide the folds, they stood on men's backs with quadrant symmetry. The garment of the mantle extrinsically, itself to quadrangular, thrown back on either shoulder, and meeting closely round the neck in the gripe of the buckle, used to repose on the shoulders. Its counterpart is now the priestly dress, sacred to Aesculapius, whom you now call your own. 
so too, in your immediate vicinity, the sister state used to clothe, her citizens, and wherever else in Africa Tyre, has settled. But when the urn of worldly lots varied, and God favored the Romans, the sister state, indeed, of her own choice hastened to effect a change, in order that, when Scipio put in at her ports she might already beforehand have greeted him in the way of dress, precocious in her romanizing. To you, however, after the benefit in which your injury resulted, as exempting you from the infinity of age, not deposing you from your height of eminence, after Gracchus and his foul omens, after Lepidus and his rough jests, after Pompeius and his triple altars, and Caesar and his long delays, when Statilius Taurus reared your ramparts, and Sentius Saturninus pronounced the solemn form of your inauguration, while Concord lends her aid, the gown is offered. Well, what a circuit has it taken, from Pelasgians to Lydians, from Lydians to Romans, in order that from the shoulders of the sublimer people it should descend to embrace Carthaginians. Henceforth, finding your tunic too long, you suspend it on a dividing cincture, and the redundancy of your now smooth toga you support, by gathering it together fold upon fold, and, with whatever other garment social condition or dignity or season clothes you, the mantle, at any rate, which used to be worn by all ranks and conditions among you, you not only are unmindful of, but even deride. For my own part, I wonder not, thereat, in the face of more ancient evidence, of your forgetfulness. For the ram withal, not that which Liberius, calls, back twisted horned, wool skinned, stones dragging, but a beam like engine it is, which does military service, in battering walls never before poised by any, the redubted Carthage, keenest in pursuits of war, is said to have been the first of all to have equipped. For the oscillatory work of pendulous impetus, modeling the power of her engine after the choleric fury of the head of engine beast, when, however, their country's fortunes are at the last gasp, and the ram, now turned Roman, is doing his deeds of tearing against the ramparts which erst were his own, forthwith the Carthaginians stood dumbfounded as at a novel and strange ingenuity, so much doth time's long age avail to change. Thus, in short, it is that the mantle too, is not recognized. Chapter 2. The Law of Change, or Mutation, Universal. Draw we now our material from some other source, lest Punic could either blush or else grieve in the midst of Romans. To change her habit is, at all events, the stated function of entire nature. The very world itself, this which we inhabit, meantime discharges it. See to it an Aximenda, if he thinks there are more, worlds, see to it, whoever else, thinks there exists another, anywhere at the region of the Meropes, as Silenus prates in the ears of Midas, apt, as those cars are, it must be admitted, for even huger fables, may, even if Plato thinks there exists one, of which this of ours is the image, that likewise must necessarily have similarly to undergo mutation, inasmuch as, if it is a world, it will consist of diverse substances and offices, answerable to the form of, that which is here the world. For world it will not be, if it be not, just as the world is. Things which, in diversity, tend to unity, are diverse by demutation. In short, it is their vicissitudes which federate the discord of their diversity. Thus it will be by mutation, that every world will exist whose corporate structure is the result of diversities, and whose attemperation is the result of vicissitudes. At all events, this hostelry of ours is versiform, a fact which is patent to eyes that are closed, or utterly Homeric. Day and night revolve in turn. The sun varies by annual stations, the moon by monthly phases. The stars, distinct in their confusion, sometimes drop, sometimes resuscitate, somewhat. The circuit of the heaven is now resplendent with serenity, now dismal with cloud, or else rain showers come rushing down, and whatever missiles, mingle, with them, thereafter, follows, a slight sprinkling, and then again brilliance. So too, the sea has an ill repute for honesty, while at one time, the breeze is equably swaying it, tranquility gives it the semblance of probity, calm gives it the semblance of even temper, and then all of a sudden it heaves restlessly with mountain waves. Thus too, if you survey the earth, loving to clothe herself seasonably, you would nearly be ready to deny her identity, when, remembering her green, you behold her yellow, and will ere long see her hoary too. 
of the rest of her adornment also, what is there which is not subject to interchanging mutation the high ridges of her mountains by recursion, the veins of her fountains by disappearance, and the pathways of her streams by alluvial formation? There was a time when her whole orb, withal, underwent mutation, overrun by all waters. To this day marine conches and tritens horn sojourn as foreigners on the mountains, eager to prove to Plato, that even the heights have undulated. But withal, by ebbing out, her orb again underwent a formal mutation, another, but the same. Even now her shape undergoes local mutations, when, some particular, spot is damaged, when among her islands Delos is now no more, Samus a heap of sand, and the Sibyl, is thus proved, no liar, when in the Atlantic, the Isle, that was equal in size to Libya or Asia is sought in vain, when formerly a side of Italy, severed to the center by the shivering shock of the Adriatic. And the Tahenian seas, leave Sicily as its relics, when that total swoop of decision, whirling backwards the contentious encounters of the mains, invested the sea with a novel vice, the vice not of spewing out wrecks, but of devouring them, the continent as well suffers from heavenly, or else from inherent forces, glance at Palestine. Where Jordan's river is the arbiter of boundaries, behold, a vast waste, and a buried region, and bootless land. And once, there were there, cities, and flourishing peoples, and the soil yielded its fruits. Afterwards, since God is a judge, impiety earned showers of fire, Sodom's day is over, and Gomorrah is no more, and all is ashes, and the neighbor see no less than the soil experiences a living death. Such a cloud overcast Etruria, burning down her ancient Valsinii, to teach Campania, all the more by the eruption of her Pompeii to look expectantly upon her own mountains. But far be, the repetition of such catastrophes, would that Asia, with all, were by this time without cause for anxiety about the soil's veracity, would too, that Africa had once for all quailed before the devouring chasm, expiated by the treacherous absorption of one single camp. Many other such detriments besides have made innovations upon the fashion of our orb, and moved, particular, spots, in it. Very great also has been the license of wars, but it is no less irksome to recount sad details, than, to recount, the vicissitudes of kingdoms, and to show, how frequent have been their mutations, from Ninus the progeny of Belas, onwards, if indeed Ninus was the first to have a kingdom, as the ancient profane authorities assert, beyond his time the pen is not wont, to travel, in general, among you, heathens, from the Assyrians, it may be, the histories of recorded time begin to open. We, however, who are habitual readers of divine histories, are masters of the subject from the nativity of the universe itself. But I prefer, at the present time, joyous details, inasmuch as things joyous with all are subject to mutation. In short, whatever the sea has washed away, the heaven burned down, the earth undermined, the sword shorn down, reappears at some other time by the turn of compensation. For in primitive days not only was the earth, for the greater part of her circuit, empty and uninhabited, but if any particular race had seized upon any part, it existed for itself alone. And so, understanding at last that all things worshipped themselves, the earth, consulted to weed, and scrape her copiousness, of inhabitants, in one place densely packed, in another abandoning their posts, in order that thence, as it were from grass and settings, peoples from peoples, cities from cities, might be planted throughout every region of her orb. Transmigrations were made by the swarms of redundant races. The exuberance of the Scythians fertilizes the Persians, the Phoenicians gush out into Africa, the Phrygians give birth to the Romans, the seed of the Chaldeans is led out into Egypt, subsequently, when transferred thence, it becomes the Jewish race. So too, the posterity of Hercules, in likewise, proceed to occupy the Peloponnesus for the behoof of Temenus. So, again, the Ionian comrades of Nellius furnish Asia with new cities, so, again, the Corinthians with Archaeus, fortify Syracuse. But antiquity is by this time a vain thing, to refer to, when our own careers are before our eyes. How large a portion of our orb has the present age reformed, how many cities has the triple power of our existing empire either produced, or else augmented, or else restored. While God favors so many Augusti unitedly, how many populations have been transferred to other localities, how many peoples reduced, 
how many orders restored to their ancient splendor, how many barbarians battled. In truth, our orb is the admirably cultivated estate of this empire, every aconite of hostility eradicated, and the cactus and bramble of clandestinely crafty familiarity wholly uptorn, and, the orb itself, delights them beyond the orchard of Alcinus and the rosary of Midas, praising, therefore, our orb in its mutations, why do you point the finger of scorn at a man? Chapter 3, Beasts similarly subject to the law of mutation. Beasts too, instead of a garment, change their form, and yet the peacock withal has plumage for a garment, and a garment indeed of the choicest, nay, in the bloom of his neck richer than any purple, and in the effulgence of his back more gilded than any edging, and in the sweep of his tail more flowing than any train, many colored, diverse colored, and versi colored, never itself, ever another, albeit ever itself when other, in a word. Mutable as oft as movable. The serpent too, deserves to be mentioned, albeit not in the same breath as the peacock, for he too wholly changes what has been allotted him his hide and his age, if it is true, as it is, that when he has felt the creeping of old age throughout him, he squeezes himself into confinement, crawls into a cave, and out of his skin simultaneously, and, clean shorn on the spot. Immediately on crossing the threshold leaves his slough behind him then and there, and uncoils himself in a new youth, with his scales his years too, are repudiated. The hyena, if you observe, is of an annual six, alternately masculine and feminine. I say nothing of the stag, because himself withal, the witness of his own age, feeding on the serpent, languishes, from the effect of the poison, into youth. There is, withal, a tardigrade field haunting quadruped, humble and rough. The tortoise of Percuvius, you think? No. There is another beastling which the versicle fits, in size, one of the moderate exceedingly, but a grand name. If, without previously knowing him, you hear tell of a chameleon, you will at once apprehend something, yet more huge united with a lion. But when you stumble upon him, generally in a vine yard, his whole bulk sheltered beneath a vine leaf, you will forthwith laugh at the egregious audacity of the name, inasmuch as there is no moisture even in his body, though in far more minute creatures the body is liquefied, the chameleon is a living pellicle, his head can begin straight from his spine, for neck he has none, and thus reflection is hard for him, but, in circumspection, his eyes are out darting, nay, they are evolving points of light. Dull and weary, he scarce raises from the ground, but drags, his footstep amazedly, and moves forward, he rather demonstrates, than takes, a step, ever fasting, to boot, yet never fainting, a gape he feeds, heaving, bellows like, he ruminates, his food wind, yet with all the chameleon is able to effect a total self-mutation, and that is all. For, whereas his color is properly one, yet, whenever anything has approached him, then he blushes. To the chameleon alone has been granted, as our common saying, has it to sport with his own hide. Much had to be said in order that, after due preparation, we might arrive at man. From whatever beginning you admit him as springing, naked at all events, and ungarmented he came from his fashioner's hand, afterwards, at length, without waiting for permission, he possesses himself, by a premature grasp, of wisdom. Then in their hastening to fork over what, in his newly made body, it was not yet due to modesty, to fork over, he surrounds himself meantime with fig leaves, subsequently, on being driven from the confines of his birthplace, because he had sinned, he went, skin clad, to the world as to a mine, but these are secrets, nor does their knowledge appertain to all. Come, let us hear from your own store, a store, which the Egyptians narrate, and Alexander digests, and his mother reads touching the time of Osiris, when Ammon, rich in sheep, comes to him out of Libya. In short, they tell us that Mercury, when among them, delighted with the softness of a ram which he had chanced to stroke, flayed a little ewe, and, while he persistently tries, and, as the pliancy of the material invited him, thins out the thread by assiduous traction, wove it into the shape of the pristine net which he had joined with strips of linen. But you have preferred to assign all the management of wool work and structure of the loom to Minerva, whereas a more diligent workshop was presided over by Arachne. Thenceforth material, was abundant, 
nor do I speak of the sheep of Miletus, and Selge, and Autonum, or of those for which Tarentum or Betica is famous, with nature for their dire, but, I speak of the fact, that shrubs are for due clothing, and the grassy parts of flax, losing their greenness, turn white by washing. Nor was it enough to plant and sow your tunic, unless it had likewise fallen to your lot to fish for raiment. For the sea with all yields fleeces, inasmuch as the more brilliant shells of a mossy wooliness furnish a hairy stuff. Further, it is no secret, that the silkworm, a species of wormling it is, presently reproduces safe and sound, the fleecy threads, which, by drawing them through the air, she distends more skillfully than the dial-like webs of spiders, and then devours. In like manner, if you kill it, the threads which you coil, are forthwith instinct with vivid color. The ingenuities, therefore, of the tailoring art, superadded to, and following up, so abundant a store of materials first with a view to coveting humanity, where necessity led the way, and subsequently with a view to adorning with all, a, and inflating it, where ambition followed in the wake, have promulgated the various forms of garments, of which forms, part are worn by particular nations, without being common to the rest part, on the other hand, universally, as being useful to all, as, for instance, this mantle, albeit it is more Greek, than Latin, has yet by this time found, in speech, a home in Latium, with the word the garment entered, and accordingly the very man who used to sentence Greeks to extrusion from the city, but learned, when he was now advanced in years, their alphabet and speech the self same Cato, by bearing his shoulder at the time of his praetorship, showed no less favor to the Greeks by his mantle-like garb. Chap. Fourth change not always improvement. Why, now, if the Roman fashion is, social, salvation to every one, are you nevertheless Greek to a degree, even in points not honorable? Or else, if it is not so, whence in the world, is it that provinces which have had a better training, provinces which nature adapted rather for surmounting by hard struggling the difficulties of the soil, derive the pursuits of the wrestling ground pursuits which fall into a sad old age and labor in vain in the unction with mud, and the rolling in sand, and the dry dietary? Whence comes it, that some of our Nomidians, with their long locks made longer by horsetail plumes, learn to bid the barber shave their skin clothes, and to exempt their crown alone from the knife? Whence comes it that men shaggy and hirsute learn to teach the resin, to feed on their arms with such rapacity, the tweezers to weed their chin so thievishly? A prodigy it is, that all this should be done without the mantle. To the mantle, appertains this whole Asiatic practice. What hast thou, Libya, and thou, Europe? to do with athletic refinements, which thou now est not how to dress. For, in sooth, what kind of thing is it to practice Greekish depilation more than Greekish attire? The transfer of dress approximates to culpability just in so far as it is not custom, but nature, which suffers the change. There is a wide enough difference between the honor due to time, and religion. Let custom show fidelity to time, nature to God. To nature, accordingly, the Lerisian hero gave a shock, by turning into a virgin, he who had been reared on the marrows of wild beasts, whence too, was derived the composition of his name, because he had been a stranger with his lips to the maternal breast, he who had been reared by a rocky and wood haunting and monstrous trainer in a stony school, you would bear patiently, if it were in a boy's case, his mother's solicitude, but he at all events was already beheaded. He at all events, had already secretly given proof of his manhood to someone, when he consents to wear the flowing stole, to dress his hair, to cultivate his skin, to consult the mirror, to bedizen his neck, effeminated even as to his ear by boring, whereof his busted sagium still retains the trace. Plainly afterwards he turned soldier, for necessity restored him his sex. The clarion had sounded of battle, nor were arms far to seek. The steel self, says, Homer, attracteth the hero. Else if, after that incentive as well as before, he had persevered in his maidenhood, he might with all have been married. Behold, accordingly, mutation. A monster, I call him, a double monster, from man to woman, by and by from woman to man, whereas neither ought the truth to have been belied, nor the deception confessed. Each fashion of changing was evil, the one opposed to nature, the other contrary to safety. Still more disgraceful was the case when lust transfigured a man in his dress, than when some maternal dread did so, and yet adoration is offered by you to me, whom you ought to blush at, that club shaft and Hidabra, 
who exchanged for womanly attire the whole proud heritage of his name. Such license was granted to the secret haunts of Lydia, that Hercules was prostituted in the person of Omphale, and Omphale in that of Hercules. Where were Diamond and his gory mangers, where Bucyrus and his funereal altars, where Jaron, triply won. The club preferred still, to reek with their brains, when it was being pestered with unguents. The now veteran, stain of the, hydras and of the centaur's blood upon the shafts, was gradually eradicated by the pumice stone. Familiar to the hairpin, while voluptuousness insulted over the fact that, after transfixing monsters, they should perchance sew a coronet. No sober woman even, or heroine of any note, would have adventured her shoulders beneath the hide of such a beast, unless after long softening and smoothening down and deodorization, which in Omphale's house, I hope, was effected by balsam and fenugreek salve. I suppose the main two, submitted to the comb, for fear of getting her tender neck imbued with lionly toughness. The yawning mouth stuffed with hair, the jaw teeth overshadowed amid the forelocks, the whole outraged visage, would have roared, had it been able. Nemia, at all events, if the spot has any presiding genius, groaned, for then she looked around, and saw that she had lost her lion. What sort of being the said Hercules was in Omphale's silk, the description of Omphale in Hercules' hide has inferentially depicted. But, again, he who had formerly rivaled the Tyrinthian, the pugilist Cleomachus, subsequently, at Olympia, after losing by efflux his masculine sex by an incredible mutation, bruised within his skin and without, worthy to be wreathed among the fullers even of Novius, and deservedly commemorated by the mimographer Lynchulus in his catenensions did. Of course, not only cover with bracelets the traces left by, the bands of, the Cestus, but likewise supplanted the coarse ruggedness of his athlete's cloak with some super finely wrought tissue. Of Fisco and Sardanapalus I must be silent, whom, but for their eminence in lusts, no one would recognize as kings. But I must be silent, for fear lest even they set up a muttering concerning some of your Caesars, equally lost to shame, for fear lest a mandate have been given to canine constancy, to point to a Caesar impurer than Fisco, softer than Sardanapalus, and indeed a second Nero. Nor less warmly does the force of vainglory also work for the mutation of clothing, even while manhood is preserved. Every affection is a heat, when, however, it is blown to, the flame of, affectation. Forthwith, by the blaze of glory, it is an ardor. From this fuel, therefore, you see a great king, inferior only to his glory, seething. He had conquered the Median race, and was conquered by Median garb. Doffing the triumphal mail, he degraded himself into the captive trousers. The breast is sculptured with scaly bosses, by covering it with a transparent texture he bared, punting still after the work of war, and, as it were, softening, he extinguished it with the ventilating silk. Not sufficiently swelling of spirit was the Macedonian, unless he had likewise found delight in a highly inflated garb, only that philosophers withal, I believe, themselves affect somewhat of that kind, for I hear that there has been, such a thing as, philosophizing in purple. If a philosopher, appears, in purple, why not in glided slippers too? For a Tyrian to be shod in anything but gold, is by no means consonant with Greek habits. Someone will say, well, but there was another who wore silk indeed, and shod himself in brazen sandals. Worthily, indeed, in order that at the bottom of his Bacantian raiment he might make some tinkling sound, did he walk in cymbals. But if, at that moment, Diogenes had been barking from his tub, he would not, have trodden on him, with muddy feet as the platonic couches testify, but would have carried him pedicles down bodily to the secret recesses of the Closini, in order that he who had madly thought himself a celestial being might, as a god, salute first his sisters, and afterwards men. Such garments, therefore, as alienate from nature and modesty, let it be allowed to be just to eye fixedly, and pointed with the finger, and exposed to ridicule by a nod. Just so, if a man were to wear a dainty robe trailing on the ground with men and the like effeminacy, he would hear replied to himself that which the comedian says what sort of a cloak is that maniac wasting? For, now that the contracted brow of sensorial vigilance is long since smoothed down, so far as reprehension is concerned, promiscuous usage offers to a gay Swedeman in equestrian garb, branded slaves in that of gentlemen, the notoriously infamous, in that of the freeborn. 
clowns and that of city folk, buffoons and that of lawyers, rustics and regimentals, the corpse bearer, the pimp, the gladiator trainer. Clothe themselves as you do, turn, again, to women. You have to behold what key sinner severus pressed upon the grove attention of the senate, matrons stole us in public. In fact, the penalty inflicted by the decrees of the Orgolinchulus upon any matron, who had thus cashiered herself was the same as for fornication, inasmuch as certain matrons had sedulously promoted the disuse of garments which were the evidences and guardians of dignity, as being impediments to the practicing of prostitution. But now, in their self-prostitution, in order that they may the more readily be approached, they have abjured stole, and chemise, and bonnet, and cap, yes, and even the very litters and sedans in which they used to be kept in privacy and secrecy even in public. But while one extinguishes her proper adornments, another blazes forth such as are not hers. Look at the street walkers, the shambles of popular lusts, also at the female self-abusers with their six, and, if it is better to withdraw your eyes from such shameful spectacles of publicly slaughtered chastity, yet do but look with eyes askance, and, you will at once see, them to be, matrons. And, while the overseer of brothels airs her swelling silk, and consoles her neck, more impure than her haunt, with necklaces, and inserts in the armlets, which even matrons themselves would, of the goodens bestowed upon brave men, without hesitation have appropriated, hands privy to all that is shameful, while, she fits on her impure leg the pure. White or pink shoe, why do you not stare at such garbs, or, again, at those which falsely plead religion as the supporter of their novelty, while for the sake of an all-white dress, and the distinction of a fillet, and the privilege of a helmet, some are initiated into, the mysteries of, sets, while, on account of an opposite hankering after somber raiment, and a gloomy woolen covering upon the head. Others run mad in Bellona's temple, while the attraction of surrounding themselves with a tunic more broadly striped with purple, and casting over their shoulders a cloak of Galatian scarlet, commends Saturn, to the affections of others, when this mantle itself, arranged with more rigorous care, and sandals after the Greek model, served to flatter Aesculapius, how much more should you then accuse and assail it with your eyes, as being guilty of superstition albeit superstition simple and unaffected. Certainly, when first it clothes this wisdom which renounces superstitions with all their vanities, then most assuredly is the mantle, above all the garments in which you array your gods and goddesses, an august robe, and, above all the caps and tufts of your salii and flamines, a sacerdotal attire. Lower your eyes, I advise you, and, reverence the garb, on the one ground, meantime, without waiting for others, of being a renouncer of your error. Chapter 5, Virtues of the Mantle. It pleads in its own defense still, say you, must we thus change from gown to mantle? Why, what if from diadem and scepter? Did an achasis change otherwise, when to the royalty of Scythia he preferred philosophy? Grant that there be no, miraculous, signs in proof of your transformation for the better, there is somewhat which this your garb can do. For, to begin with the simplicity of its uptaking, it needs no tedious arrangement. Accordingly, there is no necessity for any artist formally, to dispose its wrinkled folds from the beginning a day beforehand, and then to reduce them to a more finished elegance, and to assign to the guardianship of the stretchers the whole figment of the masked boss, subsequently, at daybreak, first gathering up by the aid of a girdle the tunic which it would better to have woven of more moderate length, in the first instance and, again scrutinizing the boss, and rearranging any disarrangement, to make one part prominent on the left, but, making now an end of the folds, to draw backwards from the shoulders a circuit of it, whence the hollow is formed, and, leaving the right shoulder free, heap it still upon the left, with another similar set of folds reserved for the back, and thus clothe the man with a burden. In short, I will persistently ask your own conscience, what is your first sensation in wearing your gown? Do you feel yourself clad, or aided, wearing a garment, or carrying it? If you shall answer negatively, I will follow you home, I will see what you hasten to do immediately, after crossing your threshold. There is really no garment the dulling whereof congratulates a man more than the gowns does. Of shoes we say nothing, implements as they are of torture proper to the gown, most uncleanly protection to the feet, yes, and false too. For who would not find it expedient, in cold and heat? to stiffen with feet bare, rather than in a shoe with feet bound, 
a mighty munition for the tread have the Venetian shoe factories, provided in the shape of effeminate boots. Well, but, than the mantle nothing is more expedite, even if it be double, like that of crates. Nowhere is there a compulsory waste of time in dressing yourself, in it, seeing that its whole art consists in loosely covering. That can be effected by a single circumjection, and one in no case inelegant, thus it wholly covers every part of the man at once. The shoulder it either exposes or encloses, in other respects it adheres to the shoulder, it has no surrounding support, it has no surrounding tie, it has no anxiety as to the fidelity with which its folds keep their place, easily it manages, easily readjusts itself, even in the dulling it is consigned to no cross until the morrow. If any shirt is worn beneath it, the torment of a girdle is superfluous, if anything in the way of shoeing is worn, it is a most cleanly work, or else the feet are rather bare, more manly, at all events, if bare, than in shoes. These, please I advance, for the mantle in the meantime, in so far as you have defamed it by name. Now, however, it challenges you on the score of its function with all. I, it says, owe no duty to the forum, the election ground, or the senate house, I keep no obsequious vigil, preoccupy no platforms, hover about no praetorian residences, I'm not odorant of the canals, I'm not odorant of the lattices, I'm no constant wearer out of benches, no wholesale router of laws, no barking pleader, no judge, no soldier, no king, I have withdrawn from the populace. My only business is with myself, except that other care I have none, save not to care. The better life you would more enjoy in seclusion than in publicity, but you will decry me as indolent. Forsooth, we are to live for our country, and empire, and estate. Such used, of old, to be the sentiment, none is born for another, being destined to die for himself. At all events, when we come to the Epicurean Zenones, you give the epithet of sages to the whole teacherhood of quietude, who have consecrated that quietude with the name of supreme and unique pleasure. Still, to some extent it will be allowed, even to me, to confer benefit on the public. From any and every boundary stone or altar it is my wont to prescribe medicines to morals, medicines which will be more felicitous, in conferring good health upon public affairs, and states, and empires, than your works are. Indeed, if I proceed to encounter you with naked foils, gowns have done the commonwealth more hurt than cuirasses. Moreover, I flatter no vices, I give quarter to no lethargy, no slothful incrustation. I apply the cauterizing iron to the ambition, which led M. Tullius, to buy a circular table of citron wood for more than four thousand, and a sinuous gallus to pay twice as much for an ordinary table of the same Moorish wood, hem, at what fortunes did they value woody dapplings, or, again, sell at a frame dishes of an hundred pound weight. I fear lest, that balance be small, when a Drusillanus, and he withal a slave of Claudius, constructs a tray of the weight of 500 lbs, a tray indispensable, perchance, to the aforesaid tables, for which, if a workshop was erected, there ought to have been erected a dining room too. Equally do I plunge the scalpel into the inhumanity, which led Vedius Palio to expose slaves, to fill the bellies of sea eels. Delighted, forsooth. With his novel savagery, he kept land monsters, toothless, clawless, hornless, it was his pleasure to turn perforce into wild beasts his fish, which, of course, were to be forthwith cooked, that in their entrails he himself with all might taste some savour of the bodies of his own slaves. I will fall up the gluttony which led Hortensius the orator, to be the first to have the heart to slay a peacock for the sake of food, which led Orphidius Lurco to be the first to vitiate meat with stuffing, and by the aid of force meats, to raise them to an adulterous flavor, which led a senior seller to purchase the vine of a single mullet at nearly fifty, which led Aesopus the actor, to preserve in his pantry a dish of the value of nearly 800, made up of birds of the self-same costliness, as the mullet aforesaid, consisting of all the songsters and talkers, which led his son, after such a tidbit, to have the hardihood, to hunger after somewhat yet more sumptuous, for he swallowed down pearls, costly even on the ground of their name, I suppose for fear he should have supped more beggarly than his father, I'm silent as to the Nerus and the Percy and Rufi. I will give a cathartic to the impurity of a Scorus, and the gambling of a Curious, and the intemperance of an Antony, and remember that these, out of the many, whom I have named, were men of the toga such as among the men of the Pallium you would not easily find. 
these purulences of a state who will eliminate and exuperate, save a bemantled speech, chapter 6, further distinctions, and crowning glory, of the pallium, with speech, says, my antagonist, you have tried to persuade me, a most sage medicament. But, albeit utterance be mute impeded by infancy or else checked by bashfulness, for life is content with an even tongueless philosophy, my very cut is eloquent. A philosopher, in fact, is heard so long as he is seen. My very sight puts vices to the blush. Who suffers not, when he sees his own rival? Who can bear to gaze ocularly at him at whom mentally he cannot? Grand is the benefit conferred by the mantle, at the thought whereof moral improbity absolutely blushes. Let philosophy now see to the question of her own profitableness, for she is not the only associate whom I boast. Other scientific arts of public utility I boast. From my store, are closed the first teacher of the forms of letters, the first explainer of their sounds, the first trainer in the rudiment of arithmetic, the grammarian, the rhetorician, the sophist, the medical man, the poet, the musical time-beater, the astrologer, and the burgesser. All that is liberal in studies, is covered by my four angles. True, but all these rank lower than Roman knights. Well, but your gladiatorial trainers, and all their ignominious following, are conducted into the arena in togas. This, no doubt, will be the indignity implied in from gown to mantle. Well, so speaks the mantle. But I confer on it likewise a fellowship with a divine sect and discipline, joy, mantle, and exult. A better philosophy has now deigned to honor thee, ever since thou hast begun to be a Christian's vesture. Translated by the Reverend S. Thelwall. Tertullian on the veiling of virgins chapter 1. Truth rather to be appealed to than custom, and truth progressive in ITS developments. Having already undergone the trouble peculiar to my opinion, I will show in Latin also that it behoves our virgins to be veiled from the time that they have passed the turning point of their age, that this observance is exacted by truth, on which no one can impose prescription, no space of times, no influence of persons no privilege of regions, for these, for the most part, are the sources whence, from some ignorance or simplicity, custom finds its beginning, and then it is successionally confirmed into an usage, and thus is maintained in opposition to truth. But our Lord Christ has surnamed himself truth, not custom. If Christ is always, and prior to all, equally truth is a thing sempiternal and ancient. Let those therefore look to themselves to whom that is new which is intrinsically old. It is not so much novelty as truth which convicts heresies. Whatever savours of opposition to truth, this will be heresy, even, if it be an, ancient custom. On the other hand, if any is ignorant of anything, the ignorance proceeds from his own defect. Moreover, whatever is matter of ignorance ought to have been as carefully inquired into as whatever is matter of acknowledgement received. The rule of faith, indeed, is altogether one, alone immovable and irreformable, the rule, to wit, of believing in one only God omnipotent, the creator of the universe, and his son Jesus Christ, born of the Virgin Mary, crucified under Pontius Pilate, raised again the third day from the dead, received in the heavens, sitting now at the right, hand, of the Father, destined to come to judge quick and dead through the resurrection of the flesh as well as of the spirit. This law of faith being constant, the other succeeding points of discipline and conversation admit the novelty of correction. The grace of God, to wit, operating and advancing even to the end. For what kind of, supposition, is it, that, while the devil is always operating and adding daily to the ingenuities of iniquity, the work of God should either have ceased, or else have desisted from advancing? Whereas the reason why the Lord sent the paraclete was, that, since human mediocrity was unable to take in all things at once, discipline should, little by little, be directed, and ordained, and carried on to perfection, by that vicar of the Lord, the Holy Spirit. Still, he said, I have many things to say to you, but ye are not yet able to bear them, when that spirit of truth shall have come, he will conduct you into all truth and will report to you the supervening, things. But above, with all, he made a declaration concerning this his work. What, then, is the paraclete's administrative office but this, 
the direction of discipline, the revelation of the scriptures, the reformation of the intellect, the advancement toward the better things. Nothing is without stages of growth, all things await their season. In short, the preacher says, a time to everything. Look how creation itself advances little by little to fructification. First comes the grain, and from the grain arises the shoot, and from the shoot struggles out the shrub. Thereafter boughs and leaves gather strength, and the hold that we call a tree expands, then follows the swelling of the German, and from the German bursts the flower, and from the flower the fruit opens, that fruit itself, rude for a while, and unshapely, little by little, keeping the straight course of its development, is trained to the mellowness of its flavor. So, too, righteousness for the God of righteousness and of creation is the same was first in a rudimentary state having a natural fear of God, from that stage it advanced, through the law and the prophets, to infancy, from that stage it passed, through the gospel, to the fervor of youth, now, through the paraclete, it is settling into maturity, he will be, after Christ, the only one to be called and revered as master, for he speaks not from himself, but what is commanded by Christ, he is the only prelate because he alone succeeds Christ. They who have received him set truth before custom. They who have heard him prophesying even to the present time, not of old, bid virgins be wholly covered. Chapter 2, Before proceeding farther, let the question of custom itself be sifted. But I will not, meantime, attribute this usage to truth. Be it, for a while, custom, that to custom I may likewise oppose custom. Throughout Greece, and certain of its barbaric provinces, the majority of churches keep their virgins covered. There are places, too, beneath this, African, sky, where this practice obtains, lest any ascribe the custom to Greek or barbarian gentlehood. But I have proposed, as models, those churches which were founded by apostles or apostolic men, and antecedently, I think, to certain, founders who shall be nameless. Those churches therefore, as well, as others, have the self-same authority of custom, to appeal to, in opposing phalanx they range times and teachers, more than these later, churches do. What shall we observe? What shall we choose? We cannot contemptuously reject a custom which we cannot condemn, inasmuch as it is not strange, since it is not among strangers that we find it, but among those, to wit, with whom we share the law of peace and the name of brotherhood. They and we have one faith, one God, the same Christ, the same hope, the same baptismal sacraments, let me say it once for all, we are one church. Thus, whatever belongs to our brethren is ours, only, the body divides us. Still, here, as generally happens in all cases of various practice, of doubt, and of uncertainty, Examination ought to have been made to see which of two so diverse customs were the more compatible with the discipline of God. And, of course, that ought to have been chosen which keeps virgins veiled, as being known to God alone, who, besides that glory must be sought from God, not from men, ought to blush even at their own privilege. You put a virgin to the blush more by praising than by blaming her, because the front of sin is more hard learning shamelessness from and in the sin itself, for that custom which belies virgins while it exhibits them, would never have been approved by any except by some men who must have been similar in character to the virgins themselves. Such eyes will wish that a virgin be seen as has the virgin who shall wish to be seen. The same kinds of eyes reciprocally crave after each other. Seeing and being seen belong to the self-same lust. To blush if he see a virgin is as much a mark of a chaste man, as of a chaste virgin if seen by a man. Chapter 3, Gradual Development of Custom and ITS results, passionate appeal to truth, but not even between customs of those most chaste s teachers chosen to examine, still, until very recently, among us, either custom was, with comparative indifference, admitted to communion, the matter had been left to choice, for each virgin to veil herself or expose herself, as she might have chosen, just as, she had equal liberty, as to marrying which itself with all is neither enforced nor prohibited. Truth had been content to make an agreement with custom, 
in order that under the name of custom it might enjoy itself even partially. But when the power of discerning began to advance, so that the license granted to either fashion was becoming the mean whereby the indication of the better part emerged, immediately the great adversary of good things and much more of good institutions set to his own work. The virgins of men go about, in opposition to the virgins of God, with front quite bare, excited to a rash audacity, and the semblance of virgins is exhibited by women who have the power of asking somewhat from husbands, not to say such a request as that, forsooth, their rivals all the more free in that they are the handmaids of Christ alone may be surrendered to them. We are scandalized, they say, because others walk otherwise, than we do, and they prefer being scandalized to being provoked, to modesty. A scandal, if I mistake not, is an example not of a good thing, but of a bad, tending to sinful edification. Good things scandalize none but an evil mind. If modesty, if bashfulness, if contempt of glory, anxious to please God alone, are good things, let women who are scandalized by such good learn to acknowledge their own evil. For what if the incontinent with all say they are scandalized by the continent? Is continence to be recalled? And, for fear the multinubists be scandalized, is monogamy to be rejected? Why may not these latter rather complain that the petulance, the impudence, of ostentatious virginity is a scandal to them. Are therefore chaste virgins to be, for the sake of these marketable creatures, dragged into the church, blushing at being recognized in public, quaking at being unveiled, as if they had been invited as it were to rape? For they act no less unwilling to suffer even this. Every public exposure of an honorable virgin is, to her, a suffering of rape, and yet the suffering of carnal violence is the less, evil, because it comes of natural office, but when the very spirit itself is violated in a virgin by the abstraction of her covering, she has learned to lose what she used to keep. O oh, sacrilegious hands, which have had the hardihood to drag off a dress dedicated to God, what worse could any persecutor have done, if he had known that this, garb, had been chosen by a virgin? You have denuded a maiden in regard of her head, and forthwith she wholly ceases to be your virgin to herself she has undergone a change. Arise, therefore, truth, arise, and as it were burst forth from thy patience. No custom do I wish thee to defend, for by this time even that custom under which thou didst enjoy thy own liberty is being stormed. Demonstrate that it is thyself who art the coverer of virgins. Interpret in person thine own scriptures, which custom understandeth not, for, if she had, she never would have had an existence. Chapter 4, of the argument drawn from Cor, 11, 5, 16. But in so far as it is the custom to argue even from the scriptures in opposition to truth, there is immediately urged against us the fact that no mention of virgins is made by the apostle where he is prescribing about the veil, but that women only are named, whereas, if he had willed virgins as well to be covered, he would have pronounced concerning virgins also together with the women named, just as, says, our opponent, in that passage where he is treating of marriage. He declares likewise with regard to virgins what observance is to be followed, and accordingly, it is urged, that they are not comprised in the law of veiling the head, as not being named in this law, nay rather, that this is the origin of their being unveiled inasmuch as they who are not named are not bidden. But we with all retort the self-same line of argument. For he who knew elsewhere how to make mention of each sex of virgin I mean, and woman, that is, not virgin for distinction's sake, in these, passages, in which he does not name a virgin, points out, by not making the distinction, community of condition. Otherwise he could here also have marked the difference between virgin and woman just as elsewhere he says, divided is the woman and the virgin. Therefore those whom, by passing them over in silence, he has not divided, he has included in the other species. Nor yet, because in that case divided is both woman and virgin, will this division exert its patronizing influence in the present case as well, as some will have it. For how many sayings, uttered on another occasion, have no weight in cases, to wit, where they are not uttered unless the subject matter be the same as on the other occasion, so that the one utterance may suffice, 
but the former case of virgin and woman is widely divided from the present question. Divided, he says, is the woman and the virgin. Why? Inasmuch as the unmarried, that is, the virgin, is anxious about those things, which are the Lord's, that she may be holy both in body and in spirit, but the married, that is, the not virgin, is anxious how she may please her husband. This will be the interpretation of that division, having no place in this passage, now under consideration, in which pronouncement is made neither about marriage, nor about the mind and the thought of woman and of virgin, but about the veiling of the head, of which, veiling, the Holy Spirit, willing that there should be no distinction, will that by the one name of woman should likewise be understood the virgin, whom, by not specially naming, he has not separated from the woman, and, by not separating, has conjoined to her from whom he has not separated her. Is it now, then, a novelty to use the primary word, and nevertheless to have the other, subordinate divisions, understood in that word, in cases where there is no necessity for individually distinguishing their, various parts of the, universal whole? Naturally, a compendious style of speech is both pleasing and necessary, inasmuch as diffuse speech is both tiresome and vain. So, too, we are content with general words, which comprehend in themselves the understanding of the specialties. Proceed we, then, to the word itself. The word, expressing their, natural, distinction, is female, of the natural word, the general word is woman, of the general, again, the special is virgin, or wife, or widow, or whatever other names, even of the successive stages of life, are added here too. Subject, therefore, the special is to the general, because the general is prior, and the succedent to the antecedent, and the partial to the universal, each is implied in the word itself to which it is subject, and is signified in it, because contained in it. Thus neither hand, nor foot, nor any one of the members, requires to be signified when the body is named. And if you say the universe, therein will be both the heaven and the things that are in it, comma sun and moon, and constellations and stars, comma and the earth and the seas, and everything that goes to make up the list of elements. You will have named all when you have named that which is made up of all. So, too, by naming woman, he has named whatever is woman's. Chapter 5. Dot of the word woman, especially in connection with ITS application to Eve. But since they use the name of woman in such a way as to think it inapplicable save to her alone who has known a man, the pertinence of the propriety of this word to the sex itself, not to a grade of the sex, must be proved by us, that virgins as well as others, may be commonly comprised in it. When this kind of second human being was made by God for man's assistance, that female was forthwith named woman, still happy, still worthy of paradise, still virgin. She shall be called, said, Adam, woman, and accordingly you have the name comma, I say, not already common to a virgin, but proper, to her, a name which from the beginning was allotted to a virgin. But some ingeniously will have it that it was said of the future, she shall be called woman, as if she were destined to be so when she had resigned her virginity, since he added with all, for this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and be conglutinated to his own woman, and the two shall be one flesh. Let them therefore among whom that subtlety obtains show us first, if she were surnamed woman with a future reference what name she meantime received, for without a name expressive of her present quality she cannot have been. But what kind of, hypothesis, is it that one who, with an eye to the future, was called by a definite name, at the present time should have nothing for a surname? On all animals Adam imposed names, and on none on the ground of future condition, but on the ground of the present purpose which each particular nature served, called, as each nature was, by that to which from the beginning it showed a propensity. What, then, was she at that time called? Why, as often as she is named in the scripture, she has the appellation woman before she was wedded, and never virgin while she was a virgin. This name was at that time the only one she had, and, that, when nothing was, as yet, said prophetically. For when the scripture records that the two were naked, Adam and his woman, neither does this savor of the future 
as if it said his woman as a presage of wife, but because his woman was withal unwedded, as being, formed, from his own substance. This bone, he says, out of my bones, and flesh out of my flesh, shall be called woman. Hence, then, it is from the tacit consciousness of nature that the actual divinity of the soul has educed into the ordinary usage of common speech, unawares to men, just as it has thus educed many other things to which we shall elsewhere be able to show to derive from the scriptures the origin of their doing and saying, our fashion of calling our wives our women, however improperly with all we may in same instances speak. For the Greeks, too, who use the name of woman more, than we do, in the sense of wife, have other names appropriate to wife. But I prefer to assign this usage as a testimony to scripture. For when two are made into one flesh through the marriage tie, the flesh of flesh and bone of bones is called the woman of him of whose substance she begins to be accounted by being made his wife. Thus woman is not by nature a name of wife, but wife by condition is a name of woman. In fine, womanhood is predicable apart from wifehood but wifehood apart from womanhood is not, because it cannot even exist. Having therefore settled the name of the newly made female which, name, is woman and having explained what she formerly was, that is, having sealed the name to her, he immediately turned to the prophetic reason, so as to say, on this account shall a man leave father and mother. The name is so truly separate from the prophecy, as far as, the prophecy, from the individual person herself, that of course it is not with reference to Eve herself that, Adam, has uttered, the prophecy, but with a view to those future females whom he has named in the maternal fount of the feminine race. Besides, Adam was not to leave father and mother whom he had not for the sake of Eve. Therefore that which was prophetically said does not apply to Eve because it does not to Adam either. For it was predicted with regard to the condition of husbands, who were destined to leave their parents for a woman's sake, which could not chance to Eve, because it could not to adorn either. If the case is so, it is apparent that she was not surnamed woman on account of a future, circumstance, to whom, that, future, circumstance, did not apply. To this is added, that, Adam, himself a published the reason of the name, for, after saying, she shall be called woman, he said, inasmuch as she hath been taken out of man the man himself with all being still a virgin. But we will speak, too, about the name of man in its own place. Accordingly, let none interpret with a prophetic reference a name which was deduced from another signification, especially since it is apparent when she did receive a name rounded upon a future, circumstance there, namely, where she is surnamed Eve with a personal name now, because the natural one had gone before. For if Eve means the mother of the living, behold, she is surnamed from a future, circumstance. Behold, she is pronounced to be a wife, and not a virgin. This will be the name of one who is about to wed, for of the bride, comes, the mother. Thus in this case too it is shown, that it was not from a future, circumstance, that she was at that time named woman who was shortly after to receive the name which would be proper to her future condition. Sufficient answer has been made to this part, of the question. Chapter, Vi. The parallel case of Mary considered. Let us now see whether the apostle with all observes the norm of this name in accordance with Genesis, attributing it to the sex, calling the Virgin Mary a woman, just as Genesis, does, Eve. For, writing to the Galatians, God, he says, sent his own son, made of a woman, who, of course, is admitted to have been a virgin, albeit he be and resist, that doctrine, I recognize, too, the angel Gabriel as having been sent to a virgin, but when he is blessing her, it is among women, not among virgins, that he ranks her, blessed thou among women, the angel with all knew that even a virgin is called a woman, but to these two, arguments, again, there is one who appears to himself to have made an ingenious answer, to the effect that, inasmuch as Mary was betrothed, therefore it is that both by angel and apostle she is pronounced a woman, for a betrothed is in some sense a bride. Still, between in some sense and truth there is difference enough, at all events in the present place, for elsewhere, we grant, we must thus hold. Now, 
However, it is not as being already wedded that they have pronounced Mary a woman, but as being nonetheless a female even if she had not been espoused, as having been called by this name from the beginning, for that must necessarily have a prejudicating force from which the normal type has descended. Else, as far as relates to the present passage, if Mary is here put on a level with a betrothed, so that she is called a woman not on the found of being a female, but on the ground of being assigned to a husband, it immediately follows that Christ was not born of a virgin, because, born, of one betrothed, who by this fact will have ceased to be a virgin. Whereas, if he was born of a virgin albeit with all betrothed, yet intact acknowledge that even a virgin, even an intact one, is called a woman. Here, at all events, there can be no semblance of speaking prophetically, as if the apostle should have named a future woman, that is, bride, in saying made of a woman. For he could not be naming a posterior woman, from whom Christ had not to be born that is, one who had known a man, but she who was then present, who was a virgin, was withal called a woman in consequence of the propriety of this name comma vindicated, in accordance with the primordial norm, as belonging, to a virgin, and thus to the universal class of women. Chapter 7, of the reasons assigned by the apostle forbidding women to be veiled. Turn we next to the examination of the reasons themselves which lead the apostle to teach that the female ought to be veiled, to see, whether the self-same, reasons, apply to virgins likewise, so that hence also the community of the name between virgins and not virgins may be established, while the self-same causes which necessitate the veil are found to exist in each case. If the man is head of the woman, of course, he is, of the virgin too, from whom comes the woman who has married, unless the virgin is a third generic class some monstrosity with a head of its own. If it is shameful for a woman to be shaven or shorn, of course it is so for a virgin. Hence let the world, the rival of God, see to it, if it asserts that close-cut hair is graceful to a virgin in like manner as that flowing hair is to a boy, to her, then, to whom it is equally unbecoming to be shaven or shorn, it is equally becoming to be covered. If the woman is the glory of the man, how much more the virgin, who is a glory with all to herself. If the woman is of the man, and for the sake of the man, the tribe of Adam was first a virgin. If the woman ought to have power upon the head, all the more justly ought the virgin, to whom pertains the essence of the cause, assigned for this assertion. For if, it is, on account of the angels those, to wit, whom we read of as having fallen from God and heaven on account of concupiscence after females who can presume that it was bodies already defiled, and relics of human lust, which such angels yearned after, so as not rather to have been enflamed for virgins, whose bloom pleads an excuse for human lust likewise. For thus does scripture with all suggest, and it came to pass, it says, when men had begun to grow more numerous upon the earth, there were with all daughters born them, but the sons of God, having described the daughters of men, that they were fair, took to themselves wives of all whom they elected. For here the Greek name of women does seem to have the sense wives, inasmuch as mention is made of marriage. When, then, it says the daughters of men, it manifestly purports virgins, who would be still reckoned as belonging to their parents for wedded women are called their husbands whereas it could have said the wives of men in like manner not naming the angels adulterers, but husbands, while they take unwedded daughters of men, who it has above said were born, thus also signifying their virginity, first, born, but here, wedded to angels. Anything else I know not that they were except born and subsequently wedded. So perilous a face, then, ought to be shaded, which has cast stumbling stones even so far as heaven, that, when standing in the presence of God, at whose bar it stands accused of the driving of the angels from their, native, confines, it may blush before the other angels as well, and may repress that form or evil liberty of its head, comma, a liberty, now to be exhibited not even before human eyes. But even if they were females already contaminated whom those angels had desired, so much the more on account of the angels would it have been the duty of virgins to be veiled 
as it would have been the more possible for virgins to have been the cause of the angels sinning. If, moreover, the apostle further adds the prejudgment of nature, that redundancy of locks is an honor to a woman, because hair serves for a covering? Of course it is most of all to a virgin that this is a distinction, for their very adornment properly consists in this, that, by being massed together upon the crown, it wholly covers the very citadel of the head with an encirclement of hair. Chapter 8. The Argument e Contrario. The contraries, at all events, of all these, considerations, effect that a man is not to cover his head, to wit, because he has not by nature been gifted with excess of hair, because to be shaven or shorn is not shameful to him, because it was not on his account that the angels transgressed because his head is Christ. Accordingly, since the apostle is treating of man and woman why the latter ought to be veiled, but the former not it is apparent why he has been silent as to the virgin, allowing, to wit, the virgin to be understood in the woman by the self same reason by which he forbore to name the boy as implied in the man, embracing the whole order of either sex in the names proper, to each, of woman and man. So likewise Adam, while still intact, is surnamed in Genesis man, she shall be called, says he, woman, because she hath been taken from her own man. Thus was Adam a man before nuptial intercourse, in like manner as Eve a woman. On either side the apostle has made his sentence apply with sufficient plainness to the universal species of each sex, and briefly and fully, with so well appointed a definition, he says, every woman, what is every, but of every class, of every order, of every condition, of every dignity, of every age question mark if, as is the case, every means total and entire, and in none of its parts defective. But the virgin is with all a part of the woman. Equally, too, with regard to not veiling the man, he says every, behold two diverse names, man and woman every one in each case, two laws, mutually distinctive, on the one hand, a law, of veiling, on the other, a law, of bearing. Therefore, if the fact that it is said every man makes it plain that the name of man is common even to him who is not yet a man, a stripling male, moreover, since the name is common according to nature, the law of not veiling him who among men is a virgin is common too according to discipline, why is it that it is not consequently prejudged that, woman being named, every woman virgin is similarly comprised in the fellowship of the name, so as to be comprised too in the community of the law. If a virgin is not a woman, neither is a stripling a man. If the virgin is not covered on the plea that she is not a woman, let the stripling be covered on the plea that he is not a man. Let identity of virginity, share equality of indulgence. As virgins are not compelled to be veiled, so let boys not be bidden to be unveiled. Why do we partly acknowledge the definition of the apostle, as absolute with regard to every man, without entering upon disquisitions as to why he has not with all named the boy, but partly prevaricate, though it is equally absolute with regard to every woman. If any, he says, is contentious, we have not such a custom, nor has the church of God. He shows that there had been some contention about this point, for the extinction whereof he uses the whole compendiousness of language not naming the virgin, on the one hand, in order to show that there is to be no doubt about her veiling, and, on the other hand, naming every woman, whereas he would have named the virgin, had the question been confined to her. So, too, did the Corinthians themselves understand him. In fact, at this day the Corinthians do veil their virgins. What the apostles taught, their disciples approve. Chapter 9 veiling consistent with the other rules of discipline observed by virgins and women in general. Let us now see whether, as we have shown the arguments drawn from nature and the matter itself to be applicable to the virgin as well, as to other females, so likewise the precepts of ecclesiastical discipline concerning women have an eye to the virgin. It is not permitted to a woman to speak in the church, but neither is it permitted her to teach, nor to baptize nor to offer, nor to claim to herself a lot in any manly function, not to say, in any, sacerdotal office. Let us inquire whether any of these be lawful to a virgin. If it is not lawful to a virgin, 
but she is subjected on the self-same terms, as the woman, and the necessity for humility is assigned her together with the woman, whence will this one thing be lawful to her which is not lawful to any and every female if any is a virgin, and has proposed to sanctify her flesh, what prerogative does she, thereby? Earn adverse to her own condition, is the reason why it is granted her to dispense with the veil, that she may be notable and marked as she enters the church. That she may display the honor of sanctity in the liberty of her head. More worthy distinction could have been conferred on her by according her some prerogative of manly rank or office. I know plainly, that in a certain place a virgin of less than twenty years of age has been placed in the order of widows. Whereas if the bishop had been bound to accord her any relief, he might, of course, have done it in some other way without detriment to the respect due to discipline, that such a miracle, not to say monster, should not be pointed at in the church, a virgin widow. The more portentous indeed, that not even as a widow did she veil her head, denying herself either way, both as virgin, in that she is counted a widow, and as widow, in that she is styled a virgin but the authority which licenses her sitting in that seat uncovered is the same which allows her to sit there as a virgin, a seat to which, besides the sixty years not merely single husbanded, women that is, married women are at length elected, but mothers to boot, yes, and educators of children, in order, forsooth, that their experimental training in all the affections may, on the one hand, have rendered them capable of readily aiding all others with counsel and comfort, and that, on the other, they may nonetheless have travelled down the whole course of probation whereby a female can be tested. So true is, it, that, on the ground of her position, nothing in the way of public honour is permitted to a virgin. Chapter 10. If the female virgins are to be thus conspicuous, wh why not the male as well? Nor, similarly, is it permitted on the ground of any distinctions whatever. Otherwise, it was sufficiently discourteous, that while females, subjected as they are throughout to men, bear in their front an honourable mark of their virginity, whereby they may be looked up to and gazed at on all sides and magnified by the brethren, so many men virgins, so many voluntary eunuchs, should carry their glory in secret, carrying no token to make them, too, illustrious for they, too, will be bound to claim some distinctions for themselves either the feathers of the garments, or else the fillets of the barbarians, or else the cicadas of the Athenians, or else the curls of the Germans, or else the tattoo marks of the Britons, or else let the opposite course be taken, and let them lurk in the churches with head veiled. Sure we are that the Holy Spirit could rather have made some such concession to males, if he had made it to females, for as much as, Besides the authority of sex, it would have been more becoming that males should have been honoured on the ground of continency itself likewise, the more their sex is eager and warm toward females, so much the more toiled does the continence of this greater ardour involve, and therefore the worthy or is it of all ostentation, if ostentation of virginity is dignity. For is not continence with all superior to virginity, whether it be the continence of the widowed, or of those who, by consent, have already renounced the common disgrace, which matrimony involves. For constancy of virginity is maintained by grace, of continence, by virtue. For great is the struggle to overcome concupiscence when you have become accustomed to such concupiscence, whereas a concupiscence the enjoyment whereof you have never known you will subdue easily, not having an adversary, in the shape of, the concupiscence of enjoyment. How, then, would God have failed to make any such concession to men more, than to women, whether on the ground of nearer intimacy, as being his own image, or on the ground of harder toil, but if nothing, has been thus conceded, to the male, much more to the female. Chapter 11. The rule of veiling not applicable to children but what we intimated above for the sake of the subsequent discussion not to dissipate its coherence we will now discharge by an answer. For when we joined issue about the Apostle's absolute definition, that every woman must be understood, as meaning woman, of even every age, it might be replied by the opposite side, 
that in that case it behoved the virgin to be veiled from her nativity, and from the first entry of her age, upon the roll of time, but it is not so, but from the time when she begins to be self-conscious, and to awake to the sense of her own nature, and to emerge from the virgin's sense, and to experience that novel sensation, which belongs to the succeeding age. For with all the founders of the race, Adam and Eve, so long as they were without intelligence, went naked, but after they tasted of the tree of recognition, they were first sensible of nothing more than of their cause for shame. Thus they each marked their intelligence of their own sex by a covering. But even if it is on account of the angels that she is to be veiled, doubtless the age from which the law of the veil will come into operation will be that from which the daughters of men were able to invite concupiscence of their persons, and to experience marriage. For a virgin ceases to be a virgin from the time that it becomes possible for her not to be one. And accordingly, among Israel, it is unlawful to deliver one to a husband except after the attestation by blood of her maturity. Thus, before this indication, the nature is unripe. Therefore if she is a virgin so long as she is unripe, she ceases to be a virgin when she is perceived to be ripe, and, as not virgin, is now subject to the law, just as she is to marriage. And the betrothed indeed have the example of Rebecca, who, when she was being conducted herself still unknown to an unknown betrothed, as soon as she learned that he whom she had sighted from afar was the man, awaited not the grasp of the hand, nor the meeting of the kiss, nor the interchange of salutation, but confessing what she had felt namely, that she had been, already, wedded in spirit denied herself to be a virgin by then and availing herself, a woman already belonging to Christ's discipline, for she showed that marriage likewise, as fornication is, is transacted by gaze and mind, only that a Rebecca likewise some do still veil, with regard to the rest, however, that is, those who are not betrothed, let the procrastination of their parents, arising from straitened means or scrupulosity, look, to them, let the vow of continence itself look, to them, in no respect does, such procrastination, pertain to an age which is already running its own assigned course, and paying its own dues to maturity. Another secret mother, nature, and another hidden father, time, have wedded their daughter to their own laws. Behold that virgin daughter of yours already wedded her soul by expectancy her flesh by transformation for whom you are preparing a second husband. Already her voice is changed, her limbs fully formed, her shame everywhere clothing itself, the months paying their tributes, and do you deny her to be a woman whom you assert to be undergoing womanly experiences? If the contact of a man makes a woman, let there be no covering except after actual experience of marriage. Nay, but even among the heathens, the betrothed, are led veiled to the husband. But if it is at betrothed that they are veiled, because, then, both in body and in spirit they have mingled with the male, through the kiss and the fight hands, through which means they first in spirit unseal their modesty, through the common pledge of conscience whereby they mutually plighted their whole confusion, how much more will time veil them? Question mark, time, without which espoused they cannot be, and by whose urgency, without espousals, they cease to be virgins. Time even the hens observe, that, in obedience to the law of nature, they may render their own fights to the, different, ages. For their females they dispatch to their businesses from, the age of, twelve years, but the male from two years later, decreeing puberty, to consist, in years, not in espousals or nuptials. Housewife one is called, albeit a virgin, and house father, albeit a stripling. By us not even natural laws are observed, as if the God of nature were some other than ours. Chapter 12, Womanhood Self-Evident, and not to be concealed by just leaving the head bare. Recognize the woman, a, eh? recognize the wedded woman, by the testimonies both of body and of spirit, which she experiences both in conscience and in flesh. These are the earlier tablets of natural espousals and nuptials. Impose a veil externally upon her who has, already, a covering internally. Let her whose lower parts are not bare have her upper likewise covered. Would you know what is the authority which age carries? Set before yourself each, of these two, 
one prematurely compressed in woman's garb, and one who, though advanced in maturity, persists in virginity with its appropriate garb. The former will more easily be denied to be a woman than the latter believed a virgin. Such is, then, the honesty of age, that there is no overpowering it even by garb. What of the fact that these, virgins, of ours confess their change of age even by their garb, and, as soon as they have understood themselves to be women, withdraw themselves from virgins, laying aside, beginning with their head itself, their former selves, dye their hair, and fasten their hair with more wanton pin, professing manifest womanhood with their hair parted from the front. The next thing is, they consult the looking glass to aid their beauty, and thin down their over-exacting face with washing, perhaps with all vamp it up with cosmetics, toss their mantle about them with an air, fit tightly the multiform shoe, carry down more ample appliances to the baths. Why should I pursue particulars? But their manifest appliances alone exhibit their perfect womanhood, yet they wish to play the virgin by the sole fact of leaving their head bare denying by one single feature what they profess by their entire deportment. Chapter 13, If unveiling be proper, wh why not practice it always, out of the church as well as in it? If on account of men they adopt a false garb, let them carry out that garb fully even for that end, and as they veil their head in presence of heathens, let them at all events in the church conceal their virginity, which they do veil outside the church. They fear strangers, let them stand in awe of the brethren too, or else let them have the consistent hardihood to appear as virgins in the streets as well, as they have the hardihood to do in the churches. I will praise their vigor, if they succeed in selling aught of virginity among the hens with all identity of nature abroad as at home, identity of custom in the presence of men as of the Lord, consists in identity of liberty. To what purpose, then, do they thrust their glory out of sight abroad, but expose it in the church? I demand a reason. Is it to please the brethren, or God himself? If God himself, he is as capable of beholding whatever is done in secret as he is just to remunerate what is done for his sole honor. In fine, he enjoins us not to trumpet forth any one of those things which will merit reward in his sight, nor get compensation for them from men. But if we are prohibited from letting our left hand know when we bestow the gift of a single halfpenny or any elemacinary bounty whatever, how deep should be the darkness in which we ought to enshroud ourselves when we are offering God so great an oblation of our very body and our very spirit when we are consecrating to him our very nature. It follows, therefore, that what cannot appear to be done for God's sake, because God wills not that it be done in such a way, is done for the sake of men common a thing, of course, primarily unlawful as betraying a lust of glory, for glory is a thing unlawful to those whose probation consists in humiliation of every kind. And if it is by God that the virtue of continence is conferred, why gloriest thou, as if thou have not received? If, however, you have not received it, what hast thou which has not been given thee? But by this very fact it is plain that it has not been given you by God that it is not to God alone that you are for it. Let us see, then whether what is human be firm and true. Chapter 14, Perils to the virgins themselves attendant upon not veiling they report a saying uttered at one time by someone when first this question was mooted, and how shall we invite the other, virgins, to similar conduct? Forsooth, it is their numbers that will make us happy, and not the grace of God and the merits of each individual. Is it virgins who, adorn or commend? The church in the sight of God, or the church which adorns or commends virgins. Our objector, has therefore confessed that glory lies at the root of the matter. Well, where glory is, there is solicitation, where solicitation, the compulsion, where compulsion, the necessity, where necessity, their infirmity. Deservedly, therefore, while they do not cover their head, in order that they may be solicited for the sake of glory, they are forced to cover their bellies by the ruin resulting from infirmity. For it is emulation, not religion, which impels them. Sometimes it is that God their belly himself, because the brotherhood readily undertakes the maintenance of virgins. But, moreover, it is not merely that they are ruined, 
but they draw after them a long rope of sins, for, after being brought forth into the midst, of the church, and elated by the public appropriation of their property, and laden by the brethren with every honor and charitable bounty, so long as they do not fall comma when any sin has been committed, they meditate a deed as disgraceful as the honor was high which they had. It is this, if an uncovered head is a recognized mark of virginity, then, if any virgin falls from the grace of virginity, she remains permanently with head uncovered for fear of discovery, and walks about in a garb which then indeed is another's. Conscious of a now undoubted womanhood, they have the audacity to draw near to God with head bare. But the jealous God and Lord, who has said, Nothing covered which shall not be revealed, brings such in general before the public gaze, for confess they will not, unless betrayed by the cries of their infants themselves. But, in so far as they are more numerous, will you not just have them suspected of the more crimes? I will say, albeit I would rather not. It is a difficult thing for one to turn woman once for all who fears to do so, and who, when already so turned, in secret, has the power of, still, falsely pretending to be a virgin under the eye of God. What audacities, again, will, such an one, venture on with regard to her womb, for fear of being detected in being a mother as well? God knows how many infants he has helped to perfection and through gestation till they were born sound and whole, after being long fought against by their mothers. Such virgins ever conceive with the readiest facility, and have the happiest deliveries, and children indeed most like to their fathers. These crimes does a forced and unwilling virginity incur. The very concupiscence of non-concealment is not modest, it experiences somewhat which is no mark of a virgin comma the study of pleasing, of course, a and, of pleasing, men, let her strive as much as you please with an honest mind, she must necessarily be imperiled by the public exhibition s of herself, while she is penetrated by the gaze of untrustworthy and multitudinous eyes, while she is tickled by pointing fingers, while she is too well loved, while she feels a warmth creep over her amid assiduous embraces and kisses, thus the forehead hardens, thus the sense of shame wears away. Thus it relaxes, thus is learned the desire of pleasing in another way. Chapter 15 Of Fascination Nay, but true and absolute and pure virginity fears nothing more than itself. Even female eyes it shrinks from encountering. Other eyes itself has. It betakes itself for refuge to the veil of the head as to a helmet, as to a shield, to protect its glory against the blows of temptations, against the dam of scandals against suspicions and whispers and emulation, against, envy also itself, for there is a something even among the heathens to be apprehended, which they call fascination, the too unhappy result of excessive praise and glory, this we sometimes interpretatively ascribe to the devil, for of him comes hatred of good, sometimes we attribute it to God, for of him comes judgment upon haughtiness, exalting, as he does, the humble and depressing the elated, the more holy virgin, accordingly, will fear, even under the name of fascination, on the one hand the adversary, on the other God, the envious disposition of the former, the sensorial light of the latter, and will joy in being known to herself alone and to God, but even if she has been recognized by any other, she is wise to have blocked up the pathway against temptations. For who will have the audacity to intrude with his eyes upon a shrouded face? A face without feeling? A face, so to say, morose? Any evil cogitation whatsoever will be broken by the very severity. She who conceals her virginity, by that fact denies even her womanhood. Chapter 16, Tertullian, having shown his defense to be consistent with scripture nature, and discipline, appeals to the virgins themselves. Herein consists the defense of our opinion, in accordance with scripture, in accordance with nature, in accordance with discipline. Scripture founds the law, nature joins to attest it, discipline exacts it. Which of these, three, does a custom rounded on, mere, opinion appear in behalf of? Or what is the color of the opposite view? God's is scripture, God's is nature, God's is discipline. Whatever is contrary to these is not God's. If scripture is uncertain, nature is manifest, 
and concerning nature's testimony scripture cannot be uncertain, if there is a doubt about nature, discipline points out what is more sanctioned by God, for nothing is to him dearer than humility, nothing more acceptable than modesty, nothing more offensive than glory in the study of men pleasing, let that, accordingly, be to you scripture, and nature, and discipline, which you shall find to have been sanctioned by God, just as you are bid to examine all things and diligently follow whatever is better. It remains likewise that we turn to, the virgins, themselves, to induce them to accept these, suggestions, the more willingly. I pray you, be you mother, or sister, or virgin daughter let me address you according to the names proper to your years veil your head, if a mother, for your son's sakes, if a sister, for your brethren's sakes, if a daughter for your father's sakes, all ages are periled in your person, put on the panoply of modesty, surround yourself with the stockade of bashfulness, rear a rampart for your sex, which must neither allow your own eyes egress nor ingress to other peoples, wear the full garb of woman, to preserve the standing of virgin, belie somewhat of your inward consciousness, in order to exhibit the truth to God alone, and yet you do not belie yourself in appearing as a bride, for wedded you are to Christ, to him you have surrendered your flesh, to him you have espoused your maturity, walk in accordance with the will of your espoused, Christ is he who bids, the espoused and wives of others veil themselves, and, of course, ranch more his own, chapter 17, an appeal to the married women, but we admonish you, too, women of the second, degree of, modesty, who have fallen into wedlock, not to outgrow so far the discipline of the veil, not even in a moment of an hour, as, because you cannot refuse it, to take some other means to nullify it, by going neither covered nor bare, for some, with their turbans and woolen bands, do not veil their head, but bind it up, protected, indeed, in front, but, where the head properly lies, bare. Others are to a certain extent covered over the region of the brain with linen quaffs of small dimensions I suppose for fear of pressing the head and not reaching quite to the ears. If they are so weak in their hearing as not to be able to hear through a covering, I pity them. Let them know that the whole head constitutes the woman. Its limits and boundaries reach as far as the place where the row begins. The region of the veil is coextensive with the space covered by the hair when unbound, in order that the next two may be encircled, for it is they which must be subjected, for the sake of which power ought to be had on the head, the veil is their yoke. Arabia's heen females will be your judges, who cover not only the head, but the face also, so entirely, that they are content, with one eye free to enjoy rather half the light than to prostitute the entire face, a female would rather see than be seen, and for this reason a certain Roman queen said that they were most unhappy, in that they could more easily fall in love than be fallen in love with, whereas they are rather happy, in their immunity from that second, and indeed more frequent, infelicity, that females are more apartment to be fallen in love with than to fall in love, and the modesty of in discipline, indeed, is more simple, and, so to say, more barbaric to us the Lord has, even by revelations, measured the space for the veil to extend over, for a certain sister of ours was thus addressed by an angel, beating her neck, as if in applause, elegant neck, and deservedly bare, it is well for thee to unveil thyself from the head fight down to the loins, lest with all this freedom of thy neck profit thee not, and, of course, what you have said to one you have said to all, but how severe a chastisement will they likewise deserve, who, amid, the recital of, the Psalms, and at any mention of, the name of, God, continue uncovered, who, even when about to spend time in prayer itself, with the utmost readiness place a fringe, or a tuft, or any thread whatever, on the crown of their heads and suppose themselves to be covered, of so small extent do they falsely imagine their head to be, others, who think the palm of their hand plainly greater than any fringe or thread, misuse their head no less, like a certain, creature, more beast than bird, albeit winged, with small head, long legs, and moreover of erect carriage, she, they say, when she has to hide, 
thrusts away into a thicket her head alone plainly the whole of it, though leaving all the rest of herself exposed. Thus, while she is secure in head, but, bare in her larger pans, she is taken wholly, head and all. Such will be their plight with all, covered as they are less than is useful. It is incumbent, then, at all times and in every place, to walk mindful of the law, prepared and equipped in readiness to meet every mention of God, who, if he be in the heart, will be recognized as well in the head of females. To such as read these, exhortations, with good will, to such as prefer utility to custom, may peace and grace from our Lord Jesus Christ redound, as likewise to Septimius Tertullinus, whose this tractate is translated by the Reverend S. Thalwall. Tertullian The Passion of the Holy Martyrs Perpetua and Philistos preface of ancient illustrations of faith which both testify to God's grace and tend to man's edification are collected in writing, so that by the perusal of them, as if by the reproduction of the facts, as well God may be honored, as man may be strengthened, why should not new instances be also collected, that shall be equally suitable for both purposes if only on the ground that these modern examples will one day become ancient and available for posterity, although in their present time they are esteemed of less authority, by reason of the presumed veneration for antiquity. But let men look to it, if they judge the power of the Holy Spirit to be one, according to the times and seasons, since some things of later date must be esteemed of more account as being nearer to the very last times in accordance with the exuberance of grace manifested to the final periods determined for the world. For in the last days, saith the Lord, I will pour out of my Spirit upon all flesh, and their sons and their daughters shall prophesy. And upon my servants and my handmaidens will I pour out of my Spirit, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And thus we, who both acknowledge and reverence, even as we do the prophecies, modern visions as equally promised to us, and consider the other powers of the Holy Spirit as an agency of the Church for which also He was sent, administering all gifts and all, even as the Lord distributed to every one as well needfully collect them in writing, as commemorate them in reading to God's glory, that so no weakness or despondency of faith may suppose that the divine grace abode only among the ancients, whether in respect of the condescension that raised up martyrs, or that gave revelations, since God always carries into effect what he has promised, for a testimony to unbelievers, to believers for a benefit, and we therefore, what we have heard and handled, declare also to you, brethren and little children, that as well you who were concerned in these matters may be reminded of them again to the glory of the Lord, as that you who know them by report may have communion with the blessed martyrs, and through them with the Lord Jesus Christ, to whom be glory and honor forever and ever. Amen. Chapter 1 When the saints were apprehended, Saint Perpetua successfully resisted her father's pleading, was baptized with the others, was thrust into a filthy dungeon, anxious about her infant, by a vision granted to her, sh she understood that her martyrdom would take place very shortly. 1. The young catechumens, Revocatus and his fellow servant Philistos, Saturninus and Secundulus, were apprehended and among them also was Vivia Perpetua, respectably born, liberally educated, a married matron, having a father and mother and two brothers, one of whom, like herself, was a catechumen, and a son and infant at the breast. She herself was about twenty-two years of age. From this point onward she shall herself narrate the whole course of her martyrdom, as she left it described by her own hand and with her own mind. 2. While says she, we were still with the persecutors? And my father, for the sake of his affection for me, was persisting in seeking to turn me away, and to cast me down from the faith, Father, said I, do you see, let us say, this vessel lying here to be a little pitcher, or something else. And he said, I see it to be so. And I replied to him, can it be called by any other name than what it is? And he said, no. Neither can I call myself anything else than what I am, a Christian. Then my father, provoked at this saying, threw himself upon me, as if he would tear my eyes out. But he only distressed me, and went away overcome by the devil's arguments. Then, in a few days after I had been without my father, I gave thanks to the Lord, 
and his absence became a source of consolation to me. In that same interval of a few days we were baptized, and to me the Spirit prescribed that in the water baptism nothing else was to be sought for bodily endurance. After a few days we are taken into the dungeon, and I was very much afraid, because I had never felt such darkness. Oh terrible day! Oh the fierce heat of the shock of the soldiery! because of the crowds. I was very unusually distressed by my anxiety for my infant. There were present there Tertius and Pomponius, the blessed deacons who ministered to us, and had arranged by means of a gratuity that we might be refreshed by being sent out for a few hours into a pleasanter part of the prison. Then going out of the dungeon, all attended to their own wants. I suckled my child, which was now enfeebled with hunger. In my anxiety for it, I addressed my mother and comforted my brother, and commended to their care my son. I was languishing because I had seen them languishing on my account. Such solicitude I suffered for many days, and I obtained for my infant to remain in the dungeon with me, and forthwith I grew strong and was relieved from distress and anxiety about my infant, and the dungeon became to me as it were a palace, so that I preferred being there to being elsewhere. 3. Then my brother said to me, My dear sister, you are already in a position of great dignity and are such that you may ask for a vision, and that it may be made known to you whether this is to result in a passion or an escape. And I, who knew that I was privileged to converse with the Lord, whose kindnesses I had found to be so great, boldly promised him, and said, Tomorrow I will tell you. And I asked, and this was what was shown me. I saw a golden ladder of marvelous height, reaching up even to heaven, and very narrow so that persons could only ascend it one by one, and on the sides of the ladder was fixed every kind of iron weapon. There were their swords, lances, hooks, daggers, so that if anyone went up carelessly, or not looking upwards, he would be torn to pieces and his flesh would cleave to the iron weapons. And under the ladder itself was crouching a dragon of wonderful size, who lay in wait for those who ascended, and frightened them from the ascent. And Saturus went up first who had subsequently delivered himself up freely on our account, not having been present at the time that we were taken prisoners. And he attained the top of the ladder, and turned towards me, and said to me, Perpetua, I am waiting for you, but be careful that the dragon do not bite you. And I said, In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, he shall not hurt me. And from under the ladder itself, as if in fear of me, he slowly lifted up his head, and as I trod upon the first step, I trod upon his head, and I went up, and I saw an immense extent of garden, and in the midst of the garden a white-haired man sitting in the dress of a shepherd, of a large stature, milking sheep, and standing around were many thousand white-robed ones. And he raised his head, and looked upon me, and said to me, Thou art welcome, daughter. And he called me, and from the cheese as he was milking he gave me as it were a little cake and I received it with folded hands, and I ate it, and all who stood around said Amen. And at the sound of their voices I was awakened, still tasting a sweetness which I cannot describe. And I immediately related this to my brother, and we understood that it was to be a passion, and we ceased henceforth to have any hope in this world. Chapter 2 Perpetua, when besieged by her father, comforts him. When led with others to the tribunal, S.H.E. avows herself a Christian and is condemned with the rest to the wild beasts. S.H.E. prays for her brother Denocrates, W.H.O. was dead. 1. After a few days there prevailed a report that we should be heard. And then my father came to me from the city, worn out with anxiety. He came up to me, that he might cast me down, saying, Have pity my daughter, on my gray hairs. Have pity on your father, if I am worthy to be called a father by you. If with these hands I have brought eat you up to this flower of your age, if I have preferred you to all your brothers, do not deliver me up to the scorn of men. Have regard to your brothers, have regard to your mother and your aunt, have regard to your son, who will not be able to live after you. Lay aside your courage, and do not bring us all to destruction, for none of us will speak in freedom if you should suffer anything. These things said my father in his affection, kissing my hands, and throwing himself at my feet, and with tears he called me not daughter but lady. And I grieved over the gray hairs of my father, that he alone of all my family would not rejoice over my passion. And I comforted him, saying, On that scaffold whatever God wills shall happen. For know that we are not placed in our own power, but in that of God. 
and he departed from me in sorrow. 2. Another day, while we were at dinner, we were suddenly taken away to be heard, and we arrived at the town hall. At once the rumor spread through the neighborhood of the public place and an immense number of people were gathered together. We mounted the platform. The rest were interrogated, and confessed. Then they came to me, and my father immediately appeared with my boy, and withdrew me from the step, and said in a supplicating tone, Have pity on your babe. And Hilarionus the procurator, who had just received the power of life and death in the place of the proconsul Minusius Timonianus, who was deceased, said, Spare the gray hairs of your father. Spare the infancy of your boy, offer sacrifice for the well being of the emperors. And I replied, I will not do so. Galerianus said, Are you a Christian? And I replied, I am a Christian. And as my father stood there to cast me down from the faith, he was ordered by Galerianus to be thrown down, and was beaten with rods. And my father's misfortune grieved me as if I myself had been beaten. I so grieved for his wretched old age. The procurator then delivers judgment on all of us, and condemns us to the wild beasts, and we went down cheerfully to the dungeon. Then, because my child had been used to receive suck from me, and to stay with me in the prison, I sent Pomponius the deacon to my father to ask for the infant, but my father would not give it him. And even as God willed it, the child no long desired the breast, nor did my breast cause me uneasiness lest I should be tormented by care for my babe and by the pain of my breasts at once. 3. After a few days, whilst we were all praying, on a sudden, in the middle of our prayer, there came to me a word, and I named Dinocrates, and I was amazed that that name had never come into my mind until then, and I was grieved as I remembered his misfortune, and I felt myself immediately to be worthy and to be called on to ask on his behalf. And for him I began earnestly to make supplication, and to cry with groaning to the Lord. Without delay, on that very night, this was shown to me in a vision. I saw Dinocrates going out from a gloomy place, where also there were several others, and he was parched and very thirsty, with a filthy countenance and pallid color, and the wound on his face which he had when he died. This Dinocrates had been my brother after the flesh, seven years of age, who died miserably with disease, his face being so eaten out with cancer, that his death caused repugnance to all men. For him I had made my prayer, and between him and me there was a large interval, so that neither of us could approach to the other. And moreover, in the same place where Dinocrates was, there was a pool full of water, having its brink higher than was the stature of the boy, and Dinocrates raised himself up as if to drink. And I was grieved that, although that pool held water, Still, on account of the height to its brink, he could not drink. And I was aroused, and knew that my brother was in suffering. But I trusted that my prayer would bring help to his suffering, and I prayed for him every day until we passed over into the prison of the camp, for we were to fight in the camp show. Then was the birthday of Gaius Caesar, and I made my prayer for my brother day and night, groaning and weeping that he might be granted to me. For then, on the day on which we remained in fetters, this was shown to me. I saw that that place which I had formerly observed to be in gloom was now bright, and Dinocrates, with a clean body well clad, was finding refreshment. And where there had been a wound, I saw a scar, and that pool which I had before seen, I saw now with its margin lowered even to the boy's navel. And one drew water from the pool incessantly, and upon its brink was a goblet filled with water, and Dinocrates drew near and began to drink from it and the goblet did not fail. And when he was satisfied, he went away from the water to play joyously, after the manner of children, and I awoke. Then I understood that he was translated from the place of punishment. Chapter 3 Perpetua is again tempted by her father. Her third vision, wherein S.H.E. is led away to struggle against an Egyptian. S.H.E. fights, conquers, and receives the reward. 1. Again, after a few days, Budens, a soldier an assistant overseer of the prison, who began to regard us in great esteem, perceiving that the great power of God was in us, admitted many brethren to see us, that both we and they might be mutually refreshed. And when the day of the exhibition drew near my father, worn with suffering, came in to me, and began to tear out his beard, and to throw himself on the earth, and to cast himself down on his face, and to reproach his years, 
and to utter such words as might move all creation. I grieved for his unhappy old age. 2. The day before that on which we were to fight, I saw in a vision that Pomponius the deacon came hither to the gate of the prison, and knocked vehemently. I went out to him, and opened the gate for him, and he was clothed in a richly ornamented white robe, and he had on manifold colloquially. And he said to me, Perpetua, we are waiting for you, come. And he held his hand to me, and we began to go through rough and winding places. Scarcely at length had we arrived breathless at the amphitheater, when he led me into the middle of the arena, and said to me, Do not fear, I am here with you, and I am laboring with you, and he departed, and I gazed upon an immense assembly in astonishment, and because I knew that I was given to the wild beasts, I marveled that the wild beasts were not let loose upon me. Then there came forth against me a certain Egyptian, horrible in appearance, with his backers, to fight with me. And there came to me, as my helpers and encouragers, handsome youths, and I was stripped, and became a man. Then my helpers began to rub me with oil, as is the custom for contest, and I beheld that Egyptian on the other hand rolling in the dust. And a certain man came forth, of wondrous height so that he even overtopped the top of the amphitheater, and he wore a loose tunic and a purple robe between two bands over the middle of the breast, and he had on colloquially a varied form, made of gold and silver, and he carried a rod, as if he were a trainer of gladiators, and a green branch upon which were apples of gold. And he called for silence, and said, This Egyptian, if he should overcome this woman, shall kill her with a sword, and if she shall conquer him, she shall receive this branch. Then he departed, and we drew near to one another, and began to deal out blows. He sought to lay hold of my feet, while I struck at his face with my heels, and I was lifted up in the air, and began thus to thrust at him as if spurning the earth. But when I saw that there was some delay I joined my hands so as to twine my fingers with one another, and I took hold upon his head, and he fell on his face, and I trod upon his head, and the people began to shout and my backers to exult. And I drew near to the trainer and took the branch, and he kissed me, and said to me, Daughter, peace be with you, and I began to go gloriously to the sin of Ivarian gate. Then I awoke, and perceived that I was not to fight with beasts, but against the devil. Still I knew that the victory was awaiting me. This, so far, I have completed several days before the exhibition, but what passed at the exhibition itself led who will write. Chapter 4 Saturus in a vision, and Perpetua being carried by angels into the great light, behold the martyrs, being brought to the throne of God, are received with a kiss, they reconcile Optidus the bishop and Aspasius the presbyter, one, moreover, also, the blessed Saturus related this his vision, which he himself committed to writing, we had suffered, says he, and we were gone forth from the flesh, and we were beginning to be borne by four angels into the east, and their hands touched us not, and we floated not supine, looking upwards, but as if ascending a gentle slope, and being set free, we at length saw the first boundless light, and I said, Perpetua, for she was at my side, this is what the Lord promised to us, we have received the promise. And while we are borne by those same four angels, there appears to us a vast space which was like a pleasure garden, having rose trees and every kind of flower. And the height of the trees was after the measure of a cypress, and their leaves were falling incessantly. Moreover, there in the pleasure garden four other angels appeared, brighter than the previous ones, who, when they saw us, gave us honor, and said to the rest of the angels, Here they are, here they are. With admiration, and those four angels who bore us, being greatly afraid, put us down, and we passed over on foot the space of a furlong in a broad path. There we found Jocundus and Saturninus and Artaxius, who having suffered the same persecution were burnt alive, and Quintus, who also himself a martyr had departed in the prison. And we asked of them where the rest were. And the angels said to us, Come first, enter and greet your Lord. 2. And we came near to place, the walls of which were such as if they were built of light, and before the gate of that place stood four angels, who clothed those who entered with white robes. And being clothed, we entered and saw the boundless light, and heard the united voice of some who said without ceasing, Holy, Holy, Holy. And in the midst of that place we saw as it were a hoary man sitting, having snow-white hair, 
and with a youthful countenance, and his feet we saw not, and on his right hand and on his left were four and twenty elders, and behind them a great many others were standing. We entered with great wonder, and stood before the throne, and the four angels raised us up, and we kissed him, and he passed his hand over our face. And the rest of the elders said to us, Let us stand, and we stood and made peace. And the elders said to us, And enjoy. And I said, Perpetua, you have what you wish. And she said to me, Thanks be to God, that joyous as I was in the flesh, I am now more joyous here. 3. And we went forth, and saw before the entrance Optatus the bishop at the right hand, and Aspasius the presbyter, a teacher, at the left hand, separate and sad, and they cast themselves at our feet, and said to us, Restore peace between us, because you have gone forth and have left us thus. And we said to them, Art not thou our father, and thou our presbyter? that you should cast yourselves at our feet? And we prostrated ourselves, and we embraced them, and Perpetua began to speak with them. And we drew them apart in the pleasure garden under a rose tree. And while we were speaking with them, the angels said unto them, Let them alone, that they may refresh themselves. And if you have any dissensions between you, forgive one another. And they drove them away. And they said to Optatus, Rebuke thy people because they assemble to you as if returning from the circus, and contending about factious matters. And then it seemed to us as if they would shut the doors. And in that place we began to recognize many brethren, and moreover martyrs. We were all nourished with an indescribable odor, which satisfied us. Then, I joyously awoke. Chapter 5 Secundulus dies in the prison. Philistus is pregnant, but with many prayers S.H.E. brings forth in the eighth month without suffering the courage of Perpetua and of Saturus unbroken. 1. The above were the more imminent visions of the blessed martyrs Saturus and Perpetua themselves, which they themselves committed to writing. But God called Secundulus, while he is yet in the prison, by an earlier exit from the world, not without favor, so as to give a respite to the beasts. Nevertheless, even if his soul did not acknowledge cause for thankfulness, assuredly his flesh did. 2. But respecting Philistos. For to her also the Lord's favor approached in the same way, when she had already gone eight months with child, for she had been pregnant when she was apprehended, as the day of the exhibition was drawing near, she was in great grief lest on account of her pregnancy she should be delayed, because pregnant women are not allowed to be publicly punished, and lest she should shed her sacred and guiltless blood among some who had been wicked subsequently. Moreover, also, her fellow martyrs were painfully saddened lest they should leave so excellent a friend, and as it were companion, alone in the path of the same hope. Therefore, joining together their united cry, they poured forth their prayer to the Lord three days before the exhibition. Immediately after their prayer her pains came upon her, and when, with the difficulty natural to an eight months delivery, in the labor of bringing forth she was sorrowing, some one of the servants of the cataract Terii said to her, you who are in such suffering now, what will you do when you are thrown to the beasts, which you despised or when you refuse to sacrifice? And she replied, Now it is I that suffer what I suffer, but then there will be another in me, who will suffer for me, because I also am about to suffer for him. Thus she brought forth a little girl, which a certain sister brought up as her daughter. 3. Since then the Holy Spirit permitted, and by permitting willed that the proceedings of that exhibition should be committed to writing, although we are unworthy to complete the description of so great a glory, yet we obey as it were the command of the most blessed Perpetua, nay her sacred trust, and add one more testimony concerning her constancy and her loftiness of mind. While they were treated with more severity by the tribune, because, from the intimations of certain deceitful men, he feared lest that should be withdrawn from the prison by some sort of magic incantations. Perpetual answer to his face, and said, Why do you not at least permit us to be refreshed, being as we are objectionable to the most noble Caesar, and having to fight on his birthday? Or is it not your glory if we are brought forward fatter on that occasion? The tribune shuddered and blushed, and commanded that they should be kept with more humanity, so that permission was given to their brethren and others to go in and be refreshed with them, even the keeper of the prison trusting them now himself. 4. Moreover, on the day before, when in that last meal, which they call the free meal, they were partaking as far as they could, not of a free supper, but of an agape, 
with the same firmness they were uttering such words as these to the people, denouncing against them the judgment of the Lord, bearing witness to the felicity of their passion, laughing at the curiosity of the people who came together, while Saturus said, Tomorrow is not enough for you, for you to behold with pleasure that which you hate. Friends today, enemies tomorrow, yet note our faces diligently that you may recognize them on that day of judgment. Thus all departed thence astonished, and from these things many believed. Chapter 6 From the prison they are led forth with joy into the amphitheater, especially Perpetua and Philistos. All refuse to put on profane garments. They are scourged, they are thrown to the wild beasts. Saturus twice is unhurt. Perpetua and Philistus are thrown down, they are called back to the Cenovivarian gate. Saturus wounded by a leopard exhorts a soldier. They kiss one another, and are slain with the sword. 1. The day of their victory shone forth, and they proceeded from the prison into the amphitheater, as if to an assembly, joyous and of brilliant countenances, if precans shrinking, it was with joy, and not with fear. Perpetua followed with placid look, and with step and gait as a matron of Christ, beloved of God, casting down the luster of her eyes from the gaze of all. Moreover, Philistos rejoicing that she had safely brought forth, so that she might fight with the wild beasts, from the blood and from the midwife to the gladiator, to wash after childbirth with a second baptism. And when they were brought to the gate, and were constrained to put on the clothing, the men, that of the priests of Saturn, and the women, that of those who were consecrated to seers, then a bull-minded woman resisted even to the end with constancy. For she said, We have come thus far of our own accord, for this reason, that our liberty might not be restrained. For this reason we have yielded our minds, that we might not do any such thing as this, we have agreed on this with you. In justice acknowledge the justice, the tribune yielded to their being brought as simply as they were. Perpetua sang psalms, already treading underfoot the head of the Egyptian, Revocatus, and Saturninus, and Saturus uttered threatenings against the gazing people about this martyrdom. When they came within sight of Hilarionus, by gesture and nod, they began to say to Hilarionus, Thou judgest us, say they, but God will judge thee. At this the people, exasperated, demanded that they should be tormented with scourges as they passed along the rank of the Venators, and they indeed rejoiced that they should have incurred any one of their Lord's passions. Too. But he who had said, Ask, and ye shall receive, gave to them when they asked, that death which each one had wished for. For when at any time they had been discoursing among themselves about their wish in respect of their martyrdom, Saturninus indeed had professed that he wished that he might be thrown to all the beasts, doubtless that he might wear a more glorious crown. Therefore in the beginning of the exhibition he and Revocatus made trial of the leopard, and moreover upon the scaffold they were harassed by the bear. Saturus, however, held nothing in greater abomination than a bear but he imagined that he would be put an end to with one bite of a leopard. Therefore, when a wild boar was supplied, it was the huntsman rather who had supplied that boar who was gored by that same beast, and died the day after the shows. Saturus only was drawn out, and when he had been bound on the floor near to a bear, the bear would not come forth from his den. And so Saturus for the second time is recalled unhurt. 3. Moreover, for the young women the devil prepared a very fierce cow provided especially for that purpose contrary to custom, rivaling their sex also in that of the beasts. And so, stripped and clothed with nets, they were led forth. The populace shuddered as they saw one young woman of delicate frame, and another with breasts still dropping from her recent childbirth. So, being recalled, they are unbound. Perpetua is first led in. She was tossed, and fell on her loins, and when she saw her tunic torn from her side, she drew it over hers a veil for her middle, rather mindful of her modesty than her suffering. Then she was called for again, and bound up her disheveled hair, for it was not becoming for a martyr to suffer with disheveled hair, lest she should appear to be mourning in her glory. So she rose up, and when she saw Philistos crushed, she approached and gave her her hand, and lifted her up, and both of them stood together, and the brutality of the populace being appeased, they were recalled to the Sanivivarian gate. Then Perpetua was received by a certain one who was still a catechumen, Rusticus by name, who kept close to her, and she, as if aroused from sleep, so deeply had she been in the spirit and in an ecstasy, began to look round her, and to say to the amazement of all, 
I cannot tell when we are to be led out to that hell. And when she had heard what had already happened, she did not believe it until she had perceived certain signs of injury in her body and in her dress, and had recognized the catechumen. Afterwards causing that catechumen and the brother to approach, she addressed them, saying, Stand fast in the faith, and love one another, all of you, and be not offended at my sufferings. For the same satirist at the other entrance exhorted the soldier Budans, saying, Assuredly here I am, as I have promised and foretold, for up to this moment I have felt no beast. And now believe with your whole heart, Lo, I am going forth to that beast, and I shall be destroyed with one bite of the leopard. And immediately at the conclusion of the exhibition he was thrown to the leopard, and with one bite of his he was bathed with such a quantity of blood, that the people shouted out to him as he was returning, the testimony of his second baptism, saved and washed saved and washed. Manifestly he was assuredly saved who had been glorified in such a spectacle. Then to the soldier Budans he said, Farewell, and be mindful of my faith, and let not these things disturb, but confirm you. And at the same time he asked for a little ring from his finger, and returned it to him bathed in his wound, leaving to him an inherited token and the memory of his blood. And then lifeless he is cast down with the rest to be slaughtered in the usual place. And when the populace called for them into the midst, that as the sword penetrated into their body they might make their eyes partners in the murder, they rose up of their own accord, and transferred themselves whither the people wished, but they first kissed one another, that they might consummate their martyrdom with the kiss of peace. The rest indeed, immovable and in silence, received the sword thrust, much more satirous, who also had first ascended the ladder and first gave up his spirit, for he also was waiting for Perpetua. But Perpetua, that she might taste some pain, being pierced between the ribs, cried out loudly, and she herself placed the wavering right hand of the youthful gladiator to her throat. Possibly such a woman could not have been slain unless she herself had willed it, because she was feared by the impure spirit. O most brave and blessed martyrs, O truly called and chosen unto the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ! whom whoever magnifies, and honors, and adores, assuredly ought to read these examples for the edification of the church, not less than the ancient ones, so that new virtues also may testify that one and the same Holy Spirit is always operating even until now, and God the Father Omnipotent, and His Son Jesus Christ our Lord, whose is the glory and infinite power for ever and ever. Amen. Tertullian to his wife Book 1 Chapter 1. Design of the Treatise Disavowal of Personal Motives in Writing IT I have thought it meet, my best beloved fellow servant in the Lord, even from this early period, to provide for the course which you must pursue after my departure from the world, if I shall be called before you, and to entrust to your honor the observance of the provision. For in things worldly we are active enough, and we wish the good of each of us to be consulted. If we draw up wills for such matters, why ought we not much more to take forethought for our posterity in things divine and heavenly, and in a sense to bequeath the legacy to be received before the inheritance be divided, comma, the legacy, I mean, of, admonition and demonstration touching those, bequests, which are allotted out of, our, immortal goods, and from the heritage of the heavens, only, that you may be able to receive in its entirety this fulfillment and trust of my admonition, may God grant, whom be honor, glory, renown, dignity, and power, now and to the ages of the ages. The precept, therefore, which I give you is, that, with all the constancy you may, you do, after our departure, renounce nuptials, not that you will on that score confer any benefit on me, except in that you will profit yourself. But to Christians, after their departure from the world, no restoration of marriage is promised in the day of the resurrection, translated as they will be into the condition and sanctity of angels. Therefore no solicitude arising from carnal jealousy will, in the day of the resurrection, even in the case of her whom they chose to represent as having been married to seven brothers successively, wound any one of her so many husbands, nor is any husband awaiting her to put her to confusion. The question raised by the Sadducees has yielded to the Lord's sentence. Think not that it is for the sake of preserving to the end for myself the entire devotion of your flesh, that I, suspicious of the pain of, anticipated, slight, am even at this early period instilling into you the counsel of, perpetual, 
widowhood. There will at that day be no resumption of voluptuous disgrace between us. No such frivolities, no such impurities, does God promise to his servants. But whether to you, or to any other woman whatever who pertains to God, the advice which we are giving shall be profitable, we take leave to treat of it large. Chapter 2 Marriage Lawful but not polygamy. We do not indeed forbid the union of man and woman, blessed by God as the seminary of the human race, and devised for the replenishment of the earth and the furnishing of the world, and therefore permitted, yet singly. For Adam was the one husband of Eve, and Eve his one wife, one woman, one rib. We grant, that among our ancestors, and the patriarchs themselves, it was lawful not only to marry, but even to multiply wives. There are concubines, too, in those days, but although the church did come in figuratively in the synagogue, yet, to interpret simply, it was necessary to institute, certain things, which should afterward deserve to be either lopped off or modified, for the law was, in due time, to supervene, nor was that enough, for it was meet that causes for making up the deficiencies of the law should have forerun him who was to supply those deficiencies. And so to the law presently had to succeed the word of God introducing the spiritual circumcision. Therefore, by means of the wide license of those days, materials for subsequent emendations were furnished beforehand, of which materials the Lord by his gospel, and then the apostle in the last days of the Jewish age, either cut off the redundances or regulated the disorders. Chapter 3 Marriage Good celibacy preferable. But let it not be thought that my reason for premising thus much concerning the liberty granted to the old, and the restraint imposed on the later time, is that I may lay a foundation for teaching that Christ's advent was intended to dissolve wedlock, and, to abolish marriage talents, as if from this period onward I were proscribing an end to marrying. Let them see to that, who, among the rest of their perversities, teach the disjoining of the one flesh in twain, denying him who, after borrowing the female from the male, recombine between themselves, in the matrimonial computation, the two bodies taken out of the consortship of the self-same material substance. In short, there is no place at all where we read that nuptials are prohibited, of course on the ground that they are a good thing. What, however, is better than this good, we learn from the apostle, who permits marrying indeed, but prefers abstinence, the former on account of the insidiousnesses of temptations, the latter on account of his straits of the times. Now, by looking into the reason thus given for each proposition, it is easily discerned that the ground on which the power of marrying is conceded is necessity, but whatever necessity grants, she by her very nature depreciates. In fact, in that it is written, to marry is better than to burn. What, pray? is the nature of this good which is, only, commanded by comparison with the evil, so that the reason why marrying is mere good is, merely, that burning is less. Nay, but how far better is it neither to marry nor to burn? Why, even in persecutions it is better to take advantage of the permission granted, and flee from town to town, than, when apprehended and racked, to deny, the faith. And therefore more blessed are they who have strength to depart, this life in blessed confession of their testimony. I may say, what is permitted is not good, for how stands the case, I must of necessity die, if I be apprehended and confess my faith, if I think, that fate, deplorable, then flight, is good, but if I have a fear of the thing which is permitted, the permitted thing, has some suspicion attaching to the cause of its permission, but that which is better no one, ever, permitted, as being undoubted, and manifest by its own inherent purity. There are some things which are not to be desired merely because they are not forbidden, albeit they are in a certain sense forbidden when other things are preferred to them, for the preference given to the higher things is a dissuasion from the lowest. A thing is not good merely because it is not evil, nor is it evil merely because it is not harmful. Further, that which is fully good excels on this ground, that it is not only not harmful, but profitable into the bargain, for you are bound to prefer what is profitable to what is, merely, not harmful, for the first please is what every struggle aims at, the second has consolation attaching to it, but not victory, but if we listen to the apostle, forgetting what is behind, let us both strain after what is before, 
and be followers after the better rewards. Thus, albeit he does not east a snare upon us, he points out what tends to utility when he says, the unmarried woman thinks on the things of the Lord, that both in body and spirit she may be holy, but the married is solicitous how to please her husband. But he nowhere permits marriage in such a way as not rather to wish us to do our utmost in imitation of his own example. Happy the man who shall prove like Paul, chapter 4, of the infirmity of the flesh, and similar pleas. But we read that the flesh is weak, and hence we soothe ourselves in some cases. Yet we read. 2. That the spirit is strong, for each clause occurs in one and the same sentence. Flesh is an earthly, spirit a heavenly, material. Why, then, do we, too prone to self-excuse, put forward, in our defense, the weak part of us, but not look at the strong? Why should not the earth yield to the heavenly? If the spirit is stronger than the flesh, because it is with all of nobler origin, it is our own fault if we follow the weaker. Now there are two phases of human weakness which make marriages necessary to such as are disjoined from matrimony. The first and most powerful is that which arises from fleshly concupiscence. The second, from worldly concupiscence. But by us, who are servants of God, who renounce both voluptuousness and ambition, each is to be repudiated. Fleshly concupiscence claims the functions of adult age, craves after beauty's harvest, rejoices in its own shame, pleads the necessity of a husband to the female sex, as a source of authority and of comfort, or to render it safe from evil rumors. To meet these its counsels, do you apply the examples of sisters of ours whose names are with the Lord, who, when their husbands have preceded them, to glory, give to no opportunity of beauty or of age the precedence over holiness. They prefer to do wedded to God, to God their beauty, to God their youth, is dedicated. With him they live, with him they converse, him they handle by day and by night, to the Lord they assign their prayers as dowries, from him, as oft as they desire it, they receive his approbation as double gifts. Thus they have laid hold for themselves of an eternal gift of the Lord and while on earth, by abstaining from marriage, are already counted as belonging to the angelic family. Training yourself to an emulation of, their, constancy by the examples of such women, you will by spiritual affection bury that fleshly concupiscence, in abolishing the temporal and fleeting desires of beauty and youth by the compensating gain of immortal blessings. On the other hand, this worldly concupiscence, to which I referred, has, as its causes, glory, cupidity, ambition, want of sufficiency, through which causes it trumps up the necessity for marrying, comma, promising itself, forsooth, heavenly things in return to lord it, namely, in another's family, truce on another's wealth, to extort splendor from another's store to lavish expenditure which you do not feel. Far be all this from believers, who have no care about maintenance, unless it be that we distrust the promises of God, and, his, care and providence, who clothes with such grace the lilies of the field, who, without any labor on their part, feeds the fowls of the heaven, who prohibits care to be taken about tomorrow's food and clothing, promising that he knows what is needful for each of his servants not indeed ponderous necklaces, not burdensome garments, not Gallic mules nor German bears, which all add luster to the glory of nuptials, but sufficiency, which is suitable to moderation and modesty. Presume, I pray you, that you have need of nothing if you will tend upon the Lord, nay, that you have all things, if you have the Lord, whose are all things. Think often on things heavenly, and you will despise things earthly. To widowhood signed and sealed before the Lord not is necessary but perseverance. Chapter 5. Dot of the love of offspring as a plea for marriage. For the reasons for marriage which men allege for themselves arise from anxiety for posterity and the bitter, bitter pleasure of children. To us this is idle. For why should we be eager to bear children, whom, when we have them, we desire to send before us, to glory, in respect, I mean, of the distresses that are now imminent, desirous as we are ourselves, too, to be taken out of this most wicked world, and received into the Lord's presence, which was the desire even of an apostle, to the servant of God, forsooth, offspring is necessary, for of our own salvation we are secure enough, 
so that we have leisure for children. Burdens must be sought by us for ourselves which are avoided even by the majority of the Gentiles, who are compelled by laws, who are decimated by abortions, burdens which, finally, are to us most of all unsuitable, as being perilous to faith. For why did the Lord foretell out woe to them that are with child, and them that give suck? except because he testifies that in that day of disencumbrance the encumbrances of children will be an inconvenience. It is to marriage, of course, that those encumbrances appertain, but that, woe, will not pertain to widows. They, at the first trump of the angel will spring forth disencumbered will freely bear to the end whatsoever pressure and persecution, with no burdensome fruit of marriage heaving in the womb, none in the bosom. Therefore, whether it be for the sack of the flesh, or of the world, or of posterity, that marriage is undertaken, nothing of all these necessities affects the servants of God, so as to prevent my deeming it enough to have once for all yielded to some one of them, and by one marriage appeased all concupiscence of this kind. Let us marry daily, and in the midst of our marrying let us be overtaken, like Saddam and Gomorrah, by that day of fear, for there it was not only, of course, that they were dealing in marriage and merchandise, but when he says, they were marrying and buying, he sets a brand upon the very leading vices of the flesh and of the world, which call man off the most from divine disciplines the one through the pleasure of riding, the other though the greed of acquiring. And yet that blindness then was felt long before the ends of the world. What, then, will the case be if God now keep us from the voices which of old were detestable before him? The time, says, the apostle, is compressed. It remaineth that they who have wives act as if they had them not. Chapter. Vi. Examples of heathen surged as commentatory of widowhood and celibacy. But if they who have wives are thus bound to consign to oblivion what they have, how much more are they who have not prohibited from seeking a second time what they no longer have, so that she whose husband has departed from the world should thenceforward impose rest on her sex by abstinence from marriage abstinence which numbers of Gentile women devote to the memory of beloved husbands. When anything seems difficult, let us survey others who cope with still greater difficulties. How many are there who from the moment of their baptism set the seal, of virginity, upon their flesh? How many, again? who by equal mutual consent cancel the debt of matrimony voluntary eunuchs for the sack of their desire, after the celestial kingdom. But if, while the marriage tie is still intact, abstinence is endured, how much more when it has been undone? For I believe it to be harder for what is intact to be quite forsaken, than for what has been lost not to be yearned after. A hard and arduous thing enough, surely, is the continence for God's sack of a holy woman after her husband's decease when Gentiles, in honor of their own Satan, endure sacerdotal offices which involve both virginity and widowhood. At Rome, for instance, they who have to do with the type of that inextinguishable fire, keeping watch over the omens of their own, future, penalty, in company with the, old, dragon himself, are appointed on the ground of virginity. To the Achean Juno, at the town Aegeum, a virgin is allotted, and the, priestesses, who rave at Delphi know not marriage. Moreover, we know that widows minister to the African seers, enticed away, indeed, from matrimony by a most stam oblivion, for not only do they withdraw from their still living husbands, but they even introduce other wives to them in their own room the husbands, of course, smiling on at all contact, with males, even as far as the kiss of their sons, being forbidden them, and yet, with enduring practice. They persevere in such a discipline of widowhood, which excludes the solace even of holy affection. These precepts has the devil given to his servants, and he is heard. He challenges, forsooth, God's servants, by the continents of his own, as if on equal terms. Continent are even the priests of hell, for he has found a way to ruin men underscore even in good pursuits, and with him it makes no difference to slay some by voluptuousness some by continence. Chapter 7, The death of a husband is God's call to the widow to continence. Further evidences from scripture and from heathenism. To us continence has been pointed out by the Lord of salvation as an instrument for attaining eternity, and as a testimony of, our, faith, as a commendation of this flesh of ours, which is to be sustained for the garment of immortality, which is one day to supervene, for enduring, 
and find, the will of God, besides, reflect, I advise you, that there is no one who is taken out of the world but by the will of God, if, as is the case, not even a leaf falls from off a tree without it, the same who brings us into the world, must of necessity take us out of it too, therefore when, through the will of God, the husband is deceased, the marriage likewise, by the will of God, deceases, why should you risk to worry what God has put an end to, why do you, by repeating the servitude of matrimony, spurn the liberty which is offered you, you have been bound to a wife, sap the apostle, seek not loosing, you have been loosed from a wife, seek not binding, for even if you do not sin in remarrying, still he says pressure of the flesh ensues, wherefore, so far as we can, let us love the opportunity of continence, as soon as it offers itself, let us resolve to accept it, that what we have not had strength, to follow, in matrimony we may follow in widowhood, the occasion must be embraced which puts an end to that which necessity commanded, how detrimental to faith, how obstructive to holiness, second marriages are, the discipline of the church and the prescription of the apostle declare, when he suffers not man twice married to preside, over a church, when he would not grant the widow admittance into the order unless she had been the wife of one man, for it behoves God's altar to be set forth pure, that whole halo which encircles the church is represented, as consisting, of holiness, priesthood is, a function, of widowhood and of celibacies among the nations, of course, this is, in conformity with the devil's principle of rivalry, for the king of heathendom, the chief pontiff, to marry a second time is unlawful, how pleasing must holiness be to God, when even his enemy affects it exclamation mark not, of course, as having any affinity with anything good, but as contumeliously affecting what is pleasing to God the Lord. Chapter 8, Conclusion, 4, Concerning the honors which widowhood enjoys in the sight of God, there is a brief summary in one saying of his through the prophet, Do thou justly to the widow and to the orphan, and come ye, let us reason, saith the Lord. These two names, left to the care of the divine mercy, in proportion as they are destitute of human aid, the father of all undertakes to defend, look how the widow's benefactor is put on a level with the widow herself, whose champion shall reason with the Lord, not to virgins, I take it is so great a gift given, although in their case perfect integrity and entire sanctity shall have the nearest vision of the face of God, yet the widow has a task more toilsome, because it is easy not to crave after that which you know not, and to turn away from what you have never had to regret. More glorious is the countenance which is aware of its own right, which knows what it has seen. The virgin may possibly be held the happier, but the widow the more hardly tasked the former in that she has always kept the good, the latter in that she has found the good for herself, in the former it is grace, in the latter virtue, that is ground, for some things there are which are of the divine liberality, some of our own working, the indulgences granted by the Lord are regulated by their own grace, the things which are objects of man's striving are attained by earnest pursuit, pursue earnestly, therefore, the virtue of continence, which is modesty's agent, Industry, which allows not women to be wanderers, frugality, which scorns the world, follow companies and conversations worthy of God, mindful of that short verse, sanctified by the apostles' quotation of it, ill interviews good morals do corrupt, talkative, idle, wine-bibbing, curious and fellows, do the very greatest hurt to the purpose of widowhood, through talkativeness their creepant words unfriendly to modesty. Through idleness they seduce one from strictness, through wine bibbing they insinuate any and every evil, through curiosity they convey a spirit of rivalry and lust. Not one of such women knows how to speak of the good of single husbandhood, for their God, as the apostle says, is their belly, and so, too, what is neighbor to the belly. These considerations, dearest fellow servant, I commend to you thus surly, handled throughout superfluously indeed after the apostle, but likely to prove a solace to you, in that, if so it shall turn out, you will cherish my memory in them. Book 2, Chapter 1. Reasons which led to the writing of the second book. Very lately, best beloved fellow servant in the Lord, I, as my ability permitted, 
entered for your benefit at some length into the question what course is to be followed by a holy woman when her marriage has, in whatever way, been brought to an end. Let us now turn our attention to the next best advice, in regard of human infirmity, admonished hereto by the examples of certain, who, when an opportunity for the practice of continence has been offered them, by divorce, or by the decease of the husband, have not only thrown away the opportunity of attaining so great a good, but not even in their remarriage have chosen to be mindful of the rule that above all they marry in the Lord. And thus my mind has been thrown into confusion, in the fear that, having exhorted you myself to perseverance in single husbandhood and widowhood, I may now, by the mention of precipitate marriages, put an occasion of falling in your way. But if you are perfect in wisdom, you know, of course, that the course which is the more useful is the course which you must keep. But, inasmuch as that course is difficult, and not without its embarrassments, and on this account is the highest aim of, widowed, life, I have paused somewhat, in my urging you to it, nor would there have been any causes for my recurring to that point also in addressing you, had I not by this time taken up a still graver solicitude, for the nobler is the countenance of the flesh which ministers to widowhood, the more pardonable a thing it seems if it be not persevered in. For it is then when things are difficult that their pardon is easy. But in as far as marrying in the Lord is permissible, as being within our power, so far more culpable is it not to observe that which you can observe. Add to this the fact that the Apostle, with regard to widows and the unmarried, advises them to remain permanently in that state, when he says, But I desire all to persevere in, imitation of, my example, but touching marrying in the Lord, he no longer advises, but plainly bids. Therefore in this case especially, if we do not obey, we run a risk, because one may with more impunity neglect an advice than in order, in that the former springs from counsel, and is proposed to the will, for acceptance or rejection, the other descends from authority, and is bound to necessity. In the former case, to disregard appears liberty, in the latter. Contrumacy. Chapter Lee. Dot of the Apostles meaning in I Cor. 7. 12 14. Therefore, when in these days a certain woman removed her marriage from the pale of the church, and united herself to a Gentile, and when I remembered that this had in days gone by been done by others, wondering at either their own waywardness or else the double dealing of their advisers, in that there is no scripture which holds forth the license of the steed, comma, I wonder, said I whether they flatter themselves on the ground of that passage of the first, epistle, to the Corinthians, where it is written, if any of the brethren has an unbelieving wife, and she consents to the matrimony, let him not dismiss her. Similarly, let not a believing woman, married to an unbeliever, if she finds her husband agreeable, to their continued union, dismiss him, for the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the believing wife, and the unbelieving wife by the believing husband, else were your children unclean. It may be that, by understanding generally this monition regarding married believers, they think that license is granted, thereby, to marry even unbelievers. God forbid that he who thus interprets, the passage, be wittingly ensnaring himself. But it is manifest that this scripture points to those believers who may have been found by the grace of God in, the state of, Gentile matrimony, according to the words themselves, if, it says, any believer has an unbelieving wife, it does not say, takes an unbelieving wife. It shows that it is the duty of one who, already living in marriage with an unbelieving woman, has presently been by the grace of God converted, to continue with his wife, for this reason, to be sure, in order that no one, after attaining to faith, should think that he must turn away from a woman who is now in some sense an alien and stranger. Accordingly he subjoins with all reason, that we are called in peace unto the Lord God, and that the unbeliever may, through the use of matrimony, be gained by the believer. The very closing sentence of the period confirms, the supposition, that this is thus to be understood, as each, it says, is called by the Lord, so let him persevere. But it is Gentiles who are called, I take it not believers, but if he had been pronouncing absolutely, in the words under discussion, touching the marriage of believers merely, then, had he, virtually, given to saints a permission to marry promiscuously, if, 
However, he had given such a permission, he would never have subjoined a declaration so diverse from and contrary to his own permission, saying, The woman, when her husband is dead, is free, let her marry whom she wishes, only in the Lord. Here, at all events, there is no need for reconsidering, for what there might have been reconsideration about, the Spirit has oracularly declared. For fear we should make an ill use of what he says, let her marry whom she wishes, he has added, only in the Lord, that is, in the name of the Lord, which is, undoubtedly, to a Christian, that Holy Spirit, therefore, who prefers that widows and unmarried women should persevere in their integrity, who exhorts us to a copy of himself, prescribes no other manner of repeating marriage except in the Lord, to this condition alone does he concede the foregoing of continence, only, he says, in the Lord. He has added to his law a weight only, utter that word with what tone and manner you may, it is witty, it both bids and advises, both enjoins and exhorts, both asks and threatens, it is a concise, brief sentence, and by its own very brevity, eloquent. Thus is the divine voice wont, to speak, that you may instantly understand, instantly observe. For who but could understand that the apostle foresaw many dangers and wounds to faith in marriages of this kind, which he prohibits. Sad that he took precaution, in this first place, against the defilement of holy flesh and gentile flesh. At this point someone says, what, then, is the difference between him who is chosen by the Lord to himself in, the state of, gentile marriage, and him who was of old, that is, before marriage, a believer, that they should not be equally cautious for their flesh question mark whereas the one is kept from marriage with an unbeliever the other bidden to continue in it. Why, if we are defiled by a Gentile, is not the one disjoined, just as the other is not bound? I will answer, if the Spirit give, me ability, alleging, before all, other arguments, that the Lord holds it more pleasing that matrimony should not be contracted, than that it should at all be dissolved, in short, divorce he prohibits, except for the cause of fornication, but continence he commands, let the one, Therefore, have the necessity of continuing, the other, further, even the power of not marrying. Secondly, if, according to the scripture, they who shall be apprehended by the faith in, the state of, Gentile marriage are not defiled, thereby, for this reason, that, together with themselves, others also are sanctified, without doubt, they who have been sanctified before marriage, if they commingle themselves with strange flesh, cannot sanctify that, flesh, in, union with, which they were not apprehended, the grace of God, moreover, sanctifies that which it finds, thus, what has not been able to be sanctified is unclean, what is unclean has no part with the holy, unless to defile and slay it by its own, nature. Chapter, 3, remarks on some of the dangers and wounds referred to in the preceding chapter, if these things are so, it is certain that believers contracting marriages with Gentiles are guilty of fornication, and are to be excluded from all communication with the brotherhood, in accordance with the letter of the Apostle, who says that with persons of that kind there is to be no taking of food even, or shall we in that they produce, our, marriage certificates before the Lord's tribunal, and allege that a marriage such as he himself has forbidden has been duly contracted, what is prohibited? in the passage just referred to, is not adultery, it is not fornication, the admission of a strange man, to your couch, less violates the temple of God, less commingles the members of Christ with the members of an adulteress, so far as I know, we are not our own, but bought with the price, and what kind of price, the blood of God, in hurting this flesh of ours, therefore, we heard him directly, what did that man mean who said that to wed a stronger was indeed a sin? but a very small one, whereas in other cases, setting aside the injury done to the flesh which pertains to the Lord, every voluntary sin against the Lord is great, for, in as far as there was a power of avoiding it, in so far is it burdened with the charge of contumacy. Let us now recount the other dangers or wounds, as I have said, to faith, foreseen by the Apostle, most grievous not to the flesh merely but likewise to the spirit too, for who would doubt that faith undergoes a daily process of obliteration by unbelieving intercourse, evil confabulations corrupt good morals, how much more a fellowship of life, 
and indivisible intimacy. Any and every believing woman must of necessity obey God. And how can she serve two lords underscore the Lord, and her husband a Gentile to boot? For in obeying a Gentile she will carry out Gentile practices comma personal attractiveness, dressing of the head, worldly elegancies, baser blandishments, the very secrets even of matrimony tainted, not, as among the saints, where the duties of the sex are discharged with honor, shown, to the very necessity, which makes them incumbent, with modesty and temperance, as beneath the eyes of God. Chapter 4, Of the Hindrances Which an Unbelieving Husband Puts in His Wife's Way But let her see to, the question, how she discharges her duties to her husband, to the Lord, at all events, she is unable to give satisfaction according to the requirements of discipline, having at her side a servant of the devil, his lord's agent for hindering the pursuits and duties of believers, so that if a station is to be kept, the husband at daybreak makes an appointment with his wife to meet him at the baths, if there are fasts to be observed, the husband that same day holds a convivial banquet, if a charitable expedition has to be made. Never is family business more urgent, for who would suffer his wife, for the sack of visiting the brethren, to go round from street to street to other men's, and indeed to all the poorer, cottages, who will willingly bear her being taken from his side by nocturnal convocations, if need so be, who, finally, will without anxiety endure her absence all the night long at the paschal solemnities, who will, without some suspicion of his own. Dismiss her to attend that Lord's Supper which they defame, who will suffer her to creep into prison to kiss a martyr's bonds. Nay, truly, to meet any one of the brethren to exchange the kiss? To offer water for the saints' feet? To snatch, somewhat for them, from her food, from her cup? To yearn, after them? To have, them, in her mind, if a pilgrim brother arrive? What hospitality for him in an alien home? If bounty is to be distributed to any, the granaries, the storehouses, are foreclosed. Chapter 5. Dot of sin and danger incurred even with a tolerant husband. But some husband does endure our practices, and not annoy us. Here, therefore, there is a sin, and that Gentiles know our practices, in that we are subject to the privity of the unjust, in that it is thanks to them that we do any good work, he who endures, a thing, cannot be ignorant of it, or else, if he is kept in ignorance because he does not endure, he is feared, but since scripture commands each of two things namely, that we work for the Lord without the privity of any second person, and without pressure upon ourselves, it matters not in which court you sin, whether in regard to your husband's privity, if he be tolerant, or else in regard of your own affliction in avoiding his intolerance. Cast not, saith he, your pearls to swine, lest they trample them to pieces, and turn round and overturn you also. Your pearls are the distinctive marks of even your daily conversation. The more care you take to conceal them, the more liable to suspicion you will make them, and the more exposed to the grasp of gentile curiosity. Shall you escape notice when you sign your bed, your body? When you blow away some impurity, when even by night you rise to pray, will you not be thought to be engaged in some work of magic? Will not your husband know what it is which you secretly taste before, taking, any food? And if he knows it to be bread, does he not believe it to be that, bread, which it is said to be? And will every, husband, ignorant of the reason of these things, simply endure them? without murmuring, without suspicion whether it be bread or poison, some, it is true, do endure, them, but it is that they may trample on, that they may make sport of such women, whose secrets they keep in reserve against the danger which they believe in, in case they ever chance to be hurt, they do endure, wives, whose dowries, by casting in their teeth their, Christian, name, they make the wages of silence, while they threaten them, forsooth, with the suit before some spy as arbitrator. Which most women, not foreseeing, have been wont to discover either by the extortion of their property, or else by the loss of their faith. Chapter, Vi. Danger of having to take part in heathenish rites, and revels, the handmaid of God dwells amid alien labors, and among these, labors, on all the memorial days of demons, 
at all solemnities of kings, at the beginning of the year, at the beginning of the month, she will be agitated by the odor of incense, and she will have to go forth, from her house, by a gate wreathed with laurel, and hung with lanterns, as from some new consistory of public lusts, she will have to sit with her husband oft times in club meetings, oft times in taverns, and, want as she was formerly to minister to the saints, will sometimes have to minister to the unjust, and will she not hence recognize a prejudgment of her own damnation, in that she tends them whom, formerly, she was expecting to judge? Whose hand will she yearn after? Of whose cup will she partake? What will her husband sing to her, or she to her husband? From the tavern, I suppose, she who sups upon God will hear somewhat, from hell what mention of God, arises? What invocation of Christ? Where are the fosterings of faith by the interspersion of the scriptures, in conversation, where the spirit? Where refreshment? Where the divine benediction? All things are strange, all inimical, all condemned, aimed by the evil one for the attrition of salvation. Chap. 7. The case of a he whose wife is converted after marriage with him very different, and much more hopeful. If these things may happen to those women also who, having attained the faith while in, the state of, Gentile matrimony, continue in that state, still they are excused, as having been apprehended by God in these very circumstances, and they are bidden to persevere in their married state, and are sanctified, and have hope of making again held out to them. If, then, a marriage of this kind, contracted berate conversion, stands ratified before God, why should not, one contracted after conversion, to go prosperously forward, so as not to be thus harassed by pressures, and straits, and hindrances, and defilements, having already, as it has, the partial sanction of divine grace, because, on the one hand, the wife in the former case, called from among the Gentiles to the exercise of some eminent heavenly virtue, is, by the visible proofs of some marked, divine, regard, a terror to her Gentile husband, so as to make him less ready to annoy her, less active in laying snares for her, less diligent in playing the spy over her. He has felt mighty works, he has seen experimental evidences, he knows her changed for the better, thus even he himself is, by his fear, a candidate for God. Thus men of this kind, with regard to whom the grace of God has established a familiar intimacy, are more easily gained. But, on the other hand, to descend into forbidden ground unsolicited and spontaneously, is, quite, another thing. Things which are not pleasing to the Lord, of course offend the Lord, are of course introduced by the evil one. A sign hereof is this fact, that it is wooers only who find the Christian name pleasing, and, accordingly, some heathen men are found not to shrink in horror from Christian women, just in order to exterminate them, to wrest them away to exclude them from the faith, so long as marriage of this kind is procured by the evil one, but condemned by God, you have a reason why you need not doubt that it can in no case be carted to a prosperous end. Chapter 8 Arguments drawn even from heathenish laws to discountenance marriage with unbelievers, the happiness of union between partners in the faith enlarged on in conclusion. Let us further inquire, as if we were in very deed inquisitors of divine sentences, whether they be lawfully, thus condemned, even among the nations, do not all the strictest lords and most tenacious of discipline interdict their own slaves from marrying out of their own house question mark in order, of course, that they may not run into lascivious success, desert their duties purvey their lords goods to strangers, yet, further, have not, the nations, decided that such women as have, after their lords formal warning, persisted in intercourse with other men's slaves, may be claimed as slaves, shall earthly disciplines be held more strict than heavenly proscripts, so that Gentile women, if united to strangers, lose their liberty, ours can join to themselves the devil's slaves, and continue in their, former, position, forsooth, they will deny that any formal warning has been given them by the Lord through his own apostle. What am I to fasten on as the cause of this madness, except the weakness of faith, ever prone? to the concupiscences of worldly joys question mark which, indeed, is chiefly found among the wealthier, for the more any is rich, and inflated with the name of matron, the more capacious house does she require for her burdens, 
as it were a field wherein ambition may run its course, to such the churches look paltry. A rich man is a difficult thing, to find, in the house of God, and if such an one is, found there, difficult, is it to find such, unmarried. What, then, are they to do, whence but from the devil are they to seek a husband apartment for maintaining their sedan, and their mules, and their hair curlers of outlandish stature. A Christian, even although rich, would perhaps not afford, all, these, set before yourself, I beg of you, the examples of Gentiles, most Gentile women, noble in extraction and wealthy in property, unite themselves indiscriminately with the ignoble and the mean, sought out for themselves for luxurious, or mutilated for licentious, purposes, some take up with their own freedmen and slaves, despising public opinion, provided they may but have, husbands from whom to fear no impediment to their own liberty. To a Christian believer it is irksome to wed a believer inferior to herself in a state, destined as she will be to have her wealth augmented in the person of her poor husband. For if it is the poor, not the rich, whose are the kingdoms of the heavens, the rich will find more in the poor, than she brings him, or than she would in the rich. She will be dowered with an ampler dowry from the goods of him who is rich in God. Let her be on an equality with him. On earth who in the heavens will perhaps not be so. Is there a need for doubt, and inquiry, and repeated deliberation, whether he whom God has entrusted with his own property is fit for total endowments? Whence are we to find, words, enough fully to tell the happiness of that marriage which the church cements, and the oblation confirms, and the benediction signs and seals, which, angels carry back the news of, to heaven, which, the father holds for ratified, for even on earth children do not rightly and lawfully wed without their father's consent. What kind of yoke is that of two believers, partakers, of one hope, one desire, one discipline, one and the same service? Both, are, brethren, both fellow servants, no difference of spirit or of flesh, nay, they are, truly two in one flesh. Where the flesh is one, one is the spirit ton, together they pray together prostrate themselves, together perform their fasts, mutually teaching, mutually exhorting, mutually sustaining. Equally, are they, both, found, in the church of God, equally at the banquet of God, equally in straits, in persecutions, in refreshments, neither hides, aught, from the other, neither shuns the other, neither is troublesome to the other. The sick is visited, the indigent relieved, with freedom, alms, are given, without, danger of ensuing, to warment, sacrifices, attended, without scruple, daily diligence, discharged, without impediment, there is, no stealthy signing, no trembling greeting, no mute benediction, between the two echo psalms and hymns, and they mutually challenge each other which shall better chant to their Lord, such things when Christ sees and hears, he joys, to these he sends his own eye peace, whereto, are, there with all he himself, where he, there the evil one is not. These are the things which that utterance of the Apostle has, beneath its brevity, left to be understood by us. These things, if need shall be, suggest to your own mind. By these turn yourself away from the examples of some. To marry otherwise is, to believers, not lawful, is not expedient. Translated by the Reverend S. Stelwell.